Skyrim is one of the most influential games of the 2010s. You see this not just with its gargantuan sales figures, landing Bethesda a sale price at Microsoft twice that of Star Wars, but in the explosion of open world games afterwards, and the rise in popularity of perk-based progression systems in the least expected places, we'll be picking pieces of Skyrim's DNA out of games for another decade. I started this project the month of Dovahkiin's 10th birthday. I wonder if his parents were really happy about their lifetime free copies of all those Bethesda games that have come out since, you know, Elder Scrolls games like Fallout 4, Fallout Shelter, Fallout 76, and soon, Starfield. Skyrim is a difficult game to talk about. Deceptively difficult. It seems easy because it's popular and it's dumbed down. Babbies can play it. There's no way the game is actually a Gordian knot that reverts common sense into clown logic. Imagine my surprise when G-Man Lives and Angry Joe made the best Skyrim videos, because it turns out this game is not the easy target it appears to be. Now my goal here isn't to just put down Skyrim for its iniquities. It actually has some strengths and intelligent design behind it. It's obvious most of Skyrim's problems are a consequence of deliberate design. Things being held back to achieve a particular vision. Rather than restrictive factors like time or lack of resources, which, while being great for Bethesda and the people who make up the company, is not so great for the people who were fans before it was cool. The place to begin our analysis is with the introduction. Hitting new game, we are shown an image of a dragon upon a stone wall, a model which was actually translated into the real world and sold in the collector's edition. I was actually at a midnight release for Skyrim and people booed a guy because he was the only person to buy the PC collector's edition, so they just had him come up and get it, and then leave, ahead of everyone else. We live in a pay-to-win world. Included on this screen is a small verse prophesizing the events of the game, which seems to be a replacement for the voiceover narrations of old, before we see the iconic fade into the world. To be honest, the Skyrim fade-in meme is not actually one from the Elder Scrolls community, despite being about Skyrim. It's simply the first moments of an iconic and well-known game. The meme could have easily been about Half-Life 1's very similar intro, had it been nearly as popular with non-traditional gamers. We are greeted by a man who is beaming a massive smile at us before he begins to preach to us information about the setting and our current situation. I have to say, I hate preachers. That is not a statement of hostility towards religious groups that use that term, I've known many academics, corporate workers, and entertainers who were also preachers. Rather, I dislike the idea of a person who only wants to step up to a podium and dictate their ideas to a captive audience, without being willing to entertain a reply. I'm rather a big fan of dialogue, of options, and engagement being presented to the audience. I say all that as an explanation of my decision to begin these videos with discussion. Ah, <laughs> gotcha. Let's make a deal. If my intro is longer than Skyrim's, then it is too long. Also, yes, I am a VTuber, and this is the only time I will ever mention it in this entire video. Rather than simply jumping straight into the sermon as is common, normally I wouldn't even take time to explain the explanation. It seems intuitive that if you click on a video that is 8, 12, or 20 hours long, that you would not be bothered by 4-6 to six minutes of meta discussion. Unfortunately, I was wrong about this, hence this very brief section. My introductions are sometimes described as strawmanning or whining. I didn't understand that perspective until I saw pretty much every major Skyrim video ever made, which, which as a general rule are typically made by preachers. There seems to be a belief that this is not a valid part of the video, that the video doesn't begin until this discussion is over. While I'm going to be talking 100% about Skyrim within a couple minutes, the truth is, you're already watching the video. I have been in the Elder Scrolls community for more than half of my life. I've had a couple conversations about the games over the years. I've heard pretty much every argument ever made, and it is rare that someone offers a truly fresh perspective, simply due to the lack of new content. My original intention with the introduction was simply to inform people about many arguments I had heard before in these discussions. If I strawman an argument about fast travel, that is because I have heard it before. Instead of having to hear it again, I simply respond to it. That way, if you genuinely believe in that argument, you have the opportunity to hear my response to it. It's a straw man, but the thing about straw men is that they do still serve a purpose. They stop birds from eating crops. 
Not only that, but as the primary person responsible for reading the comments, I can say that my philosophy has largely been successful. Plus, I pointed out that Fallout 3 required a patch to run in the Oblivion video's introduction, and a month later, Bethesda randomly decided to fix that issue. Would that have ever happened without the introduction? Well, probably, but I'm still gonna take credit. To give an example, in the Morrowind video I preempted the argument that fast travel is convenient by explaining in a story how tension in a fight could be created when physical travel time is a factor in decision making. I chose that argument because it's often made, and I guess that if I did not address that point, then many people would make it again, despite me already knowing it. Instead of having to hear about how fast travel is convenient, I instead heard a less common argument. That fast travel is necessary because some players do not have the real-world time to spend traveling in a video game. It was something new. Things developed. In the Oblivion video, I discussed this response, explaining that I believe this to be invalid, because one hour of travel in Morrowind is the same, if not oftentimes better, than one hour of instantly teleporting between dungeons and quest locales in Oblivion. As you can see, there was a dialogue. Now, what would happen if I did not do that, if I took the common road of simply preaching with an authoritative voice? In that instance, then I would simply dictate my perspective on fast travel as though it were the one correct opinion to have, and then move on. There are some who advocate this, saying that I would appear stronger and more confident in my arguments if I never entertained opposition. Again, I disagree. Well, partially. It is true that many would be both entertained and convinced simply with a deep voice and an air of charisma. Insert profile pictures of relevant YouTubers here. However, I don't look at my audience as people to be tricked into liking my work with techniques of propaganda. If you want videos that simply preach opinions as the only true perspective to have, then dozens of videos that are both pro and against Skyrim already exist to validate your existing opinions. When you realize that over 80% of those videos have nothing to say, I'll still be here, keeping my gate open for you. Because I love you. And there you go. 700 words that I should not have needed to say. Thankfully, I can make up for it, since I don't really have anything new to say about long videos. It seems that my peers and I have largely won that debate. Long videos are here to stay as long as people continue to have the patience to make them, which... Anyways, just as a heads up, if this is your first long video, when you need a break, you can comment a timestamp, which is generally more reliable than trying to have YouTube remember your place for you, which can often be off by more than 20 minutes. Obviously, I get metrics for this, but I don't think that's going to matter much if you watch enough of the video to need a bookmark. I also do not make these videos to be reliant on past works or having played the game. If you've seen my earlier videos or played Skyrim, you will be better off, but they are written to be self-contained. This is also going to be a fairly audio-focused experience. You can put me on the second monitor while you go play Morrowind. Normally with Gordian Knots, the solution is to cut straight through them. But we need the rope for later, so we have to untangle it. Let's start with all the versions of Skyrim that I played. We have the Legendary Edition, which is the release version of the game and all the DLC. We have the Special Edition, which was a 64-bit re-release owners of the Legendary Edition were given for free back in 2016. We have Skyrim VR, which was just a VR port dumped out in 2018. And we have the Anniversary Edition, which was a downgrade for the Special Edition released for the 10-year anniversary. So, unless you count each individual console release as being separate, which I have never seen done for any game other than Skyrim, we have four releases of Skyrim in 10 years. The only one I patched and modded was Skyrim VR, because it is quite literally broken. It barely functions on the Valve Index, which was released less than two years later. Bethesda abandoned Skyrim VR as it was a cynical cash grab on the VR trend. Technically, if you want, you can count the Anniversary Edition creations as modded content, which is supposed to be the point of it, but Skyrim fans get really pedantic about how it's now official content because Bethesda placed a stamp of approval on it and sold it for money. But this time I did not use the unofficial patch, crash prevention mods, or anything else like that. Part of that is that the unofficial Oblivion patch is... Fairly sensical with its changes, but years of no new games to fix for free has caused the unofficial Skyrim patch to stray into the territory of making gameplay changes, so I chose not to use it. There was a time where I wanted to record the entire video in vanilla Skyrim VR, but 
Having now played it, I can say you do not want to watch that. Instead, I settled for the next best thing, lengthy playthroughs in each version of the game. I played half the game on the launch version, half the game on the special edition with no Creation Club content, and an entire playthrough on the Anniversary Edition. It is pretty funny to try and say I hate these games when I played over 200 hours of Skyrim just to make a video as long as two work shifts. Obviously, we have to start with Helgen since that is where the game begins. Back when I made the Morrowind video, I hated Helgen. It's just such a long and boring introduction sequence that makes replaying the game miserable. Since then, however, I have played so many games that do introductions much worse that I've started to gain an appreciation for it. Why do a 30-minute forced tutorial cave when you can make the introduction last for three hours? Skyrim does have a more cinematic approach than Oblivion, however. At the very least, you can say that you got straight into the game as soon as the cutscene was over. Skyrim replaces the pre-rendered cutscene with a cart ride. This is to create a potentially unbroken first-person perspective for the entire game, except there are moments that force you into third person, so why bother with avoiding the cutscene? It's only five minutes, but those five minutes drag on a repeat playthrough, because there aren't details in this sequence to notice once you've completed the story. Morrowind made us a released prisoner, Oblivion gave us a life sentence, and Skyrim has finally decided to open with an execution. I mean, it's got nothing on Fallout New Vegas. New Vegas starts with a five minute cutscene that establishes the entire conflict of the game visually while also having the balls to put around through the player character's head at the end. These days, that's fairly normal, but I do find it weird that for a few years, games were obsessed with pretending like they are going to kill the player character, while simultaneously becoming easier than ever. Skyrim's character creation is also much more streamlined, due to changes in the mechanics. You create your character model, and that's it. There's never a class creation screen. The game only alludes to the differences between races, and those differences are mostly inconsequential. The only occasion where it matters is if you're trying to do a very specific build, such as playing Khajiit for hand-to-hand -hand or Orc for werewolves. Speaking of, a big point of improvement was in the character models. Bethesda really took the criticism of the Oblivion character faces to heart. It is easier to make a decent looking character in Skyrim than it was to make an ugly character in Oblivion. Not every character is a knockout, and there are far too few hair options, since hair is honestly what you're going to be seeing when you play in third person. Most of the actual story of the introduction is better suited to discussing later. One thing I find disappointing is that the game does not trust you to walk to the execution block. It showcases what happens if you try to run away. Halt! You're not gonna kill me! Archers! Anyone else feel like running? But it doesn't actually let the player try to run away. You're permitted to cheat in this scenario and just script the player's death if they get too far away. Even after we are finally given movement controls, it is a while still until our hands are unbound and we are able to begin interacting with the environment. The game slow boils its mechanics. Here is melee, here is stealth, here are potions, here is thievery, here is magic, here is archery. Oblivion was pretty similar, but took note of what you did and recommended a class based on how you played. Since Skyrim is going for a system where you play exactly how you want, it introduces the player to many things off the bat. So the real question is, what is not here? Because that would be something that hadn't received as much attention. For instance, pickpocketing. Crafting also isn't in the tutorial, but that's probably just because it would really slow things down, but most magic schools aren't in the tutorial either. When we leave, we are deposited into the open world. It should be known that Skyrim is an open world game first and foremost, and that the priority is on allowing the player to do what they want pretty much whenever they want to. Most people likely don't approach Skyrim the same way I would, doing all the factions in bursts, but rather interspersing it with side adventures. Skyrim has less variety than Cyrodiil, but each biome does feel like a distinct part of the world. You don't have to look closely to gauge what part of Skyrim I am currently in, while you need map knowledge to glance at a screenshot of Oblivion and guess where that is. Indeed, if any one department was successful at Bethesda, it was the world designers. They'd moved away from the generated height map and speed tree and gone back to fully handcrafting everything, spending years coming up with a system for creating a world like this that would even function on a 7th generation console. It was in playing Skyrim VR that I truly began to appreciate the scale of what Skyrim accomplished with its world. 
Even watching the footage back does not convey the feeling I had at realizing the sheer elevation differences in the game. You move your hand to look up in the flat version of the game, but in VR you have to physically look up. Playing this I realized that many areas I had perceived as being flat actually had drastic elevation differences. However, while I can handily say that this aspect of Skyrim VR impressed me, no other part did. The world is amazing, but what the world is filled with is not. Even subtracting all the hours of overexposure to the game's content, I was never really impressed by anything the game was showing me. The more interesting a biome is, the less content there seems to be to do there. Hjalmarch, Eastmarch, Winterhold, and The Pale are some of my favorite areas in the game, which have almost no content to them. Meanwhile, more generic areas like Whiterun, Falkreath, and The Rift have great deals of content. While it is handily a step up in world crafting over Cyrodiil, there is nothing that is distinctly fantastical about this environment outside of the Reach. Indeed, the world is covered in a layer of realistic grit, exemplified by the vanilla version of the game's bland color scheme. If this isn't depressing enough for you, consider heading inside one of Skyrim's many dungeons so that you can combine the boring environment with the boring gameplay that constitutes The Elder Scrolls V. When people commit long hours to play Skyrim, it always comes with the caveat of mods. There are a few aspects of Skyrim which cannot be modified in some way, and if you ever get bored of playing through the game's content, as I did on my very first playthrough back in 2011, there are even ambitious attempts at adding new content to the game to play through instead. But that raises a great question. If I got bored of Skyrim 11 years ago, then what are we doing here? To be honest, the allure of Skyrim for me is not the trap itself, but the psychology of those who have been trapped up to this point. There is something about Skyrim that can hold the attention of plebs who don't want to dip their toes in water any deeper, but also attracts the gaze of those who know it is a bad time, yet subject themselves to it anyways. In other words, the fact that all these videos got made, and yet people still, to this day, feel a need to talk about this game is fascinating. It goes beyond the usual allure Elder Scrolls games have. Did we all die to that meteor in 2012, and we're all just stuck in limbo trying to resolve our earthly flaws? Moving on from Helgen, we escape into the world and find ourselves provided with near-absolute freedom. Or so several Skyrim videos would say. Whether or not this is true is, from where I'm sitting, dependent entirely on how immersed you are in your character. Yes, if you look at this from the perspective of being a person, playing a video game, you can go off in 180 degrees of possible exploration. But if you approach this from a role-playing perspective, then there's no choice but to go to Riverwood. The introduction is crafted in such a way to make that the only viable option for a character. This disconnect comes from whether Skyrim engages you as a role-playing game or as an action-adventure game. But even as the latter, you just escaped the tutorial with tons of loot that you would need to sell, which means a trip to town, which you have just been told is to the northeast if you follow your tutorial companion. Skyrim funnels you down the path to Riverwood, and only pretends that doing anything else is actually a reasonable option. This is not a ridiculous game theory, but those of themselves use this sequence to advertise the game. We are given a tour through the countryside, the first stop being the Standing Stones. For the only time in the entire game, three of them have been erected in a single location. Standing Stones are a combination of birth signs and birth sign stones from Oblivion rather than just a simple replacement. In Oblivion, you would choose a birth sign that would give you a number of powers or abilities in order to augment or enhance your class. This came from Morrowind, which itself came from Daggerfall's advantages and disadvantages system. The birth sign stones, however, were an idea taken from the Blood Moon expansion, where you could find stones in the world that would give you abilities. To give an example, the Atronic sign in Oblivion would fortify Magicka 150 points, provide 50% spell absorption, but would prevent passive Magicka regeneration. The Atronach Stone would give you the ability to give yourself an additional 30% spell absorption and 20 Magicka for 2 minutes once per day. You did not have to take the Birth Sign Stone correlated to your Birth Sign. But this was also an obscure mechanic since most Oblivion reviews don't even mention these stones existing. Skyrim combines the passive nature of the signs with the exploration element of the stones. 
These mechanics are rewards for exploration. You see the icon on your compass, and immediately recognize that there might be a cool new stone to find. At least until you actually find enough of them to realize they aren't that cool. This is akin to the bobbleheads and magazines of the Fallout series, trying to provide mechanical rewards for exploration in addition to regular loot. The failing is that there are 13 of them, and like the birth signs in Morrowind and Oblivion, a great inequality in their value. It's also a misunderstanding of their original mechanical purpose. Advantages and disadvantages were a way to mechanically define your character. Morrowind used birth signs because it was easier than recreating the full system, but Morrowind did not take full advantage of the opportunity provided. The Atronach sign is the best example of that. It provides a benefit but also a detriment that massively changes the way you have to play the game. Oblivion should have added more signs like the Atronach, but instead Skyrim went the opposite direction. There is nothing more cynical than your introduction to the signs being the three archetypes of gameplay. Warrior, Mage, Thief. This is the paradigm that Todd Howard forced the game to be about. Even the afterlife has these symbols in the skybox. Did you like being a monk, or paladin, or priest, or battle mage, or spellblade? Well, too bad. Some hybrid classes are still possible, but some aren't because their core mechanics have been gutted. The triad of core classes has been an element of Elder Scrolls for a long time, but with Skyrim, many things make it feel like a box you need to fit yourself into. You don't choose to wear robes for the benefits, you have to wear robes if you want magic to be functional. These three standing stones each make the skills under their division level 20% quicker. That is a mechanical incentive to specialize. Say you are playing a character that uses destruction magic but wears heavy armor. Should you take the warrior or the mage? In theory, it provides a mechanical choice between whether you prioritize offense or defense, but in reality it just encourages a change in playstyle. If you pick the warrior, you might as well switch to one-handed, it'll level faster. If you pick the mage, you might as well switch to alteration, it'll level faster and robes will increase your offensive potential. The actual choice you're making comes later, which is whether you want skills to level 20% faster or if you want another standing stone that might provide you a utility benefit. Funny thing, the Thief Stone covers the most skills, despite the fact that Skyrim has three playstyles, each owning six skills. Bethesda decided that the Thief would cover the archery skill, meaning that the stone has seven skills that it benefits, while the Warrior only has five. Skyrim's developers talk a lot about the vision of the game being that the player can, at any time, pick up any skill they want to start using, and it'll just work. That laissez-faire attitude is a nice sentiment, but in reality does not work that well. Mechanically, Skyrim pushes the player to specialize. Anyone who has ever tried to pick up another combat playstyle mid-character can attest to that being the case. High-level Draugr exists to mechanically reinforce that you should not have tried switching to magic at level 20. We continue down the road to Riverwood. Gerder's family first settled here as woodcutters a few generations ago. She Gerder's family first settled here as woodcutters a few generations ago. You may not have realized, but during the gameplay demo for Skyrim, different dialogue was used for the NPCs. Arguably, in some cases, the dialogue is actually better in the demo than the game. Get me down! It's coming loose. I can feel it! Now cut me down before anything else shows up. The only explanation I can come up with is that Bethesda did not want the NPCs in Riverwood to have unique voices from the rest of the game, even if that dialogue was better. It is more realistic to say that once players reach Riverwood, they are free to truly go off on their own. You can rest and recover from Helgen while visiting the town vendor, but all roads that lead to Riverwood continue on to the main quest. Even if you try to take on side quests like helping out a local love triangle, that leads to the Riverwood Trader, which leads to Bleak Falls Barrow, which leads to the main quest. If you go to the inn, you can talk to the innkeeper to discuss rumors. One will point you at the Civil War quest line, one will point you to the Riverwood Trader, one will point you at the College of Winterhold, and one will point you towards the Dark Brotherhood. Of course, now that we've recovered, we can do whatever we want to, but it is important to point out how Bethesda is trying to make sure players go off to do the strongest content first, instead of allowing the player the freedom to go get lost in the world. In Oblivion, you could run off as soon as you escape the sewer in pretty much any direction. The game begins in the center of the map. In Morrowind, the main quest outright told you to go do side quests and to get experience. Yet Skyrim is apparently the one that affords the player the most freedom. Right. 
Even if you want to leave town, your choices are to either double back up the road you already came down or leave to the northeast. Which leads to Whiterun and, you guessed it, the main quest. Of course, thanks to the Creation Club, there are a number of other content options that get forced into the player's quest log. In every part of this video, I will be mentioning pieces of Creation Club content, usually relevant to the overall section, so I feel it's necessary to really introduce this, since I have a suspicion that many people listening don't really know what the Creation Club is. In 2017, Bethesda launched the Creation Club for Skyrim, which was an in-game store that sold add-ons developed by contracted mod authors. During the production of the Oblivion video, I decided I was going to feature this content in my future Skyrim video, and even include references to a few pieces relevant to Oblivion. My goal was to have a unique Skyrim video by including this official content that few people up to that point had even mentioned beyond its existence. I bought some Creation Club credits, the currency you need to purchase to actually buy the content, a common tactic used to obfuscate the true price of the DLC. I spent $80 on this bit, only for Bethesda 2, a few months later, announced the Anniversary Edition. It would cost $20 on PC, unlocking all 74 pieces of Creation Club content. So, in total, I spent $100, because the price of the upgrade did not account for all of the creations that I already owned. In essence, Bethesda betrayed anybody actually dumb enough to buy Creation Club content, which I doubt was very many people anyways, but still. See, the UESP is made up of super fans of Elder Scrolls, yet many creation pages were fairly empty, so even they weren't spending the money to pick up this content, even to make pages for it. While I was playing through the Anniversary Edition, I tried to play as much of this content as possible, which became increasingly... difficult. Most of it is bad, so much so in fact that I consider paying for the Anniversary Edition to actually be purchasing a downgrade for the game, and after a point I stopped playing it. The core problem of the Creation Club is laziness. Much of the content is just ports of old items, heavy reuse of existing assets, or even for stuff that is more original, insulting nostalgia bait. Many items are extremely overpowered, I assume based on the justification that if it's going to cost real money to buy the Staff of Shia Gwarath, then the item better be powerful, no matter how easily you can get the item in Skyrim. However, the real issue is that the content is poorly integrated into the world. It has the grace of your Oblivion, Fallout 3, and New Vegas era of DLC, where content is thrust onto the player at the start of the game. That was a product of short-sighted thinking, where the developers figured players buying DLC would already be an appropriate way into the game, not realizing that the majority of people to ever play that content will be doing so on new characters in the future. Bethesda actually realized this with the Skyrim DLC, Yet the Creation Club brings a return to that bad design. I cannot stress this enough, do not purchase the Anniversary Edition of Skyrim. This is just Bethesda trying to recoup their losses on the Creation Club, which itself was a second attempt at doing paid mods. Now let's discuss Bethesda's next cash grab. Ah! <laughs> Virtual reality! In late 2017, Bethesda began releasing some of their games in VR. Rather than selling these as additional DLC for the existing titles or as an alternate display method, they are instead standalone versions sold for full price. Skyrim VR is a great way to see the game from a fresh perspective. It is challenging to talk about VR games with an audience accustomed to flat games. What you're seeing is not a truly accurate representation of the experience. I have reviewed a VR game in the past, and the tricky thing is trying to communicate the sense of scale. It is impressive having to look up to see things that are above you. I realize that I often look at Skyrim more like I'm looking at miniatures on a table from a distance. Unfortunately, as amazing as this is, it is also modded. When I said earlier it was necessary, I absolutely meant it. Skyrim VR is awful. It's one of the worst games I've played in my headset. I was playing on the Valve Index, which was released less than two years after Skyrim VR. Despite that, Bethesda made no attempt to make their games actually compatible with the headset. We are talking about a company valued in the billions of dollars, which won't even provide support and update to their games two years after release. Even if you get the game running, the game's design is extremely basic for a VR title. They did as much as was necessary to get it to work in VR, and moved on to doing the same exact thing with Fallout 4. 
It is blatantly a cash grab, and the greatest signifier that it is expected of Bethesda customers to modify their games to better resemble their liking. But in my opinion, I have no idea what people are talking about when they say that this game is amazing when modded. Pretty much the entire time I was playing Skyrim VR, I was wishing that I was sitting in my comfortable chair, using a monitor, keyboard, and mouse to play. Virtual reality has provided me with some of the most amazing experiences I have ever had playing video games. I am extremely gifted with being able to play with full motion and smooth turning with zero motion sickness problems, yet Skyrim VR would give me a headache. I realize that if dynamic resolution is turned on, the game is constantly changing the, well, resolution. It's like the game is a child, turning the knob fully in one direction, and then when it finds the end, going in the other direction. When I would look at character faces, they would constantly go in and out of focus. Dynamic resolution is a trick used to maintain a steady frame rate by lowering the image resolution whenever something big is happening. Skyrim apparently is just in a constant state of something big happening, so it's constantly changing the resolution when you have this option on. Another thing is that the LOD distance is turned way down again to buy frames. This made the world look terrible, and the fade distances were also turned down drastically. Have you seen the funny gestures that people do while playing? That's actually a mod. Interacting with NBCs by grabbing them? That's a mod. Does this werewolf mode look cool? That's a mod too. There's a reason you've never seen a Skyrim analysis done in VR, despite the amount of time there has been for one to be made, and how marketable it would be. A big part of that is the mechanics. I'll quickly go through the trio of playstyles. Melee is the least fun, even modded. Better systems of melee combat have come out, but even now there is no flawless system. The core of the problem is that in real life, if you hit someone with a sword, there will be a collision. That doesn't happen in VR. Damage is also applied flatly, which makes sense when playing with a controller or mouse, but in VR, damage should be determined by swing intensity. If it's not, there's nothing to stop players from just casually swinging from the wrist. You know how it takes a lot of swings to kill stuff in Skyrim? Now imagine having to actually physically swing your arm every time you want to do that. Simply put, this problem is such a challenge to overcome that I honestly question why they tried. Fallout 4 VR works better as a basis because gunplay in VR is much more functional. On to ranged combat. Archery games in VR are not a favorite of mine, so I wasn't too big on using bows. Magic was probably the best playstyle in VR. Sadly, for reasons I'll be talking about in part 4, magic in Skyrim is not good. While VR is a novelty, the amount of combat that Skyrim requires and the weakness of Skyrim combat in VR made the experience rather tedious. I would absolutely like to see attempts at classic Elder Scrolls-style role-playing games done in virtual reality, but serious lessons need to be learned from dedicated VR games. And actually, I would rather that ever be put into making more flat games in that genre, since it's been pretty slim pickings out here for a long time. I wanted to get a ways in before discussing this particular topic, but it's important to mention. At a few spots in the video, I'm going to be discussing points made in other Skyrim videos. I tried this idea out with Oblivion, and it was great. It's not really responsible for ballooning the length of the overall product, though. If you cut all of it out, this video would still be longer. Back in November, I took the time to watch almost every Skyrim video ever made. However, I streamed this process in addition to a number of articles and interviews I was researching. I think what surprised people was how often I was defending Skyrim, but in reality I was simply putting stress on people's arguments in order to test them out. The stream series immensely improves the videos I do them for, and not just in the easily observable way of giving me arguments to counter. For example, it's a good reference for what the level and amount of gold a full playthrough of Skyrim typically gives. It's a perspective of what people will commonly do in their playthroughs. Rather than guessing what these values would be, now I have more data points. There are a thousand other invisible ways that doing this has made the videos better, mostly because I was able to wholesale plagiarize entire sections from other creators. I have not actually written anything original in this video. It has all been copied. Alright, and now to check the comments section. Jokes aside, I mention this because I don't want people to get caught off guard when I talk about other videos and creators, but yes, I consider each step in my Elder Scrolls series to be a massive step up, and in part that is because I have studied the failures of other videos and trying to craft my own. I can say at least with certainty that I am providing a very different experience with this project. I certainly agree that most Skyrim videos don't really offer anything that guys like DW Terminator and Mr. Caption didn't already say back in 2013 and 2014. 
This is also the point that I should mention Private Session's own gargantuan Skyrim project. For those who don't know, we know each other. He appeared in a number of my streams, often as a chatter, but sometimes as a co-host. We've done a couple episodes of a podcast together, and he's in both this and the Oblivion video. What we're offering is two very different experiences, which is interesting given how much in common we do know. He got to see a lot of the same research I saw, yet our videos turned out very differently. That's why I firmly believe there is no such thing as topic oversaturation, because despite being similar in many ways, we were still different enough to provide unique experiences. His video is very good, and I say that outside of nepotism. I would also rate Kretosis and G-Man Lives videos highly. In the middle pack, I would say that Mr. Caption and, oddly enough, Acer Thorn are both videos I could recommend if you can stand Acer's bad audio production value. YouTube has undoubtedly played an important role in the rise of popularity of Bethesda, but I would also say the biggest criticisms against Bethesda have also become mainstream by that same method. However, I've been in this boat a long time. I've wanted to do a Skyrim video since 2015, longer than I've wanted to do a Morrowind video. I've even tried to do it before. I don't mean ill towards other creators, but it is curious that when held to the same exact standard that I typically hold game developers in my videos, that viewers suddenly got offended. Almost as though there is a double standard, that we're allowed to make criticisms against games but not against videos. In fact, it's worse because, as a video and audio editor, I could actually make even more informed criticism against a video than I could a game. I am not one of those people who think you need to have a college education and five years experience in the industry just to share a minor opinion about a game on Twitter. Everybody brings something new to the genre, and I'm a fan of this style of content, but we are a few years past bloated in this space. Undoubtedly, my Skyrim video will be dismissed for bringing nothing new to the table simply by the topic, title, and thumbnail without a single second of runtime being played to evaluate if that is an accurate opinion. This speaks to a problem that there just aren't enough video analysts taking pride in their work. There have to be several boring Skyrim analysis videos for people to be of the automatic opinion that another one must be continuing that pattern. Combat seems like a good place to really start trying to crack this egg of a game open. This is the debut of my Legendary Edition character, Shoring Hardheart, a Nord whose name nods to the leader of the Morrowind Fighters Guild. This playthrough was the one where I played the original version of Skyrim, so if things look a little desaturated, that's because Shoring has Seasonal Affective Disorder. If the player follows the natural flow and insistence of Skyrim, you will eventually head out towards Whiterun, where you will encounter this event. Or, more likely, you will be approached by a woman named Ayella asking why you didn't help her and her friends fight a giant that is already dead. Well, that's taken care of. No thanks to you. I usually have to sprint here if I want to land a hit on the giant, as leisurely taking the path and really absorbing the sights of Whiterun means the fight will be over before I arrive. Whether or not you contribute, Ayella will still suggest the player becomes a companion which is obviously weird to get the offer just after Ayala scolds you for not helping, as though the implication is that Ayala invites everyone she meets to join the faction. More than likely, of course, is that Bethesda does not want to ostracize the player from a potential faction because of something that is out of their control, which is the fact that the giant fight has a good chance of loading early and ending before our arrival. This is funny because chances are good the players on their way to Whiterun from Riverwood as part of the main quest, and already Bethesda's stacking on side quests to distract you. If you take the companions up on their offer, you'll enter their Hall of Yorvasker and find a couple people having a fist fight, in case you didn't pick up that this was going to be the fighting faction. You'll be sent downstairs to talk to Codlack, the leader of the companions, where you'll overhear a conversation establishing that Codlack is not the leader of the companions and then are told in conversation again that Codlack is not the faction leader of the Companions before being given a trial and then a tour that ends in being told to find work from a leader of the Companions. Let's back this up. Vilkas and Codlack are having a conversation when we arrive, and Vilkas refers to Codlack as Master. This is pretty unusual because Vilkas is a long-term member of the Companions and knows Codlack very well. He knows full well 
that Kodlek is not the leader of the Companions, as the Companions have no leader. Despite that, he still feels the need to call Kodlek his master, and then Kodlek feels the need to reaffirm that he is not the leader. It's a pointless exposition that serves to fill the player in on an irrelevant lore detail that the Companions totally don't have a faction leader, guys. Just a harbinger role that's responsible for doing all the paperwork, making all the executive policy decisions, and having the biggest bedroom at Yorvisker. And the game does this at the cost of one of its primary characters for the storyline, Vilkis. Which is pointless because 1. Our conversation with Kodlek reaffirms that fact, and 2. The game does little with this information. I guess it's just a way for Bethesda to sidestep the old criticism of faction leadership positions being meaningless by saying that the player technically isn't the leader of the Companion since they don't have one, but that's dumb because the Harbinger rank is totally a leadership position considering that all the rules of the Companions were established by past Harbingers, decisions like whether or not the Companions participate in civil wars, and one very big, very recent decision that is central to this storyline. Kodlek thinks we are worthy of joining the faction, but Vilkus disagrees. We're later told why Kodlak thinks we're worthy, but not what metric Vilkus uses, or why the other Circle members are not consulted about our initiation. Yeah, the leaderless Companions faction not only has a leadership rank, but a circle of management level positions where the Harbinger can veto at will. Basically, the Companions form into this hierarchy, with an equal number of Circle members to regular Companions and an equal number of Harbingers to Initiates, with us being the only one. We start out by sparring with Vilkus to gauge our physical prowess by bashing on his shield. It's established that the player cannot use magic here, but I have had this quest more than once turn into an absolute bloodbath due to buggy scripting. Vilkus does not always take getting hit how he's supposed to. What counts as magic can include enchantments on your weapons, and your hireling and fellow companions will often interpret this as an outright fight and start engaging in a bloodbath. It's peaceful training! Peaceful training, Smoking Joe! I've been outright murdered by Vilkus doing this. Hell, my first time doing this, I accidentally landed a blow on Farkas back at the giant fight, and he murdered me there before inviting my corpse to join their faction. You look strong. Come to Orbasker and be a companion. How is the sparring sequence from the Battlehorn Castle DLC for Oblivion more functional than this? Anyways, we're allowed to become an initiate, and Vilkus has us take his sword up to Yorland Greymane, the blacksmith who is not a companion but does make all their weapons and uses their special Skyforge. This is mostly to establish that, in principle, nobody in the companions is supposed to be anybody's boss, and that Vilkus is just taking advantage of our newness to make us run errands for him. You'll hear some of the brighter faces around here talk about honor and glory. I've got nothing against it, but for me, the promise of coin is what feeds my blade. Where Yorlin then asks a favor of us to deliver a shield for him. While it's an identical FedEx objective, it does make good use of context to delineate that one delivery was an order and the other is a favor. Even if the player doesn't really have an option to decline doing said favor, we take the shield to Aela, who is having a conversation with her boyfriend Skior, although I'm not sure if you're meant to actually overhear anything or if it just didn't load, Bethesda's bug and all. They'll ask you if you could take Vilkus in a real fight. This is the part where you fall down and bleed to death. Huh? It's just trick. No, not yet. Then they ask Farkas to show us to the common room where we can meet most of the other lower level members before being sent back to ask the companion leaders for work. At this point we have to talk about Radiant Quests. Your first time doing the companions, you might be deceived into thinking the next quest you get, usually from Farkas since he's right here, is a pre-scripted deal, and only on repeat playthroughs will you notice that the quest has changed each time. This is a Radiant Quest, and Joseph Anderson hit the nail on the head with them. My guess is that some people at Bethesda are really proud of how these Radiant Quests can sometimes appear like regular ones, that many players might not even notice that they're doing artificially generated content, when in reality I think this is viewing it backwards. It's that the actual scripted quests are so dull and samey that it's that they appear like Radiant ones, not the other way around. I cannot understate how accurate this sentiment is. There is a non-zero number of times that I have seen handcrafted quests described as being radiant, because only on repeat playthroughs can you really notice the difference. And even then, it's sometimes difficult. A good example is the quest Moss Mother Cavern, 
where the player will be sent out to look for a lost hunter named Valdir. I've seen this quest described as radiant, when in reality it's just so generic that it's super easy to make the mistake of assuming that it is. Also, we'll talk about Daggerfall later in the video if you know why you know. Bruce Nesmith, Skyrim's lead designer, gave a talk two months after the launch of the game and long before any of the DLC or re-releases ever occurred. During this talk, it was established that the Radiant story system was intended to be a way of dynamically generating content tailored to the player character based on your relationships and interactions with the world. Todd Howard had tasked the design team with coming up with the system during pre-production. This, for instance, is how the game causes the different NPC reactions to the player dropping items. Whether NPCs will fight over it, return it to the player, or you're confronted by a guard. I assume this was inspired by how responsibility and oblivion would cause different NPCs to approach acquiring food in different ways, with irresponsible NPCs often getting killed for stealing. The idea was that quests could be generated for the player based on your exploits. Help a family and later their daughter gets kidnapped and you're tasked with rescuing her. So you walk into town and, and the game just says, oh, there's a guy in town who likes you. Um, we're going to kidnap his kid who you might have met and put him in this dungeon for some reason you didn't go to. And that dungeon happens to be um, a higher level dungeon. And so we think you could use a challenge right now. And, it's just, and the, the reward is going to be this other thing that your character can use. If that sounds like a cool system that isn't in the game, that's because it is. The closest I can say that this occurred was as follows. I did Danica Pure Springs quest to restore the Gilder Green Tree, then later when I got a Radiant quest from the Companions, it was to rescue a kidnapped Danica from the Forsworn. This appears, however, to have been a complete coincidence. Only non-essential NPCs can be kidnapped, and Danica was simply added to the list of potential kidnapping victims after doing her quest, which removed her essential status. The location is also completely random and had little to do with my playthrough or my character. However, to further obfuscate casual analysis of Radiant Quests, there are a handful of them in the Companion's questline which only have 10 potential locations, two of which happened during both of my playthroughs on the faction. In each playthrough, I was tasked with visiting Orithyme and Brokenhelm Hollow twice, back to back, both times. They were in different orders, but their genericness made it difficult to remember which character did which locations in what order. It essentially became a mush of unmemorable quests that had the illusion of being scripted because, again, coincidentally, it happened twice on two different characters on two separate versions of the game. Each faction has a different implementation of Radiant quests. The Companions uses them as spacers between its primary quests, which, as you can see, is a very short quest line without this filler content. The Thieves' Guild has optional Radiant quests that are only mandatory if you want to rebuild the guild. The College of Winterhold has Radiant quests, usually just retrieving literature from dungeons. The Dark Brotherhood ends in a permanent quest fittingly titled The Dark Brotherhood Forever, offering infinite assassinations of generic, unnamed NPCs, but otherwise does not utilize the Radiant system in its primary storyline. Much of the game uses Radiant story in some way. Bounties are Radiant, for instance. If a quest points you to a cave without any specific directions, then they're also likely Radiantly chosen. The Helm of Winterhold quest can occur in a dungeon called Yingvild, which has the notable quality of having not been opened since the days of Yskermor thousands of years prior, and the Radiant quest can actually even break the scripting of the dungeon, causing the Helm of Yngol to not spawn properly, meaning that the player cannot take the shortcut out of the dungeon. Another great example is the Hired Thug event. Anytime you steal something or murder someone with relatives, there is a chance of an NPC hiring thugs to teach you a lesson. This can be a particularly harrowing encounter in the early game, but it has some amusing implications. Regardless of how clandestine you are, hired thugs can be sent. On the flip side, no matter how frequently I would blatantly steal from NPCs, they would not hire thugs to go after me. Another thing is that sometimes thugs will be hired by somebody who is dead. One of the vampires you kill during the Dawnguard raid on Castle Vogelhar hired thugs to teach me a lesson because technically they were still alive when I killed their friend, even if they died moments later from a crossbow bolt to the heart. The best part, however, is that there is a random event where the Dark Brotherhood will send an assassin to kill you. This is not a radiant event, rather it is a random event that are we call radiant really for random random events were introduced in fallout 3 you enter an area and the game rolls a dice to determine what happens do it once and maybe you encounter a dog fighting a pack of wolves do it again and maybe you encounter a skirmish or a rogue atronach or some guy who runs up to you and gives you an item and tells you not to snitch on him 
To put this in D&D terms, this is comparable to random event tables some dungeon masters use. Where the hired thugs are a response to an action in the world, these are truly random. For the longest time, I thought the Dark Brotherhood assassination attempts were actually radiantly generated, as in they were a response to something I had done, and I found it frustrating that you aren't really given any clues as to who hired the assassin to kill you like you are with the thugs. But in reality, nobody hired the Dark Brotherhood. It is a random event. This is a big part of the reason why Skyrim is a deceptively difficult game to review, because casual analysis can make it difficult to determine what is scripted, what is radiant, and what is random. To bring it back to the companions, Shorin was given a contract to go teach Alham a lesson. Yes, this is identical to the hired thug event, and I have to wonder why Skyrim didn't incorporate that element into the faction. Maybe instead of generic hired thugs, companions are sent to teach the player a lesson, which could also serve as a way to invite the player to the faction after you defeat them and they surrender. And then when you join the companions, you could replace the companion thugs with the generic hired thugs. The funny part is that this quest has a pool of like 400 NPCs, encompassing most of Skyrim's civilian population, but you have to have visited their hold prior to getting the quest. There's also a bunch of bugs tied to this. If the person permanently resides in a place you have to trespass to reach, you will not be given the correct dialogue and the quest line will softlock. Sometimes, if the target dies, even when the player is not involved, the quest will softlock. Some targets will be NPCs who leave Skyrim as part of their quest. The quest is clearly lacking some sanity checking. The player should probably be given the option to forfeit jobs so as to not end up with a quest that cannot be completed. There are also a lot of NPCs who probably should not be on the list of potential targets. The thing is, all of the Companion's Radiant quests have bugs that can potentially softlock the game, depending on a variety of factors. Items you're sent to rescue end up being put in inaccessible inventories. Locations you're sent to clear might point you to corpses if you already did the dungeon. NPCs you're sent to help may refuse to talk to you if you kill an animal in their house and then talk to them while trespassing. The Thieves' Guild also has a couple uncompletable quests, for instance, stealing an item from a house that gets destroyed by another quest, but it also provides the option to forfeit those contracts. This is a nasty mix of being forced to do these quests, but having the chance of those quests bugging and softlocking the entire faction for you. Which is actually fine, as the Companions is not only the worst faction in Skyrim, but probably the worst faction in all of the Elder Scrolls games. But think about Radiant quests this way. Morrowind and Oblivion may have both started their fighters factions with a rat quest, but Skyrim finishes its fighters faction with infinite rat quests. After doing your radiant quest, you will be locked out of doing any more, and instead sent on a quest to reclaim a fragment of Wuthrad with Farkas. He will replace whatever hireling we have with us without performing any of their functions, which is... annoying. I get that they are literally called companions, but the main reason I have hirelings is to pick up skill books and, well, Farkas won't pick up this copy of the Battle of Sankar Tor for me. This is our trial, because we technically aren't a full companion yet despite being sent out to do business in the world representing them. This starts as a Draugr Crypt, which we are sent to as a scholar recently informed the companions of the Fragment's location here. But it's pretty apparent there has been some recent excavation work, and it ends up being an ambush. We're trapped in a small room, and before Farkas can get us out, he's surrounded by enemies, with his back up against the wall. Killing you will make for an excellent story. He then transforms into a werewolf, wiping the enemies out before leaving the room and opening the gate. First off, it's a bit weird that the enemies respect the anime rule of allowing Farkas to complete his transformation before attacking. Realistically, Farkas's transformations should look a bit more like this. Hate to spoil things, but these guys are the Silver Hand, who are an order of professional werewolf hunters. They seeded the rumor of the fragment of Wuthrad being here in order to lure companions here to ambush us. So they know full well that Farkas is a werewolf, and that if he successfully transforms, he will become harder to kill. Not only that, but there are dozens of these guys here, yet for some reason they didn't all come pouring out the second the gate opened, lining the back wall with archers just to mow Farkas down, Boromir style. Second, while it's a nice detail that the Silver Hand uses expensive silver weapons, you know what might be a more prudent financial decision? Armor. 
Most of these guys, even at high levels, are wearing armor fashioned from fur scraps. They're as well equipped as bandits, despite being an order of people who hunt werewolves. Werewolf claws are good at rending flesh, not so good against armor. It seems like silver swords should have been issued to the officers, and then the money saved from buying everyone's silver weaponry could be spent giving more people... armor. Because it's not even like silver weapons are necessary to kill werewolves in Elder Scrolls. They'll die to steel, they just die to silver a little bit faster. It's just a funny detail. I couldn't stop thinking about how absurd it was that every single member of the Silver Hand has a signature silver weapon, but a minority actually possess any kind of armor that would protect them from slashing damage. Third, I find the players' reactions to be equally funny. It goes beyond base naivete into the realm of stupidity. Even if you have done Hircine's quest that primarily involves a werewolf, the player character will not recognize the form, nor show an appropriate level of concern. A man, practically a stranger to us, just turned into a giant monster and murdered four people. Farkas isn't even winded by the encounter, these guys did not stand a chance and we just respond with, what was that? And then meekly follow it up with, you're gonna turn me into a werewolf? Fourth, why is there actually a fragment of Wuthrad here? I know Wuthrad is important to the companions, but it's not like they would actually know if it was here or not. We were baited here by a scholar, but they could have just as easily pointed us at an already cleared out Draugr crypt, one much easier to stage ambushes in. If the Silver Hand knew the fragment was here, why didn't they claim it first? I would imagine that to be a pretty big bargaining chip to possess. And if the companions already knew it was here, why didn't they try to excavate the site to claim it sooner? Wait, you aren't going to answer any of these questions, are you? The rest of the dungeon is a mix of Draugr enemies and Silver Hand, and ends with a fun little gauntlet where you fight wave after wave of Draugr. Honestly, a lot of these Draugr dungeons would be more fun if they ended with fighting a bunch of Draugr, instead of fighting a single beefcake Draugr. Also, there's an alluring word wall that teaches you a word of the fire breath shout in case you forgot about the main quest. Our reward is a Skyforged steel weapon, which is actually really strong. Like, this weapon carried me for a long time in the playthrough. What's that? They actually made the steel weapons that are implied to be of the highest quality possible in Skyrim do damage that is only beaten by weapons fashioned from rare materials? Seriously, it surprised me how meaningful this reward can be to melee characters, since your next possible replacement will likely not show up until after level 27. That said, there is no Skyforge Steel Mace, so they didn't get everything right. Congratulations! We're now companions. There's a little ceremony where we're welcome to the Order and we have a conversation with Codlag. We mentioned the werewolf thing and he mentions to us that it's true, the upper level of the companions are werewolves. But he's old and wants to go to Sovngarde, something that isn't possible as long as he is a werewolf. After one Radiant quest, we're invited to the Underforge by Skewer and offered to become a werewolf in order to join the Circle. I'd hate to rip the band-aid off like that, but this is how we have to talk about the worst moment in an Elder Scrolls story. How did they suddenly stumble into furry porn? The player is given an ultimatum. To join the circle, we have to participate in a blood ritual and become a werewolf. You are told that you are allowed to say no, but that path ends the companions. Not as a questline, as a faction. You can no longer accept radiant contracts for the faction meaning that you can't earn money from doing these quests and you can't proceed with the storyline until you return to the Underforge and complete this ritual. Ayala and Skior will remain in the Underforge forever, until this happens, or until you stop playing Skyrim. Which is what happened in my first playthrough back in 2011 because I rejected the gift, in quotes, I was being offered. This is hazing, and not only that, but it's insane to me that the player is given no recourse in this situation. You can't go to Farkas or Vilkas or even Kodlak, who just two paragraphs ago established that he regretted becoming a werewolf because of the implications it had for his eternal soul. You can't go to anyone, not the Jarl, not Ulfric Stormcloak, not General Tolius, not the Pinnitus Oculatus, not the Thalmor, not the Blades, not the Greybeards, not even the Silver Hand. Bethesda did not anticipate that there was even a chance that people would say no to this. This is what ended my Skyrim playthrough prematurely. Unlike the earlier games which had full playthroughs my first time, my Skyrim playthrough was over before November of 2011 had even concluded. For a game, I had attended a midnight release to get my hands on and stayed up until 3 in the morning on a school night playing. 
Every Tez game I have played has always started with a Red Guard Swordsman doing the Warriors faction, and the fact that I was ostensibly locked out of this faction for an in-character decision completely soured the taste. Worse still is the fact that Skyrim features a faction that, if the player morally detests the idea, they can actually destroy, the Dark Brotherhood. It's simply amazing to me that Bethesda was so confident that the player would be so naive or paying so little attention that they would not have an issue with this decision. Even designing Shoring as a character around this decision still made this a bitter pill to swallow. Only someone who was desperately jockeying for power in any way possible, like Shoring Hardheart from Morrowind, could be stupid enough to be told that they will be excluded from an eternity in Sovereign Guard of feasting and rough gay sex, and then within 15 minutes be forced into making that decision. The absolute worst part. No one calls this out. As far as I've seen, and I've seen most popular Skyrim videos, not many people seem to have an issue with this, which means that not only did Bethesda anticipate that everybody playing their game would either be a moron or not paying attention, but that they were absolutely right. So, like the cuck we are, we return to the Underforge after being unable to tell anyone in Skyrim that the companions are werewolves. I wonder what Aeola and Skewer were doing while we were gone so long. We participate in the ritual and are subject to a forced transformation. You can go on a rampage, or you can just hang out at the Skyforge for a really long time before you end up waking up in the woods. Skewer went ahead of us, so we and Aeola chased after him into a fort occupied by the Silver Hand. Since this is the obvious time we're meant to use our new werewolf powers, let's talk about werewolves. I'd hate to do this so soon, but we have to compare the werewolves of Skyrim to their closest Elder Scrolls counterpart, Morrowind's expansion Blood Moon. People hate Morrowind comparisons because it's narratively and mechanically the objectively superior game. But here it's really fair because it's pretty evident that most of their design was gleaned from a DLC feature of that game. Werewolves are not very good in Skyrim. I suppose we have to ask the question of whether or not they should be good. Lycanthropy, and vampirism to some extent, are meant to be two things. One, an unwitting curse that makes a person dangerous to keep in society, but if sought out willingly, then two, a shortcut to power. Your powers are augmented at the cost of your humanity. Neither Blood Moon nor Skyrim really sold this idea, in my opinion. Instead, both games keep lycanthropy as an almost entirely separate progression to the normal game. This means that lycanthropy plays more like a mini-game in Elder Scrolls than an actual curse. I mean, in Skyrim, there's not really a downside, other than not getting the rested bonus. In Blood Moon, you were plagued with nightly transformations, where you had to feast that night or you would wake up at low health the next morning. This made it unwieldy to use a normal Morrowind, but a godsend for dungeon divers. Skyrim took that element of random transformations away outside of potentially during a single quest. So now, there's no downside to having lycanthropy thrust upon you besides annoying guard voice lines and being temporarily gated out of vampirism. Now I remember. You're that new member of the Companions. So, you what? Fetch the mead? Huh? Don't cross me, elf. Guard lines which acknowledge player actions have been a thing since Oblivion. It's obvious that they tried to scale up the system, and it's probably one of the best and easiest ways of making the world feel dynamic. Completing quests and even the equipment and skills you use add to this pool. It is cool that guards will acknowledge that iron swords are weak, for example. Unfortunately, while there are a great many ways to give the guards new dialogue, there are not many ways to take away old dialogue. This becomes more and more apparent as you complete quest lines, yet guards continue to refer to you as though you just started it. While guards will respect the role of the Harbinger, they will sometimes use the line for new members, asking if we just fetch the mead. There are other prolific lines guards favor, such as the infamous Arrow in the Knee line, or the Dawn Guard rumor. Heard uh, they're reforming the Dawn? Vampire hunters or something in the old what? near Riften. Might consider it up myself. This one in particular plays a lot because of how this system works. These generic greetings are all assigned a priority value, with most of them being assigned the number 31. Because so many options share this number, there's an equal chance of getting all of them. This particular Dawnguard rumor has a value of 62, meaning that the guards will consistently prefer to use it over other existing dialogue until you complete the first quest of the expansion. This is practically identical to the Solstheim rumor in Morrowind overriding general region-specific rumors, 
It is a very short-sighted way of advertising the expansion content to the player that probably should have been toned down in the game's final update. After the first time, you're never again forced to use it, which I'm personally thankful for, but I don't consider it a good thing. If you're going to work this hard for a werewolf story, then maybe you should just do it. Blood Moon's werewolf story was designed around the mechanics and actually worked really well, all things considered. At least until the endgame gauntlet that was meant to challenge in-game player builds, which pure werewolves were not powerful enough for. However, if I as a player am thankful that this isn't the case in Skyrim, then what is the actual werewolf system like mechanically? It's not ideal. You're locked to third person, unlike Morrowind, but you're also twice as big as before, meaning that it can be difficult to see what you're doing. Your health no longer regenerates naturally, nor do you have access to potions. Your implementation of healing is consuming hearts from corpses. This can be later upgraded, but we're not talking about upgrades just yet since they were DLC content. This caveat of only being able to heal from the dead is a big concession, as it means you can't really push the difficulty in Skyrim while playing as a werewolf. A character who's comfortable playing at Master or even Legendary difficulty will find themselves having to turn the difficulty down just to make werewolf not viable but possible. This is obviously the opposite of the intention shown in the Farkas scene where lycanthropy was used to gain an edge in combat. It also means the player is heavily limited on the types of dungeons you can run. Any dungeon that doesn't involve beating hearts will mean no healing. Speaking of dungeons, Skyrim inherits another annoying quirk from Morrowind, the inability to loot as a werewolf. Since the core of the dungeons in these games is looting stuff along the way, and the designers assumed that you could do that, running dungeons in Skyrim as a werewolf means running dungeons twice. Or not at all, depending on if dungeon progression is tied to items. The first time for all the combat, and the second time to pick everything up. Which is weird, because apparently werewolves have increased carrying capacity. Is the intention that I stuff my inventory full, then turn into a werewolf and run home? But most of the base game homes are inside the cities. Your main mode of combat as a werewolf is to just slash attack, and you can ragdoll people with power attacks. Also, you can howl to scare people. So if you're provided some small measure of crowd control in exchange for losing a lot of the game's mechanical complexity, what little there is anyways, I guess you could do Ayala's quest to unlock extra functions for the howl, like detect life, summon pack members, and have a higher level fear effect, but that's all marginally useful and falls off in the mid-game. Werewolves were severely undercooked, and it took the vampire-themed expansion Dawnguar to add in some necessary changes to the system. This is, outside of a single voice line, the only acknowledgement of lycanthropy in that expansion. Yes, I can smell it on you. The power of my blood will purge that filth and make you whole again. The first was to add a scaled level of armor rating to the player. I cannot imagine a level 40 werewolf player being asked to fight stuff without any additional damage resistance. It's insane enough how weak you are as it is now. The other main addition is the werewolf perk tree, which was hinted at in the Bethesda game jam. So again, it wasn't really a focus of the DLC as much as a band-aid fix that was thrown in. You gain werewolf XP from eating hearts, which you then spend on perks. You can increase your damage, health, healing rates, increase the number of types of things you can eat to heal, and add extra effects to the werewolf howl like summoning better allies, making the fear effect apply to more enemies, or add more functions and range to the detect life effect. It's better, but it's still not that good. Hence why it's a band-aid solution. There's also a handful of rings used to augment the player, which is a new idea to Skyrim. In the base game, there's the Ring of Hearsing, which existed in the Blood Moon. In Blood Moon, the ring would turn you into a werewolf at will, while in Skyrim, the ring allows you to transform multiple times per day. This means that Skyrim requires you to already be a werewolf to actually get the benefit of the ring. I think the only issue is that the player cannot turn off the werewolf mode, something that could have been added similar to how you can turn off the vampire lord mode. It seems, in the base game, Beast Mode was meant to be a sort of ultimate ability to get out of jams, whereas the Ring of Hearsing makes Lycanthropy more of a consistent playstyle. Which is weird, because Hearsing's quest will not acknowledge you being a werewolf, like, at all. The other four rings were added in the Dragonborn expansion, which is fitting seeing as that expansion is a revisit of the setting of Blood Moon. These rings are fairly expensive, so they are definitely meant to be acquired later in the game, like level 20 or so, when the Dawnguard perks start to lose their luster. In order of value, the Ring of Bloodlust, which causes you to do 50% more damage, at the cost of taking 50% more damage. This definitely opens up a different kind of playstyle, which hinges on you utilizing your mobility and crowd control to kill before you get killed. A maxed out werewolf with this ring will do some serious damage, so much so that you can chain kill cams, which is 
mildly useful since it means that you can use the invulnerability of the kill cam to plan your next attack. As blocky as the kill cams in Skyrim are, werewolves are where the kill cams actually have a mechanical implication just because of the nature of the playstyle. The Ring of the Moon increases werewolf howl duration by 25%, which is nice and all, but isn't really useful. The Ring of Instinct causes a 40% time dilation effect when you transform, which again has questionable usefulness. It implies you will transform repeatedly since it doesn't augment you long term, but you can't use the ring in conjunction with the Ring of Hearsing since you can only wear one ring in Skyrim. Finally, the Ring of the Hunt is the most expensive, but increases your health regeneration and enables the ability to very, very slowly regain health passively. And that's it. That's all Dragonborn had to offer werewolves. Two mildly useful rings that might change how you play, and two less useful rings. It is not surprising that werewolves feel undercooked, an awkward mechanical addition that the player is only forced to use once. As late as July of 2011, Todd Howard seemed cagey about confirming whether or not werewolves were even going to be in the game. And uh, right off the bat, he asked if, if you're able to be a werewolf in Skyrim. I mean, I can say that we are, we're fans of that stuff as well. We are currently messing with all of that. I don't want to commit to, here are the things you can change into and, right. and what they're like right now. Not because we're not doing it or not attempting to. I just don't know, honestly, where that's, where that's going to end up and how, how deep we're going to get into that well i can tell a you. lot of times you'll hear this answer probably a lot you know we will we will try things and if we don't feel it's helping the game there are other areas we'd like to spend our time on in the game will the character be able to change into certain creatures we've done various things like that in our previous games and it's something that we probably won't be talking about specifically on this one don't read into that we just prefer not to discuss this one we'd like to leave that an open question until the game is out you know, a lot of fans when I realized that werewolves were actually going to be like the Khajiit, just a human with a head on it, mm -hmm. and it was, uh, it was, it was, it was horrible. That was always absolutely hilarious that it was going to be people with dog heads and totally normal bodies, and everyone was going to be all scared of them. Meanwhile, you have some like druggy cat guy hanging out the city, and everyone's fine with them. The original concept art shows werewolves as being bipeds. Even the lycanthropy perk tree was the product of a short game jam Bethesda held where developers had one week to implement anything they wanted. And there seemed to be more perks in that tree than are currently in the game. It's not really a surprise that lycanthropy feels like an undercooked addition in the game. The story only utilizes it a single time, as though Bethesda is apologetic for forcing it onto the player, and curing lycanthropy is baked into the very same questline at little expense. It doesn't utilize any of the new mechanics, like the hand system, where each hand has a different function, nor does it integrate the new dragon shouts. Bloodman was designed around the entire expansion being played as a werewolf, expecting multiple transformations and balancing its quests around the player's stats. Bethesda had the same opportunity with the Companions questline, but leaves it up to the player whether or not they're going to fight these unarmed renamed bandits with silver weapons using the werewolf mode or not. It's a problem because the Companions is the one ostensibly warrior faction in the game, and the pre-existing fighting mechanics are now competing with the new werewolf mechanics. Instead of augmenting your abilities, Lycanthropy just replaces them. It would be better if there was a second warrior faction in Skyrim, like the Silver Hand. Speaking of, the Silver Hand have occupied the Fort of Gallows Rock and are using it as a base of operations. They're pretty well ingrained here too, with prison cells and a torture chamber where we find the corpse of a werewolf. Although Aella confirms it was not a member of our pack. I guess let's talk about them as a faction. You know how Bethesda is weirdly proud of their environmental storytelling? Like our level designers are great. Like I remember we're playtesting one time and you're in a cave and then all of a sudden there's a there's a giant tower right in the middle of it. And it tells a whole story right there, right? What, hap what happened to this big stonework that's in the bottom of this cave now? Yeah, absolutely. I don't know. What did happen? When are you going to tell me? Well, the Silver Hand is an experiment in whether or not a faction can be done entirely through environmental storytelling. I shit you not. The bulk of lines in the companions about the Silver Hand are environmental observations made while doing their dungeons. There are zero observations made about them as an order. How did they get founded? What do they believe in? What's their ethical limit? Who is their leader? Where are they getting money to buy their equipment? How do they know the companions are werewolves? How long has this faction conflict been going on? Would they accept a truce if Kodlak told them they were trying to find a cure? The list of questions goes on, and I'm fairly confident there isn't even a single lore book that actually refers to them by name or broaches those questions. At one point, we're tasked with retrieving the Silverhand stratagem. Finally, 
Through the power of the written word, maybe this faction can finally be characterized. I mean, that's usually criticized as cheap, but all other measures have failed so far. Well, get fucked, because the Silverhand Stratagem is not considered a book, but a miscellaneous item. That's because it's empty. There's nothing inside it. It's literally a journal that exists as a plot device to explain how we end up fighting the Silverhand headquarters. There is literally a single named member of this faction, Krav the Skinner, and he is radiantly generated, meaning his race and gender are randomized. The Silverhand are literally just bandits, with extra silver weapons, ingots, cure disease potions, and literature about werewolves. If you try to soul trap their corpses, it'll even refer to them as bandits. Most people see them as a bandit gang with a passion for fighting werewolves, but that doesn't make sense. Why would bandits invest themselves that hard into fighting such a minor threat? Why would bandits invest themselves that hard into fighting werewolves who seem to have a fairly competent control of their condition and who could rally a cause to fight against you? Why did the Silver Hand hate dogs so much they literally do dog fights and even eat them? You know that the most militant factions don't form out of mild displeasure, right? The Vigil of Stindar formed out of hatred for Daedra and Daedric cults because of the Oblivion Crisis. The Dawn Guard formed out of hatred for vampires. Hell, Oblivion even made fun of this with the Order of the Virtuous Blood, a meme vampire hunter faction staffed entirely by weakened warriors who are being taken advantage of by a vampire. But since I brought them up, I have to wonder if the Vigil of Stindar was meant to be the actual Silver Hand. When asked if the Vigil fight Daedra, they'll respond, and any other abominations that prey on mortals? Vampires? Werewolves? Witches? I have a sneaking suspicion that originally the companions were to fight the Vigil of Stendar, but something mid-development happened that changed that intention, and in turn, the Vigil had to be very quickly replaced. The easiest way being to simply create a new faction of reskinned bandits. I mean, think about it. If Todd wasn't sure werewolves were going to be in the game mere months before release, and being a werewolf is an integral part of the story of the companions, is it possible we're dealing with a redrafted narrative? This is not unfounded. I find the fact that the witches are also mentioned peculiar because, surprise surprise, this story also involves witches. And I mean, why else would Bethesda put in the work to develop a faction that served little purpose in the original Skyrim but not even fashion a unique armor set for the principal antagonists of the game's warrior faction? So we find Skewer dead at the hands of the aforementioned Krev the Skinner. Wow, not even gonna have Krev kill Skior in front of us and then whisk away to show up later as an antagonist. Just a one-and-done boss fight. When werewolves die, they stay in their wolf form, yet Skior, a practicing werewolf, died trying to fight in his human form. For some reason, it's not even really clear why Skior decided to rush the situation. That's explainable if he was a werewolf and was on a rampage, not if he died fighting as a man. I bet you didn't think, when I said his name, that he would literally be gone the second we got back to the plot. Ayella is a bit torn up over Skewer's death, but doesn't mind if we honorably loot Skewer's corpse of his wolf armor. Hey, I'm in the circle now. I gotta look the part. Better than my second run, where I took Skewer's armor so it could sit on a mannequin in my house. The wolf armor isn't bad. It's steel armor, but weighs significantly less, plus it honestly looks good. Well, the male version, anyways. The female armor is hideous. Look at those legs! Look at those breast compartments. No wonder Ayala isn't wearing this. It looks like trash. Ayala honestly takes the death of her fuckboy pretty well, asking us to head out and steal some plans from the Silver Hand. Like, it's hard to generate emotion about a radiant quest, and the only thing of real note is that my second time around, I did it non-lethally. Return to Ayala, and she gives us another quest, this time to assassinate a leader of the Silver Hand. This one's more lethal, obviously, but my second time around, I made sure to only kill the leader. Technically, there is a third Radiant quest where we go and recover a fragment of Wuthrad from the Silver Hand, but I've never received it. That's because after doing the second quest, Kodlak wants a word. He knows about our little campaign against the Silver Hand. Whether you annihilate them down to a man or simply assassinate their leader, Kodlak will still disapprove of our endeavor and then immediately proceed to task us with a vital mission that we're sent alone to do. If you have Whiplash, there is actually a logical, in-character reason why Kodlak is doing all this. It is not like earlier where Ayala chastises us for not helping with the giant and then immediately invites us to the companions. Kodlak, as previously stated, wants to cure his lycanthropy, and he has a brilliant idea. He wants us to seek out the witches of Glen Morrill, who generations past made a deal with the Harbinger, that gave the companions lycanthropy, and he wants us to bring back one of their heads. I went ahead and brought back all of their heads, considering the last thing the companions need is another faction war. It is funny that Kodlak's first instinct is to kill the witches, not even to try and negotiate with them. 
the magic's in their heads, so bring the heads back. The witches are actually hag ravens, which were one of the wild animals I got dispatched to deal with. I'm sorry, but there is a world of difference between rats in the attic and a bird woman who can cast high-level destruction magic. The Glenmoral Coven was a minor faction from Daggerfall that became a plot device in Blood Moon and Oblivion for curing lycanthropy and vampirism, respectively. So it's a bit of a surprise that they're now in the business of inflicting those conditions. They didn't really gain anything in Blood Moon, although at least the transaction in Oblivion involved Melisande getting her hands on some rare, in quotes, Grand Soul Gems. But here they are now just playing middleman between Hirstein and the Companions. It's not like the designers did not know this. Skior, Ayala, and even Kodlak all make direct references to Hirstein, and Ayala outright worships him. So here they are, dying out, serving their role once again as plot devices. Can't wait for the Hammerfell or whatever branch of Glenmoral witches in Tez 6. Upon our return, however, tragedy. Kodlak has died. Not of old age, but was killed in a Silverhand raid. Somehow. For some reason, the Whiterun guards wouldn't let me into the city without a good reason, and they banned these Alakir warriors from the city for rowdiness, but an entire brigade of Silverhand warriors entered the city, went up to the Cloud District, and assaulted Yorvesker without guard opposition. The security in Whiterun is terrible. Shameful is what it is. Yeah, sure is, buddy. Although, funnily enough, upon our arrival, Kodlak is... naked. I don't understand this. It's not to stop us from looting Kodlak's armor considering I'm literally wearing Skewer's old set, which is the same thing. It just seems like an oversight that Bethesda teleported a dead Kodlak here and deleted all of his items, including his apparel. Except the designer had to intentionally add the script to stop you from interacting with his corpse, so somebody had to look at naked Kodlak dead on the floor and say, yeah, that, that's, exa that's how it's supposed to be. My best guess is that later, when we cremate Kodlak in the Skyforge, he's supposed to be naked, and for whatever reason, this script is just firing too early. In the chaos of being all murdered, the Silver Hand made off with our fragments of Wuthrad. Oh no, all our hard work. I'm not even sure what for. Again, lore black hole that the Silver Hand is, we don't know what their motivations are surrounding Wuthrad beyond maybe setting up more ambushes to draw us out. Vilkas figures it's time to get some revenge, so while we're annihilating the Silver Hand, let's talk about Skyrim's melee combat. And they will know terror before the end. Skyrim's melee combat is an evolution of Oblivion's combat, refining Oblivion's rougher edges into a system that is widely cited as one of the worst melee combat systems in existence. Now in fairness, this probably has a lot more to do with Skyrim being extremely popular, making it a point of comparison, rather than some misguided nostalgia for Oblivion's melee combat. Like straight up, Skyrim has better combat than Oblivion. Oblivion just had more issues with spongy enemies. Hitting an enemy in Oblivion felt like slapping someone with a pool noodle. Compare that to Fallout 4. Look at that, I just exploded a guy's head with a tire iron. Despite functioning almost identically, all that changed was the feedback, and Fallout 4 is better. Even if Fallout 4's strength is in its guns, not its melee. Skyrim's most often cited problem is simple. The combat is just spamming the right trigger. Well, there's more to it than that. But it is true that at various points all Skyrim demands is a functional left mouse button. Like the turkey punching minigame from Doom 3, but extrapolated into a full product. Melee is divided into three types. Hand-to-hand, -hand, one-handed, and two-handed, with the reskins of the latter two. Of those, there are swords, axes, and maces. Each of them has different functions, but in all reality, I can imagine you could stealthily add a mod to someone's Skyrim install, which switches all the models around, and they wouldn't notice that the sword they're using has the stats of a mace. Hand-to-hand -hand is the easiest to dismiss. This is Maik the Woke, who specializes in hand-to-hand -hand combat. There is no skill. Instead, your only option is to pick Khajiit, stack gear that fortifies unarmed damage, and pick the heavy armor perk. It's surprisingly robust, but not something I would want to do for an entire playthrough. It's weird, too, because they added kill animations for hand-to-hand -hand in a patch. This is the first Elder Scrolls game where you can literally suplex people into the dirt, and there's still no hand-to-hand -hand tree. Not even as post-launch content, despite Bethesda showing off that they can add new perk trees with only a week of development time. I mean, Bethesda also showed that they could do spears in the game jam, so, you know. The main thing that I can say, and I... I see a lot of those comments are, they, they go back to we had X weapon types in Daggerfall, then X weapon types in Morrowind. Oblivion has its own, and, and, and Skyrim has its own. Um, and any time there's something that we, we stop doing, whether that's uh, spears, having a skill for that, or crossbows and things like that, 
we tend to each time start over and we want to find weapon types with this game that really yield gameplay 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 <laughs> Next is two-handed weapons. I still do not like them. Hell, I haven't liked them since Morrowind. Skyrim came with a change to its stance system. In Morrowind, you had a melee stance and a magic stance. Oblivion changed it to where you're always in melee stance, but added a cast magic button that you can do at any time. Skyrim changed it again, inspired by Bioshock, to where each hand can have an item in it. Unless you're an archer or use two-handed weapons, in which case your hands are full. So now you can dual wield, have a staff in the offhand, have magic in the offhand, have a shield and use magic in the right hand. While it's a system, I have to lament that you cannot dual wield shields. Which is a shame because shields are extremely underrated as far as Skyrim reviews go. People do not realize just how strong the new shield bash mechanic is. In fact, it's the primary reason I discriminate against the two-handed wielders. They can do some damage, but they lack fine control over the flow of combat. Not only that, but they provide a surprising amount of utility to combat, depending on the shield. On the lame end is the Shield of Iskermore, which provides 20% magic resistance. That's an Oblivion-style shield. Boring. Spellbreaker creates a ward capable of diminishing incoming magic. Targe of the Brooded can do bleed damage upon bashing. The Ethereal Shield can turn enemies into ghosts, basically putting them in spiritual timeout for 15 seconds. Ariel's shield can store kinetic energy from incoming attacks and create a shockwave that ragdolls opponents. Even in the DLC, there aren't really that many melee weapons that create that kind of utility. Plus, one-handed weapons can easily switch to magic, which is yet another benefit. It's a shame because two-handers in Morrowind were in a good place. It's hard to really identify what needs to be done because I like the new dual hand system a lot more than I do the concept of two-handed weapons in Morrowind. I guess you would just have to greatly amplify their damage or implement a system like how Dark Souls does two-handed weapons where you can switch on the fly how many hands you use, but it changes the moveset to be less effective. With that in mind, let's answer the question. Swords, maces, or axes? I used axes, but regretted this almost immediately and wish I had picked swords. The way it works in Skyrim is that swords do the least damage, axes do medium damage, and maces do the most. However, swords are the fastest, with war axes being in the middle and maces being the slowest. This is usually a single point of damage, but it means that a steel mace does the same damage as an orcish axe and a dwarven sword. However, the difference comes in the perk system. At first it starts simple, with a flat percentage damage increase. However, at one-handed 30, you're presented a choice in perks. You can take multiple, but really you should only pick one as there's lots of perks you'll want and not enough points for all of them. Axes unlock the ability to do bleed damage, maces unlock the ability to ignore a percentage of armor rating, and swords unlock the ability to do critical damage. Let's break this down in order of usefulness. Maces are nice, but a minority of enemies in Skyrim have armor ratings. This is because armor rating is tied to equipment, which usually only human enemies have. Bethesda didn't think to put an armor rating value on enemies like Chorus or Dragons or Automatons, meaning that for the bulk of enemies in Skyrim, your mace perk will do nothing. Axes are alright, but the bleed effect is kind of bizarre. For one, you're given zero information about how it works or what kind of damage it does. There's also a bunch of issues with it, particularly with weapons not having the effect applied to them without an unofficial patch, or different versions of the game breaking the effect. Even then, it's not particularly impressive. Wow, 12 extra damage on my Daedric Axe. For two more perk points, that could be 18 damage. Also, the bleed effect does not apply to the undead or automatons. Swords are the worst in terms of numbers, but they have the best perks. A percentage chance to do critical hit damage. It's not standout, and it's only based on weapon damage without perks or upgrades, but there's also no restrictions on who it applies to. You know what really kills the system? Balance. For some reason, some designer at Bethesda thinks they're creating an MMO and so worked very hard making sure nobody could say there was a best weapon type, but the end result is that effect where you could swap weapon models without anybody noticing the difference between weapons. Here's a difference. If you do enough damage with a mace, just have their head explode, or their bones shatter, or their limb go limp. It's not actually that outlandish considering Fallout 3 and New Vegas literally had limb-based damage mechanics in the same engine prior to this. But the most you get is a perk that increases decapitation chances. Go all in on that. Axes cut limbs off. Swords can impale people. Please, do literally anything. I am tired of every weapon in Elder Scrolls feeling like flavored paddles.
Oh yeah, Block is amazing and highly underrated now, except the fact that the first perk description is straight up wrong. Seriously, four of the five shield wall perks tell you the wrong value. Really though, Shield Bash can be made insanely good, doing increased damage and staggers and eventually disarms. You can stun lock enemies in Skyrim, even dragons. Playing sword and board in Skyrim is actually surprisingly fun, especially if you max out your heavy armor rating. That's why I want to establish Shoring as a sort of mechanical baseline for Skyrim. Because using only generic blacksmithing potions he found in dungeons, he got himself a set of equipment and a skill set that made him unstoppable, even on legendary difficulty. I missed playing Shoring on my subsequent stealth and magic playthroughs. He was a good character, without exploits or extra cheese. Encounters stayed challenging without becoming tediously easy or tediously difficult, which is a rarity for Skyrim. It's ironic because, again, Skyrim's melee combat is widely heralded as being bad. Let's make some comparisons, although bear in mind that every game is attempting to accomplish something different with its systems. That's why it's called comparison and contrast. Contrast being comparison's ugly twin sister that nobody ever likes to hang out with. The first comparison is Dark Souls, which I would agree, Dark Souls handily has this game beat. So much so that it's not worth going in depth on the subject just yet. Let's start a little lower, Dead Island. A good comparison since it came out a couple months before Skyrim, and has an emphasis on first person melee combat. There are guns later in the game, but most of the early game you're limited to melee weapons with variety. They aren't reskins of paddles, a knife in Dead Island is distinct from a baseball bat in more than just speed, it can cut and stab while the bat can break bones. The game even has a variety of elemental effects, like electrifying a weapon to then shock enemies as well as some mild RPG progression. The game makes combat tense by limiting your pool of stamina, run out and you can quickly find yourself overwhelmed. It also provides lots of feedback, enemies stagger and bleed. Obviously it's rather limited since most of the enemies you fight in Dead Island are zombies, but then again you fight a lot of Draugr in Skyrim. Dead Island also seems to go more for quantity of enemies, with you cutting through the individual fodder pretty quick. And it was easy to kick spam enemies, which brings us to the next comparison. Dark Messiah of Might and Magic is an oft-praised game for its combat. I think it's unfair to compare an arcane game to Elder Scrolls. Arcane often went for kinetic combat rather than combat with skill-based progression. But the end result of Dark Messiah is kick-spamming enemies to death. I kid you not, I clicked on a random point in a random Dark Messiah playthrough on YouTube and guess what the guy was doing pretty much exclusively to beat enemies. It's really not that different than Shield Bash spamming enemies to keep them stunlocked, with the big difference being that kicks just ragdoll enemies. I guess people are more easily amused by ragdolls, but I don't think Skyrim would be improved by more ragdolling in its combat. In a role-playing game, you want a system where skill and equipment progression are recognized, which are not big elements of Arcane's games. In Dishonored, for instance, released a year after Skyrim, combat is extremely fast-paced. It's easy to kill singular opponents, which is why Dishonored makes it very easy to attract groups of enemies that can overwhelm the player. Enemies die fast, but so do you. It's hard to make finding a new sword feel impactful in a system like Dishonored, since most weapons can kill staggered opponents in a single attack anyways. Obviously this comes down to a question of intentions, of what the designers want from the system. Dishonored is trying to sell the fantasy of a fast-paced assassin character. Something like Chivalry or Mordhau is more focused on combat between individuals of comparative skill levels. All attention is on the action, with no attention paid to progression. So, we have to ask the question, is it possible to make a game with satisfying first-person melee combat but also has RPG progression systems? Because the more I look at it, the more I find these ideas may be at odds with each other. But I wouldn't be so hasty. Something like Mountain Blade can provide the experience of becoming better at fighting both in character and as a player, while also providing action combat that can end quickly for both parties. You can also command armies and there are many dynamic systems outside of combat. Honestly, Mountain Blade does classic Elder Scrolls better than Skyrim at this point. Kingdom Come Deliverance has also made more than a couple cameos in the comments section of my Elder Scrolls video on the topic of combat, and for good reason. While it's unrealistic to expect Bethesda to have delivered a combat and progression system like this for Skyrim, it would not be unfair to expect them to start taking notes from this for Elder Scrolls 6. There is also the topic of hit chance based combat. You can argue in my comments all day about whether or not it belongs in games, which is really weird to say. It's like, some people like that, so why would you say it outright doesn't belong in action games? I want dice rolls in a game where I'm in the head of my character, not looking down at them from heaven like Pathfinder. What was I talking about? Right, hit chance combat. Consensus seems to be that if you added some feedback like a dodge animation or a glancing blow sound effect, that the system wouldn't be too bad. After all, it conveys player progression from a novice to a master in combat while also providing a fast-paced combat system where there's an imbalance in levels. Like, yeah, fighting ordinators takes a while. They are high-level religious warriors. Okay, fine, on topic. 
Oblivion seems to be an awful middle ground of the two systems. A combat system that devolves into paddle spamming combat while two numbers grind against each other. This is definitely the rock bottom of melee combat systems. So to get us moving on, because I don't think there's a definitive right answer in this case, I'll tell you what I would do if I was made lead designer on Elder Scrolls 6 and was tasked with making the melee combat good. I would add more enemy variety and more move variety. I wouldn't pull too much from Dark Souls since it's purely a third person experience. I would lean more towards a Mountain Blade style of having cardinal directions for attacks. That way the system can work in both first and third person. I would also tie stagger chances into weapon skill differentials rather than perks. So instead of Shield Bash stunning enemies to death, you have to actually be better, in terms of skill numbers, than the enemy. This means you'll gradually begin trouncing the low-level enemies, but still have challenging encounters with the bosses. Using cardinal attack directions, you can apply extra damage resistance to successful parries and blocks. I'm still a fan of my kinematic animation from the Oblivion video idea. Basically, when you swing, the game calculates your odds of a successful hit landing, then generates an animation that reflects those results. The end result, of course, being that when you miss, you don't see the models intersect on screen. We have to use new technology to trick plebs into not complaining that they are playing a role-playing game, after all. Of course, once I'm backseat devving, I'm gonna go crazy with adding skills and attributes back into the game. I like the idea of the perk system, though, especially if the high-level perks change how the skill works. For instance, at some point, archers should be able to pin weak enemies against the walls with how powerful their shots are. Or if you hit a limb, imagine an arrow ripping a bandit's arm off and pinning it to a wall. Having perks that are percentage damage increases aren't actually a bad thing if the percentages are things other than just more damage. For instance, you could have multiple tiers of a perk that increase the percentage chance a shield bash will stagger. Of course, we have to ask, if we're increasing the number of skills, does that mean an increase in the number of perks as well? The way I see it, the one point per level rule can be kept for attribute perks. For skills, I might give multiple points per level, depending on how this level system gets reworked. Either that or have skills give you perk points when you hit tiers. For instance, you get one point for hitting level 25 in a skill. Perks are the hardest thing to backseat dev though, I will admit. You can only really rework them in the context of Skyrim, because once you've committed to changing something mechanically like attributes, you're already operating in the realm of starting from scratch. A lot of people dismiss Skyrim's perk system due to mostly being just percentage changes to the combat formula. In reality, Skyrim has a more gamified version of Oblivion perks, which itself was just trying to make skills more interesting over Morrowind. For instance, the dual flurry perk makes dual wielding attacks faster. If you want to be reductive, sure, that just means more DPS. However, Elder Scrolls Combat was never really a system defined by DPS values until Skyrim. So with that in mind, what is a perk that actually meaningfully changes the way a skill works supposed to look like? Critical damage makes it so you can do a power attack while sprinting to do double critical damage. Paralyzing Strike unlocks the ability to do backwards power attacks that have a 25% chance of paralyzing your opponent. Moreover, for all the fist waving I've seen about how uninteresting Skyrim perks are, nobody really seems interested in suggesting how you would change the system to make it more interesting. So let's see how Ordinator, a popular Skyrim perk mod, approached the one-handed tree. Hmm. More damage, but your critical strike damage goes up per individual level. Well, the skill already makes you do 0.5% more damage per level anyways, for a bonus 50% damage at level 100. But most of what's in this tree just increases the damage you do, usually with some basic abstraction, but at the end of the day, investing in one-handed perks with Ordinator makes you do more damage, because that's what perks are supposed to do. That's what makes the complaint so strange. The perk system isn't what makes Skyrim's combat boring, it's the fact that the combat is just spamming the left mouse button as numbers grind against each other. This would be akin to saying that what makes Elden Ring combat engaging are weapon upgrades. No, it's the unique movesets, weapons, and enemies that make combat engaging. Weapon upgrades are just simple numerical increases designed to help meter the progression out. So, in summary, to make the combat of Elder Scrolls more engaging, there needs to be more utility in combat. However, too much utility and you start to lose the role-playing elements of the combat. Ultimately, combat is less important than the ability to role-play a character and to have a tangible sense of progression from the start of a playthrough through to the end. Combat progression should not be about keeping up with the world, but becoming tangibly stronger. The focus of the game should never be on direct, kinetic combat, because Elder Scrolls will, by their nature, always be outdone by games that focus on that aspect. We head out to Driftshade Refuge, which is apparently the last of the Silverhand hideouts. Note that unlike the previous Silverhand quests we've done, this one is not radiant. Not that you could really tell the difference. 
Like the dynamic dungeon target of Faldar's Tooth is way better because it has a whole environmental story about how these bandits are running dogfights. Why is one of the radiant quest locations that players have a chance of never visiting more interesting than the handcrafted, handpicked quest location that players who do this quest line will be guaranteed to visit? So the Silver Hand are done as a faction. They do not come back after this. Codlax worry that we will just earn greater retaliation for the horrible things we do to the Silver Hand came true with Codlax's death and the end result of this cycle of retaliation. One of the sides got wiped out almost immediately. We don't really know who started the conflict. Like, did the Silver Hand strike first because the companions were werewolves, or did something companions of the past did merit the founding of the Silver Hand? Who struck first here? It doesn't matter, because we struck last. So I guess the moral is that instead of finding a peaceful resolution, murder all of your enemies, even the children, so that nobody is left to continue the cycle. What a great message. Good to see consistency with the peaks of storytelling that was the Blackwood Company. What's funny is that after recovering the fragments of Wuthrad and attending Kodlak's funeral, the circle retreats to the Underforge. Yorland asks us to get the fragment that Kodlak kept in his room, and we have the option of reading his journal. More on that in a minute. Yorland then reveals that he has instantly reforged Wuthrad, using presumably the fiery power provided by Kodlak's spirit or something. The timing's all wrong. Unless the implication is that the player read Kodlak's journal after returning the final fragment, giving Yorland... time to do this? I mean, bodies don't cremate instantly, and forging takes time. I like the premise, but there should have been a quest here while Yorland works. Kodlak's journal reveals quite a bit. It reveals that he had been having dreams about Sovngarde for some time. Some nights I dream about the mists of Sovngarde. And he even says that the dreams were so strong that it motivated him to actually start keeping a journal in the first place, which, yeah, I guess I hadn't thought about how weird it was that all these Nords like writing about their thoughts and feelings in convenient, easy-to-modify text formats. Nords seem the stoic type to only share their feelings verbally at night around a campfire while it's raining. How weird that a textual format holds some advantages in interactive storytelling. Kodlak's main concern was that the Harbingers who took the beast blood would be dragged to Hirsin's hunting grounds. At first the Harbingers welcomed it, but when it came time for Kodlak he felt he had a choice, and then he saw us and we drew weapons together to oppose Hirsin. Kodlak brought this dream to the circle, leaving our part out. Skior and Aella were torn about it while Vilkus felt betrayed, and Farkas was indecisive. This formed a rift in the companions as Kodlak and Farkas tried to- <laughs> oh my god. This formed a rift in the companions as Kodlak and Farkas decided to try and stop using their werewolf forms, while Vilkus continued to do so sparingly and Skior and Aella continued their frequent usage. Then we arrived and Kodlak actually recognized us from his dream. That is why he supported our membership and why he tasked us with retrieving the witch's heads. Shorin shows valor, though, even in this most underhanded time. We have not had cause to speak much and that is something... I deeply regret. Dude, you cold-shouldered me during my hazing. If you hate the beast blood so much, why did you do nothing to prevent my affliction? Your dream never guaranteed our success, only our mutual fight. Kodlak expresses curiosity about what choice we'll make with the beast blood and comments on us learning of it early but makes no attempt to actually provide an alternative to avoid its usage. Like imagine for a moment actually getting to pick. While the Valorous path seems obvious, if Lycanthropy is a good system, then maybe players will be tempted to use the Beast Blood. It would be a neat bit of diegetic storytelling how truly alluring being a werewolf can be to warriors, and how it can corrupt them. As it stands, at best, players are apathetic towards it, if not outright rushing the quest line just to be rid of it. Anyways, Kodlak intended to counsel us for years, but then had his untimely but expected death. The old man had one wish before he died, and he didn't get it. It's as simple as that. Being Moonborn is not so much of a curse as you might think, Vilkas. That's fine for you, but he wanted to be clean. He wanted to meet Iskramor and know the glories of Sovngarde. But all that was taken from him. Then Yorland, who is not a companion, I will remind you, brings in Wuthrad, the Axe of Iskramor, founder of the Companions. With it, we can open Iskramor's tomb and, through the purifying flames, redeem Kodlak's eternal soul as well as any of the living companions, including ourselves. 
This, however, requires us to go through a gauntlet of spirits that represents Ysgrimor's companions. Vilkas stays in the lobby, citing grief. Farkas will eventually turn back, citing fear of the frostbite spiders. I can't go any fur- What was that? I can't go any further, Shield Sister. Ever since Dustman's Cairn, the big crawly ones have been too much for me. Only Aella will make it to the Flames of the Harbinger, for some reason. I feel a bit odd about the decisions related to the characters in this story. Skior, Aella, Farkas, Vilkas, and Kodlak are obviously meant to be a main roster of characters driving the narrative. The problem is that the game gives these characters so little screen time that it's hard to really say they're fleshed out. This is my own little faux pas. I was a little more serious about this than Todd was about the above line <laughs> at the time. Um, you know, the companion's quest line should be nothing but radiant quests. That turns out not to be as good an idea either. We don't know Skewer long before he dies. Codlack doesn't really chat with us as often as he could before he dies as well. Of the three remaining, it's Vilkas that says his heart has been corrupted by vengeance. Yet that's obviously supposed to be Aella and our flaw. Aella doesn't quit or have a moment of failure, her only foible is that she fully embraces lycanthropy. Something that isn't a failure as much as it is just a difference. Farkas says that he's been scared of spiders since Dustman's Cairn. Note that he doesn't say anything about this at the time it happens. In fact, it's so insignificant I actually forgot there were even spiders at Dustman's Cairn. Farkas is the dumb one with a good heart. If anything, it seems more like that Farkas would be the one to make it to Kodlak, not Aella. Farkas, Vilkas, and Kodlak all mean wolf in different languages. Skior means fragile, while Aella means angel. Wow, and they made her freshly single, just in case you needed another reason. I love the kind of woman that will actually just kill me. An outsider, eh? I really hope some hot chick paints my brains all over some fucking hallway. Ah, a man of action. I'm talking full-on watermelon in the thighs level carnage. Good luck. I want you to fuck me up. Overall, the titular companions upon which this questline was supposed to be built are fairly weak as far as characters go. Part of that is that we really just don't get enough opportunities to hang out with these characters. Also, as quest companions, they're almost completely worthless in combat. For some reason, whenever companions go out on jobs, they always go with their shield brothers and sisters. But when we go out to do jobs, nobody ever tries to come with us, nor will they have anything to say. See, if you wanted to be smart with the story, you would introduce the main roster of characters early, but it would be up to the player which companions to go out on which missions with. Each companion has unique dialogue if they accompany you, and this final quest would be a sort of test of your choices. Depending on who you picked, they might make it different links of the dungeon. One way to go would be to have your favorite companion make it to the end, the other way would be the inverse. The more blood you put on their hands, the more guilt they feel. Of course, you have to wonder why all the companions can't just make it to the end with you. Mass Effect 2 had been out for almost two years before Skyrim. In that game, everyone you recruit has loyalty missions in which you learn more about their character, while also preparing them for a suicide mission. Perhaps up to this point, you could give each companion their own quest to resolve some personal issue that they have, and that determines who makes it to the end alongside you. Because remember, we're supposed to be an order of warriors, bound together through thick and thin. Skior died when he tried to go alone, yet everything this quest tells us conflicts with that idea. We do a lot of things alone. One of the most important things we ever did was a secret mission on our lonesome. We don't help our friends resolve their issues so that they can fight on. We should objectively fail this gauntlet because of our weakness. But the test ends up being one of our literal strength rather than just our loyalty to each other. Okay, so funny thing, the ghosts are just normal NPCs with a spectral effect, nothing crazy. So on my second character, past around level 50, low level enemies actually started to run away in fear from her. A surprisingly cool detail since, yeah, anybody smart enough would not cross her. This includes ghosts. I shit you not, Delta Fear has such a terrifying presence that the spirits of Ysgrimor's companions, the men and women who sailed from Atmora and committed a retaliatory genocide against the Snow Elves, so devastating that it doomed their species to near extinction and led to their evolution into the goblin-like Falmer. I mean, they were always Falmer, but you know what I mean. 
Did you know that Iskermore rode atop a Stormatronach fashioned into the shape of a bear that you can buy in Elder Scrolls Online if you bought the Stormatronach crate for $7.99? Yeah, this kind of thing is why ESO is not canon. Delta Fear is so terrifying that these members of the 500 legendary companions are actually scared of her, which is especially ironic because she's a dark elf. Her race literally did not exist in their era. Anyways, apparently all the spirits of the Harbingers are huddled up in Iskermore's tomb, but we only see Kodlak because he's the only one we knew. Unintentionally, they actually reinforce this since hirelings will not help you fight Kodlak's wolf spirits since they would not be able to see Kodlak. Bethesda's bug maybe, but it's cool. Vilkas and Farkas can, later on, ask to be cured of lycanthropy, although they don't seem interested in doing it while we're already here. Ayala, however, will not want to be cured, which is actually all in character since Ayala has extra radiant quests to retrieve the totems of Hearsene, improving our werewolf powers. Also, it's really funny that Kodlak up and names us leader of the companions after curing him, again without consulting the circle. Hey, remember how the companions don't have a leader? But for today, return to your best. Triumph in your victory, and lead the companions to further glory. Did I hear right? Did he say you were to lead the companions? Ayala's indignation is funny. For sure, it makes sense because the companions are supposed to be leaderless. I guess not everyone at Bethesda was on the same page about this concept. I think it's possible to portray this, like the faction is a democracy where each member of the circle represents a sub-faction, so... Ayala represents the archers and hunters of the faction, and then the Harbinger, the wisest companion, will just preside over the council. Instead, the companions are more like how socialists on Twitter- For Delta Fear, it's even funnier to imagine the companions just accepting her as leader because they're scared of her. I'm sure the story of how the ghost of Iskimor's companions begged her for mercy got passed around Yorvaskar. Our other rewards are Wuthrad and the Shield of Iskimor, which are nice wall ornaments. Wuthrad is a meme weapon, with an enchantment that does extra damage to elves. As logical as that is, this weapon only makes sense if it's Morrowind where two-thirds of the population are actually elves. The Shield of Iskermore is also pretty uninspired, although I have to wonder, is Iskermore implied to have been so strong that he could wield Wuthred and his shield at the same time? Because Wuthred is a two-handed weapon. And yeah, that's the companions. I guess the only thing of note is that Farkas and Vilkas are curious about dragons and will go out with you to fight one. Radiantly chosen, of course. The Companions are the worst faction in any of the 3D Elder Scrolls games. It's comically short, with filler radiant quests, confusing characters, nonsensical and inconsistent world building, and the worst part is this. When I finished the Companions, I thought it was cool that the werewolf question is left up to the player. The question of whether or not to continue using the beast blood is up for you to decide. As Harbinger, you get to make that decision. Except you don't, because Kodlak states outright that you will oppose it and help lead the harrowing of the hunting grounds, where all the spirits of the Companions are redeemed and returned to Sovngarde. You can support continuing that practice, but you will eventually purify the companions. All you have to do is say that Kodlak's dream ends with seeing us draw a weapon, which he interprets as a sign of alliance, but here seen later implies as a sign of opposition. Then the actual outcome is decided by the player, not the writer. Plus, you aren't really given anything to do as the leader except more radiant work. I mean, even the Oblivion Fighters Guild let you decide if the guild was going to focus on recruiting or working jobs, and that would deposit loot in your office depending on what you picked. I know it's a meme to bring up how the player can lead every faction in these games, because it's up to you whether or not you actually want to do that with your character, but I don't think it would be out of the realm of possibility to include quests after taking over as leader. Like maybe you help with a new companion's initiation, creating a parallel with your own. Because again, the companions have five circle members, four now that Skewer and Kodlak are dead, Five normal members, two servants, and a blacksmith who claims to only be interested in working the forge. In the days of Iskermore, he had 500 companions, and that's the real issue. The companions are meant to be the way that Skyrim deals with the legend of Iskermore. Iskermore is one of the most important humans in Elder Scrolls history, being the man who led the Nord's conquest of Skyrim, and eventually, humanity's presence on the continent. There is a 56-volume compendium of songs detailing legends of Iskermore, although only eight seem to still exist. Iskermore has been mentioned in lore since Daggerfall and hyped up since Morrowind, and in turn, all he gets is this lame companion's faction and a cameo in the main quest. Like, wouldn't it have been cool if Iskermore's ghost was so famous that it showed up to help exercise the wolf spirits from the companions? It's not unreasonable, considering we're gonna meet Iskermore and Sovereign Guard later on anyways. With the companions done, there's one more thing I want to discuss in their section, and that is the new smithing system. 
In Morrowind and Oblivion, Armorer was a skill dedicated to the art of repairing your equipment. It was a bit undercooked in Morrowind since NPC smiths could cheaply repair equipment for you and high-level gear had so much durability that you could forget about the mechanic until it suddenly surprised you. Oblivion responded by making equipment break far too often, but also added new mechanics like being able to repair equipment up to 125% durability, making its stats better than the baseline. It was an annoying system because gear broke far too quickly and weapon damage was intrinsically tied to the durability of the weapon. Skyrim takes that latter system, but the former? Well, let's just say Skyrim has no durability system. So really, it's more accurate to say that Armorer was cut and then smithing was added. The idea behind smithing is to give the player the ability to convert resources found in the world or purchased at smiths into the same generic equipment that you might find. If it seems like you would rather find stuff, that's because that's smarter, but smithing also adds the ability to improve all equipment in the game. Okay. There are a lot of asterisks, mostly due to bad implementation. Basically, equipment has a series of tags that dictate what exactly it is. For instance, whether it's one-handed or two-handed, whether it's a sword, etc. Sometimes, however, the designers would forget to add tags that dictate what material upgrades a weapon. Most generic items don't have this issue, but it does crop up with artifacts. Even to this day, some items remain unpatched. Let's start with crafting new items. Generic items have been divided into a series of tiers of items which already existed. The system just formalizes it. For instance, iron, steel, dwarven, orcish, etc. A number of materials have been added which can then be refined and used for crafting. Iron, corundum for steel, dwarven metals, or calcum. Access to these resources is controlled by either finding it in the world or buying it at smiths once you reach a high enough level. Another control, however, is the fact that the tiers are gated through the perk system. This is what is supposed to stop a low-level player from getting immediate access to the best items in the game. Now, you can level smithing by creating and improving items. However, after patch 1.5, which came out only 4 months after release, they changed the XP formula to factor in item value, which is why it's hilarious to still see people making reviews a full decade after launch, using and complaining about the outdated Iron Dagger technique. I'm not a big personal fan of crafting systems, but if this is your sort of thing, it's about as good as any other crafting system out there. It's mediocre. For example, how is it I can smith a few hundred Iron Daggers and suddenly and magically know how to craft Daedric weapons and armor? And you'd need to have farmed your ass off for smithing and enchanting to be good enough. But leveling these skills is a shallow, repetitive grind fest of just doing the same things over and over and over again. Smithing is very much a tedious and time-consuming task. Of course, the reality of smithing is still quite a bit of grinding. However, the intention behind the change to factor in item value is obvious. You are supposed to be creating higher level items the more you level up. The problem is that there's no reason to make a second pair of orcish boots. Because the first pair never breaks and they can continue to be upgraded as I level up or until I replace them with something better. If all you use smithing for is to craft and upgrade your equipment, and even the equipment of a follower, smithing will not keep up with the rate at which new gear is found in the world. If you make certain to use all of the resources you find as you find them, smithing will still not keep up. The fact is, even with the item value change, smithing is still a system where grinding is inevitable. When you combine frequent smithing of jewelry with enchanting, the system does work a little better, but at the end of the day, the best solution is to just stack up on ore, transmute it until it's all gold, and grind out jewelry. Once that's exhausted, then you can make a quick run through some easy Dwemer ruins, bring back as much metal as you can carry, and grind out dwarven bows. Then once that's done, you visit the ebony mine and make ebony and daedric equipment until you finally get to 100 smithing, then you do the entirety of Dragonborn to refund your perk points and go back down the tree to whatever tier of items you were trying to upgrade. And that's just crafting the items. You may have noticed that improvements are also tied to perk values. Many Daedric artifacts are considered to be ebony tier, and you may have noticed that as content has been added to the game, various styles of items have been thrown into other perks without changing descriptions. Moreover, the system is actually total nonsense. For instance, say you're using heavy armor but find a glass weapon. Unfortunately, glass is considered to be a light material, meaning that you have to unlock all the light armor perks leading up to glass smithing to receive the ability to upgrade that glass weapon. Once you have replaced those glass weapons, those perk points are wasted, with no ability to refund your perks being added into the game until a full year after launch. The same works in reverse. If you use light armor but find an ebony weapon, you have to waste points to upgrade it. Or how about the fact that steel plate armor is considered an advanced armor, which you may have noticed is on the light armor side of the tree. Steel plate is the tier between dwarven and orcish armor. It is obviously heavy armor, not to mention the fact that in the end game, once you have a set of equipment powerful enough, there is no longer any reason to actually have smithing as a skill. 
My favorite aspect has to be dragon bone equipment. The main quest is forced pretty heavily onto the player, which involves eventually slaying dragons, on which you'll find dragon bones and scales. Heavy, valuable, and alluring, which you find that there's dragon armor just by reading the smithing tree. The problem is that it's smithing level 100. Now you would say, that's lore appropriate, perhaps even a tempting reason to motivate players to pick up smithing. I would say that the actual result is the encouragement of grinding. It's ironic too, because you can't actually use what turns out to be a fairly common crafting material to actually level up your smithing skill. Now, if you're smart, you can sell dragon parts to buy resources to level smithing. However, it all leads back to sitting in place and spamming items to level up. How do we go about making the system more interesting? Well, for starters, there's a demand for equipment in Skyrim. To me, it seems obvious that the player should be able to supply this demand. One option would be player-owned stores, being allowed to place items you craft on display that would be automatically sold by our employees while the player's out and about. Sure, it's just using a merchant with an extra step, but it makes the process feel more special. It would be even better if items you craft have a tag and then the Radiant system has a chance of supplying enemies you fight with those items that have your tag on it. It could lead to a funny realization that the player is responsible for bandits acquiring so much dangerous equipment. Another important addition, however, would be changing how the upgrade perks work. Now, instead of simply unlocking crafting and making upgrades better, the perks actually unlock quests. These quests will entail the player track down a master of smithing to apprentice under. These masters will then give the players assignments, which leads to unlocking aspects of upgrading that equipment tier. I would also separate weapons and armor. Armor can be kept down to four armor trees, unarmored, light armor, medium, and heavy. Unarmored would be just tailoring, and as you progress, you unlock items with higher enchant values, allowing you to place more powerful enchantments on them. The other three would be divided into the usual tiers. I would then add a perk tree for weapons to the side so that heavy armor wielders can unlock the ability to upgrade glass weapons. My last idea is to have crafting skill perks be independent of combat skill perks. The main reason being that you don't want crafting skills reducing combat effectiveness. It's already an issue in Skyrim that crafting skills are heavily competing for the limited resource that is perk points. Once you separate these perks, adding many more to the system isn't as terrible an idea. If you add all those perks to the current version of Skyrim, it wouldn't work because there would simply be too many things to buy. The real workhorse of smithing, though, is upgrading your equipment. You can use the equipment material at a grindstone or workbench to temper your gear, improving its damage or armor rating. This makes the armor system somewhat interesting because it means that simply finding a piece of a higher tier set is not the only component to an equipment upgrade, but also your ability to upgrade that next tier. Arguably, the higher difficulties of the game are built around using this mechanic to boost your damage and defense into the stratosphere. However, they also added the ability to fortify your smithing, and then to fortify the ways you fortify your smithing, which means that things can get a little... ridiculous. But I'll have to detail that later. Like I said, just with fortify smithing potions I found in the world, I was able to craft a fairly respectable set of equipment. Personally, I find the smithing mechanics actually to be welcome additions. They need more work, like most things in this game, but I personally love the idea of being able to craft and improve my gear. It's like a warrior truly in tune with his own equipment. Imagine a Skyrim without this system. I doubt it would be better, if only because crafting as it stands gives the player more control over their progression. Is a bad system worse than none at all? In my opinion, only if it gets in the way. Now I want to talk a bit about some Creation Club armor sets. These are sold for around a dollar a piece, and there are 15 of these. Most of them are just ports of armor from Blades. It's literally in their names, alternative armors. For the most part, it's just a different way to make your character look. I found them unintrusive because it just means more potential equipment to find as loot. However, the most interesting ones were alternative armor sets which added light armor versions of heavy armor. None of them, however, added heavy armor variants of light armor sets like elven plate or stacked glass armor. I like the notion because it's a step towards medium armor. Think about it. Say you make male armor from Daedric equipment. It'll never be light, but you could cut down the weight to some kind of in-between state of light and heavy armor. Or if you put more glass into glass armor. It'll never be heavy, but it could be some kind of median value of armor between maneuverability of light and the protection of heavy. There's also Fearsome Fists, which for a dollar adds 15 new gauntlet variants to the game that adds a variety of spikes sticking out of those gauntlets. If you find these in the world, they come enchanted with Fortify Unarmed damage. That just makes the enchantment more common. You could already easily get it in the base game. It's mostly just cosmetics, though. Because of the way hand-to-hand -hand works in Skyrim, which is an afterthought, you have to use a heavy armor item with a high defense rating, making only the Daedric Gauntlets actually viable for this build. I'm, I'm sorry, but does anybody making this stuff actually know how the mechanics of the game work?
It is established that Riften is the city of the Thieves' Guild, a fact that was established in the lore back in Daggerfall when the city was called Riftone with an O, and also this was a book where a Dunmar princess got railed by a Khajiit in order to be sponsored to join the guild. Things have certainly changed. Now we get railed by the game instead of a furry. Riften is probably the best example in Skyrim of Bethesda's new city design philosophy, which I call the Bethesda Roller Coaster. Go ahead, strap yourself in and make sure you keep your hands and feet inside the cart at all times. Riften starts upon your arrival. Just before you enter the city, you're stopped by a guard who tries to extort you. But it isn't max level corruption. The guard is worried someone will overhear us when we call him out. So I guess it's not a big deal. We find out who the guard may be worried about in short order as we head inside the gates to find a conversation between a woman named Miol the Lioness and her simp. Miol loudly states that she has had conflict with the Thieves' Guild. The simp responds that the Thieves' Guild are supported by Maven Blackbriar and that she could send her to jail. Quite the scene going on here, to be certain. Then we pass a man named Maul, who warns us not to mess with the Blackbriars, lest we have to deal with the Thieves' Guild. Should you be interested, you can ask Maul for more information, telling you to meet someone named Brynjolf in the marketplace. We continue forward and across the bridge, which is being hogged up by a woman named Sapphire extorting a man for money. To cross this bridge, you have to walk right in the middle of them. Finally, we reach the Riften marketplace where our ride ends, and we are approached by a stranger named Brynjolf with a unique voice actor, so you know he's important. The world calls for wet work, and we answer. No greater good. No just cause. Actually, Robin Adkin Downs is one of those voice actors that's practically in everything. Hell, he was literally Vivek in Elder Scrolls Online. I had no clue. The situation that troubles me has taken a toll on my arch cannon. Unlike most game voice actors, he can actually sound different between performances. It's all about sizing up your mark, lad. The way they walk, what they're wearing. It's a dead giveaway. Oh, but that's where you're wrong, lad. Wealth is my business. Maybe you'd like a taste. That said, while I appreciate Skyrim for going to the extra effort of acquiring more voice talent, I feel it's a bit misplaced. It means that it's very easy to tell which of these market stall NPCs are going to be giving side quests and which of them is going to represent a faction. I feel like they would be better served doing the Oblivion thing, but with a larger pool of talent. Instead of getting an expensive voice actor to play single role key characters, Get a bunch of voice actors to be general roles, but provide each actor a key character to represent in one of the primary stories. This is similar to how each Oblivion voice actor usually also got to play a distinct Daedric Prince. This is of course unless the intention is to make me almost immediately identify quest NPCs simply by voice. If that were true though, then the same logic should carry for the translations as well. <laughs> The issue is that Brynjolf doesn't sound like a Nord, he just sounds like a normal human with a nice voice. So not only does it stand out because Brynjolf has a different voice from other characters, but he doesn't really sound Nordic. We've been contracted to make sure Branche remembers not to meddle in affairs that aren't his own. It's fine if it's a character from presumably another province, like some of the guild members we meet later, but Skyrim definitely has an accent problem with important Nords having strange accents. Brynjolf invites us in on a little scheme. He figures he has an eye for people, and he knows we're bad news. While this is true for my second character Maglir, modeled upon the character of Fargoth from Morrowind and named after a character from Oblivion, it's actually funny because it's possible that no, the player has only done honest work in their lives. Skyrim is the first game where the player can earn money from normal jobs like chopping wood, harvesting crops, and mining. And at no point in the tutorial is the player required to do anything morally questionable. You can leave all the fighting up to Raylov. Stop assigning morality to my character, I just want to use your fine marketplace to perform transactions. At a point in the main quest, you'll be directed to Brynjolf looking for a character in Riften, and he'll force you to do this little scheme with him unless you pass one of the hardest speech checks in the game. Let me find him first. Dragons are bad for business. Passing on a golden opportunity is worse. Cringe. I think this was meant to be a way of making sure players knew about the faction, but that only works if the faction is a secret in the first place. Riften could literally have a neon billboard that says, Riften, Home of the Thieves Guild on it, and it would only be slightly more obvious than what's already in the game. 
If you don't know, the designer of Oblivion's Thieves Guild, Bruce Nesmith, stepped up into a lead design position on Skyrim, while Kurt Coleman, the Oblivion main quest writer, would take a co-lead position and Emil Pagliarulo, Oblivion Dark Brotherhood designer and lead designer on Fallout 3, took the senior design position. This is all to say the guy who made the Thieves Guild last time is now in charge of the project, which might inform why the Thieves Guild is presented front and center in Skyrim, and like how in Oblivion, the player had to be more proactive in finding and joining. You help me out, and I'll help you out. That's just how it is. While Skyrim preserves the test element of the first quest, it removes the competition. In Oblivion, you could fail to steal the journal in time and have to be given a second test where you were alone. Now there's no competition. But the funny part is, you can still fail, and there's no second test. I guess I expected too much hey, from you. Gold or two? I didn't think you'd get pinched. A bug forced me to do this on my mage character, as I had a rare bug where, no matter where I went, even if I was invisible, I was still detected by NPCs for some reason. I don't know why that happened, but I think it had to do with a creation club thing changing something. We are doing a simple shield job. We need to steal a ring from Medici and plant it in Branche's pocket. Then the theft will be reported to the guards, and Branche will then spend the rest of his life in jail. Actually, it's just supposed to be a week, but Bethesda's bug means that Branche gets a life sentence instead, unless you fail the quest. I'm going to cause a distraction. You're gonna steal Medesi's silver ring from a strongbox under his stand. Once you have it, I want you to place it in Branche's pocket without him noticing. There's someone that wants to see him put out of business permanently. I guess I expected too much from you. Also, there is a hidden perk applied to the player for the duration of this quest that makes you 30% better at pickpocketing, and all the NPCs are scripted to leave Medici's stand, so Bethesda tried to make this as easy as possible. The game had to literally break to reach a point where I could naturally fail, which is pretty funny because Delta Fear actually has a maxed out pickpocket skill. The thing is, this quest is better if you fail. For one, Branche does not deserve life in the joint. Branche is getting sent to jail for meddling and expresses naive interest in Brynjolf's Falmer blood scam. However, the notable thing is that Branche is a dark elf with an Argonian name. He actually has a quest where you investigate his lost family, revealing through a journal from his parents that Branche is actually Brandel Telvani, the sole living heir to House Telvani. That's not really how Great House Telvani works, as possibly evidenced by a spelling mistake referring to his father as Limdren Tenvani. But all the same, the idea of Branche being a lost heir to a Telvani councilman whose parents died after fleeing Morrowind from an Argonian invasion, to later be raised by Argonians and to settle down in the same city another errant Dunmer noble had lived in before her return to Tramrielic politics is... I don't know, kind of interesting. But the quest is boring and doesn't really go anywhere, and most of Branche's characters and dialogues the player probably won't see because after your first encounter with him, he'll spend the rest of his days clad in irons in Riften's prison. Anyways, my second character, Delta Fear, failed this quest, meaning that Branche not only remains free, but a potential ally in the future. No, oh, never mind. Brynjolf will interpret either outcome as a positive and invite you to the guild. If you succeed, then you are the person who can turn the guild's luck around. If you fail, then that's just a sign that thieves everywhere are currently cursed with bad luck, so you should join up with the guild for safety. Take note, people, this is how cult leaders recruit new members. No matter how you try to dissuade them, they'll spin it into being yet another reason to join them. Part of our initiation is getting to the Ragged Flagon, a tavern down in the city sewers where the guild hangs out. The Ratway is apparently full of failed guild members, which... So I guess they don't think much about the implication of the player failing this mission? Like, what does it take to get demoted down here? Anyways, you can sneak past everyone, but this isn't the last time you'll have to use this route, so better clear out some of the local wildlife. You'll overhear a conversation about how the Thieves' Guild is in bad times, and you can confront Brynjolf about the state of the flag in. If you were expecting a palace, then maybe you're not cut out for this line of work. Our methods involve secrecy and discretion. <sighs> My guy, you know that everyone in Riften knows you're here and what you guys do, right? You aren't the Oblivion Thieves Guild living in secret amongst the poor from the Guard. You're the Morrowind Thieves Guild, paying off the right people and manipulating the right government officials to not interfere with your operation. Do you really think a secret door in a mead barrel is going to fool the RPD if they decide to stamp you out of existence? But Brynjolf figures we're worth a second chance and sends us to run a protection racket with the Riften Merchants. There are three merchants, and each one has a way you can manipulate them into pain. Or you could brawl them, but brawling is terrible and social engineering is better. And when you get to the third person, they've heard about what you've been doing and surrender the money. The racket depends on us not killing the marks, but... 
well, after failing the market scheme on my second run, I decided to fail this one too. I can feel Look, everything was all just a misunderstanding. The third one still surrendered the cash and Brynjolf? Well, he's pissed. He's responsible for... for all of this! Think of all the men! He didn't lose a damn thing! This is the enemy! And he's here on his knees! Us. You are right, he is not one of us. Are you daft? I told you not to kill any of them. How much clearer do you need me to be? How about the gold? Did you remember to bring it? Or was that too difficult an instruction as well? Unlike the market scheme where bad luck could theoretically affect the player into failing the job, the player has to go out of their way to kill the marks on this one. And Brynjolf? He has to swallow his pride, accept that he's a cuckold, and still give the player the next quest. So we go to meet the guildmaster Mercer Frey. Sir, this is the one I was talking about. Eliminate him while you have the chance. Notable characteristic voiced by Stefan Russell, the man who did the voice acting for Corvo in the second Dishonored game, not the first. What? What happened? Nick Valentine from Fallout 4 and Bellathor of Bellathor's General Goods Store. Everything's for sale, my friend. Okay, fine. Also Garrett from Thief. This situation does have one advantage. Things can't get any worse. Why would you have the antagonist, Mercer's the guild antagonist, by the way, why would you have the antagonist of the guild share voice acting duty with other NPCs but not the face of the guild to the player? Frey is the Thieves' Guild antagonist. You can tell because he's hostile right out the gate. I'll let that comment go because you're new here. Ask things out of turn again and we have a problem. Now, are we clear on all of this? He suggests that recruitment's a waste of resources, hammers us about the rules, then assigns us to a job the Guild's top infiltrator almost got killed doing. As an antagonist, Frey is a failure compared to old Hieronymus Lex, or even Shoring Hardheart, the real one. Lex was a charismatic guy, you were never really made to hate Lex as much as just what Lex was doing, simply as an obstacle to the guild. His redeeming qualities were even turned into strengths when we reassigned him to Anvil to protect the Countess. It seems like Mercer should be more charismatic out the gate, like how a sociopath lures you into a false sense of security by wearing a mask of normalcy. Moreover, the player has just been handed an extremely important job to the guild, despite possibly failing the previous two. Face the Jarl's yeah. justice. This is where I would incorporate the Radiant system that's already in the game. If the player fails either or both missions before this point, then they have to successfully complete a number of Radiant jobs to earn enough standing to be given this one. Someone is going to defend this by saying that Mercer is trying to get the player killed, but the thing is that Mercer Frey does genuinely want this job completed. The premise is that recently, the owner of Golden Glow Estate, a honey manufacturer, has stopped paying the Thieves' Guild a cut of its revenue that they are owed. Golden Glow provides honey to the Blackbriar Meadery, Skyrim's largest meat exporter. The Thieves' Guild is paid by Maven Blackbriar and the owner Arangoth to keep the workers in line, and prevent competition from arising. But Arangoth is no longer making good on his end of the arrangement, so we need to investigate. I don't know if you've noticed, but unlike Oblivion, we're actually playing the part of a real criminal organization. We're not good guys helping the needy of Riften, we are actively stepping on their necks and extracting the wealth. To an unhealthy degree, but it's nice to see that moral grayness return to Elder Scrolls. Mercer does need this job to be completed, so even if he later states he wants us to get killed doing it, he will still need to find out why exactly Arangoth changed his tune. There's a sewer that can be used to infiltrate the estate, and this is the first real stealth mission of the guild, so I guess let's talk about stealth. Stealth in Skyrim is very basic, mostly because as I realized in the middle of my Oblivion script, Elder Scrolls is attempting to cater to many different fantasies. Thief is a better stealth game and Dark Messiah of Might and Magic has better combat and Magicka has better magic, but Skyrim's attempting to channel all of these systems into a single experience. Of course, this means there's little that Skyrim really has mastery over, and stealth in Skyrim is especially super basic. Stay out of sight, don't get detected. Your footsteps are louder the heavier your boots are unless they're magically muffled. Light levels play a factor in stealth. The issue is that stealth games are 50% the levels made for them, and yet despite having an in-house designer that worked on the original Thief games, Skyrim has no good stealth levels, even in stealth factions. Take Golden Glow Estate. It has two, yes, only two, two points where the player is provided two paths through the estate to bypass a patrol. This is because Skyrim doesn't really do guard patrols. 
Typically, you could just put points on a map and say, patrol between these two points. However, a streamlined system for developing patrols was not implemented, meaning that it's a more difficult to utilize AI package, so it's unsurprising the idea isn't used more often. It means that most hostile NPCs the player has to sneak around are either static or walk between two points. Sparingly, you might occasionally run into a torch sconce, which the player can activate to put out. But you still have to reach it physically, which begs the question of why you wouldn't just keep going. But in theory, this provides a slight mechanical edge if, for instance, you have a stealth mission where you have to double back through an area like, you know, most thief levels. But no, so when the Bethesda Game Jam saw an implementation where guards would relight torches, that is an idea that has a lot of potential, but it wouldn't really be meaningful to implement. I mean, the basic thing is a water arrow the player can shoot to put out light sources from afar. You might remember this tidbit from the Bethesda podcast I used in the Oblivion video. The other thing I try to do is that in coming off of Thief, which is a game all about stealth and sneaking, so it was like, how could I get some of that into Oblivion? You know, some of that, how to try to capture a little bit of the charm of the Thief games. It, it occurred to me, I'm like, shortly after the game is released, the mod community is going to do what they will. And sure enough, there's like a complete like Thief plugin with all of Garrett's tools from Thief. You know what I mean? Like water arrows and moss arrows and the blackjack and all this stuff. So I, I sort of knew that that was going to, I was like, this is going to happen anyway. That is Fallout 3 lead designer and Skyrim senior designer Emil Pagliarulo recording a podcast about stuff he wished he had implemented into Oblivion but left up to the modding community a full seven months before Skyrim's release, and years after Oblivion. This is the sort of thing that is the reason for Bethesda being so tight-lipped about their design in the modern day, doing less interviews and such. Because Pagliarulo is admitting that they had years to think about ways they could have improved the stealth experience, but never decided to do so. Simple stuff that are staples of stealth games like alarm states, knockouts, distraction tools, body detections, guard patrols, complex level layouts. The best Skyrim offers is a dragon shout that projects your voice, distracting NPCs and allowing you to slip by. That's it. That's far and away the biggest change to Skyrim's stealth system from Oblivion, which is the mechanical equivalent of being able to throw a rock. Instead, the primary implementation of stealth is not enemy avoidance, but elimination. Attacks from stealth have damage multipliers with perks to increase those damage multipliers. This is the incarnation of the dreaded Stealth Archer. Now stealth archers go back to tabletop, where having advantage over an opponent would allow you to do extra damage. Arena and Daggerfall didn't really sell this because stealth archery and critical strikes were all different skills. Morrowind would roll critical strikes into stealth, meaning that you could do extra damage at the start of an engagement if you got the drop on an opponent. Oblivion made this easier by removing hit chance. Any character could pick up a bow and take a pot shot at an opponent from stealth for a little extra damage to start fights. But it was Skyrim, with its classless society, that spawned this horrific playstyle. I mean it. Stealth archery is the worst. It is boring and insidious. Because there are no classes, there's no reason for all characters to not use a little bit of stealth here and there. It starts small. I'll use this bow I found to open up a fight from stealth and then finish it normally. It levels you up or you eventually kill your first opponent purely from stealth and it gradually starts to take over your playstyle. Eventually you'll be slowly clearing dungeons entirely from afar with a bow and arrow while sneaking. Unlike a melee character who can juggle staggers with a shield bash or the magic character who has lots of utility spells to try switching to, stealth archers have one move. Draw bow, aim bow, loose, repeat. In Oblivion, you either had to knowingly pick the sneak skill at the start or train it from a very low level to get use out of it. But Skyrim intentionally made sneak so easy to pick up and use that there's zero reason not to. I know people meme Legolas for being overpowered, but he's a great example of an archer character who didn't need stealth bonuses to do his job. Archery is a bit static, right? Ranged encounters are usually the most fun for archers since it involves leading shots and predicting incoming projectiles, but against melee opponents, archery is annoying due to getting staggered. Plus, the lack of limb damage means you don't have a lot of options like, I don't know, shooting someone who's charging you in the leg to cause them to limp slowly towards you. Again, Fallout 3 and New Vegas already have a system for this in the same engine. It also means there's no headshot multiplier. I just feel like archery level 100 should be around level 50, and the real level 100 should enter the realm of crazy fantasy stuff like your arrows landing with the force of a ballista, taking limbs off, or pinning torsos to walls. Towards the end, my character started to approach this, if only because I started really having to lean on custom fortify archery potions for the extra damage. You know, all this archer talk diminishes the other aspect of stealth, which is assassinations via melee. 
The downside of stealth melee is having to get close to people. The upside is six times, 15 times, uh, 30 times damage from stealth. Yeah, it's actually kind of crazy. And people meme on being able to literally crouch and fire and be unnoticed in Skyrim. But that's one of the few areas where the game really sells the fantasy that you're becoming better at the skill than anything you could accomplish in real life. Occasionally, when I got bored, I would go around stealing the armor and even weapons of enemy NPCs before starting fights, but it was never really necessary. You pop a high damage arrow with a high damage poison off your enchanted bow for three times stealth damage into the guy with the best armor in the room, then run around or find a place the NPCs can't reach and pop arrows into people. Or, even worse, you eventually start ignoring NPCs. Just sneak past and keep sneaking. There are a few things you ever really need to kill because alerting people inside a dungeon does not draw the attention of other people inside that dungeon. Look at a base in Metal Gear Solid 5. Superficially, it's a completely different world, but in reality, bases and dungeons are similar. Both are locations in an open world in which a number of enemies are located. The key difference, however, is that a Skyrim dungeon is a linear affair with an endpoint and a chest using a leveled list to determine appropriate loot. In MGS5, a base is meant to be a location in the world, a potential setting for missions or open world exploits like stealing resources or people. The safe forts work like this in Skyrim. If an enemy at a fort detects you, he raises an alarm and all their friends come to kill you. Stealth tactics are then necessary, at least temporarily, to give yourself an advantage. Or you can use the alarm state against the enemy, drawing them to a certain location, then sneaking around to complete your objective. Again, notice how it was level design that was integral to making the stealth more interesting. The heightened mechanics, artificial intelligence, and animations of MGS5 are not what makes it a superior stealth and even action experience. What's funny is that it's not impossible for Skyrim to create a competitive experience. They already have a system for making NPCs dynamically react to bodies. It's just that those reactions take place in the cities, not with generic bandits. How many times have you seen a bandit stare at their friend's corpse without a care in the world, or far too easily decide that it was safe to stop searching and that it must have just been the wind? It seems the misguided effort to focus on the town NPCs gave Bethesda tunnel vision and they didn't realize that the bulk of NPCs the players actually interact with are enemies. You want to know something funny that kind of broke me? You can kill everyone at Golden Glow. No problem. Killing all these guards, even Goth, No issues. But burn more than three beehives. Everyone in Skyrim should be talking about the massacre at Golden Glow Estate my second character did. There's botching the robbery, and then there's hunting down and murdering every single mercenary like animals. I am actually upset though, because I've thought forever, hey, this is the Thieves Guild and killing people's bad for business. Better to try and avoid these guards, but why bother? See, Garrett didn't murk all the guards for three reasons. He wasn't a phenomenal sword fighter, it creates bodies, and it raises the alarm. I mean, think about good stealth games. Most of them try to limit the player from just mowing their way through a level. Can't leave a trace that you were there, or killing people creates extra expenses, or a morality system for killing too many people. I think a good way would be to add in additional bonuses for not getting detected during the job. Ghost Golden Glow and the player gets a bow that puts out torches, or I don't know, anything really. The Game Jam proved there are creative people at Bethesda being intentionally held back. They added water arrows to the game in a week. You've made a mess of things, and Maven's furious. I told you not to burn more than three of the hives. We've reviewed into everything else that's happened since you arrived here. Guilty! All counts. Despite objectively butchering the job, we get our next mission, which is to speak directly to Maven Blackbriar. So you're the one that burned down Golden Glow Estate? Do you have any idea what that little stunt you pulled is going to cost me? I'm amazed you even bothered to show your face here. The only reason we're having this conversation is due to Brynjolf's assurance you won't botch another assignment. Rich. He claims you possess some sort of uncanny aptitude for your line of work. Justice. Quite frankly, I find that hard to believe. This is where things get really absurd, right? Because while it makes sense that Maven would specifically request Maglir, who has done everything phenomenally so far, it does not make sense that she would request the person who failed to implicate Branche, murdered two Riften merchants, and just destroyed her primary source of honey and massacred a legion of mercenaries. Delta Fear's entire concept of stealth is that you can't get detected if all the guards are dead. Maven wants us to take down a competitor in Whiterun at Honeybrew Meadery by getting the owner arrested. Somehow, she figures he'll get a life sentence and that the property will be immediately passed to the owner's assistant, who has made a deal with Maven. 
The sad part is that both of these elements come true. The assistant gives us poison to deal with the pests he planted in the metery basement, and the owner accepts hiring us to deal with it. Then we poison the still, yet somehow this poison's already in a barrel and ready to be tasted by the captain of the guard within seconds. You cannot fail this mission. Killing the owner doesn't work because he's essential. Leaving the guy raising a rat army in the basement alive doesn't work as well. From here on, failure is not an option because they didn't make it one. Which would be hilarious. If the player could only fail but the game kept having to give you quests anyways, this is almost like when an early access game has two hours and one minute of good content and then it stops trying as soon as the refund period's over. Anyways, we track down a promissory note and bring it back to Mercer. Both the note and the deed from Golden Glow have the same symbol indicating that the same person is behind both Golden Glow's purchase and Haunting Brew's founding, indicating that whoever is behind this is attempting to drive a wedge between the guild and their only remaining contact, Maven Blackbriar. A clue, however, has been left in the form of a name, Gadjul Lay, an alias for Golemai in Solitude. Like the previous two jobs, Golemai used to be a guild contact but went silent. His role was to steal or identify valuables from the East Empire company that he works for. Golemai has three persuasion options, Intimidation, which always fails despite the fact that this quest is still completable if you call his bluff and kill him, Bribery, which always succeeds and leads to him tasking us with stealing a really easy target of firebrand wine from the Blue Palace, and Persuasion, which is a very high skill check. You see, unlike the percentage chance system of Fallout 3 or the transparent skill check system of Fallout New Vegas, Skyrim has skill checks, but no way to gauge success chance. Well, that's fine, but it doesn't make it apparent just how busted these Persuasion checks really are. There are two checks which are designed to be impossible to fail, Three checks, which require a skill level of 10, which in vanilla Skyrim makes it also impossible to fail. The next tier is 25, then 50, then 75, and then a single check at 100. But there are lots of checks that are impossible to succeed, and their presence is also inconsistent. There are perks to lower the thresholds, but that requires you already have leveled speech to 50 and spend three valuable perk points for what is again an inconsistent mechanic. Also, if you've already raised your speech to 50, then you can already pass more than half of the game's checks. You can lower the thresholds with potions, but that requires you to be aware that a check is about to happen. Also, a lot of the checks are really lame, like getting extra gold, but usually all speech checks do is let you bypass a quest objective. There's not really anything that changes anything major. Like in New Vegas, you can change major plot elements just by the points you have invested in your skills. And I'm not talking about avoiding the Leg Atlantius fight. Multiple factions can be changed purely by putting points into speech, like the Great Khans. Like, Skyrim's content is so boring that Bethesda considers skipping it to be the primary reward for characters invested in speech, which I only achieved on my third character who only did the quest lines after maxing out her speech skills. I guess this is meant to be an adequate replacement for disposition, which, while still in the game, basically only affects whether the voice lines an NPC uses are friendly or hostile. It's not like Morrowind or Oblivion quests change drastically from speech checks either, but this comes off like Bethesda's trying to provide the illusion that they can do what other RPGs are doing with player choice, but it's exactly that, an illusion. Trickery works by obfuscating the facts, which is why Skyrim provides so few details about how its speech system works. It would be backwards if the player never had any conversation options, so Bethesda tricks the player into thinking that there are options. It does not tell you the percentage chance a speech check can succeed, because by design not every speech check can succeed, or even accomplish anything if it does. There are many which don't have a success state, so if it told you the chance of success it would literally just say 0%. When the chips are down, the best the designers can do is offer to skip some minor objective. Fine, you've got 75 points in speech, I guess you don't have to steal the firebrand wine. You still have to follow the rest of the quest progression. There is no possible way to convince Golemai to just give us the information we want right now. The thing is, no matter what happens, we still have to tail Golemai through the warehouse and into his hideout. If you fail the speech check and have to steal the wine, then Golemai will never leave the Winking Skeever to go to his hideout. If you steal the wine, Golemai tells you that he doesn't know who the symbol represents and leaves to go to his hideout. If you succeed the speech check, then Golemai tells you he doesn't know who the symbol represents and leaves to go to his hideout. Lots of conversation options are like this. You're presented a choice, but every choice either leads to the same endpoint or ends the conversation, starting the flowchart over. 
Now there's a reason for this. Skyrim was developed right before the era of digital releases, meaning that they're still beholden to the file size limitations of the physical medium. Every branch and dialogue that creates new responses steals from somewhere else, creating the depth of Fallout removes the breadth of Elder Scrolls. The issue is that this is somewhat disingenuous. There's no reason that Golem I, if properly convinced, can't use the same dialogue to tell us now what he'll tell us in 10 minutes when we find him in his hideout. The only reason would be to force the player to sneak through the warehouse and the hideout. Except stealth is optional. There's no punishment for murdering all the East Empire Company wardens or the bandits, and Golem I, even if he detects the player, will just keep going. Moreover, while this mission is interesting compared to the standard Skyrim fare, it's nowhere near as impressive as it should be by stealth game standards. You're given an interesting route to the warehouse, but hardly any need for them. Hell, the quest is able to be completed even if Golem I dies, as he will instead write up a confession to his brother with all the critical information. A woman named Carlia, who killed the previous guildmaster, put him up to this, and said that she would be going to where the end began. The only downside of Golem A dying is that he can't serve as the fence in solitude, but there also isn't much upside to killing him either, because it's not like you can kill him early and get the note. Every path leads to us learning the information after the stealth mission sequence anyways, so you might as well just keep him alive. Mercer recognizes the name and knows the location she was referring to, which immediately should be throwing some red flags. This means that Carlia had intentionally left this breadcrumb trail, obvious in order to lure Mercer into a trap, and yet Mercer decides that two people is sufficient for this. Why wouldn't we bring all these useless footpads that do nothing but hang out at the guild hall with us unless the intention is to betray us, which is what happens. The next red flag is that when we arrive, Mercer tells us that he found Carlia's horse and killed it. I know you're trying to prevent her escape, Mercer, but did you try slapping it on the ass first? Take the saddle off, or I don't know, steal it and ride it back to Windhelm to sell? Carlia clearly isn't going anywhere considering how she set this trap up and has presumably been waiting for a fresh minute for us to get here. Like what was Carlia's plan if Erangoth or Shabjorn decided to burn their evidence or keep it better hidden? Or if Golemai decided not to squeal? Or if Mercer forgot that Gajim Lay was an alias? Or Golemai used a new alias that Mercer didn't recognize? There are a lot of factors here that could result in Carlia waiting here for a very long time. Or what if the Thieves Guild figured it out immediately and showed up the day Carlia was out arranging her next big clue? I mean, she picked an area that Mercer knows is sentimental to her. What if Mercer routinely visits Snowvale Sanctum, or hired somebody to stake the place out and kill anybody who gets near it? That's actually within his character, since he employs bandits to guard his house that he doesn't even live in. Mercer is waiting for us, which for Maglir took a long time because the quest after this has a leveled reward. In fact, Maglir did an entire quest line in the time between Mercer leaving the Guildhall and Maglir arriving at Snowvale Sanctum. So maybe Mercer is slightly justified in taking a poke at both of my characters. Leveled rewards have been... scaled back with Skyrim. There are 15 scaled items in Skyrim total. There are even two primary quest lines you can complete that have no scaled rewards. However, this came at a cost. Less scaled items, but a much wider bracket of level scaling. In base Skyrim, the scaling goes up to level 46, while in Dragonborn, the scaling goes up to level 60. For reference, basing this off of Skyrim reviews, it seems that a normal person doing a full playthrough gets to around level 40 before stopping, which is about where both Sjorin and Maglir stopped. Oblivion and Fallout 3 in some respects to like a 1 to 25, 1 to 30. This one is balanced like 1 to 50. This makes sense as the first 20 levels go by very quickly with the game slowing down drastically in the mid-20s. Scaling of course works by changing the numbers on an item depending on the level you receive it. So for instance, the Nightingale Blade does 1 point of damage and 5 points of absorb health and stamina for each stage of the bracket that it goes up. So getting the blade at level 1, you'll get a sword that does 10 damage and 5 points of absorb health, while getting the blade at level 46, the sword will do 14 points of damage and 25 points of absorb health. Note that single point increments of damage are more drastic when factoring in skill levels, perk points, and item tempering. So at level 1, the sword equals a dwarven sword, while at level 46, the sword equals a daedric sword. That of course means that level 1 versions of the sword will be replaced by higher level weapons later in the game. This has that same oblivion problem of encouraging people to do the faction related to their playstyle last, but it's inconsistent because not every faction uses scaled items, or uses scaled items consistently. For instance, the only scaled item tied to the College of Winterhold caps out at level 25 instead of level 46. The Companions have no scaled items, while the Thieves Guild has four different items tied to it. There's also random side quests and even dungeons with scaled items, but no consistency. 
There are two options in my eyes. The first is to get rid of scaled items and replace items with static weapons that have unique abilities. The second is to keep scaled items but implement a way to increase their bracket position. Like maybe if you get a scaled item at level 1, then at level 20 you can sacrifice a grand soul to increase its bracket position. It just bothers me how much of this stuff either sits on my wall or gets sold to a vendor because Bethesda keeps throwing wheelbarrows full of generic but unique models of equipment at me. It's like they don't understand that fun content is a reward unto itself, and so feels compelled to make sure there is some kind of gear incentive, even if that gear is trash that ends up sitting in a box in my house. The first thing that stands out is that Mercer, who is impatient with us, can unlock a type of door that, as far as I'm aware, does not appear anywhere else in the game. Mercer is really drawing attention to his lockpicking because he's capable of breaking into this door that we cannot. The dungeon proper is like a weird mix of a Nordic burial crypt with a stealth level. We end up finding a word wall for disarm, which, really? Disarm? Didn't think to do something like throw voice or detect aura for this dungeon that is part of the stealth faction, both of which are shouts built for stealth. But disarm. Which is almost functionally useless, by the way. I've never gotten disarm to work on an opponent that I actually wanted to, you know, disarm. We get to a claw door, which, no, we're not addressing those yet. Big thing is that they need a claw to open, but once again Mercer is apparently so good at lockpicking that he can open it while drawing big attention to it. This is why this dungeon confuses me, because you cannot enter this dungeon at all without the quest, but then they have this claw door which seems like an adequate way of keeping players out of the part of the dungeon that has all the quest scripting, since the player can't find the claw. Anyways, we enter the room only to see the very same thing that countless NPCs had seen before they had died. We've been ambushed, and worse, we've been ambushed by a stealth archer. Mercer and Carlia have a conversation where it's revealed that Mercer Frey was the one to kill Gallus, the former guildmaster, and then Carlia starts drinking a potion. At this point, Mercer should be killing her, considering his only goal here was to tie up this loose end. But no, he lets her drink it, and she goes invisible. Mercer then ties our loose end up and leaves. We wake up outside, and Carlia declares herself our savior. Okay, let's stop. Carlia intended to shoot Mercer but couldn't get a clear shot because we were in the way, even though she could have just tried waiting for a better shot. It wasn't like we were closing in fast on her position, she literally had an invisibility potion on hand if she wanted to reposition. I also want to introduce another element. Gallus' murder was 25 years ago. According to Carlia, she had spent the last 25 years constantly on the move, conspiring to take down Mercer, singularly focused on that goal. And yet, after building an elaborate House of Cards plot to ambush Mercer, she did not anticipate that Mercer would dare bring a second person to the Sanctum. She was smart enough to set up a location to where only Mercer could get in, so that Mercer couldn't just hire some bandits to clear the place out for him, but still. After 25 years of planning, she didn't think to just wait a couple seconds longer. Now there is the question of why Carlia didn't decide to just kill Mercer. She says that she's smart enough to not cross blades with him, but like, just shoot him. Why would you close the distance between you and someone who has a sword? Don't you know that people with swords have to be close to you to do anything? Then she copes by saying that her goal was to capture Mercer and take him back to the guild to pay for his crimes. And how exactly does that work? When Carlia does return to the guild, they will go on full alert, even though most of these people wouldn't know who she is. Like, have Delvin and Vex and Brynjolf all been with the guild for 25 years? How old are all these people? Do you know how long 25 years is, Bethesda? The actual evidence Carlia needs to exonerate herself of Gallus' murder has only just been found and it is written in the Falmer language. Did Carlia never once in 25 years come back to Snowvale Sanctum to get it? Given that she says she needs to stick around to bury Gallus, I guess not. How is this journal still intact? Given that the journal isn't even written in the common tongue, it might actually be impossible to translate as most, if not all of it, will be illegible. Even then, Carlia didn't know there would be a journal, so how exactly did she plan her encounter at the guild out? It would be her word against Mercer's. That might work back in the day when she would have had friends there, but after 25 years, it's almost guaranteed that everyone would side with Mercer over Carlia. At this point, Carlia would be better off just assassinating Mercer or outliving him. I mean, we have to imagine Mercer is at least 45 or 50 years old at this point, while Carlia is not only an elf, but a direct descendant of a woman who lived through the entire Third Era. If this sounds surprising, Carlia is actually the granddaughter of Queen Baron Zaya, who we know lived for at least 430 years. I pitch it that way because we don't really know what happened to Baron Zaya after the events of Tribunal, but the fact remains that she did live an extremely long time. Now there is another element. 
which is that Mercer stole something that Carlia needs as part of her religion, the keys to the skeleton car. Oh, that old thing? So, simply living her life and letting Mercer get old and die is not an option because it may make recovering the key difficult, even though the key was already being passed around by the Thieves' Guild in Morrowind, and Nocturnal even gave the damn thing to the player as a token of her appreciation in Oblivion. Hey man, can I borrow the skeleton key? And don't hold out on me now. Apparently, the key got two big retcons, the first being that it can unlock literally anything, unless the player has it. The second is that Nocturnal needs, or more likely wants, the key to serve as a portal to her realm. The guild being cursed with bad luck is quite literal since Mercer stole the key. So the guild's been losing its grip for 25 years? 25 years of the guild being on a downward spiral? I've got one simple editorial fix. Drop the two. Say that Gallus' murder was five years ago. Five years is long enough to start believing that Carlyle did it without breaking suspension of disbelief. You seriously expect me to believe that Carlyle slept in a different place every night for 25 years? That's 9,125 times Carlia has had to find a new place to rest her head. Five years is also a good amount of time to say the Thieves' Guild's been losing influence. Given that life in Skyrim is supposed to be short, unless apparently you're a member of the Thieves' Guild, then it may well be possible the average adult in Skyrim doesn't even know about their existence. Not because they're masters of clandestine operations, but simply because they are now culturally irrelevant. Five years is long enough for the Guild to be gone from an area to make their return actually notable. More to the point, there is zero story benefit for having the gap be so long. Anyways, Carlia claims that she saved our life because her arrow slowed our heart down, preventing us from bleeding out. I'm almost insulted. Like, seriously, you can tell the writers were writing the story cock first. They wanted a betrayal scene with no consideration for how it would make sense. Am I to believe that someone like Mercer Frey can't figure out how to cut an artery, or doesn't know where our vital organs are? A slowed heart doesn't matter if we get stabbed through the neck. I sympathize with how unenviable a task it is to engineer a situation where the player is taken down without making it feel forced or cheap. I would look at something like Half-Life or Dishonored to see how hard it really is to pull this stuff off. Showing a character who can survive Dragon's Breath and bounces back from mortal wounds like it's nothing suddenly getting taken down really easily creates cognitive dissonance. I'm supposed to now accept that this can just happen to my character, even if I have 100% poison resistance. Here's my rewrite. We enter the room, only to have the puzzle door shut behind us. Carlia and Mercer have their conversation, but Carlia is hidden somewhere in the room, invisibly. Carlia puts Mercer on the back pedal, and Mercer has a mask off moment. Maybe he realizes our sudden streak of popularity might make the guild more willing to take our word than his. Or maybe he realizes someone who routinely messes up as many jobs as we do is not going to be missed. Realizing that he can't leave us alive, Mercer betrays us, when suddenly we are shot and fall to the ground. Instead of the animation made for this, it would just look like a normal paralyzation effect from the game. Mercer makes a quick insult at Carlia's bad aim, but decides it's not worth it to stick around. So instead of going on a monologue gloating about how we engineered our own downfall, Mercer just takes a quick stab and has to rush out. Then we wake up with Carlia, and this time she tells us how she saved our lives. It makes more sense. Instead of not having a clear shot, now there's no mistaking it. Carlia shot us because we were about to die instead of getting impatient or changing her mind. Oh, my poison slowed your heart. Yeah, well, I wouldn't have gotten stabbed if I wasn't paralyzed on the floor. She figures that Mercer will think we're dead. You remove the issue of Carlia deciding not to at least shoot Mercer in the leg by limiting the amount of time he's in the room, and you don't strip the player of agency in a way that isn't at least consistent with how paralysis works in the game proper. It's sort of like how Half-Life 2 has the player get knocked out the same way it would work in the actual game. It works way better than turning off the lights and taking the controls away. So Carlia brings up that Gallus' journal is written in Falmer, so it'll be difficult to use as evidence. And we mentioned that like, hey, why don't we try getting it translated? And Carlia's like, oh yeah. The implication is that maybe Carlia has been eroding Thieves Guild relations down for years and only recently started putting her signature on it so she would be found. But really, it feels like it took Carlia 25 years to have the idea to alienate the Blackbriars. Because she doesn't seem very intelligent. She's definitely not the sort of woman that scholars would like. By the way, Gallus wasn't just a thief, but a scholar as well, which is actually pretty cool. How is Gallus posthumously a more interesting character archetype than any of the living characters? Anyways, at the mention of a translation, Carlia mentions Inthir, a contact Gallus had at the College of Winterhold. I then subsequently went down to Riften to visit the Thieves' Guild. Delvin Mallory, Vex, not even Brynjolf will give us any insight or acknowledgement about anything that just happened. Why are you here? Did Skullface send you? Sorry, lass. 
I've got important things to do. We'll speak another time. Bullshit, Brynjolf. You literally do what everyone else here does. Hang out all day in the cistern while I work. Bethesda is so sure that the player is just going to follow the quest marker and trust the purple-eyed lady they had zero contingency for if the player actually tries to find Mercer or tell anyone what happened. What if Mercer returned, claimed we were a traitor and the frontman of the Ragged Flagon, while feeling bad about it or maybe not trusting Mercer, allows us to leave alive? Instead, Delvin's like, wow, nice model ship. Where did you find it? And did you find anything interesting and plot relevant when you did? And my character has to respond, oh, you know, places, not much. You too. Inthier, who typically lives at the college, happens to be spending the night out in the Tavern of Winterhold. Because that is what mages of Winterhold do. They hang out among the plebs of the ruins of the city that hates them. Carlia, Then she's finally found it. Wait, what do you mean found it? It was on his body. Where he died? 25 years ago? Just like I mean, I mock it, but the alternative is having the player enter the college, which is impossible to do without joining, apparently. Inthir doesn't know how to translate Falmer, but he does know how Gallus figured the language out, which was to steal the information from the court wizard over in Markarth. Calcelmo isn't too interested in sharing the information, as he's currently working on his definitive guide to translating the Falmer language. Wait, how long have you been working on this thing? Gallus somehow stole this information from you 25 years ago, if not longer, and you still haven't finished it? Just in case you guys thought it took me a long time to write a script. So this dialogue has six conversation options, although generally five. Even though I hooked him up with a dark-skinned tomboy waifu, he'll only give us a key to his museum and not the information we want. The path of last resort is to do a task for Calcimo, killing a spider who lives in the ruins he's studying so that research can continue. Or you could steal the key or pick the lock. It's the speech options I have an issue with. Intimidation and bribery always fail, which kind of highlight my issues with them. There's a perk that makes intimidations twice as likely to be successful, but I swear a minority of them ever even have success states. This makes no sense because sure, Calcelmo could call the guards, but will they get here before his body hits the floor? Intimidation should be harder than persuasion in this circumstance, but not impossible. Especially considering we are talking about a woman who has a terrifying enough presence to scare the ancient dead companions. Likewise, Calcelmo declines bribery because apparently scholars are uninterested in personal wealth. Fucking what? What about grant money? You know, having the freedom to research whatever you want without having to serve a Jarl? What about the possibility of earning enough money to found your own college? What is the motivation of publishing your work on translating the Falmer texts? Esteem? What is this, Star Trek? Is there really no quantity of money that could be offered to Calcelmo to sway him? I have a hundred thousand gold, not even that merits a day pass at the museum? Calcelmo can be swayed with a persuasion check, but it's a hard speech check, meaning speech level 75. Or you could just pick the Adept Lock, literally any character can do that. The only downside is the guards in the museum will be hostile, but you know, who cares? Past a certain point, the city guards are replaced with hostile personal guards with no bounty for killing them until the end when you encounter the wizard's guard. Why bother? Why not just make it so they're all city guards? Markarth's meant to be about as corrupt as Riften, so it would make sense that there would be more guards protecting a bunch of relics than the city itself. It would actually fit with the broader story of Markarth. There is this spider control rod, but all it does is move the spider and give it targets. At first I thought these valves could be manipulated by the spider, but no, it's just for fighting enemies, and only in this one area. Basically, there were two ideas for this level, but Bethesda should have probably picked one and focused on making it good. Either ramp up the trap elements of the area, making them necessary to slip through the lab, or lean on using the spider bot to remotely activate switches or something. Like, the guards are used to working around it and don't ask questions when they see it, so the bot could be used to activate valves remotely while we sneak through an air duct or something. Or lean on the trap element, activate traps remotely, and the guards go, shit, it happened again, better not ask questions before the fucking safety inspector comes by and finds us for not installing a WGC-compliant wheelchair ramp in our dungeon. We find the translation guide, but it turns out to be a big rock. Oh, that's why this story needed a 25-year time gap, so that our local wizard and avant-garde artist could carve out his translation guide instead of printing it in a book. Is the implication that Calcelmo is a fraud who's using the Elder Scrolls equivalent of the Rosetta Stone? Or has the man been climbing this giant tower to carve out his guide? The journal implies that he's been deriving his notes from the tablet, but then why would it take him 25 years if it wasn't actually his original work? Who knows? The only clever part of this is that the game expects us to figure out that we need to grab a roll of paper and some charcoal and create a rubbing of the stone. No quest marker, no explicit directions, just an instruction to copy the stone and some big environmental clues that charcoal and paper could be the way of copying inscriptions. 
This is the sort of thing you wouldn't expect Bethesda to do anymore because players might get confused, but I had a hard time finding examples of people on the internet actually having issues. Although, I do suppose that raises the question of the role that online wikis and easy video streaming have on quest design. If you ever get confused in a quest, you're one Google search away from finding the UESP, even if it's never at the top despite being the superior website. So then, we have to wonder, are lots of people having trouble with the quest but not saying anything because it's easy to find directions on the internet as to how to complete it, or are we speculating about a group of people that doesn't actually exist because the average person can figure it out and only a small fraction of people get confused but are loud enough to worry the developers? Bethesda is very worried about the player getting confused, so almost every little thing in Skyrim has a quest marker and written directions as to what to do. There's not much of a sense of discovery or catharsis when everything in the game is so obvious. I found the game slightly more enjoyable when I disabled the floating quest markers, because the floating markers were often one step ahead of me and preemptively telling me what to do before I would even know that I needed to do something. Anyways, we escape the tower and return to Inthir with Carlia here. Inthir does an amazing on-the-spot translation, and the journal says that Yala suspected that Mercer was stealing from the Guild Vault and did something to the Twilight Sepulchre, or Nocturnal Shrine. I might have spoiled what exactly it was that Mercer did, but the game is trying to create a sense of mystery. Sure, I wouldn't have been able to guess exactly what the game was leading to because new parameters for the skeleton key were invented, so with our evidence in hand, we head out to the Thieves' Guild. I want to touch on Inthir for a second because it's very obvious that he was a mistake on the part of Bethesda. Inthir's role was likely meant to have been played by a character named Nelikar, the actual elf wizard living in the basement of the Frozen Hearth. Nelikar was asked to leave the college due to some experiments, and it's probable that Inthir's role of supplying the college with illicit goods was actually meant to be done by him since he lives off the campus. However, the biggest piece of evidence is this. Like the Altmer? Yes, I would say their culture quite possibly rivaled our own. Now, for some reason, a lot of people have trouble telling Bosmer and Altmer apart, but Inthir is a wood elf, not a high elf like Nelikar. I think the mistake stems from the fact that Nelikar plays an important role in Azura's quest, and a lack of communication resulted in Nelikar having been played by two different voice actors. To do. These fissures and cracks aren't encouraging. Malin obviously was growing more desperate once he left the college. The Nords went to war with the Falmer in the First Era. Killed them by the thousands to drive them from their snowy homeland. Nelikar is voiced by Neil Dixon, the male Altmer voice actor, but Inthir is voiced by Stefan Russell. Yes, they actually used Mercer Frey's voice actor to record these parts, so the character ended up having to be split. Now, it's speculation on my part, but I think I've got a pretty good case here. It's not even the first time that a Thieves' Guild elf character was the wrong race. Aaron Goth is a Bosmer name, and Vex will refer to him as a Wood Elf Swit. Yeah, I did. That Wood Elf Swit. He's a lot but this is what he actually looks like. Welcome to the Thieves' Guild. If this plan works, not only is my debt gone, but I'll be set up for life. I suppose that risk always coexisted with his line of work. I just never thought his luck would run out. Get it? Cause he was in the. Speaking of cases, we return to the Thieves' Guild with evidence in hand, but they've gone on alert on account of Carlia not figuring she should probably wait outside of the flag in. She hands over the translated journal and Brynjolf, shocked, decides the way to definitively prove Carlia is innocent is to check the vault. The vault requires two keys to open, with three keys being owned by Mercer, Brynjolf, and Delvin. But shock and horror, the vault, it's empty. <sighs> that door has the best puzzle locks money can buy. By the eight, with the apotheosis of Tiber Septum, the face of the divine was transformed. Talos ascended, and the eight became... <laughs> nine! I'm no priest, and I'm certainly not religious. Why so I know the idea is that Mercer has probably emptied the vault after betraying us at Snowvale Sanctum, but the game portrays it more like Mercer has been emptying the vault for years, which he has, just in small doses. Do you get my meaning? Delvin and Brynjolf have had access to the vault, but I guess no one was bothering with doing record keeping? Moreover, the vault is not tucked away in a corner, it's front and center in the cistern. Given the number of layabouts here, I would imagine it's physically impossible to open the vaults without a curious footbat or two deciding to watch, so surely somebody would have noticed all those times, especially the most recent one, that Mercer Frey used the skeleton key to open the vault and took all the money. It doesn't look like a small amount either. I mean, when the player lugs around 100,000 gold, that's a gameplay concession. Apparently, gold is actually enchanted to be weightless, except that time in the Civil War where it had to be transported by carriage. 
Ah, yes, of course. Mercer Frey unlocked his innate ability to perform illegal teleportation magic. Yes, that's it. Just write off all your issues with magic without ever taking advantage of magic both mechanically and narratively to actually make stories interesting. Brynjol figures we need to investigate Mercer's house, Riftwield Manor. It was a gifted home, but apparently he wasn't actually living there, but he has installed an escape mechanism anyways. The yard is guarded by a man indebted to Maven Blackbriar. We can kill him. We can also do a short quest to pay off his debt. Vald's in debt because he lost an expensive pen that he was supposed to deliver to Maven. Instead of just transporting it normally and telling the guild not to waylay this shipment, Maven instead had it sent over the lake, but Vald hit a rock and lost his cargo. There's no quest marker, and the only clue is actually a lie, as the cargo is not near any rocks but in the middle of the lake. Which of course is ample reason to justify why everything needs quest markers. I mean, it's not like we could just fix the quest directions to be more accurate. The quest is only interesting because the Quill of Gemination is a unique quill made by the college with the ability to duplicate text. While it has the surface application of making transcribing books easier for scholars, it also has the criminal application of forging signatures. It's no use to the player, as only Maven can get the ink for it, but it's a really cool application of magic in the setting that is almost entirely optional because you can just kill Vald, or trick him into thinking Mercer needs him in Markarth. There's a couple literal bandits in Mercer's not house, but we eventually find his office where his plans, a note, a bust of the Grey Fox, and a unique sword are located. Now, this very questline admitted that Carlyle was intentionally leaving clues so that she would be found. So is it the same with Mercer? Why? Why would Mercer leave the one heist plan he was actually going to go pull off to be found? It's not like you even need confirmation that Mercer is going after the Eyes of the Falmer. You could just say that the Eyes of the Falmer are the biggest heist that Gallus had planned, and probably what Mercer would go do now that his cover is blown. The note reaffirms that Mercer somehow broke into an impenetrable fortress to steal an item that should have been impossible, because the skeleton key still hasn't been revealed yet. The bust is apparently there because Mercer had a fascination with the Grey Fox, even though he has nothing to say if you were the actual Grey Cowl of Nocturnal in front of him. Thanks, Creation Club, you ruined another thing. Oh yeah, and Chilrend. So in Oblivion, Chilrend was a recolored glass short sword, but with some model alterations making the blade longer. In Skyrim, it's also recolored, but it's just a normal glass sword model now that's blue. It's just... it's just blue. And of course it looks awful because glass swords in Skyrim are just giant paddles. Look at how sleek and sexy the Oblivion glass weapons were. Of course, they were based on the Morrowind glass weapons, one of which was actually added by the Creation Club, so you can compare and contrast in-game how bad the Skyrim glass swords are. Chorind is actually one of the best swords in the game. It's a scaled item, but its best incarnation is superior to anything you can find in the world. It does 15 damage, more than Daedric and as much as Dragonbone weapons, 30 points of frost damage, which is meh in Skyrim considering frost resistance. Oh, and it paralyzes for two seconds. I'm actually kind of confused why Mercer has this thing in his display case and not on his person. This seems like it should have been his signature weapon, not collecting dust in his house. We return with the news and Brynjol figures Mercer is going to do the eyes heist for style points before disappearing forever. Yeah, or maybe he left the heist plan there as a misdirection. Maybe he already did it years ago and is out stealing an Elder Scroll or something else expensive. Just because you're right does not make it okay. Carlia says guild leadership falls to Brynjolf and he decides that Mercer needs to die. Yeah, pay attention Armand Kristoff, Mr. We Aren't the Dark Brotherhood. No, since we're not the Dark Brotherhood, we're not going to kill him. Okay, okay, there's one thing I never told you. You were always my... Man betrays guild, man has to die. Simple as. What is not so simple is that Carlia thinks we can't take Mercer, which, like, what is that based on? Sure, you pussed out, and I lost because I was paralyzed on the floor, and not because I got poked by Chilrend, Carlia. Spoiler alert, we can totally take Mercer. Specifically, I can, by myself, because you will not be helping me when the time comes. Carlia figures we need every advantage we can get to take on Mercer, so she has us and Brynjolf meet her outside town at a hidden sanctuary. She wants to induct us as Nightingales, which are like, servants of Nocturnal. Gallus, Mercer, and Carlia were Nightingales, and there can only be three. Sounds like a fast track to getting your secret order wiped out if there were only ever three members. The catch, Brynjolf asks, is that we have to pledge our eternal souls to Nocturnal. Come on, start talking, bitch! Nocturnal will allow you to become a Nightingale and use your abilities for whatever you wish. And in return, both in life and in death, you must serve as a guardian of the Twilight Sepulchre. 
They played us like a damn fiddle! Excuse me? Carlyle doesn't even do the skewer thing of going, well, it's your choice. Player choice not requested. It's do this or start a new quest line. The best part is that we get nothing out of it. That advantage we needed to get from Nocturnal to beat Mercer, she doesn't give it to us. All we get out of it is this Nightingale armor, which, while good, we got before the whole pledging our soul thing. This is literally pointless. Well, maybe not. It is a point, albeit a point of contention for many players. You see, Nocturnal's Daedric quest has actually just been rolled into the Thieves' Guild, and actually, it's worse than just doing a Daedric quest because it ends with us pledging our eternal souls to Nocturnal. This is a rather long quest line to unceremoniously end with an ultimatum. However, I found there isn't really anything in our initial meeting that suggests we've made a deal just yet. We could, for instance, get our hands on the skeleton key and just hold on to it. Yeah, and nobody has an issue with us doing that, by the way. We do a really long Dwemer dungeon that just turns into a Falmer dungeon before confronting Mercer, who uses illusion magic to make Brynjolf fight Carlia. Seriously, Brynjolf? You're so low level that that works? So we one-on-one -on -one with Mercer, and he went down super easy because he didn't bring his super powerful sword with him, but he exploded the room a bit and it started filling with water. Right before we drown, however, a way opens up and we escape. Technically, this could be considered good luck granted to us by Nocturnal, but one, we still haven't returned the skeleton key, and two, only Maglir was at risk of dying. Delta Fear can breathe underwater and make things explode with her brain. There's no way she'd actually get trapped in here. Plus, that's stupid, because it would basically guarantee that Nocturnal isn't getting the key back. I mean, I assume that like all artifacts, he could just recall it, but he seems big into making mortals do that kind of thing for him. Carlia gives us her bow, which is level scaled and does frost damage. Like, you guys know this is Skyrim, right? Half the population in wildlife resists frost damage. She then entrusts the task of returning the skeleton key to the Twilight Sepulchre to us. Which is dumb, because Delta Fear just kept it. Oh wow, I guess all that catastrophic stuff that was supposed to happen if I did exactly this won't come to pass. It's almost like Carlia is either a serial liar, extremely misinformed, or really, really stupid. Probably all three, honestly. She's lying about stuff she doesn't understand because she was too stupid to comprehend what Gallus was trying to tell her. Like, this isn't even the first time Nocturnal has had something stolen from her. Remember the Eye of Nocturnal, which she said she super needed to see into the mortal realm? Or the Grey Cal of Nocturnal, which was so important that she would curse its wearer with permanent anonymity as a punishment, and it took an Elder Scroll to undo that curse? Hey, since I was wearing the Grey Cow while taking my vows and had my fingers crossed behind my back, that means the Grey Fox signed the contract, not me. Sorry, them's the rules. Blame Todd Howard for making it possible years after the fact. In the interim, let's talk about the Thieves' Guild Radiant work. I've been doing it between missions. The way it works is that there's two quest givers. Each will give you a single task at a time. There are seven mission types in total, but you'll figure out that numbers and burglaries are the best. The missions will then set a random target in a random city. Now these aren't necessary to progress in the guild, but you do have to do at least 20 of them to become the guild leader. However, there are stipulations. You can't just grind 20 and be done. In order to rebuild the guild, you have to do five jobs in each city that isn't rift in. However, the cities are assigned randomly, so you have to constantly accept and forfeit jobs until you get the one you want, or use a cheeky quick save right before the quest starts, but after the dialogue to keep refreshing the quest until you get one you want. That's still annoying, but I actually like how these Radiant quests are leading to something and not just things I'm supposed to do if I want more useless currency. After five missions in a city, we get a special job offer from an influential member of that area. These are extremely hit and miss. Like the White Run job is literally just a numbers contract, which is comically easy because it's not trespassing to be in the Jarl of White Run's bedroom. Markarth's job is to just run a marginally interesting dungeon. Windhelm's job is another dungeon, but is woven into the broader serial killer plot of the city. Solitude's job is the most complex, with us having to buy or steal some drugs and plant them on a ship so the captain gets arrested. Each job you complete adds another merchant to the Ratway. Windhelm and Markarth's jobs add fences to those cities, in addition to Golomai and Machias from the questline, and each job allows you to bribe the guards to remove your bounty at half price. This gives the Thieves' Guild the biggest license to say it's probably the best faction in the game despite its abysmal story. Without factoring in equipment, the Thieves' Guild is the most significant upgrade to our status in Skyrim. Perhaps more attention should have been focused into the special jobs, like each special mission would itself be a designed stealth mission similar to the main quest line. So for instance, maybe the Markarth job requires that we complete the dungeon without being detected, and replace the silver mold with a fake one. 
I mean, we could spitball ideas all day. The point is that this part of the faction is what needed more focus. The story of how we rebuilt the Thieves Guild, and you could have the Nightingale stuff be a side plot that develops out of it. Basically Nocturnal's quest, but as an optional three-parter. Since we have it, let's talk about the Skeleton Key. It's mildly useful. You can't spam auto attempts with it to skip the minigame like in Oblivion. It doesn't even passively boost our lock picking to make locks easier, similar to the Morrowind version. That said, since it doesn't break, it does make it easy to figure out the sweet spot of the minigame. I hardly need to introduce the minigame since it's been a Bethesda staple since Fallout 3. You position a pick and rotate the lock until you find the right spot to unlock the door. The issue is that lockpicking is now a universal skill. Daggerfall gave each archetype options to open locks. Thieves could lockpick, mages could use mysticism magic to open locks, and warriors could bash them open with their raw strength. This is a good balance of the system, with thieves having a quiet option but mages needing to use magicka and warriors damaging their weapons in the process and alerting everyone around them. Morrowind would, however, drop the ability to break locks as a warrior. I doubt it was a balance issue as much as it was a skill issue, in that it's hard to identify what skill should level up when you do it. It was a strength check before, but Morrowind would need some kind of lock-breaking skill for warriors, and people tend to forget that Morrowind was actually built from the ground up in a new engine, and lock-breaking was probably too low priority to make the final cut. Not that Bethesda then took the opportunity to add it to Oblivion, which actually did warriors dirtier by removing consistent scroll merchants, necessitating that they take up alteration magic or lockpicking. Skyrim went a step further by removing open spells from the game, channeling all playstyles into lockpicking. Technically, there are still open spells since there's the Tower Stone, which gives you one daily unlock up to expert level with a magic power. Even locks are leveled, and you'll eventually run into more master locks than any other type. And the Creation Club added a spell from Oblivion that references another spell from Daggerfall called Fenric's Welcome, which does the same thing for surprisingly cheap, despite being an expert level illusion spell. Man, I won't know what to think if Elder Scrolls VI re-adds open spells, and we'll have to wonder if the Creation Club actually did something positive for the series by reintroducing the idea. Anyways, the funny thing about lockpicking is that, despite being a universal skill, None of my characters maxed it out or bought a single perk for it. The closest I got was skill level 96 on a character that had reached level 68 and maxed out a third of the game's skills, including speech and restoration, with very little grinding, I might add. The core problem with the lockpicking skill is its perk tree. It has a spine of five perks that make a tier of lock easier. So you buy the novice locks perk to make the already easy novice locks easier, and even though really only expert and master locks provide any modicum of challenge, this means three perks you don't want or even really need to buy to unlock the two that you do want, except Expert Locks require lockpicking 75 and Master Locks require lockpicking 100. The thing is that the skill itself makes the minigame easier, so by the time you reach the point that you can unlock the perk, you already don't need it. And besides, most quests use at most an Adept Lock, if that, and past a certain point all unlocking chests does is get you more loot for the box and more gold for the pockets. I could make a better perk system than this in my sleep, and I mean that. I could do it in my waking hours without forgetting to put it in the video. Make it so that each perk makes you 20% better at lockpicking in general, and 30% better at that specific tier. So your weakened warriors who only want to be better at lockpicking to get loot from dungeons only have to spend 1 or 2 points, while dedicated thieves who break into houses regularly can access the entire tree without feeling like they're wasting their points. As for the rest of the perks, Quick hands seems like the kind of perk that would have only been useful once every 20 hours when I had to break into a place that is constantly being watched. Wax key is dumb. If you want the key to a place, it's better to steal it. Plus, you'd be locking yourself out of future experience points and locking that door. Holy fuck is this wrong? Hey, I was wrong about something. I mean, I'm right about it still being better to steal keys, but you can't get experience from the same door twice. Golden touch is useless because it gives you more money because that's really what we need. Treasure Hunter is extremely situational, maybe for spawning gear to disenchant and learn the effects, but would eventually pan out to being just another implement of money making. Locksmith seems useful, being another way to make the game easier, but requires level 80 and expert locks, which removes that usefulness. And Unbreakable requires level 100 to make your lockpicks unbreakable, like the skeleton key already is, except lockpicks are worth nothing and you'll find hundreds of them everywhere, unlike Oblivion where you have to join a guild or find some homeless guy living outside town to sell you some. The problem is, the minigame is so simple there isn't really any utility you can add. It's not like Oblivion where the perks change the game by reducing the number of pins that fall. You can tell this is the case because the perk overhaul ordinator has to add new mechanics like placing bear traps and hacking automatons to give the player something to do. You could add a high level perk that adds an autocomplete function to the minigame, or maybe a perk that lets you lock doors. 
Or how about a perk that lets you detect life within 10 meters if you're sneaking near a locked door so you can see what's on the other side? Personally, I'm a fan of making the lockpicking real-time so that perks that increase your speed and stealthiness are actually useful. Like, instead of making it so nobody can tell I'm lockpicking, start with a perk that makes it so civilians can't tell I'm lockpicking, but guards can still catch you. Look at lockpicking in Fallout 4 and how sad it is. The perks are literally just permits to unlock higher-level locks. That's not better, that's worse. Morrowind was good about this because it reinforced the idea that a character was bad at lockpicking by calculating if the player could even attempt to pick the lock by factoring in skill, agility, luck, fatigue, and the quality of the tools. Meanwhile, Nate is over here all, nope, I'm not perceptive enough to even try, despite the minigame being even easier. So anyways, Magler goes to the Twilight Sepulchre to return the skeleton key. I've always been confused why the Twilight Sepulchre and Nightingale Hall are two separate places. Also, Nocturnal isn't one for worship and reverence. There are no priests and no sermons, no services, and no arms. To make matters worse, I think the other priests are beginning to suspect we aren't who we say we are. If they discover we're posing as priests of Nocturnal, I'm sure they're not going to simply ask us to leave nicely. Nocturnal isn't one for worship and reverence. There are no priests and no sermons, no services, and no arms. The reason for there being two locations is that Gallus is hanging out in the lobby, so I guess Carlia never paid this place a visit in 25 years, really living up to her vow to protect it. Gallus is the last spirit guarding the place, and we have to get past a bunch of corrupted spirits that are also, like, guarding the place. It is a very amusing notion that the afterlife of the Thieves' Guild character is to forever wander the halls of a Skyrim dungeon. Then you have to go through a room where the light hurts you, and then turn some lights off so the lady who likes darkness is in darkness. Then some traps or a locked door, and, and you find a hole that you get stuck in before waiting a minute for the cutscene to trigger and you fall through the floor. Wish you weren't so fucking awkward, bud. Stick your key in the hole to unlock a portal that Nocturnal comes through. If I say all this matter-of-factly, it's because this is all terribly uninteresting as far as final levels go. I mean, say what you will about the Oblivion Thieves Guild, it ended in a heist. Actually, it ended in a bizarre conversation, but it had a heist. And the Morrowind Thieves Guild ended in an assassination of the Fighters Guild leader. Here we are meeting a hot, goth, Daedric prince and I'm completely zoned out because for some reason Nocturnal has to have extra rules compared to the rest of the princes. I'm sure he's lying and being extremely arbitrary to spite everyone for letting the skeleton key get stolen, except only a minority of thieves serve Nocturnal, so really it's your own damn fault and I want nothing to do with you, no matter how much cleavage you show me. Damn, she got big on parents. We have to give up the skeleton key, which is marginally useful for some powers that are only useful if you don't want to level your illusion skill up. No takebacks, plus we're guaranteed a Nightingale now. No takebacks, again. And this mission's necessary if you want to become the guild leader, which... Brynjolf not wanting it because he feels comfortable being out in the field is stupid. You'll love it, Brynjolf. You get to hang out in the cistern all day, like you already do. You also have to do all the special contracts, so 20 minimum Radiant quests later and there's a small ceremony. Are we all sure about this? Like, Delvin, you've been around a minute. Sure you don't want a promotion? What about you, Vex? There's nothing to do as the leader of the guild beyond more radiant jobs. Wish you weren't so fucking awkward, bud. Every now and then you'll unlock another item on the display shelf for doing these, and at 125 jobs you unlock a safe that's populated with loot. Which is not only an absurd amount of work, but a terrible reward because at this point you'll have done 125 of these jobs, you'll probably have more than enough gold from doing them. And of course the guild has that usual issue of not having anything to do as leader. What if Delvin came up and was like, Hey boss, what's our stance on the homeless? And we respond, we protect them, or HATE HOMELESS! And then we make more or less money, but the homeless have different lines. Or maybe we can set our policy for raiding shipping caravans with adverse effects like merchants having less items or money, and dispositions being ruined, but we make chests full of gold doing it. I'm not proposing anything that isn't impossible. And I want to guide the line of thinking to be that when we design the next faction from the ground up, let's have some consideration for what the game will look like for the people that complete the faction. Brynjolf does give us the Amulet of Articulation though, which should help with all those persuasion- Oh, wait, most of them were in this faction. Two more things. 
Along the way of doing the primary quest line is that we can find some special items in the missions that Delvin will buy from us. There's a Queen Bee statue, a decanter, a shipping map, a model ship, a dwarven puzzle cube, that bust of the Grey Fox, and one of the Eyes of the Falmer. I don't know if you can actually retrieve all of these items after the quest ends. I did have issues with going back to get the decanter and the model ship, and the quest line doesn't really introduce the idea. More, it just lets you kind of stumble upon them and realize you probably missed some in previous missions. The Empire shipping map in particular is completely out of the way, and I always miss the model ship because it's an, an unassuming side room of Snowvale Sanctum. To me, the issue is that not only is the reward gold, but leveled gold. While this is true of the Radiant jobs, I can at least excuse that as being a simulation of the player being compensated for their increasing skill set. The rewards for Litany of Larceny should be static, and maybe Delvin should offer perks for it. You could start gradually unlocking the player's ability to bribe guards in the minor holds, and then maybe some skill augmenting perks, similar to how the Crown of Baron Zaya works. No Stone Unturned refers to a quest where the player has to go around collecting these unusual stones to complete the Crown of Baron Zaya. In case you don't know, the Baron Zaya was in the Thieves Guild. There are 24 stones, and you'll likely run into a couple while doing other quest lines, but not all of them, which creates this dilemma where the quest is either for people doing comprehensive playthroughs, or it's for people who want to look on the wiki. The reward hints towards the latter, as instead of getting paid, we're given a perk that increases the amount of rare gems you can find. A really good perk, but after a while, I didn't want it because, damn, that's a lot of flawless gems. Man, Nocturnal's curse is nothing compared to Baron Zaya's blessing. Literally one urn looting session could fund the entire guild for years. Now I want to mention a creation that fits nowhere else, the Arcane Archer Pack. It was sold for $1.50 and is best described as a sequel to the Area Effect Arrows plugin from Morrowind. Now first up are the Bone Arrows, which are pretty funny. Bone Arrows were added in the Shivering Isles, a creation of a Nord named J-Red Ice Veins. The Bone Arrows in Skyrim are superficially similar, although someone had a big-brained idea when making them. It costs 10 dragon bones to create 10 arrows, but it requires the dragon armor perk or smithing level 100. You know what else you can make at that level? 24 dragon bone arrows for one dragon bone. They'll do one point less damage, but obviously there's less hassle in lugging dragon bones around to make arrows. Okay, amazing start. What's next? Fire, ice, and lightning arrows, which do iron level physical damage, but a scaling amount of elemental damage. Quite a bit, too. The models don't even look like they belong in Skyrim. Every time I found these, I was thrown off by how incongruent they are. They're expensive to make, though, requiring four elemental salts of your chosen damage type. That might have been a good idea in a game with more Daedric enemies, but not Skyrim. Soul Stealer arrows manifest into soul gems when landing killing blows on NPCs. Seems like a cheap way to get black souls, but I guess balance isn't a concern if you design from the perspective that everyone's running around with an infinite black soul gem already. There's also telekinesis arrows, which sit in the air from where they were shot until released with a power. That's pretty cool, but they had to make the arrows do 111 damage each. See, if you were designing these from the ground up, then you would make it so each arrow stores data about how it was shot. Stuff like what bow was used and whether we were in stealth when we did it. Because the game doesn't do that, the original arrows were extremely low damage and had to be increased with the Anniversary Edition. The Arcane Archer pack also adds a spell called Bound Quiver, which is actually a power. I assume the idea is to be able to conjure just the arrows without having to summon the bow. However, I find it funny that the spell gives zero experience for casting it. It's like everything added in this creation was done so with a monkey's paw. Everything's implemented in a way to make you think that it's actually a display of rebellion from the poor person forced to make this thing. The College of Winterhold likely starts for most people with being recommended by spell merchants to head up to Winterhold to visit the college. Unlike Riften and Whiterun, Winterhold is now a minor settlement, meaning that the city doesn't have walls, and also no carriage service to help you leave Winterhold on survival mode. The city is in a state of ruin, and you can pretty quickly pick up that there is some animosity between the citizens of this town and the college. 80 years ago, the bulk of the city of Winterhold collapsed so hard into the ocean that it literally stopped existing outside of a couple rocks. So somehow after a nuclear apocalypse in 200 years, I can still find stuff that's untouched from the pre-war era in Fallout, but a landslide in 80 years and the town is just gone out of existence, despite there being Nordic architecture that has lasted 5,000 years. 
And that isn't even considering the fact that Winterhold used to be the capital of Skyrim, a city that could rival Solitude. Oh, well, Solitude in the lore. Solitude in the game, a capital city with an age of thousands of years, is smaller than frontier settlements on a recently colonized island. I think the question is, where's the wall? Every other major city in Skyrim has a wall, except I guess Winterhold fell below the population threshold so the Elder Scrolls Central Bank came and foreclosed on it. Honestly, this is probably a pretty big part of the reason why ESO has dodged around letting players visit Winterhold. Because otherwise, the implication is that Winterhold, capital of Skyrim, had no wall throughout the thousands of years of political conflicts and wars that embroiled Skyrim. Or maybe the wall just happened to be right on the section of cliff that collapsed. Maybe that's what these rocks are, the old wall. And so what is left of Winterhold is actually the outlying city built outside the walls, although that begs the question of how anyone even actually survived then if the majority of the city proper just fell into the ocean. I bring all this up now because I want to get it out of the way because the story of the College of Winterhold has nothing to do with the Great Collapse. No, that's right. Skyrim was the game that caused this Great Collapse, set up this conflict, and then does next to nothing with it. It's a big deal that no one at the College is looking into. The ocean battered the city and destroyed the cliff face simply so that the Nords of Winterhold would hate the College. Something that a single book on this topic mentions was already starting to happen after the Oblivion Crisis? Here's a better guess. Bethesda realized it was a lot of work making another major city and had some mirroring going on between the five existing major cities, so Winterhold had to be demoted into oblivion. But why not then make the story about this plot point? Let's explore what actually happens, which starts when we reach the far end of Winterhold and are confronted by a high elf woman named Feralda, who is busy gatekeeping the college. She has the only very hard persuasion option in the game which is to convince her that we are worth letting into the college without doing her test. I feel like Bethesda keeps fumbling this ball. Like, do they realize that you generally don't have to be enrolled in a college to visit its library? Like, what if I just wanted some enchanting services, one of the few things keeping them in touch with the rest of Skyrim? Funnily enough, there is a main quest to get an Elder Scroll that sends you to the college, presumably as a means of introducing the faction, and Feralda will admit you into the college if you demonstrate a shout, except that also includes the part where you become a student. No, I don't want to be a student, I came here for information on the Elder Scrolls. And remember Inthir, who usually lives on campus but leaves to go to the inn for the duration of that quest? Well, they could have just set this part on the college if the player was allowed to visit the common areas and the library, but not the halls where the wizards live. It's a routine problem because Oblivion had the same issue, where the main quest had you visit the university, but they didn't want to let you into the campus early, so they compromised by having the NPCs do something they don't ordinarily, so you can meet them. Feralda generally asks you to demonstrate the ability to cast one of a couple spells, which she's willing to teach you for a mere 30 gold, which is far cheaper than buying it from a court wizard. Now, I only did this particular quest line once on my mage character, and she had to visit the college early for training, so... Unfortunately, the one character I played who maxed out their speech skill did not pass the one persuasion option in the game requiring that maxed out speech skill. It confuses me, because why bother offering a way to bypass this? I mean, it's nice to have options, typical Bethesda would just force you to complete the encounter or walk away, but why is this the encounter that has a level 100 persuasion check? That's the kind of persuasion check where you convince the villain to kill themselves. You cannot prevail against me. I will outlast you, mortal. Kill yourself! <laughs> and why is it more difficult to convince Feralda to let us skip the test than literally any other persuasion check in the game? It's easier to convince my wife Yasolda to let me owe her gold for an engagement ring and tell me where my wedding is located than it is to trick Feralda into thinking I'm a scholar or a member of an important political establishment. Which I am by the way. And hell, what about scholars who aren't magically inclined? People who have a passion for history but can't get it up magically? Does the college just say no to those kinds of people? I know this is a weird criticism, because people will think I should be praising Bethesda for getting the magical faction off to people who can cast magic, but one, the barrier of entry is extremely low, and two, this is only one of four instances of mandated magic, the others being novice level destruction and restoration spells one of which every player in the game starts with. If Bethesda was so inspired by Bioshock, why not actually emulate the plasmids? 
One of the uses of plasmids in that game was to bypass a door that had been frozen over. Skyrim actually does this, but why not do this all the time? It's Skyrim, and the ancient Nords had powerful wizards, so a little bit of ice magic doors and dungeons could go a long way to make them interesting. It is as though Bethesda took in the criticism that Oblivion's Mages Guild could be done by barbarians, and so they have attempted to appease players by saying, Fine, here's your magic test that can't be completed with scrolls, the magic faction requires magic, are you happy? It's a step in the right direction, but it's hardly a replacement for faction ranks and skill requirements, which seems all the more reasonable to implement now than before. I mean, think about it. Every faction could have radiant quests the player could go do to train up their skills. Perhaps ranking up requires your aggregate skill level of the faction skills to be at a certain point. Instead of expecting the leader of the college to have a single magic skill at 90 for the faction, just say that their overall magic skills should cumulatively add up to 250. There is zero reason why the companions should have tolerated my magical antics, why the Thieves' Guild should have tolerated my lack of subtlety, or why the College of Winterhold should tolerate me being an ice-brained moron. Honestly, having played three characters, the game works a lot better if you play a character engaging with the faction's intended mechanics than a single one-size-fits-all character doing everything. Todd loves the idea of people being able to switch up their playstyle on the fly and not have issues with that, but I think that has only made the experience worse. It's a lot better to start a new character who does magic than it is to try and pivot Shoring Hardheart into being a magic character, and vice versa. Skyrim's perk system does not create more freedom of choice, rather it is cement that locks your character playstyle in place. Nothing is greater evidence than Bethesda's two attempts to ameliorate this problem. Skyrim's patch 1.9, which came out in March of 2013, would be one of the final patches of the Standard Edition and added legendary skills. The idea is that when you max out a skill, you can legendary it, resetting it to level 15 and giving you all your perk points back. However, this is a horrible solution to the problem of not being able to refund your perk points. Say destruction is your only offensive skill, and you want to reset it so you can augment your lightning damage instead of fire. Not only do you lose the perks making your magic better, but you also lose the ability to buy the perks that you actually wanted. Now in theory, legendary skills allow you to level up forever, something people seem to have an issue with. Why did Bethesda feel the need to add this system? It's like all that mattered to Bethesda was making the biggest game possible, but it's not worth sacrificing quality in your mad quest for quantity, not to mention there's a better way to make an RPG with a near endless amount of content. Now of course, I know why Skyrim's leveling is like this, I know why it's so boring and mundane, it's because you can do however many of them your schedule permits. Because there's no level cap, you can get literally every perk. The reason this is the case is because, therefore, leveling never ends. Never-ending levels give people less reason to start a new playthrough, as opposed to just chugging along on theirs. And the longer their single playthrough lasts, the more advertisable the game is. The more advertisable the game is, the more people are likely to buy it. And when people buy Bethesda games, guess who gets money? Yeah, Zenimax. The third thing I dislike- That is the strangest reason to think Bethesda added a system, especially post-launch. Like, was Todd in the design meeting saying how he wanted the player to be able to infinitely level up, but they would only add it a year and a half after launch? Actually, the opposite seems true. And I think the thing that folks may not grasp is, given how many perks there are, that you, when you finally hit, you know, the level cap, that you're not going to have gotten to, you know, a quarter of all of the perks out there. So there is a ton of stuff still untapped and certainly a big reason to go back and replay the game. Because a lot of the power is in the perks, we want to be giving them out at a higher rate when you're playing. So we do we do talk about this as a 1 to 50 game. I mean, I'd have to go, once we play it more, the, the actual, like, maximum, depending on your particular character, how it works out, might be 75. You know what I mean? It might be 75. I don't really know. Yeah. We don't. I'm just saying we don't code in. This is the maximum level. Right. It'll right. end up wherever it ends up. The idea of leveling forever is actually impractical and would be obviously so if anyone ever played past level 45. For starters, the way leveling works in Skyrim is that doing actions grants you skill experience, and then when that skill levels up it grants you character experience for your overall level. When you level your character, you get to add 10 points to your health, magicka, or stamina, and you get one perk point. However, the amount of experience you need to level your character goes up each level with some complicated formulas dictating the amounts. The amount of character experience that is granted by leveling skills is also variable. 
The point of this is that leveling your destruction from 15 to 16 provides less character experience than leveling destruction from 99 to 100. But since the amount of experience needed to level also increases, it means that using legendary skills to level infinitely has diminishing returns. Leveling in Skyrim can go from multiple levels per hour to multiple hours per level. That is why my character that played Skyrim comprehensively including many side quests, dungeons, and creation club content only reached level 68. Sure, there are infinite levels and infinite radiant quests to do, but it's extremely unrealistic. And then there's the small detail that perks are an 8-bit integer. See, the way integers work is that when they reach their maximum value, they roll over back to 1. We don't usually run into this issue anymore since integer values have become so high and methods exist to simulate bigger numbers. However, because perk points are an 8-bit integer, their maximum value is 255. Get to level 257 without spending any perk points. Good luck with that. And watch as all your perk points disappear. Again, this is unrealistic, but I think the fact that there are only 251 perks in Skyrim is a sign that Bethesda may have been cognizant of this extremely arbitrary and weird limitation. However, the max level in base Skyrim is 81 if you don't use legendary skills. So this means that any one character in Bethesda's original design can only get one third of the possible perks. In an interview, Todd Howard guessed the max level would be somewhere around level 75, which is remarkably close to where it ended up being. That means at that point in development, players would only be able to get 74 of the 251 potential perks. My point with all these is worrying about players leveling up forever is like worrying about someone manually walking across Daggerfall. Like, yeah, someone actually spent 69 hours doing that. But it's hardly something the average player will do. Actually, wait, if it only takes 69 hours, then it may actually be faster to walk across Daggerfall than it would be to reach level 252 without exploits. However, there is more about legendary skills I want to mention. Skyrim is not a game that was designed around having your skill levels reset, and many skills have issues. Combat skills being reset can result in the oblivion problem of not being able to fight scaled enemies. You can't get XP from learning ingredient effects, you can't get free levels from skill books the second time around, since leveling slows down that means that training also slows down since it's limited per level. Did you know that lockpicking won't level from the same lock twice? This means that there is an upper limit on the amount of times you can level your lockpicking. Pickpocket is also limited since most items don't respawn in NPC inventories. Remember how my lockpicking only reached level 96 on a comprehensive playthrough? Leveling without grinding seems practically balanced around only doing it once. And since the number of skills is already so trim, there are hardly any redundant skills worth going legendary. The only instance where it was useful was maxing out my smithing, making full sets of Daedric items I would want and tempering everything I wanted, then refunding all the perk points. This was a big deal for me because... <laughs> magic in Skyrim, man. Because you only gain perk points from leveling, this means that each character has a limited selection of perk points to spend. The other solution Bethesda provided to the perk problem is the end reward of the Dragonborn expansion, which is the ability to spend Dragon Souls to refund perk points. However, it's arguably the end of Skyrim, as most people are going to do this last and won't hang around to do infinite radiant content or usually even the side content that the game offers. And a lot of reviewers don't even ever talk about Dragonborn, which is weird because it's like that's the opportunity Bethesda had to show that they were doing something different. This feels like a much more viable way to move your perk points around based on your playstyle. Like if you decide you want to do melee, you can refund your destruction points without actually resetting your destruction skill. No, I will not fucking reset. This feels like a much more viable way to move your perk points around based on your playstyle. Like, if you decide you want to do melee, you can refund your destruction points without actually resetting your destruction skill, allowing you in the future to set your perk points back if you decide to do magic again. I mean, I don't approve of the low commitment lifestyle, but of the two solutions offered to the problem of perks being permanent and locking your playstyle, this one works a lot better and actually came first. But is leveling better than Oblivion? Well, sure, but that isn't a point in favor of Skyrim. Leveling in Oblivion was catastrophically bad, taking the worst elements of Morrowind's system and exacerbating the problem in almost the exact perfect way to drive min-maxers absolutely fucking insane. It's like when developers add things to their game that screw over speedrunners. I can say that trying to min-max in Skyrim was a lot easier, but also a lot less rewarding for the effort. 
My general goal was to use training every single level to train up the most tedious of skills, which I managed to accomplish. However, there is no attribute progression, the results of a min-max Skyrim playthrough are mostly just hitting higher levels than you would if you had just played the game normally. There are a lot of interesting meta goals with a character you can accomplish in Morrowind and even Oblivion. For instance, it's popular to try and achieve the highest amount of health possible with a single character. Because Skyrim simplifies health progression down to deciding which color of juice you want to level up, that's not a very fun goal anymore. Attributes needed to be fixed from Oblivion, not removed. And it's interesting to see how many RPGs have kept attributes around despite Skyrim's actions like The Outer Worlds, Cyberpunk 2077, and Fallout 4. Fallout 4 obviously has an asterisk, however, because it's basically the inverse of Skyrim. Attributes, but no skills. Did you know that the Skyrim tabletop wargame actually has character attribute values? I actually burst out laughing when I saw that and was sad that I couldn't share the joke with anyone for over a year. So back at the college, we do Feralda's little test and she lets us in, doing some magic that opens the gate. We are directed to speak to a woman named Mirabelle who is busy having a discussion with the Thalmor liaison, although it's one of those conversations that's supposed to allude to something bigger but we're never told what. What decision has Mirabelle made that Ancano objects to? I think the idea is that this is supposed to create the illusion that the college existed before our arrival, but it's exactly that, an illusion. I doubt the designers could answer my question about what the decision was, the conversation simply has to make you think that this is another day in the life here. Mirabelle gives us an extremely slow tour as I usually freeze to death on modded playthroughs, and she gives us a free set of novice magic robes. After this we're sent to our first lesson which is conveniently about to start no matter when we arrive. Skyrim is perfectly capable of creating timed quests, and perhaps the greatest way to sell the idea that this is an educational college would be to have Tolfdir do lessons every day at 2pm. Then if you miss class or are late, you could have cheeky dialogue about it. It wouldn't take up that much extra space, but would go a lot farther into making me think that this is a college than a partial, vague conversation between Mirabelle and Uncano. Tolfdir is giving a lesson to the other apprentices and makes the classic blunder of allowing the students to dictate the tempo of the class. The other students want a practical lesson, and when it comes time for our input on what should be taught, the answer is always practical. The other students outright tell Tolfdir to ignore our choice if it's anything other than what ends up happening, so... Why bother? It's not like we can earn brownie points with Tolfdir by sucking up to the professor on the first day. Tolfdir's lesson is on wards, although I'll talk about them more later. Even if we're the one student in the room who did not want to do this, we are made to do the practical demonstration anyways. Like the one time in my life I was asked to do a practical demonstration at school, it was on lifting form for squats because I had two years of weightlifting class with that coach. This is where I actually appreciate being asked to cast magic, even if Spellbreaker can bypass this part. Unlike the door exam that locks off key services for no reason, it makes sense that we can't progress the faction without possessing some basic magical acumen. It would be better if the player could fail, though. A common issue non-magical characters have with this quest is that they'll run out of magicka between being asked to cast the ward and Tolfdir throwing the firebolt at you. Maybe instead of waiting until the player can successfully cast it, Tolfdir instead gives us some suggestions on how we can improve our ability to maintain a ward. Like what a teacher would do with their student. Tolfdir decides that it's time for a field trip, so we're going to one of Skyrim's most significant historical sites to assist with the operation. This is as far as I'm aware the college's only archaeological endeavor, being performed within a stone's throw of the college itself. It's not entirely a bad thing, such a situation could be used to say that the college is not at a good point, like they don't have the resources to fund expeditions to more sites in Skyrim. But nobody ever brings it up, it's instead treated like this is just business as usual. So the standards are not only low, but have been low long enough that nobody even knows that things could be better. Skyrim is full of ancient sites that are actively being pilfered and destroyed by adventurers, and nobody at the college really cares. Another thing is that the element of this being a Nordic site isn't brought up. It being a burial crypt is, but nobody ever says, hey, the Nords hate us, why are we even bothering to study their ancient history? The Nords claim to care about their cultural heritage, but have barely preserved their own history. There are Dwimmer ruins and mysteries about the Falmer we could be researching, instead of learning about these savages who actively hate us. So Tolfdir is all, 
Go find some magical artifacts and don't come back until you do. Talk to Arnie Olgain if you need more direction. We find a necklace on a wall that traps us in a room and Tolfdir, Mr. Safety, tells us to shoot magic at the wall. Sounds like a fast track to getting vaporized, but it actually works out, which... Is, okay, so the ancient Nords didn't want us here, right? But why would you bother with the magic necklace wall that gets destroyed by magic when you could, I don't know, use a normal wall that's like 20 feet thick? Imagine this lot trying to figure that one out. So Tolfdir heads inside with us and we fight some Draugr for a bit until we reach a big room that's stacked to the ceiling with dead. Who knows what for? And Tolfdir decides, you know what? No, you do the rest of this dungeon without me. We do, and Tolfdir eventually shows back up right before we find anything significant so that he can put on his resume that he was present for a discovery. Why even bother with not having Tolfdir for part of the dungeon? Why not just have him come all the way with us? It just comes off as though Tolfdir's trying to avoid fighting, which he isn't. He's actually a pretty cool grandfather. So we find a giant orb and a Draugr that won't die unless Tolfdir drains the orb's power, so we kill him and get a unique staff and necklace and also this giant orb that does nothing but really needs to be pondered. Ah, <sighs> god. I'm sure that joke won't be horribly out of date by the time this video comes out. Oh yeah, did I mention that at one point time stopped and we had a vision of a high elf wizard claiming to be from the Sigic Order and was super vague? Because that happened. He doesn't contribute anything other than saying that we are the chosen one and will solve whatever problem gets created as a consequence of finding this hallway. Right, so the things we found. The necklace is part of a quest where you find three parts and then fight a boss rush to retrieve an amulet. The basic story is that there was a guy named Galder who had this powerful amulet, so his three sons murdered him and stole it out of jealousy and used it to wreak havoc, until High King Harold put them down and restored the piece, then sealed away the pieces of the amulet. One of these amulets being present at Sarthal poses a potential continuity issue, since Yurik was sealed in the ruins I presume right in front of the Eye of Magnus, which apparently King Harold and everyone involved saw no use for and subsequently resealed. Just have us fight Jirik and then he, in the battle, blows open a wall that reveals yet another sealed layer to the ruin with the eye inside it. The Galdir amulet quest involves a book and a dark elf who died looking for it, but the end reward is kind of pathetic. It literally just fortifies health, magicka, and stamina by only 30 points. You know, if you want me to buy your story that the three sons murdered their father out of jealousy, maybe you should make the actual amulet powerful? There's also Jirik's staff, which is only notable because it has a lightning effect but uses the restoration staff model, providing some minor novelty. There's also a word wall here that teaches you a word of ice form, yet another reminder that the main quests exist and you should really try unlocking some of those dragon shouts. Finally, you have the Eye of Magnus, the main attraction. We actually don't know that's what it is yet, but Tolfdir figures it's important and tells us to inform the Archmage at once of this discovery. Ah, please don't tell me that another one of the apprentices has been incinerated. I have enough to deal with right now. Archmage Aaron thanks us for informing him and instructs us to begin researching the discovery in the library, gives us a staff of mage light, and raises our rank from student to apprentice, although that last part I only know from reading the wiki. I do not remember it. Skyrim got rid of faction ranks, which were only really flags for achievements in Oblivion anyways. Faction ranks were a really good way Morrowind had to make sure players could handle properly escalating quest difficulty. If you were low level, you would not qualify for faction ranks, which in turn meant that you probably couldn't handle high level quests anyways. It's a good principle, but with scaling enemies comes an implicit belief that any player can handle any challenge. Add on top of that the decreasing quest line sizes, 9 quests, 8 if you don't count the quest that tells the player the college exists. We're already a third of the way through the quest line. Now you might be thinking, here's the part of the video where we have a tangent about magic. Wrong. It's actually probably going to be more accurate to say there's a tangent about the College of Winterhold in my section on magic because I have a lot to say about this. I've been having mixed feelings about Skyrim magic for over a decade, and usually my YouTube therapists can resolve a lot of the apprehension I feel about media. But most YouTubers seem to play stealth archers or sword and board and may at best play some kind of hybrid build of magic. This means that feeling of apprehension was never resolved and in turn has been something I've kept bottled up for a while. You could say it's my character motivation for starting this channel. So where do I even start with Skyrim magic, other than my character? Each character was generally built around their playstyle. Shoring used a little restoration magic and Magler used a little illusion magic, but Delta Fear was purely a mage. Every arrow I got was put in a chest or sold. Weapons were handed off to followers. 
There is a chicken and egg situation with Pure Mage playstyles. Bethesda doesn't really cater to it because their primary audience clearly prefers swords and bows, so Bethesda doesn't create good content for it. In turn, an audience never forms because there's no good content, so there's no audience, so Bethesda doesn't create the content. Nobody's passion seems to be magic-oriented. Pretty much every advancement to the magic system was a side effect of the other system's additions. The first would be the hand system, inspired by Bioshock. In a desire to cater to an audience that wants dual wielding, they added a system where each hand could be assigned a different weapon or spell. It's weird that that system never translated to Fallout 4, actually. It seems like dual wielding guns in the Commonwealth is an obvious conclusion. In theory, this means that each hand could be casting a different spell. In VR, each hand could be used to target different enemies with those different spells. It's actually kind of cool. In practice, however, each school of magic has a nearly essential perk called dual casting. Despite Bethesda's hints and interviews, this does not result in a Magicka style system where you mix two spell effects to create a new spell. We're really, really happy with how the magic plays in the game, uh, both visually and mechanically, and then being able to do it with both hands, that there are opportunities there for combinations and things you can do. In Magicka, you could combine the fire effect with the earth effect, and kablam, you got a fireball. I cast fire in the right hand, and summon Atronach in the other, and now I have a flame Atronach. No, nothing cool like that. All spell effects are pre-baked, similar to the previous games, but since there's no spell crafting, that means that the toy box is literally just whatever Bethesda has cooked up. Which seems backwards, because the other playstyles were literally expanded into having many combinations and options with weapon crafting and enchanting. Uh, are you going to be able to craft spells, potions, and other items? We do have a lot of crafting. We do have crafting within each discipline now. We do have smithing, uh, enchanting is back as a skill, and then alchemy, we're sort of treating as a... It doesn't matter that much anymore, but it is, it is in our stealth category. Though we have sort of a blended skill list, so alchemy is the most magical of the, of the stealth skills. And then we have lots of other things that are not skill-based that you can craft, that we're messing with from cooking and things like that. It's funny because the interviewer had to ask about spellcrafting again. I know one thing that when I was down to see you guys at the studio that you were still kind of exploring stuff related to how spells would interact with each other. And I would suspect that results of your experimentation on that stuff would affect whether you have anything that's like spellcrafting, right? Yeah, spellcrafting is kind of, it's a real wild card thing that we've done a lot. And there, there are pluses and minuses to it. We'd like to find... We have some ideas that we really like and how to solve that, and I don't know where that's going to go. But the thing that we don't like about the previous systems that we've done is it becomes very spreadsheety, where it takes the magic out of magic. I'm going to summarize the rest of this. Todd has a long bit where he describes how the different destruction effects worked, which is my job, Todd. Our, our main goal is to make magic feel like this arcane powerful thing and once it goes into a spreadsheet in the game where you can just say i want something at this distance and this power it removes the illusion of like how this stuff actually works so todd is somehow of this impression that spellcrafting ruins the illusion of magic but that grinding out your smithing skills so you can make your weapons and armor better is fine for combat we're really really happy with how the magic plays in the game uh, both visually and mechanically and then being able to do it with both hands that there are opportunities there for combinations and things you can do without getting into th the spreadsheet aspect of it which i do know some people like but it, it does take away from the impact of the, of the spells that you're finding and, and mechanically how they work if, if that makes sense Right, because the other playstyles don't figure out mechanically how they work, and magic playstyles won't figure out the mechanics of how their gameplay works over the course of several dozen hours of using the exact same spell over and 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 over I get it. Spellcrafting is hard. I tried to implement spellcrafting in my own games, and no doubt ran up against the same problems Bethesda did. It's not like there's a built-in spellcrafting system to the engine you use to make the game, and spellcrafting has always just been a fancy UI of that exact system with minor limitations. The removal of spellcrafting is baffling. Nobody is going to believe this idea that because you see the numbers behind spells that the system is bereft of impact. Especially when the numbers behind weapons and armor is the core idea of how progression in these games work. So let's start with the primary way pure mages interact with the world and kill things. The Destruction School. 
It's clear they gave this school the most work as it's the most different from its Oblivion counterpart, other than mysticism, also known as just a label, right? Before, there were three types of spells, touch spells, target spells, and self spells. Now there are stream spells, target spells, area of effect spells, cloak spells, and runes. Really, stream spells replaced touch spells, and the area of effect spells were already in the game using the range parameter. Cloak spells were in Morrowind, albeit they would apply when struck rather than passively, and runes are new, so credit where it's due. In turn, however, effects have been lowered down to just fire, frost, and lightning. This means we've lost magic damage from Oblivion and are still missing poison damage from Morrowind. This has a Todd Rule of Three handprint on it. There's no doubt the idea is that fire spells are for warriors, frost spells are for thieves, and lightning spells are for mages. The trick is that while the elemental damage still works the same as bashing two numbers together and finding the difference, there's now an additional effect. Fire damage does additional burning damage, frost damage does additional damage to stamina and slows movement, and lightning damage does additional damage to magicka. This is in addition to the usual consideration of elemental resistances, however meaning that frost damage has to bear the burden of Nordic frost resistance, while in Dragonborn there is both frost and fire resistance. You know Nords used to resist lightning too because they lived up in the mountains? What constitutes the difference in these spells? Well, just a label, usually. In Oblivion, there was a really bad system of basically giving players permits for spell magnitude, so you'd create as powerful a spell as you could cast and then have to use it for 25 levels until you unlocked the next permit. Skyrim took that idea and made it worse. See, instead of fireballs being a style of spell, it is now a fixed spell. Progression then works around the idea of replacing your current daily driver spell with a new one. The novice tier spells are stream effects, and every player starts with the flame spell, which works like a flamethrower. Personally, I actually find stream spells to be more interesting than the touch spells that they replaced, and that's the extent of my praise. Pretty quickly, you'll notice that the first level perk for destruction makes your novice spells more efficient, which seems good at the beginning. Then you notice the next perk for destruction makes your apprentice spells more efficient. Apprentice spells are the target spells like Firebolt, Frostbolt, and Lightning Bolt. Again, this seems fine, but you better familiarize yourself with these particular spells because you're going to be using them for a long time. Then you start looking around. Okay, at destruction level 20 I can dual cast. It says it supercharges my spells into a more powerful version, and that's it. No details on how that works, so I guess I have to explain it for Bethesda. You can use both hands with a spell, and you get 2.2 times the effect, but the trade-off is 2.8 times the usual magicka cost. So 10% more damage, but 40% more magicka used. Seems kind of bad. Is that why they kept us in the dark on the numbers? Then at Destruction 30, I get the Augmented perks. Wait, I have to choose an element? I mean, I, I can pick multiples, but perk points are slim pickings for mages. I didn't have the luxury of boosting a second elemental effect until way into the endgame. This is a critical failure. You've locked mages into committing to an element, so all those extra effects you just offered are pointless to them because they'll do less damage than sticking with their daily driver. I picked flames for the extra health damage, which meant I had to use Firebolt, and a lot of it. Whatever stamina or magicka damage or slowdown the others dealt was pointless compared to the 25 and later 50% extra fire damage because that's it, kids. That's your extra damage and perks. Did Mr. One-Handed get a full 100% extra damage, which includes additional weapon modifiers as well as weapon crafting and upgrading? Did Mr. Stealth Archer get bonuses to his bow damage and stealth damage? Before you say, well, alchemy can fortify destruction damage, yes, I am aware. Are you aware that Mr. One-Handed and Mr. Stealth Archer also benefit from alchemy to augment their damage on top of everything else they're given? Don't worry, we'll come back to fortify destruction potions. At destruction skill 40, you get the best and worst perk of the tree, impact. What does impact do? <laughs> That. That's what impact does. I just killed a dragon without it even getting the chance to fight back. 
Impact causes enemies to stagger when hit by dual cast destruction effects. Frost damage slowing enemies, just stun lock them to death with fireballs. Lightning damage lowering enemies' magicka to reduce their spell effectiveness, no, just stun lock them to death with fireballs. Giants giving you trouble, please, not anymore. Not even fucking Shoring could stun lock a dragon to death with shield bashes. So why is this then the worst perk in the destruction tree? Because it's boring. Most enemies in the game went down without even getting a chance to fight back. It's like playing Dark Souls as the Giant Dad build, or Saitama's entire character from One Punch Man. Except unlike Saitama, I can't beat everything in one hit, so it's worse because there's no challenge, but it still takes time. It would be like if Saitama was still invincible, but hit as hard as a normal human. So, I guess Zombie Man. The best encounters in the game were when I was outnumbered, and it became physically impossible to stagger lock enemies to death. Suddenly, I was having to do things like make decisions. Personally, I would change staggers to depend on the amount of damage done compared to the overall amount of health, with impact decreasing that threshold. The basic idea is that if you do, say, a fifth of the enemy's health in damage, they should stagger, but if you only chip a little bit off, then they shouldn't. See, Bethesda made a critical mistake with the magic in Skyrim. They thought the main obstacle they had to overcome was boredom, so they made the effects flashier. They jangled the keys thinking that a good magic system has cool particle effects, and they tried to hide the numbers thinking that presentation alone is sufficient. They didn't realize the main obstacle of magic is not boredom, but apathy. Apathy is what makes me say, you know what, I'm not going to equip a ward spell. Ward spells are objectively cool. It's a magical shield that has a charge timer, meaning you can't just whip it out when you're under attack. You have to actually preempt the enemy. It is a spell for a game designed around tactical magic encounters. But generally, I have such a sense of apathy playing magic in Skyrim that most spellcasters could not stir me to use it. Kind of like how I have all these drugs in Fallout 4 and I never use them because I never seem to find the tough enemies to use them for. The only time a situation roused me into using a ward spell was when fighting dragons, and that quickly went away once I realized I could kill a dragon through staggers before he even got a word in edgewise. Skyrim has all kinds of new tactical options for magic and then goes about discouraging their usage. Why bother with all these elemental effects that have additional properties when you could stagger lock an enemy to death with high damage firebolts? Skyrim has three options for switching magic with increasing tiers of difficulty of use. That's not to say Skyrim's UI is difficult to use, but in a minute-to-minute -minute situation where I'm weighing up whether or not I want to open and use it to select spells, that is what I call the apathy threshold. Hotkeys have the lowest apathy threshold. You have 10 hotkey slots, but in combat really only 5 that can be reached without taking your hand off either the movement or aim controls. Firebolt on 1, Soul Trap on 2, Summon on 3, Heal on 4, and Potion on 5. After that, you have the medium apathy threshold of the Favorites menu. This is a new addition to Skyrim, where I press Q and a list of selected favorites pop up. However, the system is inherently flawed for mages as it shows me a little business card sized slot of information to select from. The more spells and items you favor, the longer this list gets. And since there's no custom spells, this means I can't sort the list myself, so I often have to scroll around for the spell that I'm looking for. I like the attempt, but it seems that Bethesda did not, and decided to combine favorites with hotkeys into this weird system in Fallout 4. Please, just bring the favorites menu back, but make it customizable, like in Morrowind. Favorites remind me a lot of the old Morrowind UI, which I always used instead of hotkeys because it's just so fast. Right click and boom, a fast list of all my spells and items, and spells are itemized exactly how I want while my weapons have unique icons. There's no need for a hotkey when I can find items this quickly. The only rough part was potions, and even then, Morrowind doesn't have as potion-heavy a combat as Oblivion or Skyrim. Then you have the high apathy threshold, the menu proper. Good god, I do not want to get into the UI design yet. On the one hand, it is better than Oblivion for giving me a longer list to look at. On the other, it is now so controller-focused that it's actually a pain to navigate with a mouse. It gets even worse the more DLC and Creation Club content you use, since there are more and more spells than the system was ever designed around. Destruction and Conjuration particularly suffer. You can tell the default spells the game shift with was the most the system was ever designed to handle. Speaking of, do we really need to put Conjure at the front of every spell in the interface? Like, if there was just a spell called Flame Atronach in the Conjuration section, I think I can figure out what it does. Anyways, at this point we have two options, and the Bolt spells are clearly superior. 
They rely a lot more on player skills since you have to lead targets and you have the usual concession of spending more magicka to chuck a spell at a distance than up close. It's weird that Howard talks about how there's supposed to be great variety in the playstyle. Like if I get bored of chucking fireballs at people, I guess I could switch to flamethrower mode. But then he makes it so that some spell effects are just numerically superior to others. Pretty much the only reason people use flames after getting firebolt is that they combo it with wall of flames at expert. Then you get to level 50 destruction and your second tier elemental effects and add up spells. Now in theory a low level player could get their hands on a high level spell and cast it if they have the magicka. In practice, spells only appear in leveled lists based on player level. Say you want to learn fireball and you have the requisite 133 magicka to cast it, but a low destruction level. To get a spell tome, you need to reach destruction level 40 and buy it, or player level 23 and hope to find it in random loot. So in practice, there is still a permit system to unlock better magic, it's just harder to notice because instead of being told, you need destruction level 40 to learn the spell, you just won't find it in the world until the time Bethesda wants you to find it. Which is weird because the adept spells are not improvements. 46% extra damage, for 105% extra magicka. Fireball is an area of effect spell, so it has useful applications for killing groups, but in reality, Skyrim doesn't do big groups of enemies. When it does, it's awesome and I have options, but in most single or dual enemy encounters, I'd be damaging my companions as much as my enemies. Of course, the adept spells are where they diverge the most in application. Lightning Bolt was technically different from the other apprentice spells in that its travel time is instant, but it otherwise worked the same barring the usual elemental implication. Fireball is the most familiar, it's a firebolt that explodes on impact. Ice Storm's actually pretty similar to how area spells worked in Oblivion for frost damage. You cast a projectile and then a big area travels to the target slowly, damaging everybody it hits. Chain Lightning is probably the best adept spell, it's a new effect, traveling instantly and jumping from target to target or around corners. The downside is that it costs even more magicka than fireball, so... Destruction's mid-game is a real grind. At this point, you can, in addition, get your hands on cloak and rune spells. Cloak spells do elemental damage to enemies within range, while rune spells are expensive, but you can prepare them in advance, so you draw an enemy into a hallway and then he explodes when he hits the trap. These spells can augment your playstyle, but not much really beats the apathy threshold of just sticking with firebolts. I got into a routine of using flame cloaks in addition to stagger locks for the extra damage, and if it was a boss, maybe I'd prepare a rune and then regen the magicka before starting the fight. The problem is that a firebolt is a firebolt. You can spend two perk points on increasing its damage, and then that's it. That's the game. Firebolt. 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 I don't always want to sit around waiting for my magicka to recharge after preparing a rune. Let's compare this to the system that the game is supposed to be inspired by, Bioshock. Okay, so by now you should probably see the problems. There are some core structural differences to the mechanics that makes Bioshock's plasmids fun to use. For one, throwing a fireball at somebody in Bioshock usually sets the fucker on fire and not, oh, I'm burning style fire, genuine flesh melting PTSD inducing conflagration. Not only is the effect more pronounced, most enemies die when hit with it. The trade off is that plasmids are limited by Eve, the game's magicka system. Eve does not regenerate naturally, it has to be replenished by hypos. It's a limited resource, meaning that the plasmids can be instant kills without depriving the game of challenge. You can tell Bioshock had a big effect on Bethesda because pretty much every plasmid is in the game as either a spell or dragon shout. Unfortunately, because someone at Bethesda is big on balancing the three playstyles, there is no rune which launches enemies through the air or lightning damage that instantly kills wet enemies, or fireballs that burn enemies to death. They could absolutely do that with the system they already have, it's simply a matter of asking them to do so. I personally think it would go well with my other suggestions of making melee and archery even more powerful at high level. 
Of course, that begs the question of why Magic has to be balanced with the other playstyles. Arguably, it's not. Having played all three for this video, I can handily say that Magic is actually the weakest playstyle. When Shoring was on Legendary and Maglir on Master, Delta Fear could barely crack Expert. Someone will say, of course it wasn't fun, you were playing on Legendary difficulty, but the problem is that my difficulty rules were consistent between the three playstyles. Once combat started to be easy during an average encounter, I would turn the difficulty up. This was fun for melee and mediocre for stealth, but terrible for magic. It wasn't until I started using exploits that I really started to have a similar amount of fun and actually surpass the other playstyles. There are three main exploits I want to show off before I talk about what is actually meant to be in-game magic in Skyrim. The first is free destruction magic. See, the core of magical progression in Skyrim is not about casting better magic, just casting more of it. Spells only get cheaper, not do more damage. I assume the idea is that you need to be offsetting the increasing cost of spells. Of course, it didn't take long for people to figure out how to stack fortify destruction gear to reduce their magic costs to zero. This is arguably probably not an exploit in itself, but I think they imagine that the trade-off would be that if you go for free magic in a school, it would require four enchant slots, and you couldn't have enchantments that buff health or do anything else like that. Now you can do this with any school of magic in Skyrim, usually if you're interested in exploiting your free magic to power level the other schools and get perk points, but I didn't do that. The basics of the idea is using the Fortify Restoration loop to create powerful items that cumulatively add up to reducing destruction magic to a higher than usual percent. Once you hit 100% reduction, the magic's now free. Free destruction magic was a game changer. Obviously, it takes a lot of the challenge out of the game, but for the first time I was able to play on legendary difficulty. Lots of quests were made more fun by the fact that I could spam fireballs to my heart's content. No more running out of magicka in the middle of a fight. That's a part of the problem. When Shorin ran out of stamina, there was still stuff for him to do. When Delta Fear runs out of magicka, she just gets to wait around until it recharges. By design, it inherently encourages melee hybrid builds because... If you don't have anything else to do, you could have a sword in your main hand. The problem is that it's still boring, but at least now I feel like I'm a powerful wizard. You do have to remember that at this point in the playthrough I had spent something like 40 hours spamming a single spell. I mean, less than half a year later, this is what the end game of a wizard in Dragon's Dogma is like. Ether Dynamics talks about this in his series on Skyrim. To summarize his point, Skyrim has two stages of difficulty, way too hard and way too easy. Vanilla Skyrim rarely has a comfortable stage of being challenging without being tedious or spongy. I can only speculate on what the designers thought an appropriate level of destruction cost reduction was supposed to be, that being where the spell cost reduction is enough to make combat encounters challenging without either side immediately stomping the other. Going off the pre-baked gear in the game, it would appear to be 22% spell cost reduction in addition to the 50% from the perk. I can only speculate, but the problem appears to be a lack of interest on Bethesda's part in pure mage playstyles, while also having a desire to balance these playstyles. Magic cannot be too powerful for some reason, I guess they foresaw Skyrim together. So make the expert and master level spells absurdly expensive to compensate. Lightning Bolt but renamed and does 60 damage instead of 25. How about making it cost 7 times as much Magicka? Never mind that it shows up at destruction level 65, so that's a lot of Firebolts you're going to be casting before you get the higher tier stuff. This is weird because Magicka costs in Oblivion and Morrowind were much more straightforward. More damage, more Magicka. In fact, the ratio of damage to Magicka was consistent at all levels. Bethesda took away the spreadsheety aspect of Magic because anyone with a spreadsheet would call them out on their bullshit. And the master level spells are fun, but impractical in combat applications. I couldn't usually cast these without getting staggered, and that is not factoring in their absurd magicka costs. Say I have my 22% spell cost reduction robes and my 50% master level perk because I must hate myself. Well, my napkin math here says that I would need about 400 magicka to cast this here firestorm spell. For context, that would be 30 straight levels of magicka upgrades just to cast a spell that will leave me empty, Magicka-wise, I will likely get staggered casting, and probably will not even kill anything that's a high enough level threat 
for me to justify using it. Wow, sick game. I could really see the benefits of balancing magic while playing Shoring, you know, every time I saw those mages running by, blinking everywhere, selling their portals and conjuring food, I thought to myself, damn, I wish they would go and nerf those fucking mages. All I can do is auto attack and slowly generate rage. Oh, sorry, I mixed up my notes for my World of Warcraft classic video. This is a single player game? Yeah, what the fuck are you doing? I guess while we're here, I should mention the expert level wall spells. They are stream spells, but with lasting effects, creating areas that do damage to enemies when they stand in them. They are a tactical spell and would actually be really useful if you could get them far sooner in a playthrough. The problem is that Bethesda needed an expert level effect and the other option they had was upscaled versions of the apprentice spells. I would like wall spells if there wasn't such a restrictive limit on how much fire you can lay down and also the damage number that they gave wasn't a lie. It says 50 damage, but many people have reported that it seems to be closer to 20. See, that's the benefit of getting rid of the spreadsheety elements of Skyrim magic. Now, I have to look in the editor to figure out how my spells work because the descriptions cannot be trusted. Before I want to move on from destruction magic, I want to mention my third exploit. I'll talk about the second one later. I actually discovered this one myself. So alchemy exists, and it's the primary way I think you're meant to augment your destruction magic damage. Obviously, that's silly since everyone can do it and alchemy is a stealth skill, but whatever, I'll cope. Note that all of the ingredients that fortify destruction do not list it as their first effect, so you really have to be committed to the alchemy playstyle to even know that this option exists, let alone how to do it without looking on a guide. So you grind some ingredients in your alchemy skill to make potions that mildly increase your damage, or you do the fortify restoration loop and get yourself a gear that lets you consistently make potions that fortify destruction damage 400%. Obviously, this made destruction magic rather powerful. The downside is that potions in Skyrim have set time limits, and this potion in particular only lasts one minute. So I have to carry a lot of them. And also, I should mention that potions weigh half a pound each now. Anyways, I was playing and I noticed that my flame cloak spell was hitting enemies outside of what you or I would normally expect. That's when I had the realization that cloak spells in Skyrim don't increase their damage with potions, but their range. So that powerful 400% potions increase the range absurdly. So, I did what anyone else would do with this information. I spent 3 perk points switching over to a lightning mage and getting the perk that disintegrates enemies at 20% health. And then I started clearing dungeons by popping this potion and casting lightning cloak. As I ran through the dungeon looting everything and clearing things out, I would occasionally find the piles of ash that used to be enemies, who likely died horrifically panicking that their entire body was spasming and beginning to turn into mush without any noticeable cause. I mean, at least Maglir's special shot instantly kills people without any kind of fear. I guess the upside is that they get to go straight into their burial urn. Computer, remove corpse. The reason I end on this exploit is that, effectively, it accomplishes the same thing as just going invisible and ignoring the enemies, or turning down the difficulty so everything dies in a single hit, or using the command TAI to just disable all the enemies. Elder Scrolls games have often had modular difficulties, so you could set things to the level you want them to be at. But Skyrim has never reached a comfort stage for me. I was either struggling to keep up with the other two characters, or so absurdly powerful that I often consider turning down the difficulty so I didn't have to keep taking the potion. The apathy threshold literally became the primary factor in deciding the game's difficulty. That's the sort of realization that causes me to have an existential crisis about what I'm doing, which is almost certainly not the response you want out of your video games. Or, at least, I don't think that's the intended response I'm supposed to have with this game. You know, for all the spreadsheety aspects of Morrowind, I never questioned why I was bothering to make a playstyle function. Now let's talk about restoration magic. Restoration is a perfectly valid school of magic, and don't let anyone tell you otherwise. Well, yeah, you're literally the only school of magic that Nords tolerate. I would have laughed if she was an alteration trainer. Or mysticism, but she didn't actually do anything. Restoration magic in Skyrim is super basic. You can heal yourself or allies, you can cast wards, which are still cool, and you can turn undead. Dawnguard added some spells that did sun damage for fighting the undead, and Dragonborn added a poison rune spell. Restoration is still a shadow of its former self, so it's a testament how important healing magic is that it retains its popularity. Every player starts with a healing spell and 100 magicka, so it's only natural that people are going to be tempted to try out restoration magic, even if there is a plentiful supply of health potions in Skyrim. See, Oblivion and Morrowind would have the players start with different levels of magicka based on their character, so if you didn't express an interest in hybrid builds at the start of the game, you usually would not have enough magicka or a sufficient skill level to cast useful healing magic. 
I have mixed feelings towards this change. Players who don't invest in magic will get 80 points of health from healing and the novice perk in restoration halves the cost and will up this number to 160. Restoration magic being useful might encourage more people to try magic and express interest in the playstyle, but making it too accessible takes away the fun of investing yourself into the heal slut lifestyle. It does not take a lot in Skyrim to make Restoration God tier, which sets a bad precedent if players decide to try the other schools of magic and realize that they're all underpowered by comparison. Turn Undead is basic and consistent. The different tiers of the spell just exist to increase effectiveness. Wow, weird, I thought we weren't doing that anymore. I thought Novice Turn Undead was supposed to be a stream effect, and Apprentice Turn Undead would be a bolt, and an Adept Turn would be an explosion. It can be annoying because it's very easy for the undead to outlevel your ability to use this spell, plus turning undead is a meme effect. Some spellcasting companions would have it, and in all honesty all it did was slow down the combat even more. It's the same problem fear has, there's no point in crowd control if there's rarely ever a crowd to control, and most of the enemies that it's useful to fear will almost always be higher level than you can affect. Like thanks, I really needed the ability to make the low threat enemies run away from me. The ward spells are, as I described, a short charge up time and then they'll block magic and fortify your armor rating. They're cool spells, but I think they could stand to be something like 25% cheaper to cast. And also they should provide increasing amounts of stagger resistance so it isn't so easy for enemies to break the ward effect. I would also change the effect to appear more orderly the higher level the spell is to visually communicate how strong it is. It starts with the frayed appearance but the final form should have very clean edges. They are still an interesting new idea and very much welcome, it's just that Skyrim cut three or four spells for every new one that it added. The heal spells are divided into tiers, but you really don't need to go beyond fast healing and heal other. This is because with three perks you can make restoration spells more powerful than you will need. Respite if you use stamina, regeneration for 50% more power, and dual casting. This combination plus the cost reduction perks up to Adept was more than sufficient for an entire playthrough of healing. Of course, Restoration has more perks worth mentioning, like two perks that boost Magicka recovery rates, a perk that makes wards absorb incoming Magicka, and a perk that restores 250 health if you hit 10% health once per day. Also, I have to mention the Necromage perk. 25% restoration strength against undead, and 50% spell duration. Sounds boring, right? Like a perk that's designed for the spell Turn Undead. Well, the player can become undead by becoming a vampire, and yes, it does exactly what you may be starting to think it does. It fortifies passive restoration effects by 25% and durations by 50%. It also makes destruction spells more powerful against the undead, and boosts your ability to reanimate dead minions. This feels like a massive oversight and kind of hints that maybe Bethesda wasn't thinking about vampires when designing base Skyrim. Like, wouldn't it be cool if the player could no longer use normal healing magic and had to use special undead healing spells that Dawnguard adds because normal restoration magic now hurts undead people? A good thing about restoration, which actually applies to magic in general in Skyrim, is that they factored in that magicka should affect the amount of XP you get. In other words, Instead of getting 0.6 experience for every spell cast of a restoration spell, like in Oblivion and Morrowind, and having to cast 7,500 restoration spells to max the skill in Oblivion, it's much easier to level restoration by just using more powerful magic. So after you've dabbled in baby's first magic, you may be tempted to learn what else is out there. How about a school of magic that's built around buffing yourself before combat? Welcome to Alteration, the next school of magic that will be cut in Elder Scrolls VI. With Alteration, you can buff your armor rating, create magic lights, breathe water, transmute, detect things, telekinesis, and paralyze. That's less effects than mysticism had in Oblivion, and I don't think at this point I need to remind you that what happened after that. People see, okay, we've removed mysticism, but that's just a label, right? Those spells go into other skills, and then it gets deeper within those skills. Flesh spells increase armor rating, which can be important for mage characters who are probably going to be wearing robes. There is no mandate, however. Skyrim got rid of spell effectiveness, an addition of oblivions that made it so that wearing armor would decrease the point values of magic. We're back to mages deciding if they want to wear armor based on weight, so there's no reason not to wear as much armor as possible in addition to the robes and to improve your gear. I mean, technically there is a perk called mage armor that can double and eventually triple the value of flesh spells, but the big issue is again that apathy threshold problem. 
A smaller but present issue is that there are some Dragon Priest masks you might want to use that have armor ratings, meaning that if you intend on using Mage Armor, you're also intending on not using any Dragon Priest masks. The Dragonborn masks even going so far as increasing your elemental spell damage. As to the bigger issue, Armor spells last exactly one minute, and then you have to reapply them. It definitely provides a tactical element to the game, no doubt, but so did shield spells back in Oblivion. The issue is that unlike Restoration, Alteration is a grind to level. All you can do is try to remember to cast flesh spells before every fight. And the funny part is, we don't have to sit around scratching our monkey brains trying to solve this problem. There was already a spell in the series that belonged to Alteration that would solve another problem, and it's called Open. There's a spell I would be casting all the time that would level this skill up. My best guess as to why they got rid of Open as a spell effect is probably Magicka Regeneration, as dumb as that sounds. They figured that because Magicka regenerates, it would invalidate lockpicks as a resource, he said, knowing full well that lockpicks are sold by many merchants in Skyrim. Seriously, just make the spell expensive and tier them the same way the locks are tiered. The novice spell only unlocks novice locks, etc. You have two light spells, Candlelight and Mage Light. The former creates a light around the player, the latter creates a ball of light that travels. I think Mage Light's a bad name for a traveling light. My immediate assumption is that that's the one that creates a light around the mage. I never use these, hence why you're watching Todd Howard at QuakeCon cast it. Skyrim is never really dark enough to merit using it, and this is one of those spells I suddenly find useful when using mods to make dungeons actually dark. Correction, I did end up using a light spell in a Dragonborn dungeon, surprise surprise, because it was dark. When you reach the mid-game of Alteration, after hours of only using the magic to buff your armor, you finally unlock the ability to detect life through walls which was a main spell effect from the mysticism school that, after the great delabeling, had to be forced into a different tree. If you don't know the difference, alteration magic is about altering the laws of reality, like changing your skin to have the hardness of rock, while mysticism is about manipulating magical forces in the world, like being able to trap souls and detect life auras. So, detect life being an alteration spell mildly does not make sense. Also, it's kind of a bad spell. It's a useful effect for stealth characters, but it's needlessly expensive and is a constant cast effect rather than an applied effect. And most stealth characters won't get the spell because ideally they won't need the armor rating and definitely won't need the light of the earlier spells. And there's also Aura Whisper, which is infinitely better. At the expert tier, in the end game, you can get a spell to detect the dead and also paralyze, a former illusion effect. I guess now instead of tricking people into being paralyzed, they're just physically paralyzed. Except if you have the Creation Club, which adds a spell from the Bethesda game jam called Paralyze Rune, which lasts two less seconds, but is much cheaper to use and also applies an area of effect. This is actually one of the most broken spells in the Anniversary Edition, if only because the game usually tries so hard to stop the player from having powerful magic this cheap. I mean, hell, you could get a short Paralyze effect by Adept level in Illusion back in Oblivion. Which was fun, because Oblivion was the game that added Havoc physics, so instead of NPCs freezing in place, they would fall over. That's cool. I think the problem is that Alteration doesn't offer a good value proposition up front. If you don't use the wiki, it can be hard to know if there are even fun effects in the Alteration tree. Like Telekinesis. I had this spell for the entirety of the Thieves Guild playthrough and I never used it, which is unlike how it was in Morrowind where telekinesis was constantly useful for theft and bypassing traps. The only notable thing over Oblivion telekinesis is that it can now hurt people, so people will record themselves killing NPCs with various thrown objects. Otherwise it mostly exists for people looking for fast ways to level up alteration. Speaking of. Transmute is a new effect which converts iron ore into silver and silver ore into gold. Since they nerfed the iron dagger smithing training, one of the new metas is crafting jewelry since anyone can do it. But you need lots of gold ingots to do it and there's only one gold mine. Transmute can fix that problem, helping you train both alteration and smithing in the process. This was the closest that Skyrim came to grinding magic back in Oblivion, since I set up a macro to repeatedly cast the spell for about 15 minutes. But that time pales in comparison to the hours of macro training that I did in Oblivion. The only problem is that Bethesda seemed cognizant of this and scripted Transmute's XP value to be 15% of what it should be. It should give you 100 XP per cast, but it only gives you 15. The game does not communicate this fact. In fact, Transmute Ore is the only spell in the game that has this stipulation. 
It could be fine if Bethesda wanted to try and prevent people from macro casting magic to level, but the fact that there's no communication in the game about it means that instead of preventing people from doing it, you're just wasting their time. Because unless they consult a wiki, they wouldn't know about the XP nerf. But hey, at least the game's not too spreadsheety. Why even bother putting the spell in the game? It only creates really bad lore implications and apparently stresses at Bethesda that somebody's going to sit around casting a spell repeatedly, which is... that That's fine in my opinion if you want to prevent that. I think Elder Scrolls only stands to benefit from actively discouraging people from sitting in corners and grinding, thinking that this is an appropriate answer whenever I call out a bad progression system. But then maybe you should do something like make Alteration more appealing to use? Alteration before could do Feather Spells, which is basically the same as Fortify Carry Weight. Seems like an appealing little effect that could have multiple spell tiers that would really encourage people to try the tree out. The fourth school of magic to cover is Illusion. The school is mostly unchanged from Oblivion. They added a spell that reduces the noise players make when they move, but they removed Command and Silence spells. Command makes sense. In Oblivion, you could force AI to fight for you, but it was expensive and kind of annoying to do, and the effect had lost all of its luster from Morrowind, where you could use the spell to relocate NPCs to move into your house. It seems the thought process was that players can recruit a variety of NPCs as hirelings in Skyrim, and Command generally messed with Radiant AI, so it would either have to be reworked or removed, which is a shame because both DLC expansions involve the idea of the player being able to magically mind control NPCs. It definitely seems like something that could have been a master level effect. Why is Bethesda so concerned about balancing magic? Silence makes a lot less sense as an effect to outright cut. It is true that it had questionable usefulness in Oblivion, since it would be easier to damage an enemy spellcaster than it would be to prepare a silence spell for usage. But that was mostly because enemy spellcasters in Oblivion were not particularly dangerous. In Skyrim, they're back to being very dangerous, potentially instantly killing you from across the room with a bolt of lightning style dangerous. And they have more spells that you might want to preempt, like wards, reanimations, and healing. I think the problem they ran up against is that silence as an effect can just turn mages off, so here's my version, provided for free and thought up on my Discord. Silence is a stream effect with leveled values. So the novice spell can affect casters up to level 6, since we can't do willpower checks anymore, although I would prefer it if it was an attribute check. You can buff the level values with a perk or by dual casting. When you cast the spell, which requires you to be close to an enemy due to being a stream effect, it prevents the target from casting magic. Ward spells can increase the level required to pass the check, but an adept mage can invalidate a novice's ward. The reason I bring this up is the concept of witch hunters in Skyrim is kind of lacking, which is a shame because this game has literal witch hunters, so creating an illusion-based counter to magic that isn't just, I calm the caster, I think could add quite a bit of tactical decision making in spell combat. The problem with illusion magic is that it can very quickly drop off in effectiveness. See, because there's no spell crafting, the core of the tree is spells with preset levels. Fury, for instance, affects NPCs up to level 6, so in the early game you can run around causing infighting among bandits. But once bandit thugs start showing up, you start running into enemies that you can't affect with fury anymore. The problem is that the spell tells you an integer, but the game tells you a string, and this means I have to gauge via trial and error what enemies are affected by what magic. Are bandit outlaws going to be affected by my spell that affects enemies up to level 9? Well, there goes Skyrim not telling me stuff again. So in this case, admittedly, the player will have to trust that we are doing what we say we are doing. Well, I don't trust you because you lie about what some spells do or you secretly change XP values of other spells. You don't have to talk about trust when you have a straightforward and consistent system like Morrowind and even Oblivion. This is an easy problem to fix. If you have an illusion spell in my hands, color code the enemies or their names to convey whether or not it can affect them. The reason level scaling can be an issue for illusion is that it completely contradicts the idea that Bethesda has about changing your playstyle through player experimentation. It is hard to just pick up illusion magic in the middle of a melee playthrough at level 30 because most enemies you'll face are just going to resist those early spell effects, which affects illusion the hardest since most of its magic revolves around the level of the target. Most of the spells are pretty straightforward and unchanged from Oblivion, although Frenzy in particular has had the biggest improvement since enemies will start fighting amongst each other much faster than they did in Oblivion, where you could cast Frenzy at an enemy and still get bum-rushed by the guy who's just now extra pissed off at you. 
Courage is interesting. I'm assuming they realized that Rally was extremely situational and decided to increase its usefulness by tying a health and stamina fortification to the effect. But it's weird that the health fortification spell belongs to illusion and not restoration. Hirelings all have different levels of aggressiveness, but honestly it's not worth keeping Benor around with Rally spells when you could just recruit a braver companion and also give them the extra health. Fear spells, as usual, are still useless when calm spells exist. Last thing I need is NPCs fleeing further into a dungeon and finding all their NPC friends. The only advantage fear has over calm is that it scales just slightly higher than calm, and I mean very slightly. I guess you can also attack a feared opponent more times than a calmed opponent if you're really digging for a reason to try and calm it why fear spells aren't that bad. And that leads to calm spells, which are personally the MVP for me. When I got bored of casting Firebolt or wanting to go through an area with a light touch, I would make heavy use of calm spells. It's confusing that they got rid of silence but kept calm, which can literally just turn all NPCs off in the middle of combat. It's still weaker than its Morrowind counterpart, because in Morrowind you could actually talk to calmed NPCs and ask them stuff. Usually they didn't have much to say, but then you could intimidate them through persuasion and they would get scared of you and no longer want to fight you even after the spell wore off. There were even merchants and trainers who lived among the bandits, and most of the base game enemies had unique names. You can do a mostly pacifist run of Skyrim, but what's the point? The game never really admonishes you even if you stand neck deep in the blood of Skyrim's downtrodden. Not that it has to, and I might actually be disappointed if I were to see some morality system in Elder Scrolls VI. Calm is mostly just an expression of boredom with Skyrim's combat to me and eventually was replaced with invisibility and later exploiting cloak spells to just clear dungeons. Finally, you have Frenzy, which starts fights. It's actually the most different because now it is considered assault to cast Frenzy on NPCs. You can still cast it from a shadowy corner for legal permission to murder people, but this is a big improvement over consequenceless murder. But it is one of those situations where people complain because something that was honestly too good in the first place has been changed into what it should have always been. Conjuration is the final tree. I saved it for last because it's the easiest and that means the spell section ends deceptively sooner. You summon things. Turn Undead got moved, it used to belong to Conjuration, and there is a lot less variety in the types of things you can summon in Skyrim. You can no longer bind armor, which is funny considering how prominent that was back in Oblivion. And for weapons, you can only bind swords, bows, and two-handed axes. And Dragonborn added daggers. We contrast that with Oblivion, which had bindable axes, bows, daggers, maces, shields, and swords, and Morrowind, which had all that, and spears, and also didn't do a weird progression with its spell effects. Summoning a sword in Morrowind can be done at level 1 with somebody majoring in Conjuration, but requires level 75 in Oblivion. I don't really see playstyles built around using bound equipment working that well in Skyrim. I've done it before, albeit during a modded playthrough, and the big issue was that even with the perk that upgrades their damage, bound swords are only comparable to, like, untempered glass weapons. The issue is that since Bound Sword is a novice level spell, that means you could get it at low level, and in turn, that means it has to do damage comparable to low level weapons because, you know, balance. The Bound Bow is pretty powerful. Since it's an adept spell, they didn't nerf it into the ground, but once you start getting comparable weapons that you can temper, it too ends up in the trash. This, to me at least, seems like another one of those cases where because nobody at Bethesda is really passionate about magic, beyond superficially adding new spell effects to make them look cooler, but those that didn't realize how changing mechanics they were more passionate about would affect other mechanics downstream. And the types of things you can summon are pretty pathetic. Oblivion and Morrowind both had decent selections of Undead and Daedra to summon. In Morrowind you could even learn to summon a Dwarven Centurion, while in Oblivion, at least with the Spell Tomes DLC, you could learn to summon Bears. Well, since I brought it up, Skyrim DLC and the Creation Club really opened the floodgates in terms of the number of creatures that you can summon again. In the base game though, you had a Ghost Dog, three types of Elemental Atronach, and a Dramora. And these are tiered out, so heavily limited to how often you can summon. Dawnguard added a small collection of Bonemen, which I think by implication are supposed to be similar to how you could conjure the dead in previous games. But that seemed like shorthand for real deal necromancy in those games, and here it actually exists. Not much to say, really. I've never found the Bonemen terribly useful. There's also the good boy Arvac, an undead horse you can learn to summon. Then Dragonborn added Seekers, a new type of Daedra that haven't been seen in the series before, and they're pretty cool. There's also Ash Guardians, but they require something called a Heartstone in order to not be hostile towards you. I guess it's neat that they are like 
Ash Atronax, but and due to the way they work, they don't contribute to the summon limit. You can always summon one Ash Guardian in addition to whatever else you have summoned. Here's the thing. Blood Moon was lame and added summoning bears, wolves, and bone wolves because Solstheim was lame and didn't have much going on magically. Shivering Isles on the flip side had tons of magic and lots of new things to summon. Hungers made a return for Morrowind. Shambles were like these weird bone creatures, flesh atronax, the Golden Saints, and Dark Seducers. Dragonborn has more of a magic focus than Blood Moon due to the return of Hermaeus Mora to the area, so Bethesda could have gone wild and included whatever creatures they wanted from past games or new creatures if they wanted to be creative. Which is where the Creation Club came in to really bail them out. Zombies, ghosts, skeletons, Daedra Courses, Golden Saints, Dark Seducers, Bears, and Liches. Okay, it's not that creative. Most everything they added was actually variations on things that already existed. Zombies are just reskinned Draugr, Liches are just reskinned Dragon Priests, etc. The creation name was misspelled on release as Necromancer Grimmery, and later misspelled as Necromancer Grimwire before being corrected to Necromancer Grim War on November 13th. Jesus. I know it's a hard word, but there's not really a good excuse for fixing it into another misspelling. See, I think Bethesda may have figured out that they didn't need to commit development time to creating an interesting variety of things to summon to two factors. The first is that they had done Oblivion, so now it was time to wind down for a while on the Daedra, and the second is that they also added reanimation as an effect, so there didn't need to be so much variety. I would counter the first by saying that more Daedra types is more enemy variety as well. Cut some character artists loose for a week and they might turn up several new types of enemies to fight or even just port over stuff like Scamps, Clanfear, Daedroth, Spider Daedra, Ogrims, or Winged Twilights from past games. You'd think to yourself, okay, Cal, not a big deal, right? That's my first assignment. Like, oh, it's a pretty small task. No, man, it is a furry cow. It is a very furry cow. <laughs> and fur is incredibly hard to do. Yeah, see? Want to know the best way to give them a break from creating furry creatures? Let them create some scaly or slimy monsters instead. This definitely screams another victim of intentional design rather than Bethesda simply running out of development time. I mean, consider how each tier of Conjuration only has one or two new spells. One new reanimation tier, one new summon. The only exception is that you get Storm Atronax and Dramora both at Expert. It practically leaps off of the design document. They penciled in the basics and they never went back to flesh it out. So, reanimation. A new, albeit slightly buggy, effect from Oblivion that was fine-tuned into a more common spell for Skyrim. The series has finally implemented necromancy as something the player can learn and perform. There are still no consequences for reanimating people's loved ones and dragging them through the streets, but, you know, baby steps with the AAA development studio. Since they work so hard on Radiant Story for Skyrim, getting people to react dynamically to player actions, I'm sure they'll be able to create responses to the player outright practicing necromancy with people's dead loved ones in the streets. Maybe people see it as a public service, since most of the time you practice necromancy, once the effect ends, their body dissolves into a pile of ash, conveniently ready for the burial urn. Mechanically, this is likely to prevent the player from repeatedly reanimating the same corpse, both to discourage grinding and to stop people from using undead bodyguards. There is a funny side effect where sometimes ash piles just are never swept up. This is Beatrid. She's married to the head of the wealthy Silverblood family in Markarth. During a quest, we got attacked and she was killed, and subsequently reanimated by our attackers. After it was over, she turned to ash, and then no one ever swept her remains up for the remainder of the playthrough. Reanimation is cool, however it is limited by the spells being tiered, with each spell having a maximum character level it can reanimate. So it's similar to how illusion can fall off in usefulness if it's not actively part of your playstyle. Worst, however, is that while you can get perks to upgrade your undead servant's combat capabilities, upgrading the spells to affect higher level corpses requires the Necromage perk, which is available at level 70 in the Restoration Tree. Also, reanimations last for one minute. This is significant because it means that spells are more useful as a mid-combat application, rather than selecting a powerful opponent from one room and using him in the next. It also means that reanimations are at an inherent disadvantage compared to summons. You could summon a flame atronach at the start of any fight and have it last longer than if you had reanimated a bandit outlaw in the previous room. They also have comparable magicka values, so as cool as necromancy is, it does not hold a significant advantage over just summoning. Now I want to mention my second big exploit that was a lot of fun, which involves necromancy and lots of it. So replacing birth signs were the standing stones, a flexible power that can be switched mid-playthrough. 
One of these is the Ritual Stone, which once per day allows you to reanimate corpses up to level 75 in a radius around you for three and a half minutes, with the limit as to the number of corpses you can raise being 100, and when the effect ends, the bodies collapse rather than dissolve. Now, this got people thinking. You could collect 10 or so corpses, use this power, and then travel outside a dungeon, wait 24 hours, then use those undead as a small army to clear the dungeon. You could then collect all the new corpses, as well as the old ones, wait another 24 hours, and continue to grow your horde. And since the level was so high, you could get some pretty powerful members of your undead army. Thalmor mages, bandit chiefs, even giants if you wanted. Well, Dawnguard added a side quest chain called the Ethereum Wars that ends in you fighting the Ethereum Forge, giving you an option of one of three items to craft from it. One of these being the Ethereal Crown, a circlet that allows you to have two standing stone effects. The way it works is that your second standing stone is stored and only activated when you wear the crown. It's mildly useful for passive stuff like having the Atronach and Apprentice sign at the same time, However, if the stone provides a power, then that power's daily cooldown resets every time you re-equip the crown. And thus, an awful, terrible idea was formed. Combine the overpowered ritual stone with an effective lack of cooldown, and observe the rise of the Lich Queen. This is actually a pretty fun playstyle. You don't actually just roll over dungeons with ease since there is an active maintenance required for collecting the bodies back into a pile so that they can all get hit with the effect. I ran Periite's dungeon which is usually a slog and it was a lot of fun having a growing horde of undead fighting for me. It would be cool if instead of working hard to ensure that nothing like this is possible in the Elder Scrolls 6, if Bethesda actually just leaned into this as a playstyle. For starters, if you implement body damage like in Fallout, then maybe that helps determine the health of members of your horde, so if their limbs get broken, you have to use magic to heal them. Or if it gets cut off, then that member has a fifth of their health pool missing and can't use that limb anymore. Maybe if they lose a leg, they have to crawl, or an arm and they aren't effective fighters, or their heads so they only perform extremely basic behaviors. And then you have to decide if they're no longer worth having in your horde. Basically, these proposals are to try and provide some measure of restraint in the playstyle while still making it something interesting to do. It should be pretty obvious why endlessly reanimating the same powerful corpses over and over would be a problem. Instead of forbidding it, why not actually make this a mechanical playstyle? The player can be an evil necromancer lord at the head of an undead army, but you have the problems typical with that. For instance, you take the limbs from one zombie and place it on another, and, well, since some of your Conjuration mains are no doubt screaming it by now, I guess I'll talk about the Master Level spells. Bethesda at least did try something new with the Master Level spells in Skyrim. Instead of just having spell NPCs sell them to you or allow you to craft them at spellcrafting stations, they're instead relegated to spell quests you have to do that you receive from their instructors at the College of Winterhold. To start with Conjuration, at skill level 90 you get a quest from Finest Gestor to get him a Sigil Stone. He gives you a quest to summon an unbound Dramora at a ritual site. Basically, unbound Daedra have no restraints, so if it decides to kill us, it will attempt to do so. We have to break its will first by repeatedly summoning and beating it in combat, and then order it to get us a sigil stone. Yes, my mistress. Summon me again, and I shall have your stone. Sigil Stone, Lord Dagon, is less than pleased at its loss. This quest reminds me a lot of the Dreadsteed quest from World of Warcraft. I was actually a Warlock main when I played, so I got to experience all the summoning quests. The Felsteed you got at level 40 was relatively simple, but if you wanted the faster Dreadsteed, you had to do a quest chain. It was lengthy, involved traveling the world to various sites of demonic importance, significant money and resource investment, and multiple dungeons requiring help from other players to complete. Obviously, the Skyrim iteration skates over preparing the ritual to summon the Unbound Dramora, so if any lesson could be learned for the next game, it would be that. You could make a quest about trying to find the resources needed to complete this ritual, a nice callback to the Oblivion main quest. 
Maybe completing this dark ritual requires a human sacrifice. Actually, if it's this easy, why did we even bother with the battle for Bruma? Let's just have the blades whip the yams on some Dramora and instruct him to get us a great sigil stone. Gestor doesn't actually need the sigil stone. Are you sure, dude? There's some major enchanting benefits to these things. Rather, it's for the Atronach Forge down in the Midden. He also gives us a spell called Flame Thrall, and now also sells the spells Frost Thrall, Storm Thrall, and Dead Thrall. The Thrall spells are permanent versions of their normal effects, allowing you to summon a permanent Atronach, or raise a permanent corpse, which, even if killed in combat, will not disintegrate. These are actually pretty cool rewards for mastering the Art of Conjuration. Not only can you make them more powerful, at skill level 100 you get a perk that allows you to reanimate two corpses. It simply became a matter of picking the right corpses for the job, and that would be some Dramora Lords. In addition to Jizargo, also decked out in Daedric gear, this means I have a serious gang of powerful minions. Don't get excited, however, because this is the peak. The Illusion Ritual spell is bugged. It requires level 100 instead of 90, so I didn't get to do it before the end of my playthrough. You have to cast a spell that lets you see some invisible books around the college. That's it. As a reward, you get the spell Hysteria and can buy the spells Call to Arms, Harmony, and Mayhem. Hysteria can make a group of enemies flee, but has a charge time where you get staggered and a level limit, so... Call to Arms improves combat skills, health, and stamina on all your allies for 10 minutes. I actually used scrolls of this spell during the Civil War quest line where there were lots of allies, but I don't know, why is this an illusion effect and not restoration? There isn't a courage component, this is just stat fortifications. Harmony makes all enemies within 250 feet stop fighting for a minute. Mind you, at this point you will have already mastered calm spells, invisibility, and muffle. It's nice that it's in the game, but this is hardly the reward for reaching skill level 100 in illusion. Mayhem are basically the entire reason to do all this. All enemies in 250 feet attack anyone in sight for one minute. Walk into a dungeon, cast mayhem, find most of the enemies dead or almost dead. Finally, I can make all of Whiterun fight each other. The problem is that these spells are not very good. That doesn't mean they should be removed, but that they should be fixed. I can't seriously imagine people at Bethesda played full magic playthroughs and then found these spells adequate rewards for sticking with illusion. More likely they simply used console commands, made sure the quest scripting was functional, guesstimated an appropriate spell cost, and then went back to their barbarian characters. The big problem is that you're basically expected to exploit equipment enchanting or spend the perk points unlocking master perks for the spell trees, but there's already such a huge perk commitment to playing magic that you'll inevitably find yourself having to level other non-magic skills just to get enough. And don't at me about legendary skills of Dragonborn, I'm talking about how Skyrim was balanced at launch and during its production. The Alteration Ritual. At skill level 90, Tolfdir will send you to a radiantly selected Dragon Priest dungeon to receive a knife called Kavazin's Fang, a knife that is apparently sharp enough to cut dragon scales, but not sharp enough to do any significant amount of damage. You then find a dragon corpse, equip the dagger, and loot the body to get a heart scale. While there is an exploit to do this, this quest basically expects you to have done enough of the main quest to have dragons will start appearing. Now I have, and dragons actually attack the college quite frequently, which is unusual because the college faculty can dish out some serious damage to dragons. It makes sense that they would target the college. If they can destroy it, they might do serious damage to the Nord's ability to resist their conquest. However, they attack singularly, which always results in their death. It's quite unusual. Anyways, while it is a shame that this quest in particular is tied to the main quest, it's not the first time this has happened in the series, since the Master Trainer quest for Mysticism and Oblivion was also tied to the main quest. As a reward, Tolfir gives the spell Dragonhide, and will sell you the spell Mass Paralysis. Dragonhide is different from the earlier Flesh spells. It will do 80% physical damage reduction for 30 seconds, instead of how the Flesh spells provide an armor rating increase. While this is more informative in what the actual impact of the spell is going to be, it is extremely expensive for only lasting 30 seconds. Also, it has a 3 second charge up time, so I'm both expected to cast it every 30 seconds and spend 3 seconds to do so. The duration can also be buffed, but still, you're much better off in my eyes sticking with ebony flesh and using armor than living the unarmored lifestyle and praying every night for Dragonhide. Mass Paralysis is as it sounds, paralyzes all targets within 40 feet for 15 seconds with a long list of enemies it won't paralyze, a 3 second wind up time and an expensive spell cost. Why bother with that when the Creation Club added a rune that paralyzes enemies in an area effect for a fraction of the cost? I told you the Conjuration Master spells were the peak. 
For restoration, call it Marintz will tell us to visit an entity only known as the Augur of Dunlane, down in the Midden. You're stripped naked. Okay. And then the Augur summons a triad of ghosts to gangbang you for a while, and if you can survive the ordeal, it'll teach you the spell Bane of the Undead, and call it will sell you the Guardian Circle spell. Bane of the Undead sets Undead up to level 30 within 80 feet on fire and makes them flee for 30 seconds. Wind up time, high spell cost, turn undead, you can guess how I feel about it. The best place to use this is the rare few times you get surrounded by Draugr enemies since when in conjunction with the Necromage and Flame Damage perks it will actually do fairly respectable damage, but that's not a very common situation. Guardian Circle. Undead up to level 35 enter the circle and flee. Fine. Caster heals 20 health per second while inside. Actually a cool idea but it only heals you, not your allies. It doesn't restore stamina, and it's bugged to actually restore magicka if you have the Atronax stone. <sighs> Rock bottom. The Destruction Ritual. Feralda gives you a book which has a puzzle to solve. Oh, how interesting. Let's read and see where this northward haunted northern coastline. Okay, near the coast. And south, Dwemer live and toil. Okay, south of the coast, but north of a Dwemer ruin. Sounds like most of Skyrim, but sure. A simple place. A shield from draft. Like a respite area. I know, Snowvale Sanctum. It's north of a bunch of Dwemer places, but right on the coastline. The haunted tomb of Yingle is even nearby. Wait, that's not it? What about, uh, Journeyman's Nook? I mean, it's not north of a Dwarven ruin, but it is to the northeast. At this stand, will mages craft so fierce the sea will boil. Wait, but I, I still don't know where to go. The poem could refer to like half of Skyrim. Hell, the place we're expected to go, Windward Ruins, is not directly north of a Dwarmer Ruin, but rather northeast of one. And it's hardly near the coast. This is what happens when someone not used to writing quest directions suddenly find themselves having to do so. It's a shame too, because it's one of those instances where clairvoyance could be a huge help, but since the quest has no quest marker, the spell doesn't actually help you. So what the fuck is the point of clairvoyance? And if it did, well, there wouldn't be much of a riddle. Cast a fire spell and you get the next part, which is a lot more straightforward with its clues. The first line obviously implies it's west of the throat of the world. The third line implies it's going to be close to the base of the mountain. The second line tells you it's going to be north of Skybound Watch. Cast a frost spell and you get part three. The third stage is again straightforward. On the west side of the river Karth, on the side of a mountain. Cast a lightning spell and it completes the book, granting you the firestorm spell, and you have to buy lightning storm and blizzard. It's unusual that the first part is so vague when the latter two parts can get you pretty close to the right place without looking it up. Firestorm is the most expensive spell in the game, and it has a three second cast time and has tapering damage based on the range of targets. It was fun one time, when I wanted to make a room full of friendly NPCs explode, but for actual combat applications it was nothing but a liability because if you want to do actual damage, the enemies have to be close to you, and if the enemies are close to you, well, they can and will stagger you while attempting to cast a spell. Same deal with Blizzard, although at least that one you're given more crowd control to work with. However, it's a frost spell and it's Skyrim, the land of frost resistance. Lightning Storm is the best of the three. You can charge it up for three seconds and then unleash a stream of plasma that absolutely wrecks things. Without any cost reduction, it costs 138 magicka per second, meaning that you can cast it for 10 seconds where you could only cast Firestorm once, but you can do 112 damage per second, whereas Firestorm would only do 337 damage flat. This is the only master spell where the charge up and costs make sense relative to the amount of power that you are putting down range. And those are the Master Ritual spells. Really, the biggest symptom that Bethesda either doesn't know or doesn't care about magic as a playstyle. When you master combat, you get weapons with huge numbers and lots of edges. When you master stealth, you become a master of guerrilla warfare. When you master magic, you get terrible spells that are extremely, extremely situational, which you've probably already used because of scrolls. So you just end up using the same magic that you were already using for the last 80 hours. But hey, I can light people on fire and at low health they run away now. But it gets worse. Simply explaining magic in the game is not adequate to really relay the pain I felt playing Pure Mage in Skyrim. There's a big reason reviewers on YouTube do not do it, and that is simply is that it's not fun. We have to talk about what it's like to level a mage, so let's briefly recall what it was like with the other characters. 
Now, before we begin, I want to pick apart another video's analysis on leveling because I want to stress that you don't have to present Skyrim dishonestly to sell the idea that it does leveling poorly. In fact, doing so only regresses the conversation because it allows Bethesda Shields to nitpick your arguments and say that Skyrim has good leveling, which it certainly does not. But if you don't fundamentally understand the system and at best only ever reach like level 30, then how can you really say you understand how leveling long term works? When you use skills, you gain points that contribute to your overall level. This is a choice between raising health, magicka, or stamina, 10 points. You don't get a major increase to your damage and survivability outside of your very first level up if you choose health and or stamina, which is a 10% increase at the base stat line, which then falls off dramatically as you go on. Why would you present it as a percentage increase when the game and even yourself moments earlier presented the stat increase as a flat number? While it is true that leveling health from 100 to 110 is a 10% increase, but 110 to 120 is only an 8.7% increase, those percentages are just side effects of a system where the attribute flatly increases by 10 every level. Bethesda isn't pulling some grand trick of scamming hit points from people. It would be like me looking at your savings account that you put $10 into every month and then I complain that you're putting less money into the account because the percentage difference between the total savings and the contribution is gradually diminishing. When in reality, you're still putting $10 into the account, the account is just getting bigger. Or saying that each brick you lay on a wall has a decreasing contribution to the overall height of the wall. The only basis of my complaint was manipulating the numbers to make your contribution look smaller than it actually is. The only reason I can imagine doing this is that Mr. Caption is seeking to present the leveling system in as bad a light as possible, no matter what it takes. And this is not the only bad argument he makes in the span of about 20 minutes. It's a shame because after this video was taken down, I remember it being better and capturing some of my feelings in a rather nostalgic light. And the first 90 minutes or so are fine, if not good. You can watch the re-upload on my second channel if you're curious, but upon re-watching it, I couldn't help but notice some horrific leaps in logic. He spends considerable time complaining about how Skyrim is bad because you might plan to level when hitting Archery 60 to get a perk, but because you can accidentally level other skills, he would either have to spend that perk point on something he doesn't want or quote-unquote waste it while he finishes leveling Archery to 60. Now I hope that anyone listening to what I have just said has played Skyrim and knows how utterly inconsequential that is. Even better if you have tried to min-max in Oblivion and Morrowind, where the simple act of running can cause you to level incorrectly. As much of a downgrade of not having full attributes is, at least I can say I've never been upset about a skill leveling at the wrong time in Skyrim like I have in the other games. Compare this to even the Fallout leveling system, where you have total control over how you progress your skills and then choose a potential perk after that. So Skyrim's bad, because you might have to sit on a perk point for a while, but fall out to Vegas, a game which will force you to level as soon as you get XP, even if it's just from giving homeless people water, gives you more control over your leveling. But sure, that's because you pick your skills and then your perks, so in this instance, if it was like Fallout, he could have leveled, then set his archery to 60, and then gotten the archery-related perk that he wanted. However, that is because Fallout uses a traditional leveling system where you get experience from actions to level and then increase your skills upon leveling. Elder Scrolls uses a non-traditional system, one that is artistically experimental. The core idea is that leveling should be dictated by skill usage rather than arbitrarily done at quest stages. A good example is how many Fallout quests will reward hundreds if not thousands of experience points at the end of a quest. The player can then level a skill they have never used based on that experience. You can become a master marksman despite having never held a gun before. Or even if you level from a quest that is just conversation and investigations, you can still level your combat skills. It's unrealistic. Of course, the moment you mention this to someone, you usually get some gremlins crawling out of the woodwork, usually responding with the argument, but it makes it more realistic. Which I say with a mocking tone because I think that's fucking stupid. Considering A, video games aren't just good because they're like real life, and B, this is a fucking fantasy game with dragons and cat people, and C, that argument starts to crack a little once you realize apparently making 400 iron daggers makes you proficient in Daedric and enchanted armor smithing. So the basis is, leveling attempting to reflect realistically gaining skill with that, you know, skill is not necessarily a good thing. Let's consider for a moment how the first experience systems were pioneered. Before the advent of tabletop role-playing games, the best you could do was 
cooperative storytelling and maybe a choose-your-own-adventure-style structure. Then RPGs came along and made rules for things. Instead of saying, I use my immense skills as a badass to scale the wall across the pit, you now have skills reflective of those abilities. You put those skills against the dice roll, and that determines whether you succeed or fail. You improve those skills upon leveling and arbitrary invention of the game. It was determined that flat XP issued by the Dungeon Master for completing tasks was more fair and easier than trying to determine the amount of skill XP you would receive on a per-action basis. Part of that is the difference between a human and a computer dungeon master. Human DMs can be more creative with scenarios, but are at a mathematical disadvantage to computer DMs which could actually grant XP on a per-action basis. However, the goal was always some level of realism. Even though Dungeons & Dragons is a game where you can throw fireballs at people and fly, it doesn't mean that the core of the game isn't grounded in some level of realism. If it wasn't, then it would become extremely difficult to explain how it works to new players, which was a part of the appeal of the game. Anybody can pick up Dungeons & Dragons and understand the core of how it works, no matter how fantastical it gets, because it is realistic enough to relate your own real-life experiences into that of your character. Yeah, Skyrim is now host to giant flying lizards and two-legged cat men. And you're surprised by me? Yeah, I just talked, and I'm continuing to do so. I have always found this sentiment to be dismissive and outright ignorant. While it is true that Elder Scrolls is full of fantastical elements, it is also grounded in realism. People need to eat and breathe and they need shelter and sleep. When loved ones die, they're traumatized. People's stations in life are determined by their skills. Their skills are determined by their experiences. Their experiences are determined by how much work they've done. Yorlin Greymane isn't the greatest blacksmith in Skyrim because when he was a little old man who aged sideways, he wished for it upon a galaxy and a dread pixie granted it. He worked hard and you can see him work in-game every day. He is genuinely the best at his craft and the game relays this. He creates unique weapons. He is a master trainer of smithing. Just because there are dragons does not mean that Elder Scrolls is a fundamentally alien world. The movie Reign of Fire was stated to be a massive inspiration for how Bethesda wanted to portray dragons. The premise of the movie is that dragons exist in the real world, and one day are unearthed and begin destroying humanity. The movie heavily focuses on creating an air of realism to how these monsters exist and how humans are trying to fight them. Say what you will about the quality of the movie or how good a job it does with that premise, the fact remains that just because something has fantastical elements doesn't mean realism has to be thrown out the window. Now it's more than fine if you want a leveling system that is not realistic. Mr. Caption clearly likes Dark Souls, a game where you use the souls of people you slay to augment your abilities beyond what a normal human could accomplish. It's obviously not realistic, nor is it trying to be, nor should it be. However, outright dismissing the attempt simply because there are cat people is strange, especially in a video that spends a great deal of time criticizing the story and the setting on the basis of logical thought processes. Why is it a good thing that Skyrim shows where its food supply comes from if this is a game with dragons and cat people? Imagine for a moment that back in the day the original role-playing games did use a skill-based leveling system, and Elder Scrolls was a game where the primary way you leveled was by doing quests. Would Mr. Caption still defend the flat XP system because that is what he enjoys, or would he criticize the system because it's unrealistic, and he would attack people who tried to make the argument that sometimes games don't have to be fully realistic? I hope you understand what I'm getting at here. I have to wonder if he doesn't like the system because he believes it is a bad system, or if he doesn't like the system because it is in Skyrim and Skyrim was made by Bethesda. Blowing past the Iron Dagger meme for another time because most blacksmiths do in fact gain their skill by routinely creating simple items from basic materials like axes, nails, and horseshoes, he ends this point with this line. All this aside, I'm at least glad there is some attempt at shaking up parts of the RPG formula that have been so ubiquitous and stagnant for the last 30, 40 years. Nothing someone says before the word but really counts. But I don't think this is even a remotely viable advancement for the genre. And there it is, friends! The ugly truth. It isn't that Mr. Caption doesn't like the system or that it isn't to his tastes. It is that he outright thinks, for reasons present in Skyrim, that a skill-based leveling system is not a remotely viable advancement for the role-playing game genre. Only in video game discourse is this mentality considered a remotely acceptable and even defendable position to take. It would be akin to me saying the following statements. Third-person narration is not a remotely viable advancement for the genre. Impressionism is not a remotely viable advancement for the genre. 
Percussion is not a remotely viable advancement for the genre. The rule of thirds is not a remotely viable advancement for the genre. Hunger meters are not a remotely viable advancement for the genre. This is the return of the universal design philosophy, an ideology that believes all video games are approaching a singularity of good design principles. It is one thing to criticize execution, believe me, I'm self-aware enough as to what I'm doing, but it is a completely another to say that some ideas do not belong. For that, I prescribe 50 hours of watching Ross Scott Game Dungeon videos until you understand that there is no idea that isn't worth someone taking a shot at to see if they can pull it off. If you told me there was a heist in Grand Theft Auto Online where you have to use a forklift to raise a pallet to reach an objective, I would not respond by telling you how forklift operation doesn't belong in video games because games are supposed to be fun. By the way, that's a real thing. Maybe my small success has made me more sympathetic to Bethesda than I used to be. Maybe being frequently told how long videos should and should not be has made me more conscious as a critic as to how stupid it is to say ideas should and should not be tried. Just like how I did not say the words plot hole once in my Oblivion video despite me talking about media on YouTube for 12 hours. The reason I wanted to talk about Mr. Caption's bad section on leveling is that it is not the exception, it is the rule when it comes to discussions of Elder Scrolls. Perhaps that is one of the consequences of how Skyrim does not tell you anything. Morrowind would tell you hard numbers to your next skill level. It is very easy to predict. Skyrim also uses strange mathematical formulas to ensure a non-linear change at every level. It's hard to predict or anticipate, as Caption said, but I wonder what he would have said if he had played until level 68 like I had, and realized that no, perks are not the endless resource he had perceived them as being at level 17. Leveling a mage in Skyrim is a nightmare, but it is not a system built for mages. It works for warriors and thieves, but not magic. When leveling the other characters, there were many times I would have spare perk points waiting to be spent. That's because some perks provide situational utility value, and it is very easy to get the perks you need to build a warrior or thief character. But mages? I never had enough perks as a mage character. Each magic skill has a spine of 5 perks that cuts magic costs in half for each of their tiers. That is 25 perk points just to be able to really make use of magic, but honestly, I usually would only get the perks up to adept, so only 15 perks. But yeah, that's up to level 16 in perk points that we have already committed. Imagine for a second if Skyrim made you spend a perk point to cut the stamina cost of swinging increasing tiers of weapons. Next up is that each school of magic has a separate dual casting perk, but that is only absolutely necessary for illusion and destruction, a nice benefit for restoration and alteration, and a small waste on conjuration. We'll call it even at 3 perk points, so level 19. You will want to spend 4 perk points buffing your preferred element in destruction and getting impact, so level 23. Then there are three perks you need from Restoration for Passive Magicka Recovery and Buffed Healing Magic and another perk for Necromage, so level 27. From Conjuration, how many perks you'll want will depend on your playstyle. If you want to use Bound Weapons, then you need two perks and you will want a third. If you use Necromancy, you'll need two perks and want two more. If you use Summons, you'll want three perks and want one more. Both Necromancers and Summoners will want the final perk. I'm going to say 7 perk points since I figure most people will want to have access to both Summoning and Necromancy perks, so level 34. You could cut corners by picking one, but that would really only work as an argument if I was even close to done. From Alteration, you have a 3-stage perk that provides 30% magic resistance, which is situational. There's also Mage Armor, another 3-stage perk that buffs flesh spells but requires that you don't wear armor. There's also a perk that increases alteration spell durations by 50%. The Atronach perk also provides 30% spell absorption, but requires the expert alteration perk, so getting it requires an additional point be spent to increase from adept to expert. I'll figure up three points, averaging out mage armor and magic resistance perks for different playstyles, but remember that this could well be six points if I wanted it to be. One point for the duration perk, and two points for the Atronach perk. So six points total up to level 40. Illusion goes even harder. You need 5 perk points to increase the effectiveness of your spells, otherwise as you level your spells will become increasingly ineffective. You need another perk point to make your spells silent if you want to use them from stealth, another perk point if you want your spells to work on undead, daedra, and automatons, so 7 perk points raising us up to level 47. Now you might be happy that I'm out of skills, but I'm still not done. Enchanting. After all, you need custom enchanted gear to help make your spellcasting... Well, not better per se, but more efficient. You could say that it's expected that a magic character uses the magic crafting skill of enchanting as part of their progression, similar to how thieves have alchemy and warriors have smithing. 
Of course, in reality, everybody needs every one of those, but that's a different topic. Five points into making enchantments stronger at the front, another three points spent on getting to the extra effect perk allowing you to double up the effectiveness of your enchantments. Of course, you aren't just gonna enchant raw, are you? No, no, you need alchemy potions to buff up your enchantments. I'm not talking about the restoration loop, just a, a little dose to boost your enchantments. Plus, alchemy will be useful for getting those fortified destruction potions that you need to actually do more damage. Five points up front for better potions, uh, another point for beneficial potions, and really that's all you have to spend. There's going to be some work getting there, but it's worth it for the powerful gear that you'll be making. So in total from crafting your enchanting gear and making potions, you need 14 perk points, taking us up to level 61. Now bear in mind, this isn't me being unrealistic. It's not an issue of me wanting to use all five magic skills. Look at warriors, they need a weapon skill, maybe even two if they use archery as well. They need a defensive skill, they might want to block or sneak depending on their playstyle, and they would want to buff themselves with smithing, enchanting, and maybe even alchemy. But they don't need to spend 60 perk points to be viable. Shoring got all the perks he wanted and needed with points to spare. But it doesn't stop there. After all, what if you want to use armor? Five points in heavy armor since all the other perks require a full set, but you're wearing robes so you can't. Level 66. And to make an upgrade that armor you need smithing. Five or six perk points right there depending on if you want arcane smithing or dragonbone armor. Level 71. Higher than my triple digit playtime character ever reached. I didn't even get to invest in something like sneak, but yeah, there's five or six perks there. What about speech? You'll be spending lots of monies at Merchant. Better pick up seven perks there. Pickpocket's pretty useful too, and the final perks in this tree are fun for all characters, and lockpicking is a waste of perks in my opinion, but maybe you disagree. All in all, we are well past max level in the base game, and well past the point that you have exhausted the game of content to level without grinding radiant quests. You see my problem, right? You might say that speech is a thief skill, but every character benefits from having it. We've taken it to the extreme, yeah, but even if we scale this back and cut corners on things we don't need, mages require too many perk points. It was a very real problem that once I hit level 25, when the leveling slows down dramatically, that I entered into a nightmare where I had to pick each perk point I earned very carefully, which was not something Shoring or Maglir ever had to do. Then, combine that with the next leveling problem. Every level you're given a choice to raise your health, stamina, or magicka. For warriors and thieves, this is a straightforward choice between health and damage, since more stamina means more power attacks. Mages, however, need everything. You need lots of magicka, since even with spell cost reduction, higher level spells require large amounts, and you need to be able to cast multiple times to actually kill stuff. You need health, as without it you'll start running into enemies that can one-shot kill you. While you can employ several tactics to keep melee enemies away from you, there isn't much you can do about archers who, around level 30 or so, began one-shotting my character. And you need stamina, despite not using power attacks, because buffing stamina also buffs your max carry weight, which you'll need because even though I didn't carry weapons, I did have to carry lots of potions and staves and crafting materials and loot, plus sprinting takes stamina. And then there's the gear progression. Primarily, you have your robes, which have no armor rating but come with enchantments to boost your magic. These come in five tiers, from novice to master, and will increasingly reduce the spell cost of a school of magic while increasingly fortifying the rate at which you regenerate magicka. This is crucial. While Oblivion added passive magicka regeneration, Skyrim is built around the idea. You need magicka regeneration if you plan on exclusively using magic for damage, and you need lots of it. The problem is that while other characters are finding better and cooler armor, you'll just find a slightly better set of robes. The other problem is that much of the armor you find is unenchanted, providing you freedom as to choose what to do with it. The robes you find in loot usually comes pre-enchanted. Gee, thanks, a buff to my alteration magic spell cost. It's not like I use an alteration spell once per fight, but destruction magic constantly. You can also craft new armor, but you can't craft new robes. If you want a specific piece of gear, you'll have to shell out a ton of cash to buy it, which isn't a problem. And in most cases, you can enchant armor to be better than what you can find in the world, but with robes, what you find is better than what you can create without exploits. And then you have smithing. You can improve gear to be even better using crafting materials. You cannot improve robes to be better, you can only replace them. Never mind that you can also improve weapons with smithing, but you have no mechanism to improve spells rather than simply replacing them. My point is not, wah, why do warriors get it so good? It's simply to compare how functional gear progression in Skyrim works with warriors and why that idea doesn't work with mages. It's yet another obvious sign that nobody really plays pure mages at Bethesda. 
In Oblivion, the gear progression worked because you could continually find or create new and better equipment. A big part of that was having two ring slots for enchantments, where Skyrim only has one. An innocuous change if you want to play warrior, but for mages, the decreasing number of enchantment slots is yet another nail in the coffin, and at this point, we're probably going to need to go buy another box of nails. Ignoring how many enchantment slots there are in Morrowind, reducing that number even further than Oblivion already had means less and less options for improving your character. If I'm supposed to use enchantments to make my spells better, then why do I only get gloves, boots, hats, a ring, and a necklace to do so? Why do I need master enchanting just to double the number of enchanting slots? Why do I need to exploit the fact that you can wear a circlet and a falmer helm just for a couple more slots? Why can warriors fortify their weapons and use potions to buff their damage, but I only get the potions? Why do warriors get 100% damage from perks as well as their skill values, but I only get 50% damage increases from perks and not my skill value? Why do spell enchantments reduce the cost of spells, but not just fortify their fucking damage? While being able to cast magic for longer is a form of improvement, this is not World of Warcraft where I need to be able to cast Shadow Bolt continuously for 10 fucking minutes to down a raid boss. You said you learned from the shortcomings and exploits players use in Oblivion, yet Skyrim's magical combat is basically identical to macro grinding from Oblivion, yet people praise it because the spell system has at least been improved to an extent, like spells now actually look like the element they're supposed to be. In Skyrim, a fire spell looks like fire. The lightning looks like lightning. The schnozberries taste like schnozberries. Double shot lightning! Magic was arguably too versatile in Morrowind and Oblivion, so Shouts gave all builds access to special abilities. Too fucking versatile? I think the funniest part is that Mr. Caption praised Magic in Skyrim as being his favorite part of the combat. The Magic in Skyrim is my favorite because of how varied all of the spells are. You have a lot of different spells to choose from. But then decided to play a stealth archer anyways. You're being had. They're focused on making the magic look cooler to cover up the fact that nobody at Bethesda gives a fuck. And then the end result is that every YouTuber reviews this game assumes that they don't need to look any deeper than the surface level in Magic because hey, someone else must have. In the making of documentary, they cut to the quote magic meeting end quote, except instead of talking about magic, they're talking about how armor provides damage resistance. Oh, your damage resistance is determined by your armor right. and your perks and other stuff that might fold into that. So in this case, admittedly, the player will have to trust that we are doing what we say we are doing. We've always been very big in the Elder Scrolls on dynamic growth of the character. The funniest part is the dragon shots, where they basically took a bunch of magic effects but made them available to everyone, or rather, more available. Since removing classes means anybody can pick up magic anyways. They probably only updated the magic in Skyrim as a side project to creating the dragon shouts. Why bother with magic when you can cast most of the cool effects on cooldown with a better playstyle? Paralysis, Ice Form, Detect Life, Aura Whisper, Conjuration, Call of Valor, Fear, Dismay, Calm, Kind's Peace, Fire Damage, Fire Breath. Except there's actually a bunch of Dragon Shouts that have no equivalent magical effect. Ragdolling enemies, moving quickly, summoning storms, summoning dragons, making your swings faster, making dragons land on the ground, disarming enemies, making it stop raining, becoming invincible to damage. I hated being a mage in Skyrim. I hated that my hireling Jazargo had better gear progression than I did. I hated that I was relegated to doing the same thing over and over. I hated that I had to grind multiple crafting skills just to be viable. I hated the faction that was built around my playstyle. I hated that the rewards for sticking with it to the end were so fucking terrible. I hated that the final stage of magical playstyles was just ignoring the combat. I hated that I had to do exploits to have a comparable level of power and fun to previous games. I hated how much potential the game has to have a cool magic system, but doesn't because the developers are at best apathetic about my preferred playstyle, and at worst actively making it worse in some misguided attempt to BALANCE IT. Was the goal to make people not want to play mage? Because I'm gonna say you fucking succeeded. If the goal was to make people hate magic because you want to convey how Nords felt about it, congratulations, good job. But I'm sure if you set a game in Somerset, you wouldn't intentionally make the combat shit to make a narrative point, would you? Why is it for every one new thing that you add, two things have to go? Uh-oh, someone got mad on the internet, and that means they automatically lose. So says the wisdom of passionless, depressed people trying to squeeze that last drop of dopamine out before they fully convert into NPCs. I mean, um... 
GG, no ratio. I'm actually getting frustrated writing this. Like, I usually feign emotion with a lot of stuff because my emotions don't last long enough between playing the game and writing about it. But thinking about magic is genuinely one area where I start to get angry, and I want to say in recording that I, I got angry again, it, it peaked a lot. Have you ever been a fan of a series, but as time has gone on, you've started to feel more and more that the creators resent you, that they want new fans, and that they're willing to lessen your enjoyment if it means broadening their appeal? Now imagine this is one of the only series you can get that experience from, and also there hasn't been a new title in over a decade. I asked about other games or even indie projects I could look into, and the response was that my expectations were too high. <sighs> yeah, I guess expecting developers to do what modders have already done for free with Skyrim, but this time with the actual potential to get paid for their work is just unrealistic. I'm serious, I promise you, there's an audience for this, not Bethesda, fuck them. I haven't bought one of their games without a 90% discount since 2011. I seriously doubt they'll ever try winning their old fans back other than nostalgia baiting about better games. Don't be an abused housewife, just fucking move on. No, I mean for new studios to come and who want to try innovate on the formula. Let Bethesda keep practicing their keep it simple stupid idea. Let them keep stripping mechanics down until their games become a parody of the idea of a role-playing game. Don't interrupt enemies while they're making mistakes. Instead, take advantage of it. Don't bankroll this $200 million project for hardcore RPG gamers and expect a billion in sales. Instead, come up with a realistic budget with the expectation that you can firmly capture a very specific audience consistently. That is how From Software has been able to succeed this last decade. They cater to a very specific niche and budget accordingly, and as a result, they project such a large shadow over the industry that journalists write endless articles wishing their games were more accessible because of how desirable they are. By budgeting at an estimated quarter of the cost of a Bethesda title, they can maintain a similar sized studio with only 10% of the sales figures. And while some people on V will argue that their games have gotten easier with time, the fact that they maintain an impressive audience of hardcore gamers without really compromising their vision. So whether you're a solo dev or part of a double-A studio with a couple million dollars in the budget, just know that if the boomer shooter crowd can have a renaissance in their genre, then so can role-playing games. Right, so... The College of Winterhold. Hang on, I gotta scroll up the script and see where we're at. Yeah, no, it, it's taken a while. Whoa now. Ease off on the magic. Are you fucking kidding me? Ease off on the magic. Okay, so there's a bit of a time skip in character because I did the initial quest at a very low level so that Tolfdir would offer his alteration training service, but then I left so that the level scaled rewards of this quest would be maxed out. So, months after getting instructions from the Archmage to research Sarthal, we finally return and head to the library. It's headed up by, get this, an orc. And he's pretty important at the college, too. Actually, that's only mildly progressive. While there weren't any orcs in the Cyrodiil Mages Guild, there were orcs in the Morrowind branch. Granted, three of them appeared to be battle mages deployed to a Daedric Ruin, and the fourth was a Necromancer, but that's still better than the discriminatory enrollment practices of Hannibal Traven's Mages Guild. You are now in the Arcanium, of which I am in charge. It might as well be my own little plane of oblivion. Disrupt my Arcanium, and I will have you torn apart by angry Atronox. Now, do you require assistance? Yeah. Hundreds of years have gone into assembling this collection. Ureg knows which book we need. Unfortunately, it was stolen recently by a mage looking to ingratiate himself with a band of renegade conjurers. Of all the books he could have stolen, he decided to steal a book that is effectively worthless. I mean, books are all mysteriously worthless in Skyrim. Oh, it's diegetic because the Nords hate books, okay? But not everybody hates books in Skyrim. There is, in fact, a college of people who like books. Most of the Holds have court wizards. A decent chunk of Skyrim's population are Dunmer, a race of people who greatly value literature. And the game is about how the Nords are being culturally colonized by the Imperials, another group of people who greatly value literature. I'm just saying, the copium of saying that books should be worthless because Nords are morons who can't and don't read is exactly that. Cope. 
They read all the time. Random bandits are often literate and keep journals. Many of Skyrim's legends are written down in volumes. Anyways, it's a great coincidence that happens to result in us running, of course, a dungeon. Despite the fact that this is a setting that has invented the printing press and the college can even craft quills purpose-built for duplicating writing. There's even a famous chef in Skyrim named the Gourmet who has published a popular and well-known cookbook. Something that is kind of a modern concept. I bring all this up because it's very strange and convenient that Ureg only had a single copy of this book, which happened to be stolen. So we head out to Felglow Keep, an old fort being occupied by sorcerers who decided to leave the college. Was it because they're necromancers? I sure know. Those archaic policies died out with the Mages Guild, and were never enforced here. Necromancy, as any other type of magic, is a tool to be used. It is unusual, to say the least. We aren't really given a clear idea what restrictions Archmage Aaron had placed on this group that forced them to splinter from the college. In fact, a lot of people's issues with Savas Aaron are that they don't like him, as in him personally. Which is weird because Aaron is shown to be rather hands-off. He delegates most management decisions to Mirabelle Irving, someone who is more respected by members of the college. And it seems that while Aaron disapproves of some dangerous research, everyone knows you would be stupid to actually ask the Archmage to approve of anything directly. I am quite content to see nearly any aspect of magic explored and investigated here. But I do not and will not approve of any research or experiments that cause purposeful harm to your fellow members of the college. We don't really find out what the caller's problem with the college was, considering she's just leading a small group of conjurers. The UESP editorializes and calls her insane, when in reality she's quite cogent and can even be convinced to allow us to leave with the books and her prisoner, despite the fact that we are... You're the one who barged into my home and laid waste to my projects. Orthorn is the guy who stole some literature to try and impress the caller, which failed since he's their prisoner. Funny thing is, this is the first I'm hearing of this. I've never actually run into Orthorn, so I don't have footage of him. Double funny, he disappears as soon as the quest is over, so saving him has no impact. Same with the caller. Whether she lives or dies is irrelevant for the rest of the story. So we have to ask the question, what's the point of this quest? If Ureg just had the book we were looking for, nothing would have changed other than the fact that we would have crawled one less dungeon. Now you might say the goal is to show how people are dissatisfied with and leaving the College of Winterhold due to Savos Aaron's poor leadership. Except we're not given an explicit reason why these people left in the first place. In addition, the dungeon is full of hostile wizards performing experiments on living subjects, so if anything I'm taking the opposite away that Aaron's leadership led to a bunch of degenerates being forced to leave. Of course, I doubt Bethesda was attempting to make that point. Rather, I think the idea is that it's meant to show how Aaron is fracturing the college. But when it came time to translate the story from the whiteboard to the game, someone ended up taking an existing Conjurer dungeon and slapping an NPC named generically The Caller, complete with a random face at the end and called it a day. Imagine if things had played out differently depending on how you handle this quest. For instance, if Orthorn or the Caller are alive after this quest, maybe they come back to help us later on. Maybe if you use magic to get past the Caller's servants without actually killing any of them, she will comment on this with gratitude. I'm going to compare this to Leowin's Mage's Guild quest, where the player has to find an amulet to get a recommendation from the local branch leader. It's a very similar quest in that it starts with dialogue to figure out where to go, then you go to a dungeon before being confronted by a character at the end. Except that quest had... narrative relevance. Say what you will about the Oblivion Mages Guild, but most of its quests, if it sent you to a dungeon, had a narrative reason to send you to that dungeon. We are going to Fort Blue Blood because our boss needs an amulet in order to be normal, and we are confronted by a necromancer named Kalthar, who stole the original amulet so that our boss would get fired. I criticize the execution, but this is a really good excuse to go make the player do a fort dungeon. The only reason you go to Felglow Keep is to recover a book that isn't even relevant to the keep or the group residing within it. None of the characters are relevant, it's almost entirely self-contained. When Morrowind sent you to get a book for a quest, it would go one of three ways. The book would be common, and you could find it at bookstores, which were present in several cities. The book would be rare, and you could find it only at a rare bookstore in the capital, or in the library of the secret police, or in several notable dungeons. 
or the book would be unique, and you would have to find it at a very specific location. When Morrowind sent you to a dungeon, it would give you ample cause to understand why you are going to that dungeon. And when a book was supposed to be rare, its gold value would reflect that. Vampires of Vardenfell Volume 2 is a rare book due to having been banned by the Tribunal Temple for spreading the heretical claims that it is possible to cure vampirism. You can find the book during the Tribunal Temple questline when you're sent to clear out the vampire stronghold of Gallum Deus, which is one of the locations where the book can be found. The thing that makes it distinct from the other books is that it's worth 400 gold. To translate that value to Skyrim, an Iron, Curus, and Greaves combination in Morrowind is worth 114 gold. So for the same price as three of these combinations, you could get one of these rare books. In Skyrim, rare books are worth, on average, 50 gold. While an Iron, Curus, and Greaves, now just plainly called Iron Armor, is worth 125 gold. So two and a half books now go into one set of bad armor. I already talked about book value, my point is that the player stands a decent chance at some point of running into a book and knowing it's valuable by, well, its gold value, despite it not being a skill book. We return to Ureg with the three books. Two are relevant, although right now only one appears to be so. Night of Tears, a report on Nord history written by a Dark Elf, potentially even a member of House Tilvani if the name is a clue. There isn't much to this book. Seleth criticizes another report on Sarthal, titled The Imperial Report on Sarthal, written by an Imperial, then makes several baseless speculations about the motivations of the sacking of Sarthal, including the accusation that Ysgrimor was aware of what the early Nords had found at Sarthal and attempted to cover up the incident by burying the item. I mean, this is Ancient Aliens Hyperborea tier. Don't let my meme distract you from the fact that Seleth is making extremely wild accusations, or the fact that they were right. The final line is, quote, Every effort will be made to relocate Sarthal and find that which has been lost to us. So, yeah, I can't help but notice that the ancient race war has become more modern and is being fought through these books, except for one small little detail. Seleth is a Dunmer name. The Night of Tears was performed by Falmer. The Falmer were worshippers of the Aedra, while the Chimer and later Dunmer are worshippers of the Daedra. The reason I bring this up is that the orb will be named the Eye of Magnus. Magnus is not actually an Aedra or Daedra. In fact, his notable quality is that after hearing Lorcan's mortality plan, he decided to up and just leave for Aetherius, creating a rift so massive between the planes that so much light would pour through that it actually lit up Mundus. Yes. Magnus created this universe's sun, that's how powerful he was. He's worshipped in most cultures as the god of magic or the god of the sun. The Falmer, who seemed to worship the same gods as the original Aldmer, would have been Magnus worshippers. The story typically suggests that the elves decided to wipe the Atmoran colony out to prevent mankind from getting a foothold on Tamriel, and that was the event that caused Iskrimor to get 500 battle buddies together and turn the Falmer into an endangered species. However, this seems to suggest that the action of the elves was spurred by a desire to acquire the orb for pondering. I've noticed that neither source actually specifies the race of elves involved. We only know that the Nords focused their retaliation on the Falmer. Ureg's attention is drawn primarily to the Night of Tears book, but the weird thing is that it doesn't actually tell us anything that we didn't already know. In fact, by finding the orb at Sarthal, we by default already have more information than the book provides, which is just a little bit more salt in the wound for this quest. Not only was Felglow Keep irrelevant, but the book we got was not useful. In fact, the only purpose of this quest is to make us leave the college while Tolfdir and the Archmage transport the orb back to the Hall of the Elements. So we head down to the orb and ponder it for a while with him. You know this pondering orb meme is already out of date as of writing this, so I apologize how ancient the joke is by the time you're hearing it. Anyways, the Thalmor liaison on Kano, if you even remember him, interrupts and demands that we come with him. Now Feralda, the destruction trainer and college gatekeeper, will have warned us about on Kano, and if you meet him, he'll have questions about what it was we found at Sarthal. Ancano here is representing the Aldmeri Dominion, however pretty much everybody is aware that he's really spying on the college, which is hilarious because this means that by default Ancano is actually probably a really low-ranking member of the Thalmor. I mean, think about it. The College of Winterhold is practically a community college in terms of relevance. There's barely any research or education really happening here. They didn't send their best to spy on us because they probably assumed the Nord Magic College would not do anything significant. Anyways, Ancano is interrupting our research because a member of the Psychic Order has arrived asking to meet with us specifically. Ancano is alarmed by this and demands that he attend our and the Archmage's meeting with this envoy. 
Now we meet with a member of the Order at Sarthal, but this is actually a different person. He stops time like the last guy, and we have a conversation. This object, the Eye of Magnus, as your people have taken to calling it. The energy coming from it has prevented us from reaching you with the visions you have already seen. The longer it remains here, the more dangerous the situation becomes. You must understand the Sigic Order does not typically intervene directly in events. One of the guards said he saw I a mage appear out of thin the air, trader. claimed it was one of those Sigic monks. As you may have learned, this object, the Eye, is immensely powerful. The world is not ready for it. If it remains here, it will be misused. Okay, hold on. This is where we have to talk about the second book we found at Felglow Keep. It's titled On Arteum, and it's about the island that the Sigic Order lives on. Their first appearance in recorded history is very early in the First Era, meaning that they were likely founded in the Merithic Era. To give context for this time period, the dwarves still existed, the Dunmer were still a golden-skinned race, men in Cyrodiil were slaves of the Aeliads, and there were still men arriving from Admora in Skyrim. In fact, many of the tombs you see in the game had not yet even been built, because the ancient Nords whose bodies they were meant to endure had not been born yet. The Sigics are an Altmer order, and they lived on Arteum, which was the third largest island in Alinor. I say it was, as the island vanished in the Second Era after the Mage's Guild was founded and would not reappear for 500 years. The Sigics are capable of moving their island, making it difficult for it to be visited directly, let alone invaded. The Order has also played a part in Tamrielic politics, although notably our boy Uriel VII actively did not trust them. Wow, weird, the guy that didn't trust a famous Altmer Order was assassinated by a cult led by an Altmer that led to the rise of an Altmer superpower in Tamriel. It's, it's weird how these things work out. Despite that, the Sigics and the Thalmor claim to hate each other, which is evidenced by Ancano's concern at their arrival and the reason that the Sigic stops time and afterwards pretends to be confused at who we are before subsequently leaving. It should be noted that the book that clues us in to who the Sigic Order are first appeared in Daggerfall, before the rise of the Aldmeri Dominion, meaning that there are a couple centuries of context we are missing. Now, in the Pocket Guide to the Empire 3rd Edition, a physical book that shipped with the collector's editions of Oblivion, the Order is stated to have ramped up recruitment from 17 members in the preceding millennia to 30 members in the two years before the events of Oblivion. The book also mentions how there is a cultural revolution brewing among the young Altmer in Somerset, so I think Bethesda knew full well where they were wanting to take the story when it came to the rise of the Altmeri Dominion. However, the Thalmor are an unexpected twist. We'll talk more about them during the Civil War and Main Quest sections. This appears to be the College of Winterhold's vestigial connection to the Main Quest. Each game's magical faction has generally been connected at some level to the main conflict of the story. In Morrowind, the Mage's Guild provided a big puzzle piece to the mystery of the disappearance of the dwarves, while in Oblivion, the Mage's Guild plays a role in uncovering the location of the Mythic Dawn base. In Skyrim, there's a guy who wears black and yellow who is an antagonist. This seems to be a flaccid attempt at emulating Ken Rolston's style of the unreliable narrator, but much lamer. Who are the Thalmor, and what do they truly believe? Let's leave most of that up to speculation. Who are the Sigic Order, and what do they want in this situation? Let's be vague and mysterious to sell the idea that they are a vague and mysterious order. Here's the thing. Vague and mysterious are tools you use when something is not the subject of your story. When we hear about Nords and Morrowind, it was shrouded in a lot of mystery because Morrowind was not really about the Nords. When we heard about Nords in Skyrim, we got a lot more detail because now they're the subject. As long as the Sigics were background lore, it was fine to keep them an enigma. But once they start being characters and doing things, well then that comes with the expectation that we're actually going to learn something about them. We're going to peel back a bit of that mystery and find the world is a rich tapestry of unique cultures. ESO ends up telling us a lot more about the Sigics than their actual storyline in one of the canon games. Instead, they are sentient plot devices. They somehow know, can teleport to, and stop time at Sarthal just to deliver a vague message about judgment. Quarineer implies it was a vision and that the eye is preventing them from sending further visions, except I just got back from Felglow Keep, which is halfway across Skyrim. Maybe the idea is that Tolfdir undid the binding containing the amorphous energy of the orb. A binding that could withstand the sheer power of the orb, but whatever that is. But not 10 seconds of a basic lightning spell. And also, it wasn't containing the energy at all. Yurik Galderson was using the orb to be invincible. Even if that wasn't the case, Quirinir could have met us without drawing attention. Unless the goal was to draw attention from Ancano, but that's... 
something that's going to need to be stated for me to believe it. Anyways, we're given a single clue, an entity named the Augur of Dunlane. Okay, so this was supposed to be a surprise since you can't do the restoration ritual until after this quest, so pretend for a moment that you know nothing about the ghost gangbang from earlier. What is the Augur of Dunlane, and will it take me three hours to explore this topic? So, he would be savvy to its existence, and of its power while also being aware of what had to be done to harness such power from the Dark Arts, which as we know, something is required in exchange. More than a handful of deaths, a massive ritualistic slaughter, a city's worth of people dying at once. Can you think of any events that would fit such a description? Hmm, the Great Collapse, of course. The Great Collapse, which I dare say may have been an intentional sacrifice forced upon the city by the Augur of Dunlane so he could harvest the required payload of soul energy to exchange void energy with the Dark Heart of Skyrim. I pulled that quote by randomly clicking around this video because I, I couldn't stand to watch more than 10 minutes of it. And to be honest, this video strikes me as being exactly what I've been accused of doing, which is reading further into the lore than the writers ever would have intended. That can be funny on occasion, like positing that Skior and Aella had werewolf sex, but extrapolating three hours of material on a character who everyone else would summarize in a paragraph is basically just farming watch time. Which is strange to say because this video was obviously not easy to make. There's a lot of effort poured into the research and production, it's not just reading the lore page on a character over static gameplay. This is definitely as confusing as the subject, so points. Here are two lines of dialogue you need. Well, I suppose he wouldn't mind. It was all before my time, you understand. I've heard the stories, the same as anyone else. He was a brilliant student, an accomplished wizard, delved into magic in a way none had seen before. But I think he became too focused on just how much power he could acquire. That's what led to the accident. The Augur was a brilliant mage, truly inspired, mastered spells others could barely comprehend. He was especially gifted when it came to restoration. He's, well, he's very particular about who shares the knowledge. So you'll need his approval first. Go on, go talk to him. I'm sure he's been paying attention and we'll be expecting you. The Augur is an incorporeal entity living under the college in the Midden, which apparently has foresight and knowledge of events that happen around the campus. He knows the Eye of Magnus has arrived and has given information to Ancano about it. He also figures that while we're on a similar path to Ancano, we have been pushed down a chain of events that will preserve the college. Basically, we have no agency, and so we'll need to go through the motions of saving the college despite the outcome already having been determined. He tells us we need the Staff of Magnus, and then tells us to fuck off. Now, you might be thinking, is that seriously it? Yeah, it kind of is. The Augur of Dunlane is just a plot device to point us to the next stage of the story. If the Augur was an old guy living in the Midden instead of a glowing ball of light, then I doubt anybody would have actually spent any more effort than a Reddit post investigating what their deal was. Like, nobody has done a deep dive on the real identity of the Caller and how she's secretly responsible for the Great Collapse, and you know why. Flesh and blood. But realize that the flesh is weak and all of a sudden you're responsible for the Great Collapse, which is probably supposed to be the implication, but as with all things in the mystery box, we don't know because Bethesda didn't tell us because they either don't know themselves or figure this is better. The clues are charitable at best and require great deals of mental stretching, assumption, and worst of all, ESO lore. The only part of the Augur I like is how realistic people are about it. Either you haven't been at the college long enough to know, or you've met the Augur and know what it is and react accordingly. Tolfdir Zal, oh yeah, that guy, he's in the midden, say hi for me, while Mirabel is more reserved about talking about the subject. We bring our information to the Archmage, who doesn't immediately pick up on the connection between the Staff of Magnus and the giant orb behind him, which has been nicknamed the Eye of Magnus. He is impressed with our initiative, not knowing that we don't have any, because we were told flat out to go talk to the Augur by a Sigic monk and that we... Are, you know, have a predetermined ending. A most impressive attitude. Keep this up, and you'll do quite well for yourself. I really hope Archmage Aaron doesn't have a tragic backstory about being part of a group of mages who took initiative and got killed over it. Trust me, that's just a random thought I had. 
He sends us to Mirabelle who says that yes, she did mention it, back when some Synod representative from Cyrodiil showed up looking for it. This is a pretty good little detail. Savos is so distracted with whatever it is he does all day, that he doesn't really pay full attention to anything Mirabelle tells him. She told him that the Synod were looking for the staff, but all he registered was just the Staff of Magnus. I'm genuinely praising the game here, because this is one of the only times it doesn't fumble a detail in the storyline. Apparently, the Synod are trying to hoard artifacts, because artifacts don't have a history of up and disappearing after time. In fact, the book Tamrielic Lore, written by the Last Living Dwarf and actually published across Tamriel, features a section on the Staff of Magnus that says that the Staff has a history of abandoning mages before they become too powerful. So it seems like a massive waste of time to actually find the Staff for expressly that purpose. Anyways, Mirabelle says she doesn't remember much, but she does happen to remember the name of a dungeon they were going to go visit. Oh boy, another dungeon! Mizulft is great, I mean it is the perfect example of how linear dungeons in Skyrim are. But that's just a stylistic difference, you know? Do you even remember how confusing Oblivion dungeons could be? This is so much better because it's not confu- Yeah, you get it. It's a straw man. The point is, Mizulft is a terrible dungeon, like, impressively bad. It starts promising. There's a guy bleeding out, but you can't save him. Well, you aren't expected to. The sequence apparently breaks if you do, since the key you need is on Gavros, but they meant for him to die here. Then you go down the hallway and find a corpse with a free potion. Then you continue down the hallway until you fight some enemies. You kill them, and then you continue down the hallway until you fight some enemies. And then you continue down the hallway until you fight some enemies. Down the hallway until you fight some enemies. Hallway. Enemies. Hallway. Enemies. Hallway. Enemies. Now, linear hallways of encounters can theoretically be interesting, if the encounters themselves are interesting. But this is just a series of encounters with level-scaled automatons and Falmer in Skyrim's combat. If you tried to submit this in a level design competition, you would be mocked. They were so proud of their new dungeon design philosophy that they outright lied about Oblivion only having a couple level designers, when really the team had only grown by two members, from six to eight. Yet for some reason, a dungeon that was meant to be part of a major questline got zero attention. The only interesting part is this T intersection, but even that's just as simple as go to the end of this hallway, fight a boss, get the key that they have, and then go back to the intersection and unlock the door to the quest area. But what can be done? Well, I hate how people think that if you don't have the simplicity of a Skyrim dungeon, then you obviously have to have the needless complexity of a bad Oblivion dungeon. Oblivion has some terrible dungeons. Trust me, I made a mod that connects 60 of them together into one continuous area. I know how bad they are. Now, it's not as easy as simply saying, hey, make better dungeons, Bethesda. I'm sure they're trying their best. I think the issue is that with Skyrim, the rank-and-file level designers got top-down dogmatic edicts about their design, which meant there wasn't really room to experiment. They were told that every dungeon has to be linear. You can have little supply closets along the way, but they have to be dead ends. You can't let players get confused by having side areas or multiple routes. Also, every dungeon has to end in some kind of quick shortcut back to the surface. All cool, and totally okay for DLC, but not profound, like the first time I stumbled out of a shortcut at the end of a dungeon. Or the hundredth. If you're waiting for a punchline, it's not coming. The shortcuts out of the dungeon were certainly a huge improvement over Oblivion's and Morrowind's dungeons, so that's definitely a point in the hit column of the dungeon designs. But as for the linearity, this is going to be a controversial call, but I'm going to say that this is also a hit. Personally, I feel the sense of exploration is at its best in the overworld, due to the multitudes of rewards you get for exploring there. The dungeons are designed to be more challenged than exploration, and so the linear nature works best. The problem here is again the automatic assumption that any deviation from non-linearity requires an immediate regression to some past, obviously unideal state because it is past. As is, there is one path through dungeons. Adding secondary routes would double the complexity, but it would not result in spaghetti mazes. Some of my favorite locations in Skyrim were the Forsworn surface camps with many routes through them, often resulting in complex combat situations. Yet no interior area was allowed to be designed in this same way. Note my phrasing. Areas were allowed to be designed by certain consistent parameters. Play through these dungeons and you can gradually reverse engineer what the rules were. The dungeon must be a linear hallway. It must end with a boss level encounter with a boss level chest. The dungeon must then provide either a shortcut to the entrance or an exit depositing you back into the overworld. 
It is a rote design philosophy, and it is obviously such when you compare it to areas from any other Bethesda title, including Skyrim's own downloadable content. It is a low point in the series, where Bethesda was so focused on ironing out context for areas that they neglected complexity. It is true that the average dungeon in Skyrim has a small story to it compared to such areas in Oblivion. It's also true that the UESP article for most dungeons in Skyrim have not created maps compared to their Oblivion counterparts. Creating a custom map for an article is actually a surprising amount of work. I did this myself for a certain dungeon we'll be doing later in this questline, and the games do not make it easy to do. It can be concluded that this hasn't been done because it isn't necessary for Skyrim. But let's back up a second. We've observed how the design is different, but does that make it bad level design? Level designers are often beholden to the broader mechanics of the game. It is why analysis of dungeons is intrinsically tied to analysis of the gameplay loop. If all it takes to be considered good level design is a strong connection to the gameplay, then yes, Skyrim has good level design. But I disagree. In my view, good design should be a function of how much of an experience an area provides. The experience can be many things, but for most, the easiest to strive for is fun. Other experiences can be intrigue, setting, and horror. Is an area fun? Does it create greater context for Skyrim? Does it make you fear a monstrous faction? And would you be likely to recommend that particular level to your friends? That was the inherent mistake that Oblivion made. I would say that many Morrowind dungeons violate these principles as well, but its most memorable areas did not. Examples given, Kogarun and Ald Daedroth. There are a couple dungeons in Skyrim that rise to the occasion, but the unifying element between all of them is almost always that a quest was tied to it. And where a quest is, a quest designer was, which is to say, these areas received attention because they were tied to the content loop. Other areas without quest are left to the universal blueprint because there's no guarantee that players will ever find it. Now, those two Morrowind dungeons I listed are not exceptions to that rule. They were, in fact, both tied to the main questline. Generic Morrowind dungeons also leaned on the gameplay to be memorable, it's just that the gameplay had much greater depth to support it. Skyrim dungeons are not memorable because they're not made to be. They are amusement park rides. Queue up at the door, and once the ride is over, find yourself right back where you started, but with trademarked and capitalized experience. Except people often recommend individual roller coasters. Nobody ever recommends an individual Skyrim dungeon. So funny thing, I actually missed the shortcut in this dungeon, now it's understandable. I thought the shortcut was this northern door, so in my rush to get there I managed to whirlwind sprint at exactly the right second to completely miss the actual shortcut. Then, when I found that the door wasn't the shortcut, I decided to just backtrack out of the dungeon. Now this is certainly a mix of my fault and bad luck, but there were actually two other times in the game where I did have to backtrack that weren't my fault. Having to backtrack in Skyrim is great, because it exposes how awful the dungeons are. It was generally the rule that most Morrowind dungeons involve backtracking, although funnily enough, Kogarun actually doesn't, although it deposits you inside the ghost fence and the quest is nowhere near a teleport point, so you'll either need to fly or backtrack the dungeon anyways. Backtracking in Morrowind wasn't that bad though. Besides, the fact that you could just teleport home as soon as you were done with a dungeon, it also gave you an opportunity to make sure that you had fully explored the area. Then in Oblivion, they added some dungeons that ended with a shortcut, presumably because they got rid of the teleportation. A lot of the Oblivion dungeons were also complicated, however, so backtracking wasn't the end of the world since there was a chance you might find more loot or areas to explore on your way back to the entrance. Backtracking in the Skyrim dungeon, however, is a complete waste of time. Everything there is to see will be seen the first time, like an amusement park ride. And that's the big problem with Mizulft. They wanted it to be a challenging dungeon, but there are only two ways that the level designers can create challenges without breaking the rules. They either need to stack the dungeon with high-level enemies, or make the dungeon really big. But since they can't make the dungeon wide, as it would violate the linearity rule, they have to make the dungeon long instead. The end result is this ridiculous hallway of combat encounters. We get to the end and are confronted by Peritus Decimius, a surviving member of the Synod who was expecting us to be that guy that died earlier. You know what would be really stupid? If this part of the dungeon had the back door- oh wait, it does. You might respond, sure, but the back door is up on a cliff so it would be hard to reach. Yeah, seems like a useful time for some kind of magical power that grants you the ability to fly. I mean, barring that, I like that the Synod decided that fighting their way through the automatons and Falmer in the ruins was somehow less risky than mountain climbing. 
I mean, it's not like this is literally the most important thing the Synod have going on in Skyrim right now. They are literally retrofitting a Dwarven Observatory to display the locations of all the powerful artifacts in Skyrim. Actually, no. Tamriel. That means this is not the most important thing the Synod are doing just in Skyrim. It's literally the most important thing that any faction on the continent is doing at this moment. However, it ends up not working due to interference being created at the college by the Eye of Magnus. Paratus is naturally upset, but at least takes the time to explain that the other location on the map is Labyrinthian, which presumably must be the Staff of Magnus. He is off to go inform the Council of the immense power we're hoarding, so I make sure there isn't much left of Paratus to find by vaporizing him. A place like this is definitely better suited to being in our capable hands. No need to complicate things politically. It's not like the Synod would ever know. They're portrayed as being utterly incompetent. Their stroke of genius was crafting the focusing crystal we use for this map. So, after Oblivion, the Imperial Mages Guild was dissolved due to anti-magic sentiment. I'm having difficulty imagining this crowd getting together to protest that the Arcane University and the Mages actually going, You know what? All those guild halls, we close them. I'm sure it has a lot more to do with the downfall of the Septim Dynasty and the fact that 90% of the council had either resigned over the necromancy ban or had been killed in the ensuing civil war. Even the Archmage died, sacrificing himself so that Mana Marco could be defeated, so it's hilarious that the guild still collapsed anyways because it undermines Traven and his sacrifice completely, as well as the work of the player back in Oblivion. The guild was replaced by two factions, the conservative College of Whispers, who maintained the Mage's Guild original policies of unrestricted magic usage and education, and the Synod, a liberal faction that not only continued the ban on necromancy, but extended it to conjuration as well, and changed the organization to require years of membership and dues payments just to learn magic. The only reason the Synod have enjoyed any success is by political maneuvering, in this instance the goal of collecting magical artifacts being one of those maneuvers. Now you might be thinking, College of Winterhold, Thalmor, Sigic Order, Synod, it seems like we're introducing a lot of factions without really elaborating on or characterizing any of them. This is a story by Whiteboard, College of Winterhold, College that is in Winterhold, Sigic Order, Order of Sigics, Synod, an assembly of the clergy and sometimes, oh, oh, it's Catholic, now things are starting to make sense. Are they called the College of Whispers because they have a mean librarian that makes everybody keep their voice down? Do the College of Whispers and Synod share the old Arcane University? Note here that it isn't just an absence of lore books written by Kirkbride and Peterson, although that certainly doesn't help. The story is outright uninterested in meaningfully exploring these topics. What is the point of Paratus' character? To tell us where to find the Staff of Magnus and provide some minor callback to the Oblivion Mages Guild. He is a plot device, just like every other character in the story so far. Now I won't gloss over it, this quest is one of the few occasions where casting magic is necessary. The reason the Synod failed initially was that the focusing crystal they needed warped in Skyrim's cold weather and had to be recreated. The idea then is that the focusing crystal is easily changed by elemental magic. You use magic to tune the beams to the three tracks and then you use these buttons to move lenses around. Before you get too excited, every player starts with the necessary flame spell, but if you somehow don't have it, there is a handy spell tome that is available. You also need the Frostbite spell, which there's also a spell tome for. And, well, even if you had never invested a single point in magic... Focus completely wrong by the time we got here. The cold had warped it. Bet it just needs to be heated up. No? Why would it need to be cooled down? This puzzle is still extremely easy to solve just with the base 100 magicka and base magicka regeneration that every character has. Now is that moving the goalposts? Yes. So I guess I do have to congratulate Bethesda on trusting the player to be able to cast novice destruction magic. It's like saying that I have to congratulate Bethesda for making me swing a weapon during the companions. It's a very low bar, dangerously low, a tripping hazard. It wouldn't have been so low if this wasn't the first time in the questline, at quest 6 out of 9, that we are expected to use magic in this way. I like the Harry Potter games as an example. In those, you learn a spell, and then that spell stays relevant throughout the game for making progress. It's not a new flavor of combat magic. You also need those spells to navigate and explore. What are some puzzles I could come up with without creating and or implementing any new spells? 
You could make a maze where you can see the obstacles but not the rat inside it, requiring you to use Detect Life to track the rat's progress. You could hide a person behind one of three doors and give the player one guess to get it right. You could have the Dwemer batteries that charge when shocked with lightning magic. You could have fireplaces or torches that could be lit and put out with fire and frost magic, which gives you a lot of options for puzzle doors. A bunch of invincible cultists are crowding your personal space and you have to use fear spells to get them to leave you alone. Maybe you get trapped inside one of the pipes in a Dwemer ruin and all you can do is use illusion magic to manipulate the people inside to make progress through it. Here's an idea. There's a pillar that will extend out an arm forming a bridge whenever it is happy but hurting it makes it lower that arm, and healing it makes it raise it up again. There are tons of applications of telekinesis, like maybe a pressure plate that you can't physically reach and have to use telekinesis to weigh down with an object, or the opposite. A pressure plate that you can't reach that is already weighed down by a body that you have to use reanimate to move. What about using magic lights to lure a giant unkillable spider around a room, or making it magically dark dungeon that fire will not illuminate, requiring light spells or night eye to even navigate? Actually, they did that in Dragonborn. Those are just ideas I have with the spells in the game. Feather spells could apply buoyancy to certain objects like barrels, making them float on the surface of water. Maybe there's a maze that you have to command a hireling through, and they reach a locked door that you have to remotely unlock using a targeted open spell. The spell magic to remove effects, like making paralyzed people who are obstacles in your way able to move again. I'm just saying, it's magic. Once you implement one of these systems, you can just use them routinely enough that players will understand the pattern. This is the basic framework of how children's games work, let alone actual puzzle games. Bethesda's always struggled with this, and I think it's a mixture of apprehension that players will get confused mixed with the woes of their engine. Although there is stuff in the Dawnguard and Dragonborn expansions that indicate they're not completely deaf to the possibilities of literal magic. Fallout 4 didn't exactly fill me with a lot of hope, but maybe that's just the constraints of that setting being harder to gamify in these particular ways. Because radiation magic sucks. Because we didn't take the shortcut out of Mizulft, we missed dialogue from one of our Psijic friends that was critical to understanding the story that's being told. I apologize for this and will play the dialogue in full in order to atone for not giving the game the chance to tell its story. You have done well thus far, but trying times are ahead. It is imperative that you return to your college at once. You will be called on to take swift action, rise to the challenge, and discover what you are capable of. You are on the right path, and you will prevail. Oh, sorry, never mind. The absence of this dialogue changes nothing. Actually, its presence makes things worse. So you guys can contact me remotely when out of range of the eye. Is that difficult? So why didn't the guy who physically came to the college just call us while we were at Felglow? We head back to the college to find the Hall of Elements warded off with Uncano inside pondering the orb. Forgive me for this, however, I'm going to make the assumption that Bethesda is not implying that Uncano's ward is sufficient to block the energy of the orb and make the Psijic call impossible because it happens moments after we use the Oculory, which is being interfered with by the Eye of Magnus, so unless I'm supposed to believe that Ancano just happened to throw the ward up between me killing Paratus and me reaching the shortcut, I mean... Why do this? Why add this component to the story just for Nerian here to act like a cheerleader? You've done well, things will be hard, but you can do it. If you're taking a hands-off approach to the situation, then why call me but say nothing? I know why. It's to establish that the Psijic Order is involved in the situation, but make them more mysterious and show how they're manipulating events very gradually. The hardline Psijics can't intervene directly, but since you can't observe an action, well then, we need to see one of their monks being very loud and proud about his abstinence to establish such. In other words, our time is being wasted to demonstrate how little Narian is telling us to contrast with how radical Quarinir was for telling us about the Augur. I say this with all seriousness. Never make a game set in the Somerset Isles. As much as it would be a perfect setting for a spiritual sequel to Morrowind, at present, it is very obvious that it would just be wasting potential, possibly permanently damaging the premise entirely. In retrospect, Fallout 4 is starting to make a lot more sense. Bethesda believes that it isn't actually necessary to do the work of showing an intelligent faction full of intelligent people behaving intelligently, rather that it is sufficient to simply say that they are the intelligent faction and that they can simply be taken at face value. 
Ancano's ward gets undone by a couple seconds of the combined might of three whole wizards using novice level magic. In case you power scalers want to calculate how strong a ward needs to be to block the energy of the orb to make the psychic phone calls. I don't know what he's doing, but he won't get away with it. I think the college is due for a change in leadership. Thanks, Neria. It is funny that she says this in earshot of the college's present and future leadership. Neria, not to be confused with Feralda, doesn't actually do anything at the college in terms of offering services. She's pretty much just another warm body who existed to have a rivalry with Feralda. Most everybody at the college is either a trainer or a hireling or part of a quest. I'm not really complaining though, it helps the college feel more realistic, but it is somewhat unusual that Neria's unique trait is that she has no unique traits. The Skyrim nativity play ensues. Stop this at once! I command you! Don't go near him! Are you alright? Can you walk? I need you on your feet. We're in trouble here. Despite Jizargo and I being much closer, we survive the explosion, while Aaron is flung completely out of the building to his death and Mirabelle's wounded. It's quite comical. Even better is that I think the game glitched out since Eren's body either didn't spawn or spawned in the wrong place, so it wasn't where it was supposed to be. We're not told what exactly Ancano is doing to the eye, because Bethesda has no clue themselves, but it spawned wisp creatures in Winterhold, so now we need to go save Winterhold from the problem we created, as though we're redeeming ourselves among the Nords. I think that's what this is supposed to be, but there is no scene where a crowd of Nords forgives the college, so it seems fairly unfinished no matter how you look at it. There is also a superficial MMO aspect to it. It feels like an ESO quest where I'm being tasked with killing exactly 10 wisps before the instance changes to the peacetime version of Winterhold again. Instead of just being tasked to kill wisps until either they're all dead or the event ends as is more traditional in Elder Scrolls. Which is weird because it would have been more effort in terms of quest scripting to introduce the variable that tracks the number of wisps. Mirabelle figures we'll need the staff and says that Savos had given her an object from Labyrinthian that he said she would know what to do with. Okay. Labyrinthian is the modern name for the ruins of the city of Bromjinar, capital of Skyrim during the Dragon Colt's reign. This would have been post Night of Tears. Now the ruins have that name due to Shalador, who built the titular Labyrinthian inside the city to test mages at their worthiness to lead the College of Winterhold. However, we don't actually have to do the maze. In fact, it's not even a maze, it's a labyrinth, which, yeah, it's in the name. The area is completely optional, which is cool, I guess, but it does lead people to posting their surprise that the significant site in Skyrim's history has secrets to be found. Rather, we find the big door this torque we were given corresponds to, which unlocks a lengthy dungeon named, confusingly, Labyrinthian. This is actually not the first time in the series that Labyrinthian has appeared, the previous time being an arena, as part of the game's main quest. Here is what it was like in Arena, and here's what it's like in Skyrim. What in the actual fuck is this? In fairness, Dagothur, the level, not the guy, didn't fare well by that particular metric either. But Dagothur was created under considerable time crunch by a very small team. The fact that the end of Morrowind's main quest is very badly paced is evidence enough of that. Skyrim had a much larger team and budget and couldn't even live up to the standards of Morrowind. Now, of course, the change in the complexity of these ruins could be owed to the decay of time. That explanation, however, would require the ruin to have been intact for thousands of years, and then in the span of just 225 years have drastically fallen apart. Not only has it decayed so rapidly, but it's done so perfectly as to avoid creating numerous dead ends without blocking off access to the necessary part of the ruin that housed an ancient powerful dragon priest. As we explore the ruin, we're treated to ghosts recreating the events of their past exploration. A young Savos with a group of fellow college apprentices are searching for artifacts in the ruins. They encounter many of the same traps we do, but lacking protagonist status, they dwindle in numbers at each obstacle. The skeletal dragon is a bit weird for reasons that bear mentioning in the main quest. I get what they're trying to do, though. Savus Aaron was a safety-focused archmage due to his bad experience here, losing a bunch of his friends. The problem is that it is justifying a level of strictness that we aren't even really shown. There isn't a point where Savos is hemming and hawing about the dangers of an experiment or excavation. I do have to give Bethesda credit, and it's for something that was cut rather than included. 
Originally, Aaron was meant to guide you through the ruins as a ghost. He would verbosely explain in seven different chunks the point of what happened here. Thankfully, the designers no doubt realized how terrible this was and opted for a much better style of showing us the events in ghost form. I always wondered what the rules for ghosts in this setting were. It seems to be a mixed bag. If you have feelings of injustice, I guess you could stick around until justice is served, but only sometimes. Like that Windhelm serial killer would have been caught if his victims just came back and recounted the events of what happened. Anyways, the resident Lich, I mean Dragon Priest, has figured that we are here. He exposes a detail that Aaron was here, and in case you hadn't figured that out yet. But uh, how do you know it was Aaron? This dungeon has protagonist syndrome written all over it. Six mages went into this dungeon and only one survived, yet we cleared it effortlessly despite all the enemies restocking. Two mages had to sacrifice themselves to contain Morakai, but we will manage to defeat him. We've done nothing to develop our character as part of this questline. Our rewards so far have been a staff that casts Mage Light, six skill books, a leveled circlet that can provide between 20 and 70 points of magicka, and an amulet that provides another 50 points of magicka. Let's contrast this with Oblivion. In Oblivion, between the time you join and the time you dueled the Dark Lord Mana Marco, you're given a unique mage's staff capable of a variety of effects, an amulet that can absorb magic, robes which can fortify a variety of magical skills, you learn how to craft black soul gems providing easy access to grand level souls and plenty of necromancers to harvest for that purpose, and a unique destruction spell that's cheaper than custom spells. It makes sense that the twerp who joins Cyrodiil's mages guild develops enough to fight Mana Marco that I certainly didn't question it when it happened. And then you have Morrowind's Mages Guild. Between the time you join the guild and fight Trebonius Arturius at the end, assuming you get that ending, you will be guaranteed to have a magic skill at least of 70, although more likely 80 due to how the quests are set up. There are a number of powerful items you can get before the fight depending on how your quest line goes. You'll definitely have a wizard's staff, but you may also have the Staff of Magnus, funnily enough, the Warlock's Ring, which is an artifact of Cirabane, a Daedric Dagger capable of trapping souls, a ring that can summon ghosts, and best of all, you'll have the Morrowind magic system. Again, I doubt most people would question our qualification at the end of that questline. But Skyrim? We had a door exam involving a random low-level spell, we had a couple minutes of practice casting wards, and we've been on a single school sanctioned expedition. I mean, just look at the other apprentices in our class, all of whom have been at the college longer than us. We end up doing their research or tasks for them, that's how unqualified they are for life, barring Jazargo since he was dealt a fierce companion for practically the entire game. None of the other apprentices developed this quickly because it would be stupid for them to do so. Now, sure, if you check the clock like I did in Oblivion, you can go from Associate to Archmage in a week in Oblivion, and that hasn't changed. My problem is not the amount of time, even though the questline is laughably short. My problem is that we are about to face a capital L Lich with characters that are, at best, level 3. If this was a normal story, we would have gotten the Staff of Magnus to stop this guy, not the other way around. Dragon Priests are one of those things that we'll have to come back to later. All you need to know is that Morakai was a very high-ranking priest in the Dragon Cult before being entombed in these ruins. However, there is a minor continuity error. I assume the priests were kept sustained in stasis by the Draugr, something established by a Skyrim book, but the threat of their return was made real by the return of the dragons. That's why many of the priests that are near, or in one instance living on the surface, haven't been terrorizing Skyrim for millennia. They all came back very recently. Yet somehow they managed to wake this one up, and Eren even had to go so far as sacrifice two of his comrades just to contain him. And then you have the question of how exactly Morakai got his hands on the Staff of Magnus. As mentioned earlier, the Staff last appeared in Morrowind. It's been two centuries. So no doubt through a chain of events, the Staff could have wound up here. Maybe the last mage to wake up Morakai happened to have the Staff and died. I do want to say for the record that, no, the Six Apprentices did not come searching for the Staff of Magnus, nor did they have it when they came searching. Enchanted weapons, tomes of ancient knowledge, Shalador's secrets themselves. Who knows what we can find? When asked about the Staff of Magnus, Savos expresses surprise. Trust me, Savos has a speechcraft skill of five. He could not successfully lie to us about anything. We have to assume Morakai had the staff during the incident, but it's fair to say Eren had no clue that's what it was. Makes sense, considering Morakai doesn't actually use the staff in combat. No, no really. Morakai looks at the staff and says, nah, I can do better. 
Okay, so a correction. When writing this section, I had only done this quest line once, so of course I only fought Morakai once, who didn't get to do much of anything against my OP endgame mage character. He didn't get a chance to attack me, so when the article says he elects to use his spells over the staff, I just believed it. Such things are inevitable with videos like this, and I endeavor to try and catch all of them in editing. I found out on my VR run that it turns out he will utilize the staff, but he'll as likely utilize lightning magic. The real problem is that even with the staff, Morakai is still a bog standard dragon priest encounter. Dragon priests are dangerous enemies, yet despite having eight named priests in vanilla Skyrim forming into a collection quest for masks that seem to be meant as powerful rewards, there is little distinguishing between them. They don't speak during fights, they don't reveal anything about the culture they once lived in, and a lot of the danger is simply that they are extremely mobile enemies with a big health bar. That said, it is interesting that the mage questline features a dragon priest seemingly designed to be difficult for mages to fight. Throughout the dungeon, Morakai saps our entire magicka pool, potentially forcing us to sit around and wait for it to recharge so that we can continue doing the Draugr Crypt. The other questlines do not feature equivalents of sapping stamina before a melee heavy fight, so it's almost as though the designer is intentionally trying to annoy a mage character that is doing a magic questline. The staff absorbs magicka and then once you run out, it starts absorbing your health. It makes sense! Going off of his cryptic dialogue, it's fair to say Morakai's post-life hustle has been to steal power from mages looking for artifacts of Shalador. Reflecting that by giving him a powerful mage-killing staff would be fitting, plus Morakai specializes in lightning magic and can use the spell Command Daedra, making him a powerful anti-caster boss already. But either because Bethesda realized it would be too powerful, or because they didn't have time to actually make his AI use the staff correctly, this idea was lost. And now we have the hilarious image of a powerful lich wielding a powerful ancient staff, but not actually deciding to use it. After we leave and get confirmation that Aaron had left his friends behind, we get confronted by our old school rival, and Con- uh, Estormo? Who the fuck are you? It's a bit out of left field and unusual. We just fought an ancient dragon priest and now we're being confronted by a guy as fraction as powerful. Typically, before a final confrontation, you might have a moment where you reprise a first act conflict. Think of it like dueling your Pokemon rival before or after the Elite Four. Bethesda went to the effort of making and naming this guy for no other purpose than to be a minor speed bump during this quest. When Oblivion did this, it was a council member that we had met before. There's also very little dialogue or insight provided here, just a, Ankano said you were dangerous, I'm gonna have to take that staff. This could be a moment to exposit some information about what the Thalmor are trying to accomplish here, since Ankano isn't going to. There's not even a line like, I can't believe such powerful items were allowed to languish in the hands of such weak men for so long, or anything to really characterize these people. So we head back to the college and Mirabelle is dead. What? How? I healed her. Well, it doesn't bode well that the Archmage and the leader of the college are now both dead. It also means I won't inherit a secretary. We have to use the staff to take down the barrier surrounding the college and we head inside. Cue a boss fight and Don Kano is dead. I do have to say that he is mildly more competent in terms of design than our last black-robed Altmer antagonist. He doesn't have custom spells he's mathematically incapable of casting at least. And he has an invulnerable phase that you have to use the staff to bypass. It's basic, but it's there. However, Ankano does not have a monologue discussing what exactly he's trying to accomplish. Mana Marco made it clear that his short-term goal was soul-trapping Archmage Traven, and you could easily infer from other quests that his long-term goal was to destroy Vanis Galarian's Mages Guild. Ankano is sucking up power or something, but it's pretty obvious he needs the eye for that. As soon as the eye power is gone, he becomes killable again, so whatever he seeks to accomplish would have to be pretty short term. Okay, so how would I fix this? I would give Ankano a speech about how his goal is to destroy the College of Winterhold. He might say he hated having to work here, but moreover, Undermining the magical institutions of men has been a long-term objective of the Thalmor. They're responsible for planting the seeds of distrust for magic among the Nords, especially in Winterhold. However, that was a side effect. In reality, the college was meant to have been destroyed during the Great Collapse, caused by the Thalmor and blamed on the Red Year, but the Augur of Dunlane had kept the college standing. Maybe Ankano was the wizard who summoned the storm and his failure led to him suffering a career setback. So Ankano was assigned to undermine the college's credibility in Skyrim, and merely ended up taking advantage of the opportunity provided by the Eye of Magnus to attempt to destroy the college again, this time hopefully killing the Augur in the process. 
Then the Psychic Order intervenes. They push the player down the right path and it ends in them taking the Eye of Magnus from us. They claim it's for our good since the Eye is unstable, but you can tell this is a lie. In reality, the Psychics are stealing the Eye of Magnus for their own purposes, which may well be the intended interpretation of the game already, but it comes off with an air of incompetent storytelling. You see, the Psychics provided fantastic storytelling opportunities. They are obviously versed in forbidden and illegal magic like teleportation and stopping time. No doubt they can levitate as well. Levitation was the only one that was canonically banned, after all. Teleportation is simply claimed to have been a lost art. In reality, however, it may be possible that the Psychics are responsible for the art being lost, hoarding that power for themselves. It certainly paid off. We are so magically weak in Skyrim that it is doubtful there is anything we could do to stop the Psychics from stealing the eye, even if we wanted to. It's like someone at Bethesda is actively highlighting and point out how much weaker magic has become in the setting by making a powerful group of old wizards who know Morrowind-style magic. Fuck the College of Winterhold, the only reason this questline edges out over the Companions for the award of second worst questline is that the College didn't force me to become a werewolf. Tolfdir figures we should be Archmage, having resolved the situation ourselves. Just a little more salt in the wound, huh? Hey Tolfi, the reason I resolved the situation is that I had external help from the Psijics. Yeah, the college is fucked. Not only do magical institutions run by the player have a history of falling apart, but this one's now being run by someone who can get blackmailed by the Psijic Order. Awesome. We get Aaron's robes, which are useless because even with their effect, they occupy the helmet slot, denying us more enchantment slots. Ultimately, the question remains, why is the College of Winterhold like this? The truth is, the College of Winterhold had the same fate as the magic system of Skyrim. It's pretty much just an excuse to have particle effects. Even the logo and imagery of the College is plastered with the symbol of the eye. It's all about what you see at the surface level. Think about how many times in this questline over the others the game has drawn attention to various effects that the game has. In fact, it was in replaying the game in VR, where I was more attentive due to only playing in 30 minute to hour long chunks, that I noticed just how many times the college questline will do something visually unique. The reality is, the magic questline exists only to bedazzle, just like the magic system. It's a fundamentally incurious story coached in a predetermined prophecy and actions which only exist to further the plotline. Savos Aaron gave Mirabelle the torque we need to enter Labyrinthian, but Savos' story doesn't go anywhere, nor really meaningfully accomplish anything, other than to justify his attitude. Why is he getting wrapped up in this prophecy stuff as well by thinking he will need the torque soon, when he so obviously earlier didn't know about the Staff of Magnus? Why does the Synod researcher tell us the location of the Staff of Magnus despite being at odds with us and rushing off to report the results of his artifact survey? Why does the Augur even exist if they weren't going to do anything in this story with the collapse of Winterhold? The answer is that they wanted to show us some sparkly stuff. In the making of documentary, you can see the designers having a meeting about the Augur's room. They aren't discussing what he meaningfully contributes to the experience of playing through this questline, other than the visual spectacle of being a giant, swirling ball of light. The sad part is, the college has so many good opportunities to really interface well with the rest of Skyrim. You have the mystery of the collapse, you have three distinct ancient cultures you can explore, you have an opportunity to flesh out the Thalmor, you could even make it about the Red Year or repairing the Nordic view of magic. And that's not including the opportunity to make this a character piece about Savos or the New Apprentices. When The Companions was a short and boring story, it didn't create that same feeling of wasted potential because it's a low opportunity premise. So what if it botched the idea of this one specific group of warriors? But it's pretty hard to make that argument that Skyrim hasn't been dumbed down when the faction that is literally a college is just seen as an excuse to create visual spectacle. And for what? That kind of cynicism about the audience only makes sense if Bethesda had been utilizing it in their advertising. They showed off the magic, but not the college. So ultimately we come to my final conclusion which is that nobody cared. It was all about the graphics, which were immediately dated. It accomplished its story of representing magic, but that was supposed to be secondary to telling the story. There was only a college because these games are supposed to have a magical faction. If nobody's chomping at the bit to tell a story about it, then just pass it to the special effects guys and see what they come up with. Alchemy and enchanting were two crafting skills that already existed prior to Skyrim, so their inclusion to fulfill the terms of the Rule of Three was important. Alchemy allows you to use ingredients found in the world to create potions to augment yourself, while enchanting allows you to use souls trapped from fighting enemies to augment your equipment with magical effects. The reason they are discussed together has to do with the fact that they are somewhat tied together. 
See, alchemy can fortify your ability to enchant objects, while enchanted objects can fortify your ability to create potions. It should be pretty obvious what the inherent implications of that idea are, which of course raises the question of whether or not this is an intentional idea on the part of Bethesda. You would have to imagine so. Enchanting was cut as a skill in Oblivion, and Fortify Alchemy did nothing as an effect. This came off as almost a response to people in Morrowind using alchemy to make Fortify Intelligence Potions, and then drinking them so they could make even more powerful Fortify Intelligence Potions. Bethesda has to at least be somewhat cognizant that players will take advantage of these feedback loops to create absurd items to make these changes. And indeed, doing this apparently results in a max Fortify enchantment value of 49%. This is where the effect Fortify Restoration comes into play. Restoration sits atop all the Fortify skill potions, so fortifying Restoration through potions makes those effects even more powerful. This results in what is called the Fortify Restoration Loop. The idea is that you enchant a set of items with Fortify Alchemy, make a Restoration Potion, then unequip the items, drink the potion, and repeat. The restoration effect makes the alchemy equipment more powerful, which in turn results in the second potion being even more powerful than the first. Once you're sufficiently powerful, you make a fortify enchant potion and then use it to create a new set of alchemy equipment with a much higher enchant value to save your progress. Now again, how much of that is intentional is up in the air. Given that they re-added the ability to fortify your alchemy from oblivion, it's fair to say Bethesda knew people would use the effects for this purpose, but maybe not necessarily to the extent that people do, or that the problem would self-regulate. If that's what you want from the game, they left it an option, but they probably only ever intended for players to do it once. Unless, of course, you use the unofficial patch, which hates fun. Now, as fun as creative use of game mechanics are, I'd rather talk about the systems as a whole. Morrowind has 72 ingredients in the base game, while Skyrim has 91, with 18 more being added by DLC, and wow, 75 being added by the Creation Club. Granted, they're mostly just ports of past game ingredients, most of which have to be purchased from Khajiit caravans. Like the previous game, each ingredient has four effects that you learn as you progress, and alchemy works by combining those ingredients with common effects into potions. A change, however, starts with how you actually do alchemy. Alchemy traditionally was done with apparatus. That's not the correct pluralization, but I don't care. There were four types of apparatus, and the minimum you needed was a mortar and pestle. Each one would contribute to the effectiveness of the potion, but would also increase your carry weight. So it was best to keep the other three at home and stay on the go with your mortar, which meant that your alchemy progression was tied to exploration like everything else in the game. As you can see, mechanics and progression. All cut, now alchemy is done at a station. This was by demand of the alchemist trade union in order to increase visits to alchemy shops. Each station is equal in effectiveness, and you cannot improve these stations. Mechanical choice about carry weight and progression through exploration have been replaced with perks. Enchanting is similar, albeit the context is different. Enchanting's only done at stations, but that was inherited from Oblivion. It has been made more freely available to the player, whereas Oblivion enchants were gated behind Mage's Guild progression and paid DLC. Oblivion had cut hand enchanting because the formulas were busted and almost impossible to pull off in Morrowind and decided against trying to fix it. So technically, Skyrim added enchanting back as a skill and added a progression system for it as an addition. For both skills, every 20 levels you can spend a perk point to make your creations 20% stronger, in addition to increases in effectiveness per skill point. These perks are straightforward and boring, but I would actually consider them to not be something that should be cut. Now, let's get into the core of gameplay loops of these skills. To use ingredients, you need to know what effects they have, which of course leads to the taste testing. There are a couple perks in the tree that give you more effects when you eat ingredients, but without the ability to refund those perks, that would be an immense waste. There are a couple potion recipes that you can buy from alchemy shops. While useful, I think the lack of potion recipes for fortify effects is an issue. I also think that they should, like, just teach you the effect of the ingredients instead of having to constantly open them. If I am expected to augment my damage using alchemy, then the least you can do is actually make it easy to figure out how to craft those potions without the internet. None of the effects around making yourself do more damage are primary effects, or in essence, would be listed from taste testing without perks. It's hard to tell given the sheer number of effects involved, but it's difficult to imagine someone stumbling upon Fortify Destruction simply by creating other potion types first. Morrowind avoids this problem by tying the number of effects you know to your alchemy skill. For instance, skill levels 15 through 29 will tell you the first effect, 30 through 44 will tell you the second, 45 through 59 tells you the third, and 60 through 100 will tell you all four effects. 
Oblivion continued that idea, making the first effect known to all, but the final effect requiring upwards of Alchemy 75. So it's kind of a trade-off. They gamified the system more, making it so you have to sacrifice ingredients to learn new potion types, but it also means it may be difficult to actually learn a specific potion type that you desire. For instance, if you want to learn how to make a Fortify Destruction Potion, you would first need to make a Resist Shock Potion from Glow Dust and Glowing Mushroom. As a specific example, Glowing Mushroom lists Resist Shock as a primary, and you can learn Glow Dust also has that effect from a recipe. But I don't really know how you realistically would go about learning to do all that. The UESP does have a list of 73 potions to create that will teach you every effect in the Legendary Edition, but at that point you might as well admit that you just looked up how to make whatever potion you wanted anyways. Remember, base game Skyrim does not come with the ability to grow plants. Every ingredient used has to be sourced from exploration or alchemy shops. I think this is a rare instance where adding more mechanics somehow made a system worse. And the solution's honestly staring us in the face. You can keep the experimentation and taste testing idea, I guess, but instead of adding perks that teach you more effects from testing, just add perks that teach you the effects. Do it in place of the Physician perk. See, I'm not the biggest fan of the fact that you have to take the Physician perk before you take the Poisoner perk. Maglir didn't learn the art to help others. In fact, Maglir was my attempt to try and engage with the alchemy system as naturally as possible. My usual instinct with Skyrim is to hoard ingredients until the point that I decide to do alchemy all at once. Using it as I went was somewhat natural, but the reality was that unless you decide to RP as a dedicated alchemist, I just don't think it's a good system which is probably why there have been multiple attempts to overhaul the Skyrim alchemy system. The perk tree is a mess and potions in the game are a little busted. It's far too easy to stack health potions and live forever, so most people change the system to make potions heal over time, which I would agree is a great way to handle healing effects in the system. Another issue is inherited from the previous games, which is that potion values are determined by magnitude. Sounds innocuous until you learn that this includes negative effects. In fact, the final perk that removes negative effects from potions and positive effects from poisons actually lessens your ability to make money. If, for some reason, maybe you want to have the gold value overflow, you decide to make a lot of money, what you can do is make a potion with as many effects as possible, even though the potion is FUNCTIONAL GARBAGE. Merchants will pay lots of money for it, which you can then use to buy more ingredients. Again, this is where that idea of player-operated shops might actually be useful. Having a system where people come by, buy your spare potions, and sell you ingredients would mildly automate a rather boring part of the game. Perhaps it's less efficient than handling the transactions personally, so that the people who like to play Traveling Merchant don't feel so alienated. What's funny is that Alchemy XP is tied to the value of the potion, which themselves are determined by the game rather than any kind of economy or player value. For instance, you would think an instant health potion would be much more valuable than potions that heal over time, but it's actually backwards, and massively so. This leads to a disconnect between what the player would mechanically perceive as valuable and what is actually valuable according to the game. Moreover, it causes alchemy leveling to snowball, because remember that you make more powerful potions the more you level up alchemy. It's the only crafting skill to have that effect, because increasing item value through smithing comes from tempering not the smithing directly. This leads into enchanting. Enchanting is fairly similar in premise to alchemy. You learn effects instead by breaking down existing items, creating a potential use other than gold for items you don't use. That does leave out all those artifacts you can't disenchant. Maybe the idea could transition to the player being that the artifact is the enchantment and that extracting the enchantment is sort of like channeling the spirit of the item into some other form. Either way, once you know an effect, you can then apply it to a new item using a soul gem. You fill soul gems by soul trapping creatures and killing them. None of this is new, but the system is now so accessible there's zero reason for every character to not participate in the process. In fact, given the tedium of combat, players are encouraged by the allure of doing better in combat. What effects can be put on what items are defined arguably arbitrarily. For instance, you can't apply Fortify Alchemy to every apparel slot, but only head, neck, hands, and rings. That leaves chest, feet, and shield slots open. Now generally what effects go in what slots is presented somewhat logically. Every shield enchantment is about making the player better defensively. The effects do not list which slots they occupy, requiring some trial and error and eventual disappointment about a desired effect not fitting on any desired item. While every effect has a maximum of four potential slots, some effects like Fortify Barter will only have one. Effects are then empowered by soul gem levels, so you create powerful items with grand souls and weaker as you go down. 
While this in theory means that enchanting should be limited by your ability to face enemies with sufficiently powerful souls, veterans obviously know that the most common soul type in the game is also the most powerful. This means that while the discovery element of enchanting functions better than alchemy, the mechanical resource aspect of enchanting is weaker. Enchanting is also invariably tied to smithing as a skill, since you can level both together easily, crafting items and then applying enchants to those items for higher resale value, or just experience. There's also a number of enchantments which dominate in terms of value such as Banish, Absorb Health, Paralyze, Water Breathing, Muffle, and Fortify Sneak. I found that enchanting was the least tedious of the three crafting skills. It's easy to incorporate into the gameplay loop, valuable to do so, and not resource intensive enough to become annoying. I also find the enchanting perk tree to actually be well designed. You can immediately jump into three distinct paths, one for using enchanted items, one for enchanting weapons, and one for enchanting apparel. At the top is the perk extra effect which allows you to apply two effects to an item. While Kratosis in his video sees this as the game selling things we used to be able to do back to us as perks, I really don't have a problem with that. Extra effect is a perk which unlocks a new ability for the player rather than simply making the player x% percent better at using the skill. It means that there is a tangible difference between when you start off enchanting and when you stop. It's not a huge difference, but I think the game would be worse if extra effect was a default ability. Compare that to alchemy, all that changes is that you get better at it. Oblivion did have an idea where master alchemists could make potions using a single ingredient, and really, it's Oblivion's fault. In fact, I'd say that Oblivion's enchanting system is worse than Skyrim's. The real question is, how much worse than Morrowind is Skyrim's systems? While Morrowind's system does allow you to achieve a lot, it has one fatal flaw in my eyes. What is with these enchanting costs? You aren't going to be doing any impressive multi-effect enchantments in Morrowind without a healthy helping of Fortify Intelligence potions, and most people have to engage in mercantile Krav Maga to use enchanting services providers twice. Of course, the high prices were there to offset how absurd enchantments could become, and enchanting worked differently, offering to work as additional spells instead of just player augmentation. And there were more mechanics, like individual creature soul levels distinguishing different levels of power, or different items having different maximum enchant values. You know what, we'll just call Enchanting for Skyrim best in show and write it off as a really bad year. Arcane Accessories is a spiritual sequel to the Oblivion DLC Spell Tomes. Costing a dollar, this creation adds robes and spells. Not really accessories, but okay. The robes are pretty straightforward. There are two sets which each combo a school of magic. One set for alteration and destruction, the other for conjuration and illusion. It basically combines the existing robes of those tiers, so a master set of robes will do 22% spell cost reduction for both schools, making them objectively superior to anything in the base game. It was in the first wave of CC content, back when all we knew about paid mods came from the Steam Workshop, so of course it's more powerful than anything in the base game. Hell, prior to the Anniversary Edition release, the robes would just be deposited into your inventory as soon as the creation was installed. The other aspect to this creation is a list of spells. This is where that open spell and paralyze rune came from. Choking Grasp, Hangman's Noose, Strangulation, and Touch of Death are all health absorption spells. They were actually drain health spells in Back in Oblivion, which meant that they would either instant kill an NPC or have done nothing after 5 seconds. Switching them to Absorb Health may have been necessary if Drain Health is no longer possible in the game, but come on, are you seriously telling me you're going to make Nostalgia Bait for an Oblivion DLC, but you aren't going to put in the effort to actually make the spells do what they originally did? Mara's Wrath is another adapted spell, although rather than creating an explosion of fire and turning undead, now it's a cloak spell. Pride of Hirstang is another adapted spell which did three things, Fortify Strength, Resist Frost, and Summons a Bear. Surprise surprise, Fortify Strength has been changed to Health Regeneration. It's funny because that one goes back to Blood Moon which had Call Bear which just summons a bear. I just like the lineup of Daedra and then there's just a bear among them. Orum's Aquatic Escape makes you invisible for 15 seconds as well as grants water breathing and night eye. Despite those applications, the notable part is that it's significantly cheaper than a regular invisibility spell, which is a running theme of arcane accessories, effectively replacing a lot of base game magic. This is where things get good. The unbounded spells are actually new and each effect does something unique and mildly interesting. They are streaming spells, but flame will lob balls in an arc, Frost will surround you in a blizzard, and lightning will surround you in a storm of lightning strikes. Finally, we have the elemental spells. These make me shake my head in disappointment that I was not using them sooner because they are all overpowered. 
They do the same thing, an explosion of elemental damage of all types, but they're all significantly cheaper than base game destruction magic while benefiting from every elemental perk. They had caught my eye while I was playing, but I had decided against them as to justify not spending those precious perk points, but in retrospect, that was really stupid of me. If the game had been a little more spreadsheety and informative about how spells work, I would have more easily pieced together how absurd the spells are. It's a rather interesting situation. On the one hand, I want to make fun of this creation for adding a bunch of overpowered magic to the game, and even deciding to put all the new spell tomes in a single chest that you get a quest to visit. On the other, it's like the designer wanted to make an attempt at rebalancing magic to actually be better. But they couldn't add spellcrafting because they only had 4 hours to implement all of this, so they added a couple spells from Oblivion but balanced them to the standard that magic should have originally been at. Which leads to another creation released years later, Necromatic Grimoire. This one came out as part of the Anniversary Edition wave for $1 and is necromancy themed. Apparently it was supposed to come out sooner but was delayed due to the pandemic. What? Wait, does that mean this isn't modded content but actually official Bethesda made Creation Club con- Why? While it does add new robes, the aforementioned problem with enchanting new robes over electing to wear existing robes mildly invalidates them. What about the magic? Well, most of it is not necromancy, but in fact just summoning magic. It makes more sense once you realize one critical thing, which is that this creation is actually a tie-in to Elder Scrolls Online. See, around the same time ESO was releasing its Necromancer class, this creation was data mined from a patch for Skyrim. So it seems the intention was to release them concurrently, and then the creation got delayed. The reason that's funny is that Necromancer in ESO plays more like a summoner class than a class built around reanimation, which is what this creation is. But didn't Dawnguard already add the ability to summon the undead, and Plague of the Dead added the ability to summon zombies? There seems to be an obsession with adding more and more undead to this game that already had too many to begin with. I love the undead. <laughs> I try to use them as much as possible. Just bring in one of these guys, pop them down. Funnily enough, though, the player won't accidentally absorb their own summons from this pack, so we have what is likely an official creation, actively acknowledging something that is an issue with the game, and even resolving it internally for the creation, but not actually patching the original issue in the first place. This kind of thing honestly stands out more with these magic-focused creations, probably because of that aforementioned issue with how the original designers didn't care about magic outside of presentation. Many of the new undead pale in comparison to the equivalent summons in base Skyrim. I don't want it to come off like I would criticize a creation for being both over and underpowered, but if you're going to add new expert and master level summons, you should make sure they are around the same level as the Dramora Lords in base Skyrim. Most of them are either pathetic, gimmicks, or redundant with the Soul Cairn spells from Dawnguard. Really, who was this creation for? It does have a leg up on their zombies creation, however, because at least it doesn't add a random world event where you get attacked by a reskinned Draugr. That sounds cool, maybe, until you realize that they're faithful to their Oblivion counterparts in terms of tankiness, but useless at actually doing damage. The only reason this encounter is necessary is for quote, valuable, unquote, mort flesh. Bethesda actually build it as valuable. Further signifying that they don't quite understand what actually makes a potion ingredient valuable. Which I think is a fitting cap on this section. They know they can't ask for a lot of money for creations, which inherently limits the scope of what they can accomplish. So instead of adding some kind of detailed, long-term necromancy gameplay option, they just did what was easy and added more summons. How much can you expect from something they only sold for a dollar? Sorry, the zombies one was actually sold for four dollars. My bad. Skyrim's Dark Brotherhood is a funny thing. The Oblivion iteration is praised as one of the greatest factions in an Elder Scrolls game. Not by me, and I spent time detailing its problems in the Oblivion video. Well, the funny thing is that the Skyrim iteration has not earned that same accolade, and it's kind of curious. You guys know what the Black Hand symbolizes? Uh, and I do want to confirm that QuakeCon, the Dark Brotherhood, is in the game. Fallout 3, who made the Dark Brotherhood famous for Oblivion, he's done it again, it's a great, great faction line. 
If you decide not to do the main quest, there are different quest lines. My favorite quest line is the Dark Brotherhood quest line. You've got the guy who's gotten himself a fancy promotion to senior designer and has even gotten to experience being the lead designer on a popular video game, with three or four years to reflect in retrospect on his past works. Yet even before it was popular to hate Emil for Fallout 4, nobody was really singing the praises of this faction. What happened? Well, that's what we're here to figure out. It starts with initiation. In Oblivion, you had to murder an innocent and then in your sleep you would be contacted by a representative. If it isn't Patrician, he of the Elder Scrolls videos on YouTube. Not so here. Kind of weird. A lot of people praised that aspect of the original guild. Sure, it had the habit of accepting any old murder, innocent or not, but at least it was interesting and unique. In Skyrim, you receive your invitation after doing a quest. Okay. I doubt it's because ML felt compelled to do something new. I mean, have you played Fallout 4? He doesn't seem to have an issue with reusing his ideas, which means that he must see this as a superior method of initiation. Alright, so what's the quest? I mean, at least if it's interesting, that makes it alright. Well, there's a rumor going around that Aventus Arantino is performing the Black Sacrament to summon the Dark Brotherhood, so you have to do his request. Here's the problem with that. In Oblivion, there was a guy who did the Black Sacrament who got life in prison, just for doing the ritual. Yet these Nords are... okay with it. Hey, he's a kid, I don't have the heart to stop him. Guys, he's trying to summon a murderer to your city. It would be one thing if this was solitude. Maybe imperialized culture has caused the local Nords to start looking the other way at this kind of thing. Even though the Imperials are just as intolerant of the Brotherhood, but this is Windhelm, the home of the Stormcloaks. That alone should be cause for someone to kick down his door, especially since Aventus Arantino is an Imperial name. But here's another reason. Windhelm has a serial killer who has been targeting young women. Even noble families have lost daughters. Remember how Torsten Krulsi paid the Thieves Guild to wipe out the Somerset Shadows because he believed they were responsible for his daughter's death, when it turns out all they had done was rob their corpse? Well, the child just outside Arantino's house is Grimvar Cruelcy, meaning it's only a matter of time before Daddy Cruelcy finds out about Arantino. Let's just say I'm a firm believer in an eye for an eye and leave it at that. He fancied himself a thief in some sort of new guild forming around here. Gave me some valuable information before... Well, you know. Emil even shows awareness of this plot later, as one of the Dark Brotherhood quests ties directly into the serial killer storyline. There's also the fact that the Dark Brotherhood are bitter rivals to the Morag Tong, as well as generally worshippers of Mephala. Now, what group of people on Tamriel in the last two centuries have had a cultural revival in the worship of Mephala? And what group of people have a quarter in Windhelm after having sought refuge from the Red Year? I'm just saying, there might be more than a couple Dark Elves in Windhelm who will take issue with this. But, I mean, just because it's gossiped about doesn't mean everybody knows what's going on, right? Well, there's a kid and his Dunmer caregiver outside his house who know. The guards all seem to know. Also tavern keepers. Not in Windhelm, in the rest of Skyrim. Which means that everybody knows, because publicans are rather famous for spreading information. It gets worse from here. Arantino is attempting to summon an assassin from the Dark Brotherhood, but none so far have shown up yet. What's funny is that all three of my characters did this quest, but had heard about it going on for months prior to actually investigating it for themselves. Now sure, you can say that about a lot of things in Skyrim. The open world nature of the game lends itself to this kind of predicament, where you can ignore potentially important things for months, then change your mind and decide to take care of it now. Game writers have generally learned to be pretty robust when it comes to handling this kind of interactivity. However, When we start writing a story at Bethesda, when I start working with the team, we start big. We always want to write the great American novel, right? Fallout 3 will, you know, will be this big epic thing, you're looking for your father, we'll get Liam Neeson to voice the role of the father, and you know, so we always want to tell a huge story, and like, the great American novel, we want to be, let's be the great Gatsby, and you know, or let's be Moby Dick, or let's be the Scarlet Letter, and there's, a, there's an inherent problem with that, right? These are all amazing works of fiction, but they're all non-interactive, right? When you're writing a story for a video game, you always have to keep the player in mind. And so what happens with, we're writing our great American novel, it's, it, it, this is the process, this is what happens at Bethesda when you, when you write the main story of a game, and even some of the smaller stories. So let's say, okay, we're going to write the great American novel. It's going to be this thing. 
and on every page will be written comedy and tragedy and it'll be wonderful, it'll be amazing. And you're gonna give this book, this great American novel to the player. And what are they gonna do with it? They're gonna rip out every page and make paper airplanes out of them. And they're gonna throw them around the room and they're never gonna see your story. Because the story is there, right? But they are gonna spend 30 hours making shacks. He'll spend the next few minutes explaining why it's okay, but the fact that he considers it a bitter pill to swallow says that he must have had a moment of frustration where he believed that people were playing the game wrong. We know that going in. That's, that's the, the jagged pill that we swallow when we do this. It's strange because Oblivion's Dark Brotherhood displayed a level of competence he would never show again when it comes to integrating his stories with the broader world. The Dark Brotherhood made sense to do at any time, with most of it being appropriate to do at your leisure, and only at the end was there a time-sensitive component to the quests. This is why I find it to be an appropriate mix between an open world and a story that tries to create tension. And then you have the Fallout games, which he was the lead designer on, both of which are about leaving the vault to find your missing family members. It's an open world game that distinctly tries to shackle you down with its story to try and create tension. Skyrim's Dark Brotherhood is much the same. People liked the Brotherhood before, so there's no way people are going to ignore a quest involving them as soon as they hear about it. No, we have to drop everything and head straight to Windhelm as fast as possible to do this quest. While most factions in the game have some kind of quest pointing out where to go to start a quest line, they just point out where to go, not explicitly what to do. There's definitely an air with some Skyrim quests that you're meant to drop everything now to go do it, based on how they're interfaced with the rest of the open world. I am supposed to believe Arantino has sat here for months doing the Black Sacrament unimpeded. The thing is, this is not an immersion argument. I can accept that there is a quantum element to it. My immersion is not some fragile thing that breaks at the slightest discrepancy, unlike most Skyrim reviewers. Rather, my problem is that the quest itself later draws attention to this. Arantino doing the sacrament for a long time is a plot point in the quest line. I did the Black Sacrament over and over with the body and the things. And then you came! Arantino wants the matron of the Riften Orphanage dropped due to her being unkind. This is similar to how Oblivion opened with you killing a rapist and murderer, but a lot more overt that that is actually what's happening. You had to be paying attention in Oblivion to know what Rufio did, and who wanted him dead for it. But now Skyrim's a lot more clear about it. After all, wouldn't want people being morally conflicted about their murders. The law also doesn't work in this situation. You can kill Grelod as overtly as possible, and it won't get reported. Not by the children, not by her assistant. Those who shirk their duties will get it. Be careful! It's Grilla. The quest is presented comedically, and I can easily imagine this being a Fallout quest where, like, there's an orphanage of ghouls, and one of the ghoul children escapes and asks you to kill the mean headmistress ghoul. When I grow up, I'm going to be an assassin. That way I can help lots of children, just like you! After doing this quest, you'll receive a note from a courier, the annoying, we know, message, with the signature black handprint, which singularly caused every single handprint everywhere to be posted in Elder Scrolls meme communities as secret black hand signs. It's not like a hand dipped in paint was one of the first things cavemen figured out about art. Are those his... his nostrils? They're... Well, they're nostrils. Did I forget to draw the eyes? Yeah. Oh, well, this one fucking sucks. After you get the note, the next time you sleep, you wake up in an abandoned shack and are confronted by a masked woman named Astrid. She goes on about us stealing the Dark Brotherhood's kill and how we need to make it up to them. Now, you might be wondering, hey, if Arantino was doing it long enough for word to get out around Skyrim about his actions, then surely we can't have actually stolen it from the Brotherhood. What are the odds we would find out before they did? The thing is, they lampshade that very issue in this questline. They don't have the Night Mother to alert them to sacraments. Instead, the Skyrim Brotherhood waits until they hear about the sacrament being performed and then make contact after that. So back to my original question. If Arantino was doing it long enough for word to get out, you see the problem, don't you? Because they don't have the Night Mother, Astrid relies on hearing about the sacrament being performed to find work. 
She apparently doesn't have a network of contacts in each city writing to her every time this happens, otherwise she would have heard about the Arantino job before we had. It's an absurd notion that we somehow got to him before she did, which then raises the next question. Astrid knew about the job, but chose not to do anything with that information. Why she would do that is obviously a matter of conjecture, however, I'm going to say it probably wasn't for testing purposes. It is pretty absurd that no one stopped Arantino in the first place, let alone that Astrid would assume whoever would find him would complete his contract. The Night Mother might arrange something like that, but Astrid doesn't have any contact with her. It's weird to say Astrid decided not to do a job, because then how does she know when we do accomplish it? The Night Mother is not telling her about Sithis being owed to death, and it's bizarre that Astrid would even say that given that we later find out that Astrid's family is actually not practicing any of the religious aspects of the Brotherhood. The final theory I have is that Astrid decided not to do the job because the pay would be bad, but I'm not clear on how she would know that. After all, we're clearly the first person Arantino has spoken to since he thinks we are the representative, and Arantino didn't talk about money, and even Arantino's payment's worth 100 gold, not a big payout, but also not particularly difficult. There are just a lot of problems with this premise, so I'm going to propose a solution using a character we meet later on, Babette. Babette, while looking like a 10-year-old girl, is actually a 300-year-old vampire. This was before that trope really got exposed for what it was. You're watching too much uh, lowly hentai. It's doubtful, even with the physical enhancements of vampirism, that she would be particularly useful in a field that can often result in physical violence. Perhaps she gets mostly poisoning and infiltration jobs, but her primary function in the Brotherhood is actually recruitment. See, the neat thing about children is that they are naive and constantly growing into adults, while new children are born. Perhaps Babette infiltrates communities as a homeless child, similar to some that we see, and makes friends with the local children. She then exploits these relationships to create jobs attractive to adventurers looking for opportunities to kill. After all, children can't afford to pay much, so if you're doing the job for them, it's probably just for that opportunity. Babette then monitors the kill and determines if the person is a do-gooder or a potential recruit and passes that information to Astrid. The neat thing about this particular change is that it doesn't really add any additional elements to the story other than some dialogue and maybe a cameo by Babette at the orphanage. What it does do is plug up the holes created by the Arantino introduction. This is, of course, assuming you wouldn't just want to eschew the entire thing in favor of something like if the player goes to jail for a bounty of 1,000 or more, they're contacted while in jail and the test is escaping. Speaking of tests, Astrid has one for us. We're locked in this shack and she says one of the three people tied up in the room has a contract on their head and Astrid wants us to figure out which one it is. Fultheim is a sellsword who doesn't know who wants him dead but admits it's a probability in his line of work. Aelia is a mother with a bad attitude who figures someone might want her out of their life. Vasha is a Khajiit who openly admits this isn't his first time. Astrid has a line for whomever you kill as well as whatever combination of people you kill. However, the worst lines are for when you only kill two people. The singular kills and the Astrid lines for when you kill all three are much better. Which one will you choose? Well, well. Aren't we the overachiever? Three possibilities, three victims. Must have been one of them, right? So why take chances? However, there is another option. No, it's not stealing the key. We can steal her signature dagger and her clothes, but I guess Astrid has hidden the key somewhere even talented pickpockets can't reach without detection. No, the other option is to kill her, and I guess pull the key out of her ass. Oblivion had the same option. If you wanted to, you could kill Lucian when he approached you, and that would end the questline. It was nice because instead of Lucian being essential, you had a way to opt out of the story. However, Skyrim actually goes a step further, Although before I mention it, I should say that you have to kill Grelod to reach this point, so there's no way to destroy the Brotherhood and keep your hands clean, which of course is why Grelod has to be so evil. After killing Astrid, you can report the incident to a guard who then sends you to Commander Marrow in Dragonbridge. He's the ranking commander of the Pinatus Oculatus, an organization filling the role of the Blades from past games. Marrow is quite interested in this information and will give us the passphrase to the Brotherhood hideout and instructions to clear it out. Okay, a bit odd there are no reinforcements or that you were just sitting on this information, but hey, if your character's morally good, then it's really refreshing that you're at least given the option. Shoring took this road, while Maglir and Delta Fear did the rest of the questline. 
We head to the Sanctuary, we get a free set of shrouded armor, and meet the members of the Dark Brotherhood. If we come as a new member, then the family will be sharing stories in a circle. It's kind of cringe, right? Because they're doing this near the word wall where they have a dining room they could be doing it in. Not the swapping stories part, although hearing the child voice actor trying to do an in-character old person impression caused me internal pain. Sir, my mama and papa left me all alone, and I'm so very hungry. I know a shortcut to the candy shop, through this alley. Oh yeah, very good, very good. Mine is dark down here. Oh, but you are so beautiful, such a lovely smile. Your teeth! No! Is it weird that they're doing this but don't do it later? Not really, considering Astrid probably told them a new member is going to be joining today. They really do seem like a fraternal order of assassins who take the concept of family extremely seriously. Astrid doesn't have a contract for us yet, and instead has us speak to Nazir about getting work. It makes sense that Astrid doesn't have work for us, considering the method she is currently relying on to find new work, but it's a bit odd that Astrid is so hasty in trying to find a job for us to do. We only just got here. Now sure, the Cyrodiil Dark Brotherhood and Morag Tong both had jobs for the player to complete out the gate, but that seemed to be because they were flush with work. They had the Night Mother to give them work in Shadenhall, while in Morrowind, the Morag Tong was a legal organization who had plenty of work with the Great Houses to accomplish. However, Nazir does have jobs for us. Three, in fact. For some reason, these aren't considered to be serious contracts, despite the fact that people are seriously killed and serious money changes hand for the deed. Now, what happens here is called poisoning the well. The idea is that I can go on a long and bloviating tangent about something that isn't really relevant, and some people would point out that that was what was happening. However, if I start by saying that the tangent is going to be long and bloviating, then people are more likely to notice and comment. These jobs are not different from the dead drop quests you get in Oblivion or the writs of execution in Morrowind. Here's a target, go kill them. The difference is that Skyrim draws attention to these being simple quests. These aren't particularly glamorous assassinations, I'll be honest. Don't pay much either, but they'll keep you busy. See what I mean? Nazir draws direct attention to the fact that the quests are simple, that they don't pay much, and that they're ultimately busy work. Whereas in Oblivion, you only receive the dead drop quests after being appointed to the position of Lachance's silencer. Lucian never drew attention to these being simple quests. Mix that with the fact that Oblivion started with its best quest first and suddenly the Dark Brotherhood is considered a good faction. It's a neat trick. We start with three jobs, Narfi, Beytild, and Enodius Papias. It's a bit weird. Nazir says we can just do these whenever, but why? I mean that with sincerity. Why isn't there a time component to these contracts? Isn't there somebody out there waiting for these people to die? What if they get tired of waiting and decide to hire a regular mercenary to do the hit? There's also the why question in a metatextual sense. Why do these quests need to exist in Skyrim? I can understand and actually approve of the decision to not immediately hand in an important contract to the player when they first join, like pretty much every other faction in the game, and I actually appreciate simple and straightforward jobs because you can make a lot of them. These aren't radiant quests either, so there's some thought being put into them. I just don't understand why it was necessary to make these contracts appear casual. Is the Dark Brotherhood in hard times, having difficulty finding work? Or are they so busy with work that they don't have enough time to finish up on all the little jobs they have? Which is what these are? Take the first target, Narfi. He's a homeless beggar living in Iverstead. He has a very short side quest where you try and figure out what happened to his missing sister. The local innkeeper is afraid his sister has died, but doesn't want to break the news to him. We search for her corpse and return her necklace to him, being given a choice of whether or not we tell him the truth. This quest is extremely basic, but it's interesting that they actually gave an assassination target content prior to his death. It means there's a chance, however slim, that the player might actually know Narfi, know about his plight and his mental illness. Now, I believe it is actually possible to spare Narfi, as I think you can get away with only doing two side contracts. I say I think because I was not going to play through the questline a third time just to test the theory. The problem is that you can only get the later contracts by doing all of the first three, so Narfi has to die. Okay, that's all well and good, but why exactly are we just sitting on this job? Surely somebody on their way to another job can stop by Iverstead and kill an isolated homeless man, especially since our guildmates will talk about the jobs they've done in Morrowind. Speaking of, the Brotherhood members will discuss their work with each other, even after the initial group discussion. This can be annoying if you're trying to record dialogue and the people in the other room are having a full volume conversation. 
However, it gets better because these conversations are considered radiant, meaning that they are the last refuge of Oblivion-style idle conversations. I'm going to read you a transcript of a conversation, and I want you to guess from this cast of characters who has had it. So, is it true? You're referring to that blacksmith contract. By Sithis, you slew everyone. Well, except for that one you kept alive to serve as witness. Does your wickedness, or your skill, know no bounds? Ah, contracts like that are few and far between, it seems. Makes me long for the old days. So, do you have a guess? Because you're right, congratulations. You don't even have to tell me, because the people who can have this dialogue are... Everybody. This is kind of like Oblivion where every voice type pulls from a pool of generic dialogue to generate conversations. You could overhear crack addicts discussing geopolitics, although that's actually pretty realistic. The difference is that for some reason it was decided that there should be a pool of common dialogue among everybody. Apparently everybody here has hidden inside the body of a mammoth during one of their contracts. Seven different people all have the same dialogue lines, but recorded by their individual voice actors, so about 150 voice lines are redundant for this little system, in addition to the non-redundant lines bringing the total closer to 180. Big question being why, because I noticed on my first playthrough that everyone's stories were sounding very similar. It's the worst of both worlds. You could have used a lot less dialogue by recording specific stories for each NPC, but I guess I applaud the attempt at making dynamic dialogue. However, 180 voice lines isn't really a lot in the grand scheme of Skyrim's 60,000 voice line pool, and it's definitely not enough for the system. Given the number of times you'll be returning to the sanctuary being a minimum of 9, but potentially more, the probability is too likely that you'll hear the same extremely specific voice lines get used by multiple NPCs. It doesn't help that many of these conversations take place in the background of dialogue that you may be having with Astrid or Nerzir, needlessly distracting you from the story to hear irrelevant, radiant dialogue. Either get rid of the system, or scale it up to where it's improbable that a player would hear the same story twice, or randomly assign the stories to each NPC at the start of a playthrough. I think the goal of the system is to make it seem like the NPCs aren't just hanging out in the clubhouse all day by pretending that they actually go out and do things. I think that would only really work if the NPCs did ever actually leave the sanctuary. Talandril and Shadenhall would. You could encounter her out in the world and even potentially during contracts. Anyways, we should really get back to work. I'm not exactly clear on who it is that wants Narfi killed. Plenty of speculation, but I personally don't believe the theory that he got killed just to clear him out, considering Iverstead is an actively shrinking town. There's plenty of space for new development without claiming Narfi's burned out house. Then you have Anodius Papias. He's paranoid that someone's out to kill him, so he left his old job site at a mill. Again, I'm not entirely clear on who wants him dead. You can speculate plenty in both cases, however my general rule is to not accept I don't like them as a motive for hiring assassins. Not just no. The people yeah. that have like <laughs> inconvenienced you in the slightest way. It's like, oh, it turns out that guy that fucking scratched my car, he killed himself. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Remember last week when I got into an argument at the bodega with that guy? He killed He's himself. Also, he also he, killed himself. He killed himself. Oh, yeah, no, that yeah. old landlord I had that didn't give me my security deposit back. Yeah, he had a, he, uh, uh, was car at, the accident. at the gym and choked himself to death while bench pressing. <laughs> yeah. Baytild is much clearer. She's a mine overseer in Dawnstar who is having a public feud with her ex-husband who runs a competing mine. It's not stated outright, but when even stuff like their political opinions are directly contrary to each other, well, needless to say, the old leg elf couldn't handle that strong Nord pussy. With one or three contracts done, we can get our first real contract from Astrid. See what I mean? We just killed three people, but that wasn't real work because of the way the game presented it. It doesn't help that after each mission, Nazir will make a comment. Now, he will come to respect the player's work, but at first... Congratulations. You slaughtered an emaciated beggar in cold blood. You are truly an opponent to be feared. And I hope you were careful in that lumber mill. Those splinters and rusty nails can be quite nasty. I hear the mining business is extremely cutthroat. And those hours, the murder. I could do this all day. Now, I don't think Bethesda is wrong to do this. Just that opening with two milk runs that you're forced to do and insulted after doing before you're allowed to do the quote-unquote real work is going to color people's opinions in a way that Oblivion doesn't. The game even doubles down on this being bitch work after you get your first real contract. The contracts I dole out are fairly simple. Go to a location and kill the target. But this is different. 
The jobs Astrid gives you will be more important and usually more complex. Before we get our real work, however, there's been a development. A jester has arrived alongside the corpse of the Night Mother. The Brotherhood has been without a listener for 13 years, that being the person who actually talks to the Night Mother, meaning that for this period of time there's been no magical mechanism through which the Brotherhood could find Black Sacraments. This is actually potentially the second time you'll have run into Cicero, the first time being on the road between Dawnstar and Whiterun, where you can find a wheel on his wagon has broken. You can convince a nearby farmer to help him out, or turn him into the guards. Reporting him ends in the family's death, which they deserve actually, given the wife was busy cutting me up while I was talking to her husband under the pretense of trespassing. It is interesting that Bethesda was brave enough to create an optional, and potentially missable, scenario without trying to force the player's nose into it. Originally, you would be pointed to this side quest when you overheard a conversation in Whiterun, but this was cut, and I say that's good. That's one of those areas where the cutting room floor mod always makes me raise an eyebrow, because sometimes stuff being cut is a good thing. I'm not a big fan of quest timings in RPGs, especially in extremes like Dragon's Dogma or Dark Souls. Quest timings being when the game gives you very specific windows to be able to do side content in that's only defined by arbitrary stages. However, Modern Bethesda has often gone for the other extreme, to the point of its own ridiculity. It feels like nothing ever happens in a game like Skyrim because it doesn't ever really try to even create the illusion that time is passing. In a typical Skyrim quest, if they wanted to portray Cicero's journey, the quest would involve being sent by Astrid to a point in the road where Cicero is and meeting with him then doing an objective for him, like clearing a cave of bandits or Draugr. Cicero would be instantiated at that point, and then afterwards be teleported to wherever he needs to be for the next player-related thing that he will do. While the wagon quest is just an illusion, illusions tend to go a long way in video games. Elder Scrolls games often achieve something akin to this by having NPCs actually physically travel between locations. Instead of just running into the Khajiit caravans in different cities where they teleport when you're not looking, you can actually run into them out in the world, traveling. By creating an optional opportunity to meet Cicero, they make something special for the player to discover. It is rather obvious that Cicero is going to be a main character for some questline, what with the voice actor and unique outfit, but again, baby steps. Astrid has been working hard and has come up with a contract for us. We're to meet a woman in Markarth named Yuri. That's the extent of what Astrid knows about this contract. I'm not sure what she really arranged for us here, but as compensation, she's willing to allow us to keep the full payment. Miuri is an apprentice alchemist who wants her ex-boyfriend killed, with a bonus if we kill one of her ex-friends as well. The context is that one of her friends was murdered in Windhelm by the town serial killer. Yes, that plot point came back within only a couple quests. Even better, this is about another Windhelm clan who lost a daughter, a clan which ended their relationship with Miuri after she was used by a bandit in a robbery scheme. They were mad enough to cut ties with Miuri, but I guess none of them had the heart to stop Argentino, bless his heart. These Nords would absolutely assume that Arantino was killing all these young women in his town after his mom died. Elaine Dufont is the bandit who actually exists in the world prior to this quest and you can even chance running into him during a DLC quest. You cannot, however, return the Shatter Shield heirloom of Aegis Bane that he had stolen. Her friend, Nilsine, is the bonus objective due to living in Windhelm. Muri wants the family to suffer since they falsely accused her of responsibility. I have to say that it seems like intentional design to make the town murder optional, like it's tutorializing the idea. Except Baytild was also a town murder, so I'm gonna have to ask for those points back. Plus you made me run a dungeon. The bonus reward is a ring that lets you make 15% better potions, which is pretty good until you get a fairly high level of enchanting. I have to question why an aspiring alchemist would give something like this up, but I imagine the goal is just to mechanically encourage assassins to try utilizing custom poisons. With two jobs and a wild night down, Astrid apparently trusts us more than she does the Night Mother's Keeper, Cicero. She wants us to spy on conversations that he's having privately, which will be easy given that we have the ability to go invisible. Of course, that won't cut it. It'll be no use clinging to the shadows. They'll see you for sure. No. You need a hiding place. Somewhere they'd never think to look. Like... Inside the Night Mother's coffin. The guy whose primary responsibility is maintaining the remains of the Night Mother will not look inside her coffin? I mean, other family members will point out that the goal of this is to show that Astrid is just being paranoid, but the goal is to also put the player in physical contact with the Night Mother so that she can reveal our promotion to Listener of the Dark Brotherhood, effective leader of the entire organization. 
This is definitely a subversion of Bethesda norms, and maybe even a deconstruction of how quest lines have typically been written in the past. The point of the story is that the player has had leadership thrust onto them unusually quickly, and how poorly the existing members are going to respond to that sudden shift in status quo is an analysis of that trope. It's actually surprisingly smart and well thought out. This is the right faction for the story because the Brotherhood is a religious organization whose leaders are appointed by a metaphysical entity rather than a traditional meritocratic hierarchy. And the faction is in the right state for the story, what with their gradual downfall over the past 200 years. Is Astrid a dumbass? Yeah, that's the point. She complained that a crazy person was frantically talking to himself and the punishment for her error is being supplanted in authority. This is a pretty big deal too, as having the listener again can mean only good things for the faction. Instead of having to hear rumors about the sacraments, we can once again rely on the secrecy of the Night Mother. And, as an added bonus, we have a job. Amand Motieri in the ruins of Volenrood. Astrid knows where that is, but refuses to tell us, instead tasking us with doing bitch work while she molds it over. We can, however, ignore this order if we know where Volenrood is and go anyway. Again, this is smart. By rights, we're the leader now, and don't have to take orders from Astrid. Alright. Now, is all of this actually competent? Now let's take things back a step. Your first target is an orc bard named Lurbuk. He is, by all accounts, the worst bard in all of Skyrim. Apparently, so many people sought his death, Astrid had to hold a lottery to determine the client. Congratulations, that's so fucking stupid that it invalidates three paragraphs worth of praise. I'm gonna go ahead and give Mr. Pangliarulo the benefit of the doubt here and assume that he means for Nazir to be joking. We know the Morthal Innkeeper doesn't want Lurbeck whacked, as she'll report the crime and also states that if Lurbeck wasn't paying for his room, she would not tolerate his presence. Remember, Astrid has to find contracts the old-fashioned way, so the idea that she was confronted by multiple people wanting the same guy dead, and she didn't just take all of their money. I mean, I've never heard a set at a bar so bad that I wanted to hire a dark web crypto assassin to kill the band players, and subsequently, I was not told to keep my money due to losing a lottery to bid on their deaths. As for our other job, someone wants us to kill a vampire. Romeo and Juliet here are a vampire duo running a mill by the lake. They seem to have a maid too. If I'm supposed to take away that they're threats to society, Bethesda's been unusually subtle about it. There's no obvious evidence of them waylaying travelers on the road. There is a corpse not too far from their house, but again, that's unusual subtlety. No clue if it's connected to them. I would expect, like, corpses strung up in the basement or something. Also, don't know who wants Hearn dead, as Hurt will protect him with her life and no one else is here. Like, who wants this to happen? The Dawn Guard? Of course, you know me, I went to Volenrood while I was out murdering and met with Motieri. He is, of course, a reference to Francois Motieri from Oblivion's Dark Brotherhood questline. Amand has come to Skyrim and performed the Black Sacrament, which we can actually see in order to request our services to assassinate the Emperor. Okay, yeah, I'm down. I think this is meant to be a follow-up to the Oblivion Elder Scroll heist quest, where a questline will focus on a singular story. We get an amulet for expenses and a sealed letter as instructions. The letter just contains coded instructions that explain the quests that are going to follow. There's no acknowledgement from Astrid about us meeting Motieri before she gives us the order to do so. She just ends the conversation after giving the order. Talk to this Armand Motier, and let's see where all this leads, hmm? You're back. Good. All right, so, did you meet this Motier? What did he want? That is a shame, as she would absolutely have an opinion about us ignoring her orders to go do side work, to instead go do the Night Mother's bidding. She wants to analyze the letter while we take the amulet to Delvin Mallory to get it appraised. He exchanges it for a 15,000 gold line of credit and informs us that the amulet signifies that Amand is a member of the Elder Council. The Elder Council are members of Imperial Nobility who serve as advisors to the Cyrodiilic Emperor. It's a bit odd that one would be attempting to assassinate the Emperor, Titus Mead II. This is because the Elder Council is already the highest office one can achieve on Tamriel without becoming Emperor outright. It's actually unclear if Emperor Titus has heirs, however he is pretty old and is the fifth Mede Emperor, meaning that the Mede family are more than likely to resume the throne even if he were to die. So Astrid's theory that Motieri is seeking a promotion is… unlikely. The game does not present the idea that the Motieri family are Thalmor aligned, nor have I ever really heard that theory. Again, I find this unlikely. The only way murdering the Emperor would stand to benefit the Motieri family is if they believe the Almeri Dominion is about to replace the Mede Empire, and they made a deal that they would maintain their positions on the council and the Aldmeri government. 
Not that it's impossible, and I actually believe there's a moderate chance this is where Bethesda is intending to take the series, but it's also the sort of idea that you might actually want to allude to in the game if that's the case. No, instead, like most Dark Brotherhood quests, the motivation for the murder is going to remain nebulous at best. We know that Amand wants to do it, and that he stands to benefit in some way, and the rest is open for interpretation, because that's what Elder Scrolls is about, right? It's not about the actual writing, it's about creating prompts for people on the Imperial Library and Reddit to write their own speculative rationalizations and fanfiction. Trust me, I'm aware that I am plenty guilty of this, but it's not as fun with Skyrim. The Mayrun's Dagon theory is fun because there's enough rope in Oblivion to hang myself with. It's a good conspiracy theory because it ties together many disparate ideas to create a level of plausibility. Skyrim's version of conspiracy theories is lazy, it's a prepackaged noose. It's literally just saying that X group is behind everything. Assuming Motieri's working for the Thalmor is only plausible because it's the one trick Skyrim has and it's so bad that even modders resort to using it. Instant plot, just add water. I do not know this word, Thalmor. But if you mean the elves, they were trying to learn the secrets of forging Stalrim. The Brotherhood has no basis to oppose this contract. Whether the Empire or the Dominion rules Tamriel is irrelevant because both governments will criminalize our activities anyways. The first leg of this assassination is to kill Vittoria Vici. She's the overseer of Solitude's branch of the East Empire Company, fiancé of Asgir Snowshod, and first cousin to the Emperor. We're killing her at her wedding, which is interesting. Clan Snowshod are Stormcloak aligned, and Asgir is an investor and partner in Maven Blackbriar, who herself has connections in the Empire, as well as being the real power running Riften. This wedding has implications regardless of when it happens or what has happened in the Civil War. If Ulfric wins, then it's a political marriage helping to build an alliance between an independent Skyrim and the Empire. If the war's ongoing, then it's an attempt at peace, but also undermining the Stormcloak's hold on Riften. If the Empire wins, then it's an attempt at reconstruction. Ulfric will even refuse to besiege Solitude if the wedding's ongoing. We're ready to march on Solitude, but the Emperor's cousin is getting married. If royal blood was spilled, all of Cyrodiil would be up in arms. We can't afford an all-out war with the Empire, so we'll bide our time for now. What's also funny is that Astrid has a line if the reverse is true, where if you start the siege before attempting to start the wedding mission. You. You're responsible for the Siege of Solitude. By Sithis, this undermines all our plans. Fool! Finish that mess, and only then will we speak. This wedding, however, will not be happening. It is a shame the wedding doesn't occur if you choose to wipe out the Brotherhood. But I guess accounting for the politics of this successful union would have been a bit of work. Anyways, Motieri's goal with Vici's death is to lure the Emperor to Skyrim on account of the fact that this is the setting of the game and they aren't going to recreate part of Cyrodiil for this questline. I mean, they would honestly probably just have the wedding in Bruma, that being the middle ground for the three most important parties involved. However, we're just told by Astrid to kill Vici, so understanding what exactly Motieri wants requires us reading the sealed letter which Astrid will call sloppy. Babette proposes dropping a loose hanging statue on Vici while she's given a speech, which fulfills Astrid's bonus condition of this contract. I'm sure Astrid means to make the murder as public as possible, but I feel like the bride dying anywhere at her own wedding would accomplish that same goal. The bonus is only gold anyways. The problem with the statue is that it's an accidental death. That's good for most jobs, but when the goal of the death is to draw someone out, then the method becomes very important. Is the big E really going to show up if his cousin's killed in a tragic accident? Or is he more likely to show up if she's publicly murdered? You could make cases for both. I just thought I'd mention this to get it in your mind for later. Personally, I like using Frenzy to make other people do the killing for me. This leads to pandemonium, but it gets the job done. However, Vici left the Overlook to go fight people on the ground and died in the reception area, forfeiting my bonus. Vizarro will also show up to fight people and cause a distraction, but that's kind of weird in itself. Okay, so I get out fine, but now Vizira has to fight his way out of the city instead. Seems pointless to me. I think the only point is to make it seem like this is a team effort. Funny thing, one of the priests is lying dead in the reception area, naked. I don't know when or how, but he had died at some point, but the game doesn't actually check for that and will bring dead guests to the reception anyways. It's definitely a loose quest. Not just in terms of functionality, the bugs page says as much. I'm not clear if the goal is to draw the Emperor here for a funeral or to crack down on violence in the province. Perhaps it's an open-ended goal, to encourage flexibility in the approach, but then why are there so few actual options? I can't help but feel someone played some blood money between Oblivion and Skyrim. Unfortunately, Absolution came out in 2012, so I can't make the joke that I want to. 
The problem with taking Hitman as an inspiration is due to the genre differences. Hitman is a linear series of independent missions, while Skyrim is an open world game that endeavors to have its characters exist and interact with the world before their quest. Agent 47 can perform so terribly that he jeopardizes future contracts because the missions aren't continuous. It's assumed that 47 did a good job, even if the player doesn't. I'm going to assume the goal is to lure the Emperor to Skyrim to attend his cousin's funeral. It seems like this should be harder if word gets out that Vici was assassinated, which is inevitable since an assassin shows up to fight the guards, even if Vici dies in a plausible accident. Where Skyrim can shine is by having contingency missions. Do a bad job in one area, but make it up in others. Do a bad enough job overall, and maybe even create commentary on your poor performance. This is a delicate matter and has to be handled exactly right. Part 2 of Motieri's plan is vague, but involves crippling the security for the Emperor. In this case, we need to weaken the Penitus Oculatus. Rather than killing their commander, we are instead going to implicate the commander's son Gaius in a conspiracy to assassinate the Emperor. Motieri didn't specify that plan exactly, and I don't exactly understand how this is supposed to work. Obviously, this is meant to create a false sense of security by making it seem like the threat has ended. The letter we planned, however, doesn't specify that Gallus was even involved in the Vici incident. Nothing will stand between your men and his eminence. He will die by Stormcloak hands, and neither my father nor your great leader Ulfric will even know anything is amiss until too late. Um, interesting play, making it seem like an independent plot rather than a Stormcloak ploy. That does make sense, because it means the Stormcloaks aren't going to be a continuous threat should the Emperor visit. The problem is the detail of how Marrow is implicated. We kill Marrow and plant the letter on his body. Our bonus comes from killing him in the city so that he's detected faster, which is strange because it seems like the point of killing him in the city should be that he gets detected at all. There are plenty of people in Skyrim who would pick his corpse clean and leave the body for the animals. You're walking down the street, suddenly you see a man lying on the ground, dead. He has been stabbed 36 times and laying just inside his jacket is an immaculate letter saying that this man plans to murder the president. No, not even that. This man plans to leave all the doors to the White House unlocked so someone else can murder the president. You can make it look like Mero was killed in a self-defense situation, but people everywhere should pick up pretty quickly that there are some holes in this story, like why a man who had it made on an assassination plot would randomly go crazy and get himself killed. It's as unsuspicious as the death of Mero also patrols all five major cities in Skyrim every week. Actually, only in five days. It's quite incredible that this man gets around to every city in this massive province and Jarl Ulfric is just okay with having an Imperial agent inspecting his city and guards. Upon our return to the Sanctuary, however, there has been a speed bump to our progress. Cicero decided to try and murder Astrid, but only managed to wound Vizara. Arnbjorn chased him off into the forest and Astrid gives us her horse, Shadowmere, to pursue him. We have to get a lead first, so of course there are some convenient journals in Cicero's room to hint to where he is going. We find Arnbjorn wounded outside the Dawnstar Sanctuary, which is where Cicero had been keeping the Night Mother in the seven-month interim between Cicero's departure from Cyrodiil and his decision to finally meet with Astrid. Kind of him to include the past race to the Sanctuary in his journals that he did not collect before attempting to murder somebody. Needless to say, this is pretty trap-like, what with the ghosts of the Dark Brotherhood and the Uter Fricta, which is a Pagliarulo favorite. Cicero's lying on the ground, wounded. He offers us a choice, pointing out how twisted it is that the Night Mother's Keeper and the Listener are at odds, but he's faking. I can't really justify killing Cicero, though, but apparently this is something Todd Howard himself insisted be put into the game. What are you doing? I'm posting false information on the web. Why? It's fun. Cicero's problem is that he doesn't approve of how the Brotherhood in Skyrim has operated independent of the tenants. Wow. You and me both. Cicero is a madman, but he's a correct madman. Astrid was running the real clown show without the Night Mother, but that wasn't her fault. It only became her fault when she started to have a problem with us, the listener. So, I always lie about killing Cicero. Plus, honestly, there isn't really any benefits to knocking him off. If I wanted his gear, I could just pickpocket it off him. Not that I would want it, because it's not very good. Astrid wants to get the show back on the road, and the next step is to find and replace the chef who will be preparing a meal for the Emperor. He is anonymously referred to as The Gourmet. Which would be a problem if old Festus hadn't found an autographed copy of his book Uncommon Taste belonging to the chef of Understone Keep. Anton spills pretty easily. Yeah, some friend you are. Then we just have to kill Anton so he doesn't spill about our plans to anybody else. I enjoy the explosive approach to this quest. We're looking for Balagog Gronolob, who is residing at the Nightgate Inn in Skyrim. His anonymity is owed to the fact that orcs are still heavily discriminated against in Tamriel, especially in matters seen as higher arts. While I doubt the Emperor would actually object to having a meal cooked by an orc, 
There is little doubt that Uncommon Taste would not have been as popular had he used his real name instead of the pseudonym. He would never have gotten the opportunity to cook for the Emperor without keeping his racial identity a secret. As interesting an examination of racial politics as this seems, that's the extent of it. Balagog Gronolob is hiding his identity because he is an orc. He's been living on retainer in the basement of an inn that once belonged to a village named Helyarkin that ended up being cut content. That's the reality of the Nightgate Inn. It is not some isolated corner designed to evoke a feeling of melancholy. It's the only surviving piece of cut content. I love Nightgate Inn. Really, it's not special in any way, but that makes it feel more real to me. It's just a part of this world, and it's okay that it doesn't have a story to tell the player, because not every place needs something for the player, and sometimes your imagination tells a more interesting tale anyway. And by the way, just because I include something doesn't necessarily mean I think it's objectively 100% wrong. NKB's argument about the world building is generally correct, it's just funny that he spends so much time analyzing Nightgate Inn, and how harsh life must be for its inhabitants, without actually having looked it up and realizing that it was supposed to be a settlement the size of Riverwood with an apothecary, blacksmith, and farmhouses. He doesn't really cook and only leaves his basement once a day to fish in the pond. I question the need to even hide his body, considering I doubt the innkeeper would even know to report his death to the appropriate sources. I mean, if Commander Mero eventually heard about this guy dying, he can't connect it to the Gourmet because our plan hinges on Mero not knowing who the Gourmet is. Hiding his body is funny. His dagger counts as part of his body, so dragging it into a secluded location will fulfill that condition. On the flip side, turning Balagog into a pile of ash will not. He will also resist attempts to resurrect his body, which would usually be the ultimate way to dispose of him out in the middle of nowhere. We take the writ off his corpse and return to Astrid, who informs us that it is time. To start, you'll overhear a couple Pinatus Oculatus agents loudly having a conversation about how safe the Emperor must be, now that the plot has been uncovered with Gaius. Then we meet with Commander Mero, who will comment whether or not we're wearing our chef tunic and hat. After that, we head into Castle Dower and meet with the chef? By Azra, the gourmet. I'm... I'm sorry. Your clothes, of course. I... I should have realized. Please, excuse my ignorance. For some reason, Castle Dower and the Blue Palace both have different chefs. I guess Gianna spends her days cooking meals for General Tolius and the five guys training out in the courtyard. She makes us put on a chef's hat, which I lament. What if all our cooking skill was being fortified by our helm of domination? Ah, well anyways, we get a series of options about what to put in the meal. This is a microcosm of the dialogue options we've been given throughout the quest line. A serious choice, a joke choice, and silence. Yeah, Fallout 4 should really be making sense right about now. Alright, what next then? A giant's toe? You're sure about that? Of course, I'm sorry. One giant's toe, there. What, uh, what next? Astrid had given us a poisonous herb to use in the meal. This material is actually an alchemy ingredient, so if we choose not to use it here, we could elect to use it later, which can be used to create some pretty powerful poisons. Unfortunately, it can't be grown or duplicated, so you only get to use it once. Still, I like that it actually has this property and isn't just a miscellaneous quest item. Gianna will decide not to taste this meal after we add our secret ingredient, and we take it up to the dining hall where the Emperor is, hanging out with some unnamed nobles. We do the deed, but... BETRAYAL! What? BETRAYAL! 10 out of 10! Mero confronts us. We didn't kill the Emperor, just a body double. I kind of rushed to get to the mid-act twist because if there's anything I hate doing, it's pretending to be ignorant of future plot points. One of our family members has betrayed us, making a deal with Mero that the Sanctuary would be left alone in exchange for our life. But who could it have been? Come on, don't even pretend, it's obviously Astrid. And Mero's gonna double-cross her, killing us and wiping out the Falkreath Sanctuary because... Well yeah, why wouldn't you? Sure enough, the Oculatus has torched the place. Most everyone is dead, barring Nazir and Babette. Nazir because there may still be bitch work to complete in Babette because... Well, you can't kill children. Killing a little girl at her birthday party. Astrid has survived, albeit in a burned state. She apparently performed the sacrament on herself, which... Well, I just don't think you want the precedent of the sacrament working on a living person out there. You know, rituals need rules. Astrid wants us to kill her, okay? I assume this is going to be a symbolic admission of wrongdoing on Astrid's part by embracing the old ways in her death. Except we were still doing the sacrament thing when she was alive, that was not the old way that she had abandoned. Plus, people converting on their deathbed is always lame. Yeah, that's real convenient of you. We picked up a second blade of woe, since I stole the first one, 
and now I need to dump some stuff on you. Astrid's problem is that, in the absence of the Night Mother, she became the mother of the Sanctuary. Despite the varying opinions of the Brotherhood, the universal factor is that they all share a loyalty for Astrid. But the thing is, it's a universal truth of Skyrim characters, unless you rush this particular storyline, that you will be ambushed on the road by a Dark Brotherhood assassin, a person who was part of Astrid's family. They even have orders with her name attached to them. The sealed letter you delivered to me was mysteriously unsealed upon its arrival. I can only assume you've read its contents. Sloppy. Hell, Delta Fear got jumped multiple times by Astrid's assassins. She is a paradoxical mixture of orthodoxy and liberal-minded philosophy. When we took the Arantino job, her problem was that the contract belonged to the Night Mother, a Night Mother Astrid hasn't heard from in years. Astrid values her family over the five tenets, so much so that she's willing to spy on the Keeper Cicero out of paranoia, and she betrayed us, again, out of the interest of protecting her family. Yet she has no problem inviting someone into her ranks who has an open contract on their head and has taken her family members' lives. She hates that we became the listener, but has no comment for us actually going over her head and meeting with Motieri, probably because the designers assumed it would be impossible to do that without a quest marker. She also makes mistake after mistake, despite having a diverse collection of experience at her disposal. The Vici job was sloppy and poorly organized. She left it an open prompt for someone who was new to the order and she didn't trust and then risked additional lives for no reason. The Marrow job was so poorly executed that it was likely the singular contributor to our downfall. She then pitted someone she didn't trust against another enemy of hers who clearly was luring members into a trap to slowly erode our numbers. What was Cicero going to do, leave the one corpse he's charged with caring for in the hands of heathens? And the deal Astrid made is insane. I'm supposed to believe someone who is as big about family as Astrid could not figure out that Commander Marrow was going to go back on his promises after we murdered his son and disgraced his family name. Astrid is so dumb, she has become an authorial insert. Not because the writer is dumb, but rather because her actions are more likely dictated by a graph of emotional story beats than it is logic, reason, or consistent character storytelling, or even a point. I mean, here are the five tenets that Astrid threw out. Tenet 1, never dishonor the Night Mother. Astrid's more than welcoming to the Night Mother and still seems to practice some level of reverence towards the idea. The only issue she's had is not having contact with her or the listener for years. Tenet 2, never betray the Dark Brotherhood or its secrets. Again, Astrid has not abandoned this rule because it's a common sense rule to have. She maintained the existence and secrecy of the Falkreath Sanctuary for 13 years. Her only betrayals were against Cicero, who himself broke Tenet 1 by refusing to reunite the Night Mother and potential listeners out of a selfish desire to be the listener himself. The other instance of her breaking Tenet 2 was in betraying us. Tenet 3. Never disobey or refuse to carry out an order from a Dark Brotherhood superior. Astrid has maintained this rule as well, there is a strict hierarchy in her family, and Astrid has no superior for herself to actually disobey until recently. Tenet 4 and 5 are rules about not stealing from or murdering fellow Dark Brothers and Sisters. So really, Astrid hasn't done away with the tenants, not at all. The root of the conflict was that an insane man was insane and Astrid made a completely illogical and nonsensical choice for no reason. And there it is. Nonsense for the sake of drama. Astrid has the potential to be a good character, to show how even simple-minded, honor-bound Nords are susceptible to becoming evil with the right rationalizations. Astrid isn't a murderer, she has a family. Her husband, a werewolf who went too far for the companions. Her children, a group of insane people with various conflicting personalities. Her pet, the giant spider. She's an interesting character because she's a strong Nord woman without the insults and bravado that Skyrim typically associates with that kind of character and her reward is to have her character assassinated in all senses of the phrase. Now I want to know some similarities. You have the recruitment in your sleep, the blade of woe, the ear-piercing black door, the introduction to the family that occasionally gives advice for jobs, but then you have stuff like the mission where you kill a pirate captain on their own ship, the mission where you drop an object on a target's head, the mission where you track down an NPC who travels between cities. You have the Shadow Scale, the Barbarian, the Krusty Mage, the Pet, Shadow Mirror, and the 300-year-old Vampire. No, really, they're both 300 years old. There are superficial similarities, and then there's stealing from yourself, and there's definitely a trend of Pagliarulo remaking the same stories between games, but worse. Nazir and Babette head to Dawnstar with the Night Mother's body. We track down Amand, who is surprised that we're still interested in completing the job despite having heard about us getting wiped out. Why are you still hanging out in Whiterun if you thought we weren't going to be finishing the job? Between the Civil War and the Dragons, it seems like you would return to Cyrodiil or wherever with haste. 
or solitude since the Emperor is, you know, in Skyrim. Yeah, we're told the Emperor has arrived aboard his private vessel moored near Solitude. Marrow is also there at the docks, and he'll be so angry at our survival that he'll create a self-defense situation for us to scratch that name off the list. We have to sneak aboard the ship using the anchor, although Maglir took to relieving the deck crew of their lives with a bow while Delta Fear peppered the ship with fireballs. This is pretty fun, although the Kataraya has always stood out to me. Something about its visual aesthetics clashes with normal Skyrim, so it ends up looking like something from a mod. It might be intentional, like it's trying to emphasize that the ship is from Cyrodiil so it has to look different, but so is everything else tied to the Legion. I think it's just ugly, like making your cozy little Minecraft home out of nothing but birchwood. It's good for flooring, but not the walls and ceiling. The ship itself is pretty unmemorable. There's a unique scimitar that can be found that paralyzes enemies for a tenth of a second with parry bashes. There's also a sailor found next to another dead sailor and the Penitus Oculatus agent, implying that he murdered them. The most notable thing about this level is the name of the ship itself, Cataraya. It's named after a Dunmer woman who married Pelagius the Mad and ended up serving as Empress of Tamriel for almost half a century with a fairly prosperous reign. Interesting thing about Pelagius the Mad was that prior to becoming Emperor of Tamriel, he was the King of Solitude and High King of Skyrim, although presumably he was considered a Jarl rather than a King, new lore and what have you. So, having a non-Septum Emperor coming to Solitude on the back of a ship named for another non-Septum Emperor is interesting especially given that she was an elf. Anyways, Titus Mead II is rather accepting of our arrival, like unreasonably stoic about it. This was the guy who won the Battle of the Red Ring Road in the Great War, although I couldn't really tell you how significant that accomplishment is. Legends canon implies that Mead had simply taken credit for some other schmuck's hard work, that being the player character from Legends. I mean, yeah, it's official Bethesda stamped canon, but that really isn't relevant. What I want to know is whether or not this was the intended interpretation of the canon when this encounter with Titus Mead II was written before Skyrim's release. And it amazes me how many people think I should care about things written after the fact just because there's Elder Scrolls branding on it. If Titus Mead wasn't present at the battle, then where's this sense of stoicism coming from? It perfectly matches the characteristics of a person who was worthy enough to wield Goldbrand, as was rumored, but not somebody who was content with letting other people fight their battles for them especially considering the man came to Skyrim knowing full well that he was the target of assassins. Again, that's the sort of thing a brave man does. It's a repeat of that ESO thing that retconned the Shivering Isles conclusion to be a routine thing that happens rather than a revolutionary new idea that Sheagorath had. Retroactive continuity that makes the older stories retroactively worse if you decide to accept it. Of course, nobody cares, but this particular story isn't very good and I have immense doubts Test 6 will break that trend. I think this situation is aping off of Emperor Uriel Septim VII from Oblivion who also stoically faced his own death. I mean, that's just what emperors in this series do, right? Except Uriel was a master of the mystic arts and that's more than just a label. Titus Mead II, inversely, was not magically inclined, so there's no reason for him to be all, well, I guess today's a good day to die. Also, he's voiced by Wes Johnson, because, you know, Oblivion. Anyways, after trying to cope and seethe his way out of an assassination, he asks us to kill the person who hired us. That's a pretty easy answer. No. Amon Motieri just had what we in the biz call a Positive Customer Service Interaction, or PCSI for short. See, people tend to be actually more amicable after a customer service interaction if there's a complication, but that complication gets resolved. Then they are when there are zero complications in the first place. In essence, the catharsis of finding out your order will be arriving on time after all is greater than the displeasure of finding out that your order is going to be late. I've actually abused this principle in my favor to get positive customer surveys even though nothing was actually wrong in the first place. It's immoral, but that's what happens when the system encourages metrics chasing. Amon finding out that we could pull off this assassination after all, after having languished that we had wasted good money on us, means he is all the more likely to use our services in the future, or to recommend our service to other potential clients. There's also the fact that the Emperor didn't do the Black Sacrament, so it's not officially a contract, and I don't want to encourage people trying to counter-hire assassins. Just a bad policy to have to renegotiate contracts with our targets. Plus, Amond makes good on his end of the deal, giving us the dead drop location of our payment, 20,000 gold in an urn back where we made the contract. 20k is a decent chunk of change compared to most Skyrim quest payouts, but two things. We go to Nazir and can lie to him about the payout, but it doesn't matter because he doesn't take any of it. He recommends we visit Delvin Mallory and buy some upgrades for the Dawnstar Sanctuary, the total of which is 19,000 gold, but you could honestly miss most of these. Second thing, however, is that 20,000 gold really isn't anything in Skyrim. I mean, the fact that the clip of my character getting the 20k while already having 91,000 gold says a lot. The real reward is unlocking more assassination contracts. 
The Night Mother will tell us where a prospective client is located and then we kill them. I actually got paid twice, once at the start of the conversation and again after the conclusion. And you know what these are? Radiant quests. You get a generic name, albeit an objectivized title holder like the Nervous Patron, who will then ask you to murder another objectivized title holder like the Traveling Dignitary. So this is pretty similar to how in Oblivion, after you finish the quest line, you could every week be told of a contract and relay that information back to your speaker. Except in Oblivion, the Night Mother would name the characters and locations, but you didn't actually kill anybody yourself. It's rather interesting to consider this to be the primordial Radiant quest. This is pretty much as dynamic a system as you could create in 2011, and the only way past it would be to incorporate text-to-speech naming of NPCs, or to bite the bullet and record dozens of dialogue lines for these disposable characters. While I appreciate the attempt to continue offering content for the player, it obviously rings rather hollow to keep doing this same repetitive contract over and over. The remaining generic contracts that Nazir gives you are a mixed bag. They're honestly on par with the Morag Tong assassinations in Morrowind. Go to X place and kill Y person. Except that Morag Tong missions usually pitted you against decently difficult targets and all had a bonus condition. While murdering people as a member of the Tong was legal, you would actually get paid more if you could pull the job off without having to use your writ of execution with a guard. The targets were also people who it made sense would be desired to be dead, a mixture of bandits, great house members, Ashlanders, and even the top enforcers of the Kamanatong. And then you have Dekas. He loots shipwrecks. He does not wreck the ships, he just scavenges from ships that already wrecked along Skyrim's coastline. Okay, I can imagine that eventually somebody might want him dead if he did it for long enough. What about Agnes? She's an old lady who maintains Fort Greymore, independent of whoever actually controls the fort. Oh, I guess she wrote a mean letter to the fort commander, so it's time to hire an assassin. They're like, oh, that's a suicide. That's clearly a suicide. Classic. Classic suicide. Classic suicide. Okay, and then you have Maven Drenum, a powerful wizard with a moderate rank in Grand House Tilvani. We're given zero details about why someone would want him gone, but it's pretty obvious Drenum is at least capable of doing something that would motivate his death. He's not a cowardly looter or an old maid. I think that's a pretty big deal. Again, the Dark Brotherhood's not the sort of organization that you hire over hurt feelings or mild inconvenience. Who wants the guy that runs the meat stand in Whiterun dead? He doesn't even have an AI package to actually go out hunting like we're told he should. The final contract of the Dark Brotherhood is also pretty infamous. You need to find and kill Safia, the captain of the pirate ship Red Wave. The ship travels the northern coast and sometimes isn't even in Skyrim at all. So you'll have to be patient. Good luck. Ah yes, the pirate captain. A ruthless she-devil, by all accounts. Deadly with a blade, and let's not forget her crew. Loyal and bloodthirsty, the lot of them. This is my final contract, and certainly the most challenging. Be careful with this one, my friend. Let me guess. You have some business to discuss. Ah, I see. The old Dark Brotherhood's silent intimidation treatment. Oh, I know who you are. Don't be so surprised. You ain't the first assassin sent to kill me. Won't be the last. Now let's get this over with. Somebody hey, help! What are you doing? Never should have come here. Loyal and bloodthirsty, the lot of them. 
As you can see, this is on the tier of Morrowind's Fighters Guild messing up and having an unarmored Shoring Hardheart fight you, going down without landing a single hit. But that was a mistake made by a developer working crunch hours on multiple factions at the same time. You would not expect that mistake to be made again in Skyrim. She's so hasty to start a fight you don't actually get a bounty nor does any of her crew back her up. I've often heard from other people that Bethesda was under a lot of pressure to make the 11-11-11 deadline, but haven't heard as much about this from the developers themselves. In fact, if you listen to the Bethesda podcast, because they had enough time to do a podcast, Emil Pagliarulo seemed to have more than enough time to do more than just his job. Occasionally I'll record some placeholder audio or you know, do some shouts or something, and I'll go into the sound booth, right? You never know what you're going to find in the booth. Boxes of cereal, pieces of wood, shards of glass. It's like, it's like an ocean nightmare in there. I swear to God, it's so dangerous. The sword, like, and it's funny because some of these sounds are stuff that I've supplied him with. Like, the sound of the sword un unsheathing is one of my swords. The sound of the guy blowing the horn is my horn. I hear it in the game, I'm like, hey, that's my horn. You know, like, uh... Writing off Skyrim's issues as being that of an arbitrary deadline is, in my opinion, inaccurate. Bethesda had a full three years between the release of Fallout 3 and the release of Skyrim, as well as increased staff, resources, and most important of all, experience. Pagliarulo had the title of a senior designer because he was the lead designer on Fallout 3, and had experience at Bethesda going all the way back to the Blood Moon expansion. Really, it comes off more as a lack of playtesting. And that's the Dark Brotherhood. To be honest, I consider it on par with Oblivion's iteration. The only reason the latter is remembered fondly compared to the former is due to recency bias. It's a neat detail that if you're associated with the Dark Brotherhood in Skyrim, that you can be randomly attacked by members of the Morag Tong when you go to Solstheim, since they apparently have the legal authority to kill members of the Dark Brotherhood who are considered a heretical offshoot. Killing the Gourmet will leave an emptiness in the collective soul of Skyrim. Shut the fuck up! I know that was you, I ain't even gotta look! Oh yeah, our reward back at the Vici wedding was the ability to summon the spirit of Lucien Lachance. He has some interesting dialogue to share, but he also has a habit of talking, constantly. In my time, the blades protected the Emperor. It would seem these penitus oculatus will prove equally incompetent. <laughs> I will kill this jester if you so desire, but there is a disturbance in the void. Our dread father does not wish this. Yes, kill the chef and then steal his very identity, for that is the true death. My time saw the assassination of an emperor as well. Alas. The Dark Brotherhood did not have the honor of that kill. You stand now at the precipice of the void. I am reminded of another listener, a protege I knew long ago. So long ago. You know, a good purification might be just what this sanctuary needs. That's a terrible idea. We are by implication the last of the Brotherhood. One interesting thing is that the Dark Brotherhood has basically been spared the wrath of the Creation Club. Skyrim's introduction is unique for 3D Elder Scrolls by introducing two storylines, the main quest, as well as the Civil War. I like that I stand up and I'm still the same height away. No, I'm actually- I might be closer. This isn't happening. It is happening. Holy shit. Hey. Alright, so, for some context. Daggerfall was a big political conflict, while Morrowind had a three-way proxy war being fought by its great houses. This was an understandable change, given Morrowind had reduced the land size of territory drastically in the shift to handcrafted world design over procedural generation. Oblivion, however, had zero political conflict. So Skyrim having a civil conflict between two actually joinable factions is mildly a return to form. On the one hand, you have the status quo, the Imperial Legion, or Red Team. On the other, you have the Stormcloaks, a rebellion fighting for an independent Skyrim, or Blue Team. 
The Legion holds slightly more territory, but otherwise the conflict is evenly split, in more ways than just land. The evenness of the conflict has led to it being one of those fonts of perpetual discussion about which side of the Civil War is objectively correct and true choice. Bethesda's done a pretty good job of creating a choice that isn't weighted 90-10 in favor of one side, and you have to praise that. However, both sides of the Civil War are the same. It's the same quest line down to completely asinine details. You'll do the exact same quest, except all the voice actors will be different, so they have to have these redundant voice lines when they could have just made different quests. But I get ahead of myself. It all starts in Helgen with our execution. We survive and towards the end of the surface segment are presented a choice with whom we want to accompany for the remainder of the tutorial, Hadvar or Raylof. When I asked on a YouTube poll, people seemed to heavily favor Raylof their first time and it makes sense. Hadvar being a nice guy is not going to excuse the fact that the red team just tried to execute us and if not for literal divine intervention, would have done so. What should we do? She's not on the list. Forget the list. She goes to the block. After we get out of the tutorial, our companion will tell us that we should split up, but also tells us that the nearest settlement is Riverwood and we could find help there and have tour information ready should we decide to go with them. You can actually talk to them at this stage and they will give you some information about their side of the Civil War. For instance, it's revealed that Ulfric and the boys got captured at Darkwater Crossing, which is a mining settlement in East March. What happened was after the Imperials arrested Ulfric and co, they planned to take him via convoy to the Imperial City. However, before they left Skyrim, plans changed and they were diverted to Helgen. Around the same time, we, who had been crossing the border from Cyrodiil into Skyrim, also got arrested to keep Ulfric's location secret, same with Lokir the horse thief. Alright, so to explain the teams. This is lore heavy, but Elder Scrolls lore is actually over-exaggerated in terms of complexity. Neither team is directly connected to any of the factions we've seen in previous games. This is the Imperial Legion, but it doesn't really represent the same empire as the ones in past games. And the 200 year time gap means Ulfric Stormcloak is not directly tied to anything either. Interesting thing I was told was that some people who had played Skyrim as their first Elder Scrolls game had assumed from first impression that the Empire was actually your standard evil fantasy empire, and were surprised when going back to the earlier games to find that the Empire is a generally benevolent faction. So back in Oblivion, Uriel Septim VII got assassinated, beginning the Oblivion Crisis, and his last bastard son, Martin, sacrificed himself to stop it. However, this really only created a new crisis, one of succession. The Septims were notable because they were descendants of Tiber Septim, a man who conquered the entire continent both militarily and diplomatically, and became the god Talos. Now the four and a half century Septim reign was not perfect, and there were plenty of attempts by regional leaders for independence from practically everyone. Mankar Cameron from Oblivion was the son of one such rebel. But the fourth era marked a trend of successful independence among the provinces. Black Marsh had never been conquered by the Empire, instead simply being surrounded by forts and forced into cooperation. Following the Oblivion Crisis, they sought their independence, feeling that the Empire had failed to protect them. Five years after Oblivion, the Ministry of Truth that hung over the city of Vivek crashed into the ground, retaining its velocity from when Sheagorath originally threw it. This triggered Red Mountain to erupt, devastating the territory. And then Morrowind was devastated again when Black Marsh invaded the region, raising cities and claiming new territory. The Empire was ineffectual in defending Morrowind, and by the 50th year of the Fourth Era, Morrowind was released from Imperial control, becoming an independent province. On the other side of Tamriel, the Somerset Isles were taken over by a youth movement and renamed to Alinor, and then within a decade a political alliance of Valinwood and Alinor was formed into a new state, the Aldmeri Dominion. Elsewhere would form into a confederation and become effective vassals of the Dominion, while Hammerfell would slip into civil conflict. And then the Great War happened, which was the result of the Aldmeri Dominion issuing an ultimatum to Titus Mede II, which he rejected. During the war, the Reach would be taken over by the native Bretons, and the war would end in a peace treaty named the White Gold Concordat. The Concordat ceded southern Hammerfell to the Dominion, which the province rejected and would wholly secede in the aftermath. The Blades were disbanded, and the worship of Talos was outlawed. Needless to say, things are less than ideal across the continent. Skyrim began an attempt to reclaim the Reach from the independent kingdom that was forming there, and this is when Ulfric Stormcloak enters the stage. Ulfric was the son of the Jarl of Eastmarch, and was on track to becoming a Greybeard when the Great War broke out. Ulfric joined the conflict but was captured and held as a prisoner of war by the Thalmor. After the war, Ulfric led the militia that would reclaim Markarth from the Reachmen. However, a condition of the city's release was the free worship of Talos. This drew the scrutiny of the Thalmor who came to the city and arrested Ulfric for a second time. 
This is when his father died and Ulfric, who had been imprisoned for seven years at that point, was released and took the position of Jarl of Windhelm in Eastmarch. Ulfric went into rebellion, seeking an independent Skyrim. This is when Torig became the High King of Skyrim after his father's death. Ulfric challenged Torig to a duel for the throne, and this ended in Torig's death. However, Ulfric was not formally recognized as the next High King, but he was joined in his rebellion by the Rift, Winterhold, the Pale, and initially Falkreath. And that is where Skyrim begins. General Tolius of the Imperial Legion has arrived in Skyrim and ambushed Ulfric before attempting to execute him. The execution obviously failed after a dragon attack, and now it's up to the player to pick a side in the conflict. Note that contrary to what Extra Credits believes, almost none of that information is actually dumped on the player in the cart ride. The introduction will refer to the names of various factions, but there are obvious contextual clues that give you enough information to figure out what's going on. More information is made available through some quests, and more still is contained in various books that you can find in the game. A big part of the Civil War is that it doesn't sit the player down for their history lesson before asking which side they believe is based in Red Pilled. However much information you need to pick a side is dependent entirely on you, the player, and what you're willing to seek out. The thing is, I almost never do the Civil War because Skyrim's better during the war than it is after the resolution. I guess that means that between the Stormcloaks and the Imperials, I choose the Thalmor, but that's not what I actually mean. Much of the open world of Skyrim is about the Civil War, so it doesn't feel right to immediately go off to resolve it. It's something that should be happening in the background. It would be like going back to the Mojave Wasteland after the Battle of Hoover Dam. And simply playing Skyrim gives you clues about the conflict. Now it's not New Vegas where the war is the main questline and many side quests will tie into it, but it's also not Oblivion where there's zero conflict. But how is the Civil War so even-handed? Well, it's very simple. It comes down to politics. It starts with the most surface-level observation that the conflict is about religious freedom. I practically expect people who think the war is only about this issue to be tracking drool on the carpet. Now, the Talos issue is a big deal. Tiber Septim at the end of his reign ascended and became the god Talos and was recognized and worshipped as such for about 600 years. And there's evidence of his divinity that we see in the games, from his avatar in Morrowind to his blessing being the edge needed to be Umaril in Knights of the Nine. However, the Old Mary Dominion recently started contesting this claim, setting it as the Talos mistake. However, worship had continued after the resolution of the war in Skyrim on the down low, although how down low this actually was is up for debate. The whole reason the Thalmor began investigating Skyrim searching for Talos worshippers was after the Markarth incident. However, there is evidence to suggest the Markarth incident was incited by the Thalmor in the first place, so chances are pretty good a day of religious reckoning was coming to Skyrim regardless. Now, it is the reason that many Nords who support Ulfric will cite as their cause, but you won't really encounter any Imperial supporters who are fighting to outlaw Talos worship. At best, they are apathetic about the subject. The Imperials are mostly fighting to continue their control of Skyrim. Skyrim is a valuable province full of natural resources, including an entire crop of men born after the Great War, who have recently reached fighting age. Without Skyrim, the Empire would be reduced to just Cyrodiil and High Rock. Now, losing Skyrim is not an immediate death sentence, and most people don't seem to realize an alliance between independent Skyrim and the Empire is almost guaranteed following the Civil War. Skyrim's independence also doesn't make the Thalmor a bigger threat. Skyrim is surrounded entirely by near-impassable terrain, with mountain ranges on its east, west, and southern borders, and to the north a coastline named the Sea of Ghosts owed to its treachery. The only current Thalmor holdings are in Hafingar, near Solitude, and are only there by provision of the Empire. Skyrim also has neighbors with which it can ally itself, like Independent Hammerfell or Morrowind. While it's true that Morrowind and Skyrim are historical enemies, diplomatic inroads were laid following the Red Year when Skyrim provided refuge to the Dunmer and ceded control of the island of Solstheim to Morrowind for the same reason. On the flip side, we have to ask the question, is an Old Mary Dominion dominated world really a bad thing? Stop, please. I don't know anything else. Don't you think I'd have told you already? Silence, you know the rules. Not speak unless spoken to. Master Rolandil will ask the questions. Well, almost certainly owed to the childish characterizations of the Thalmor we have seen, unfortunately. It's just unusual that a man-dominated world is treated as inherently better than an elf-dominated world, especially considering the current Mead Empire is literally comprised exclusively of the races of men. However, Imperial supporters will often point out that supporting the Imperial Legion is not supporting the Thalmor, and that the Legion should be supported in order to help prepare for the next Great War. But that's akin to saying you shouldn't support the American Revolutionary so that the British Empire can be better prepared for Napoleon. 
I'm going to posit that who you support in the Civil War is irrelevant when it comes to round two of the war with the Dominion. The Mede Empire is almost certainly doomed due to just how successful the Old Mary Dominion has been, let alone the inevitable secession crisis after the, you know, Dark Brotherhood questline. Supporting Ulfric is not a death blow to the Empire considering that blow already came 25 years before the game even started. So instead, we should focus on the question to this. Does Skyrim have a right to be independent? Can it survive independence? And is Ulfric Stormcloak the right man to be High King of Skyrim? What does Shut it have up. to do with- Can you send me pictures of them with their little skirts lifted and their fucking nuts hanging out? I don't want to see that shit! I'm not gay like you! Stop sending me hentai! Stop sending me anime pictures! Stop sending me tracks! Oh my god! The first quest of the Civil War involves enlisting in one of the sides of the war. We enlist directly with the leader of the faction, and it's evident that we are not going to be a standard foot soldier in this conflict. In each instance, we see the faction leader having a conversation with their primary subordinate about the war. Ulfric gives an impassioned speech every time you visit the Palace of Kings, which can be amusing, since it can be often due to Ulfric doubling up as leader of the Rebellion and the Jarl of Windhelm. I fight for the men I've held in my arms dying on foreign soil. I fight for their wives and children whose names I heard whispered in their last breath. I fight for we few who did come home, only to find our country full of strangers wearing familiar faces. I fight for my people, impoverished to pay the debts of an empire too weak to rule them, yet brands them criminals for wanting to rule themselves. I fight so that all the fighting I've already done hasn't been for nothing. I fight because I must. Shoring Hardheart would reverse the policy of the Companions being apolitical in times of war, joining up with the Imperial Legion. Delta Fear, however, would join up with the Stormcloak Rebellion, so if things look a little desaturated when showing the Imperial side, that's why. Unlike Ulfric, Tullius is much more pragmatic in presentation, discussing tactics to end the Rebellion as fast as possible and attempting to anticipate Ulfric's actions. Well, if he wants to stand outside the protection of the Empire, fine. Let Ulfric pillage his city. Our special status comes from having survived Helgen, and the attempted execution thing is lampshaded by the Imperials. You were at Helgen. One of the prisoners, if I recall correctly. That doesn't matter as much. Listen. Hmm, I suppose that's true. Fine. Why don't you have a chat with Legate Ricca? Tullius will address it before immediately dropping it, which is what lampshading is, in case you think it's some kind of deep insult. The second in command will then issue a test to determine our worthiness to join the ranks. Kalmar Stonefist sends us to Serpent Stone Island to defeat an Ice Wraith, while Legate Ricca will send us to a fort held by bandits to clear it out. Seems kind of... You know, uneven, if you ask me. The Stonefist test is actually a Nordic coming-of-age ritual, while Legate Ricca's test is... a dungeon. We take oaths to join our side, and then the quest lines intersect. Each side is seeking the Jagged Crown to legitimize their claims as High King, although for clarification, the Imperials want the crown for Jarl Elisif of Solitude, the widow to High King Torig. There, we may meet either Hadvar or Rayloth, both of whom will be happy to see that we've thrown in with their lot. The player's side will then assault the Ruin of Corvinjund, which will be held by the opposing team. The men we fight give way to Draugr, and after a dungeon, we'll have retrieved the crown, as well as having learned a word of slow time, in case you forgot about the main quest. Then you return the Jagged Crown to whichever side you think deserves it, regardless of your allegiance. Yes, you are given a single opportunity to flip sides here. For some reason. It's weird because you hardly learn anything about the Legion or Stormcloaks from the quest to merit you, as Ulfric puts it, walking away from the side you swore an oath to in disgust. It's not like New Vegas where there's a chance your opinions on the Mojave conflict could change between Nipton and the Strip once you learn more about all the factions. And the player flipping sides would carry a massive stigma. It's one thing to rebel years after taking your oath, it's another to rebel the next day after using said oath to get a gift for the other side. You also don't retake your oath or do the test, you just continue the quest line as though you had always been a member of that faction. It was very strange when I played through the quest line this way because Ulfric went from assuming this was an imperial trap to giving us his most important task. 
With that, we begin the first big event of the war. It's time for Whiterun to pick a side in the conflict. A big part of what's caused the conflict to enter into a stalemate has been Whiterun's neutrality. Jarl Balgriff has yet to declare for either side, and his city's two prominent clans are divided in allegiance. If you're an Imperial, Tolius will give you a message for Balgriff, while if you're a Stormcloak, Ulfric will give you his axe to deliver. Both sides indicate that a turning point in the war has been reached. Ulfric's Stormcloak is no longer going to wait on Jarl Balgriff. It is strange that both sides draw attention to this axe-giving ceremony. Oh, warriors understand what it means? What, are you saying Ulfric's hearth needs more wood? So, it comes to war. The battle for Whiterun is undoubtedly the most interesting battle of the entire Civil War. Which side of the battle you're on depends on your allegiance, with Imperials defending the city while Stormcloaks attack the city. Unfortunately, you cannot lose this battle, meaning that victory is inevitable. It would be more interesting if the battle was legitimately difficult, and failure could mean the player having to rethink their strategy or approach. As it stands, once you've picked a side during the Jagged Crown quest, the war is already decided and it's simply a matter of writing out the rest of the questline. Also unfortunate is that the battle is more interesting for attackers than defenders. If you defend the city, then the battle simply ends with the Stormcloaks breaking and retreating. But if you attack the city, then the battle ends with a confrontation with Jarl Balgriff, and we see his replacement Vignar Greymane immediately take control upon our victory. Balgriff is allowed to leave the city. So where does he go? Oh, to the Sad Room. The Blue Palace has this little corner tucked away that's difficult to notice, which houses all the NPCs displaced during the Stormcloak side of the war. The Palace and Kings in Windhelm has a similar room. I like to call it the Sad Room because it's a tacit admission of Bethesda's fear of consequences. There are still quests the player may potentially need these NPCs for, so Bethesda has to keep them around, but it doesn't actually have a place for them, so it just crams them in this little corner of the map, all because Bethesda doesn't want the player to fail quests. One of the consequences of doing the Civil War should be that you miss out on potential content, because that's war. People die, lives change, men shit in the urinal. However, this may not be how things played out for you if you took Hadvar or Rayloff's suggestion to go to the capital of their team to join the Civil War. See, if your first meeting with Jarl Balgriff is to deliver the message, Balgriff will just ignore it. He insists on dealing with the dragon problem before the Civil War, which means you have to awkwardly pivot into doing the beginning of the Skyrim main quest up to and including the point that unlocks dragons as enemies. And I'm sure he told you it was urgent. Well, he's not the only Jarl in Skyrim with problems to deal with. Did he now? Huh. The man is persistent. I'll give him that. But until that dragon's dealt with, Ulfric's just going to have to wait. For now. I'll hold on to this axe, but it's a tenuous piece at best. Help Irileth kill this dragon before it can attack Whiterun. There's no time to lose. You would think, as a Stormcloak, that I could just return to Ulfric and say that Balgriff refused the axe and that the city is prime for conquest, since it won't be garrisoned with Imperials until after the dragon at the Western Watchtower is slain. What this means is that the player character has to become the Dragonborn to complete the Civil War. You might wonder if there's a reason for this, and the answer is that there's not. Well, not really. Ulfric has a line about us being dragonborn in the conclusion of the Imperial side. Otherwise, the only reason to do things this way is that there weren't contingency voice lines for Vignar Greymane to serve that role in the main quest. It's just hilarious that Balgriff will name us as one of Whiterun's great heroes and Thane to his city, only to not even consider our input when deciding which side to support, and even calling us a traitor for siding with the Stormcloaks even though it's entirely possible that, again, our first meeting with him was as a Stormcloak messenger. It's a testament to how much Skyrim railroads you into doing the main quest first that I haven't seen this extremely awkward quest structure called out. It's at this point, however, that we enter into the tedious part of the questline, the reunification or liberation of Skyrim. Before that, though, I have to mention that my VR run of Skyrim completely and utterly locked up during the Battle of Whiterun. I have tried multiple times to get it past this point and eventually succeeded only for it to get stuck later down the line, which was annoying because the entire reason I was playing this questline a third time was to be able to record those dialogue lines about the Battle of Solitude and the BG Wedding. Eventually it broke so bad that Jarl Balgriff stayed Jarl of Storm Glogaligned Whiterun, which is the ideal outcome. I really don't know what it was that broke this quest. It could have been that I switched sides to the Stormcloaks, it could have been that I wasn't Dragonborn when I first talked to Balgriff, it could have been that the quest breaks if you play it during the full moon. Part of the problem is that the questline eludes traditional console command progression, making it difficult to force to work. I've only seen this kind of broken questline fuckery once before, and that was during the Minutemen line of Fallout 4. 
Both sides of the war do exactly the same quests, just in a different order. We start with a false front in the Pale for the Imperials and Hyal March for the Stormcloaks. In this quest, we track down a courier for the opposing side and then kill and replace them. We forge new orders for them, sabotage the military effort in the region, and then fight a battle at the local fort where we have to kill a large number of enemies. And then that minor hold is now under our control. The next quest is that we're sent to one of the southern cities. We threaten to expose the steward for crimes, either being a Talos worshipper or involved with the Thieves Guild, depending on the city. We steal proof from a very short, very easy stealth hallway and then squeeze information about a shipment of gold in the hold. We meet up with either Rayloff or Hadvar and ambush the wagon. Then we fight a battle at a fort in the hold and now have taken a major hold. It is a shame that there's no battle for Markarth or Riften, but I guess it fits considering both cities are known for corruption that we take them in this manner. The final quest is to rescue some soldiers from a minor hold fort, which doubles as a battle to take the fort. Both instances have secret entrances we can use to sneak into the fort, and we can either emerge from within the fort to clear it out, or just assault it ourselves. Also, Hadvar and Rayloff are there. Then we are given a final fort battle, either in Hafingar or Eastmarch, and with that it's time for the final battle at Solitude or Windhelm. There you go, fuck you, don't you ever say I just summarize every single quest in the game ever again. I easily could have spent an hour summarizing each individual stage from each questline like it was a new thing. But I would much rather use that time talking about how uncanny a mirror Skyrim has been warped into for this questline. As you can see, Solitude and Windhelm are mirrors, as are Markarth and Riften, Winterhold and Falkreath, Dawnstar and Morthal. Whiterun is the singular unique city which has been internally divided. It's funny to think that the collapse of Winterhold might have been for some irrelevant symbolism in an unfinished questline. I pointed this out when I talked about the Shivering Isles back in Oblivion, but the Skyrim Civil War is highly reminiscent of the conflict between the Golden Saints and Dark Seducers of that expansion. A conflict that continues in Skyrim thanks to the Creation Club. Anyways, the Saints and Seducers are locked into an eternal state of war vying for Senpai's attention, despite the fact that they are effectively just a mirror of each other. The Shivering Isles made a point of just how pointless the conflict was, intentionally because it reflected Sheagorath's own arbitrary internal division between Mania and Dementia, and now here we are, just a couple years later, doing that same pointless conflict, this time unironically. You'll need to be careful with this one. The Jarl's men won't look kindly on you rummaging through the steward's quarters. This will require stealth and discretion. The Jarl's guards won't take kindly to anyone rummaging through her steward's private quarters. There are two possibilities. The first is that Bethesda recognizes the pointlessness of the war and intentionally designed it that way to make a point, and the second is that Bethesda unintentionally parodied their own conflict, and the only intentional part of making the quest lines effectively identical was to ease player anxiety about content exclusivity. We either have to assume that Bethesda is intelligent, or are cowards, and unfortunately there's more evidence to suggest that Bethesda are cowards afraid of players doing repeat playthroughs than signs of intelligent quest design in Skyrim. This is the game where you're intended to just start using a new playstyle on an existing character instead of just creating a new character for that purpose. The problem I have trouble thinking about is determining whether the questline is unfinished or simply badly designed. For instance, during battles you can watch as bodies despawn, a trick Bethesda uses due to the limitations placed on the game by the 7th console generation hardware that it came out on. Their engine, as is, is not designed around creating battle scenarios, at least for the generation the game came out in. However, only half of the quests actually involve battles and most of those battles are extremely simple. It's just grinding against respawning enemies until the necessary number of soldiers have been killed and then the battle concludes. I would not be surprised if each fort battle was simply a copy of a template fort battle with all the necessary components, and the only thing designers changed is the layout. However, the other half of the questline is not met with this hardware limitation. Take the Tribute Quest, for instance. It actually seems like it would be more work recreating the same exact quest for the opposite side that is still identical. It's a completely different set of NPCs in a different location with different voice lines. They had to intentionally decide to do that, which brings us back to the question of why. Well, here's the thought. It may well be possible that the Civil War originally had one joinable side, that being the Stormcloaks. Think about it. Which side is the player pushed towards in the introduction? Which side has the developed trial? Which side has a conclusion scene at the Battle of Whiterun? And never mind the Emperor's assassination. The more I think about it, the more I start to believe the Imperial side of the war may actually just be a clone of the original Stormcloak questline. 
Unfortunately, this theory is incorrect. You can try to sniff out the developer intentions from what's in the game, but you would very often be wrong. This is why actual research is important and not just an argument you throw in people's faces because it sounds good to tell people that they need sources. Unfortunately, while there are plenty of ex-Bethesda employees who've talked about their time working on Skyrim, one department has remained relatively silent, the quest designers. Maybe they sacrificed goats, or maybe it's as simple as the fact that while many people praise the world and artistic design of Skyrim, Skyrim's quests tend to be treated fairly unfavorably. It's been a favorite YouTube pastime to complain about Skyrim quests since 2012, which happens to be the last time anybody who worked in that area spoke at length about the topic. So unfortunately, there are not a lot of answers to the questions I have raised. We have the cutting room floor, a source I'm hesitant to use even half a year after publishing my Oblivion video. I basically said they outright fabricated a claim about there being thousands of unused voice lines in the files, something that remains unproven to this day despite how simple it would be to show their existence. Get a physical copy, put it in a computer without an internet connection, and look at the data files. So basically just stick an asterisk in the section due to a historical lack of credibility for the source. My source is that I made it the fuck up! They've data mined the game and there are some interesting stuff reportedly hinted at. For starters, the quests were given were meant to be randomized, and there were meant to be 12 types rather than the 3 that are in the game. The quests would be given two at a time with dialogue for each combination. The quests that were not in the game included killing scouts, skirmishing in a minor settlement, sabotaging resources, there were rescue missions at more forts, assassination missions, recruitment of soldiers, a mission where you appease a giant, you steal war plans, recruit civilians, and you go on a vision quest with an orc. Also, pay would be determined by a salary that itself was determined by player rank in the faction, and Ulfric would additionally ask the player to donate their pay to the Stormcloak cause. There were also sieges in all the major cities, complete with dialogues for each transfer of power, including if the player loses a battle and is forced to escape the city. There were meant to be female soldiers and battle mages on both sides, and the officers you meet in the field camps were likely meant to have unique dialogue. Finally, there's a note in the Civil War script for modders that reads as follows. The Civil War has gone through many iterations. There's a lot of obsolete stuff in here from previous iterations where it was more dynamic and freeform. So, for various reasons, it seems that Bethesda had aimed for the stars with the Civil War questline, and reading this article makes a lot of sense in addition to Bruce Nesmith's talk on Radiant Story. Actually, it's rather interesting that the Civil War has no Radiant quests, making it the only secondary questline to not include any Radiants. However, even with this cut content, the questline still has that element of being effectively identical. Which I guess means that even in its current state, the story accomplishes its goal of being a pointless conflict for the sake of pointless conflicts. I guess you would have to continually lose ground to see all the mission types in a single playthrough, so each repeat playthrough would have a different order of radiant missions. And it would probably help seeing the different transfers of power. We can only speculate on what really happened with the questline, so let's speculate. I'm going to guess that, had Bethesda not hinted at the Civil War in the trailers, the whole deal might have gotten the Count of Kavaj treatment. However, Bethesda implied there would be a Civil War and tied it into the main quest, but they didn't have time to finish it, so they simply collated the most functional elements into a single linear narrative for each questline. Now, I should mention Season Unending, which is part of the main quest where you can negotiate a temporary truce. However, I'm going to talk about that in the main quest section. All it really does is just add more battles for whichever territory ends up changing sides during the negotiation. With that out of the way, let's conclude the Civil War. For the Imperials, we lay siege to Windhelm. Actually, there's no opposition keeping us from just entering the city. We fight our way through infinite enemies until we reach the Palace of Kings, where we confront Ulfric, Stormcloak, and Galmar. Galmar dies, and it comes down to a final execution of Ulfric. We don't capture him, we just decide to end it here and now. Ulfric will request that we do it, as we're the Dragonborn. We can decide whether or not to, and then General Tolius gives a speech to the men. For the Stormcloaks, we attack Solitude. I took the time to visit the Blue Palace during the battle because the game doesn't stop you. It's pretty much just business as usual here. It's quite surreal. There's a battle going on outside. Anyways, we take Castle Dower and General Tolius is having a little pout in the corner having been defeated. That's not me editorializing. The game itself does portray the characters in that way. Ricka dies in combat, Tolius is summarily executed, and Jarl Elisif honors Ulfric's claim to become High King of Skyrim. The end. It's a pretty straightforward questline that is not ambitious. It has a lot of awkward dialogue scenes and even more fast travel since you have to go back to the capital during each leg of the story. It's funny that of all the questlines in Skyrim, the one that was made central to the actual open world was left so unfinished. Okay, 
So I tried to make it this far without outright stating my opinions or thoughts on the conflict. Some of you might have picked it out from the subtext or have seen my streams where I've talked about the issue, in which case you already know which side I support. I want to say that before I outright state it, that my goal is to try and clear some of the air surrounding this questline and misconceptions that people tend to spread. I support the Stormcloaks. Now, my character Delta Fear supported the Stormcloaks because she was a Morrowind national who's lived long enough to remember the Empire abandoned her homeland. I think that Stormcloaks are grandly mischaracterized in a big way. I don't like the fact that he's so racist against elves and mainly all um, races that are not Nord. But the Stormcloaks are downright xenophobic and almost kind of racist at times, and they act like a bunch of misguided and violent rebels. Windhelm has immigration and racism. The only real issue I take is with the Stormcloaks and the aforementioned rampant racism. So a lot of people claim the Stormcloaks are racists, and I know why. It's because when you first enter Windhelm, you see this. You come here where you're not wanted. You eat our food, you pollute our city with your stink, and you refuse to help the Stormcloaks. But we haven't taken a side because it's not our fight. Hey, maybe the reason these Greyskins don't help in the war is because they're Imperial spies. Imperial spies? You can't be serious. Maybe we'll pay you a visit tonight, little spy. We got ways of finding out what you really are. As you can see, Stormcloak soldiers are harassing a Dunmer woman in the streets of Windhelm. Oh wait, those aren't Stormcloak soldiers. I modded the game to give them that armor. In fact, one of those two men is homeless, and the other's a drunk that lounges around at a bar all day. The only connection that these men have to the Stormcloaks is that they live in Windhelm, and Rolf is Galmar's brother. Galmar's another common sticking point I've seen people have with the Stormcloaks, but he seems reasonable to me. In fact, Galmar's a lot like the Nords we used to see in the series. Nords used to be a culturally distinct people whose bravado and brusqueness was merited by their strengths as warriors. However, comes Skyrim and most of them just seem to be milk-drinking peasants and regular humans. Galmar actually seems to be a sliver of that old warrior culture the Nords were always meant to be. He's also not a racist. When the player joins, he'll ask why we would be interested in fighting for Skyrim. However, he asks Nords the same question. He simply wants to ascertain where our loyalties lie, which is a lot more important for the Stormcloaks than it is the Legion. If the Legion loses the conflict, they will continue to exist as a faction, but if the Stormcloaks lose, that's it. It's over. As for Ulfric, he also isn't a racist, but you know who is culturally intolerant? You Nords and your bloody sense of honor. Tell me again why I'm wasting men chasing after a fairy tale. Don't you Nords put any stock in your own traditions? Without us to keep order, the provinces would fall into barbarism and lawlessness. Especially Skyrim. Any last requests before I send you to... to wherever you people go when you die? His head will be sent to Cyrodiil, where it will adorn a spike on the walls of the Imperial City. I can't say I'll ever get used to the damn cold or understand these Nords, but I've come to respect them. B the Grey Quarter, yeah, what other city in Skyrim has a cultural embassy of refugees following the Red Year? Where was Solitude during that crisis? While we do see Dunmer across Skyrim, only Windhelm has a sizable population. Also, it should be stated that the current capital of a free and independent Morrowind following the Argonian invasion is the city of Blacklight, which is actually geographically closer to Windhelm than Riften. Now, of course, how Ulfric treats this population says a lot about his opinion of the Dunmer people. However, I'd argue that most of Windhelm's Nordic population is not much better off than the Grey Quarter. Windhelm is just kind of all around a terrible city to live in. Most of Skyrim is actually a terrible place, with Solitude and Whiterun being the only decent places to live, although Solitude seems to be a community that has long since priced out its poor through its limited real estate. Remember, the player character is a member of the upper class in Skyrim society. The thing is, there's actually a decent number of High Elves living in Windhelm. They own the stables, the alchemist shop, and a stall in the market. There's even a gang of exclusively High Elves, that's how many of them there are. Now why is it that the Dunmer are victims of racism, but the High Elves, who I will remind you are the same race as the Thalmor, why do they suffer no ill effect? I'll let you in on a little secret. It's because the Dunmer are terrible people. Not to say they inherently deserve to be discriminated against, nobody does, but anybody who's played Morrowind can tell you a couple things about Dunmer culture. They are prideful and xenophobic, they discriminate against people of their own race for not being pure enough to have been born in Morrowind, they used to keep slaves, and they worship Daedra. The main quest of Morrowind was about stopping a Dunmer ethnic nationalist who wanted to commit genocide against Outlanders. 
The Red Year was, in a meta sense, retaliation for how Morrowind presented and normalized the culture of the Dunmer, and I hold it in spite for ruining the legacy of the Nerevarine. Instead of the Dunmer becoming a more tolerant race under the leadership of their cultural icon, Daddy went out for cigarettes and they had to be punished by the writers for being naughty boys. You know, slavery. Then the writers decided to create a refugee crisis, presumably as some form of social commentary, although Skyrim would actually predate the American obsession with Europe's refugee crisis by a couple years, so either someone at Bethesda is extremely politically savvy, or more likely it's meant to reflect on America's own historical issues with immigration. Now, of course, I would be loath to forget the, uh, four Argonians living out in the waterfront. So this is kind of a confusing element, but Ulfric outright forbade Argonians from entering the city. Now, is this identical to how every other city in Skyrim banned the Khajiit caravans? Sure, but we're just going to pretend that's not happening because it makes Elisif and Balgriff look bad. See, the bigotry people in Windhelm have against the Dunmer makes a degree of sense. They think they're spies and whatnot. But what have the Argonians done to earn the ire of the Nords? The Argonians seem to think that it's your typical class struggle. The Nords are entitled and they don't want to work on the docks, so the Argonians have to do it instead. Funny thing is, Ulfric's replacement Brunwolf actually maintains the order of segregation, but instead of segregating to protect the locals, it's to protect the Argonians. Like a reflection of the real world. But the thing is, I can't help but imagine Ulfric was also protecting the Argonians. You have to remember that part of the devastation of the Red Year was an Argonian invasion of Morrowind. While it was retaliatory for the slavery of Argonians, Morrowind showed that plenty of Dunmer commoners were not slaveholders. You have a city that's already suffering from one racial conflict which is going downhill due to the local leader having to balance his resources between a war for independence and city maintenance. And then you want to add the element of another racial group who have historical problems with your refugee population. Things might be better if the docks literally didn't connect straight into the Grey Quarter. Anyways, I consider the Argonians a non-issue compared to the Grey Quarter, and the Grey Quarter is... definitely an issue. However, it's not like Ulfric had years to clean the place- oh, wait, he's been fighting for Skyrim's independence for as long as he's been Jarl, which has been 20 years. Okay, maybe that's a black mark. However, I also think that's simply an issue of Bethesda not understanding how long time is. This is not the first questline in Skyrim to run up against this timeline issue, to the point that I think the game was supposed to take place in 191 instead of 201. Now that I've presented one argument against Ulfric, let's talk about Elisif the Fair, Jarl of Solitude and presumed High Queen of Skyrim following an Imperial victory. One of the first encounters you have with her, which often bugs out and doesn't play, is a court audience where a member of the Dragonbridge community requests that Elisif send someone to investigate strange lights that they've been seeing. Elisif initially suggests sending a legion, however she has to be talked down to just a couple extra guards being deployed to Dragonbridge. Elisif isn't really in control of her own hold. Her inexperience means that she's become reliant on her council of advisors to manage it for her, and General Tolius is fighting her war. She is, in essence, just a puppet ruler. So, let's talk about the people Elisif has surrounded herself with. Thane Bryling is the owner of Rockwall Mine, a mining operation that isn't even located inside of Hafingar. Falk Firebeard seems to be primarily running the hold, a duty he's compromised by having a secret relationship with Bryling. Sabella Stentor is Elisif's court wizard who will openly admit to only continuing this duty out of her own self-interest. She'll even admit to the steward that she figures Elisif will be replaced in a matter of months. Also, she's a vampire. She's been in the court long enough for people to start to notice, but nobody questions it because they need her service. People around the palace know that she's been visiting the dungeons for blood, and the warden even admits that she comes looking for... volunteers. Finally, we have Eriker. He's our Thieves' Guild contact. While Clan Battleborn in Whiterun was in bed with the Thieves' Guild, Eriker is actually our highest ranking contact. Our job with him ends in a person being framed and sent to prison for life over a broken trade agreement. He also harasses a servant girl at a party during the main quest and is suspected to be the originator of much of the dissension spread about Falcon Bryling. There was even a cut quest that involves the assassination of Elisif, in which Eriker would take over as Jarl of Solitude, although obviously that one's not in the game. Point is, Eriker's a snake and is exactly the type of Nord that Ulfric hates. He even imports low quality elven equipment from Black Marsh to sell to the Empire, so his avarice does not stop at his allegiance. He'll admit that half of Solitude owes him money and he owns most of the city. Since we took a good long look at Windhelm and its issues, let's look at Solitude. For starters, very few people actually live in the city. Let's analyze who gets that privilege. Vittoria Vici, Overseer of the East Empire Company and Cousin of the Emperor. The player character, at the price of 25,000 gold. Advar the fish merchant, Evet San the food merchant, Yala the produce merchant, girlfriend of Atar the warden and executioner. 
You have Erika and Bryling's houses, we've gone over where their money comes from, and the Blue Palace, home of the Jarl. There's also the Bard's College, which makes money from tuition costs of having the only school for Bards in Skyrim, a desirable career path for Nords. On the other side of town are the businesses, which double as their owner's homes. So, unless you're a business owner, the only way you can actually live in solitude is to either be a guard, live in Castle Dower, a student at the college, or be a servant of the Jarl. Hell, Noster Eagle Eye almost seems to be a union-appointed homeless person, probably only tolerated due to being an Imperial veteran, given how often he mentions it. Seriously, it is insane how much of a wealth and equality problem there is in Solitude. Remember that Solitude has long been the seat of the High King of Skyrim, so this is not a recent problem. Where was the wealth of Solitude during the Red Year, during the Great Collapse in Winterhold, or the Burning of Riften, or the Rebellion in Markarth? Is it any coincidence that Solitude's inaction during those crises have led to the affected holds deciding that, yeah, now is the time for change? Alright, now, counterpoint. Ulfric is actually a Thalmor puppet. I can't even begin to describe the number of times this has been stated to me as though I don't know it. At least one person's already left a comment about it and may now either be deleting or editing it. During the main quest, the player can get their hands on a couple Thalmor dossiers, including one for Ulfric Stormcloak. Most people just read the first two words and call it a day. Status, asset. Well, there you go. Ulfric Stormcloak is a Thalmor plant. Anyone read the next few sentences? This document details how Ulfric was taken prisoner during the Great War and then says, quote, We learned of his potential value and he was assigned as an asset to the interrogator, who is now First Emissary Elenwyn, end quote. During this period, Ulfric was gaslit into falsely believing that he had leaked information used to capture the Imperial City and then was allowed to escape. Later on, quote, after the war, contact was established and he has proven his worth as an asset. The so-called Markarth incident was particularly valuable from the point of view of our strategic goals in Skyrim, although it resulted in Ulfric becoming generally uncooperative to direct contact." End quote. There you go, case closed. If this doesn't raise questions for you, then you aren't thinking critically enough. Notice how the document leaves out key details about what the nature of the contact was that led to the Markarth incident. We'll assume direct contact, but we don't know anything else. For instance, it's very well possible that Elwynn had made promises to Ulfric she was not intent on keeping. She may have, for instance, told Ulfric to retake the city, promising free Talos worship as compensation. A big clue is that Ulfric, following the incident, became uncooperative. Why would a Thalmor puppet become uncooperative unless he was promised something that was then used against him? The Thalmor obviously can't write in their official report that they had promised free Talos worship in exchange for something. That would be akin to the CIA writing down that they paid someone in cocaine and not, quote, alternative recreational assets. Plus, it's also possible that the document's written in such a way to make its republication difficult for whoever steals it. After all, the likeliest group to assault the embassy and get their hands on the dossier would be, who else, Stormcloaks. If anything, the entire document could even be a fabrication existing solely to sow dissension. But the Thalmor wouldn't do something like that, right? There are many things, but they're not liars. It's not like this piece of information could be strategically released should the Stormcloaks win just to spark up another civil war against Ulfric. The latter half of the dossier states that the Thalmor have a stated interest in the civil war continuing, which, well, yeah, that should be pretty obvious. They even admit that they were going to intervene in Ulfric's execution, but were only stopped by the sudden arrival of a dragon. This intervention could range from claiming that Ulfric's their prisoner for being a Talos worshipper, to faking a Stormcloak attack to enable his escape. The final line of the dossier is also important, quote, A Stormcloak victory is also to be avoided, end quote. So, yeah, I don't consider this dossier to be a particularly conclusive piece of evidence in this discussion. It's like saying that the Imperials' account of Ulfric's duel with Torig is objective evidence. It's obvious that the Empire is spreading a stretched truth to make Ulfric's duel sound like murder, while it's also obvious that the Stormcloaks are spreading their own stretched truth to justify the duel taking place. To explain this, let's talk a bit about Game of Thrones. I haven't read the books or even really seen the show, just clips on YouTube, but in that story we hear a lot about Jaime Lannister's murder of the Mad King that he swore to protect. Most people accept the narrative that Jaime did it because his father was taking the city and he switched sides, conveniently betraying his oath and only keeping his position because of nepotism. King Robert has only heard the story from Eddard Stark, who did not witness the full context. However, Jaime shares additional context that the Mad King was about to burn King's Landing to the ground, and that's why he did him in. The point of all that is to show how each person has different perspectives on an event colored by their bias. While the unreliable narrator trope can and absolutely has been used as a shield for lazy writing, when done properly it also has the potential to create a lot of intrigue in a story. The fact is that there's generally not an objective account of events. 
It's like a messy breakup where you're friends with both parties. You cannot take either partner's account of the other at face value. It's hard to give credence to the idea that the Thalmor made Ulfric a sleeper agent when the only documentation we have even acknowledging Ulfric's imprisonment is from the Thalmor. Seems like a biased perspective to me. There's also a point where Ulfric and Elowen are in the same room and the only line hinting at any past relationship is this. But she is to observe, nothing more. We are not negotiating with her. Is that clear? Ulfric, why so hostile? After all, it's not the Thalmor that's burning your farms and killing your sons. She's supposed to be on our side? You know exactly. No. Not this time. The player also can't take the dossier to anybody. Not even Delphine will comment on it. Now, I would consider that an oversight, but it's still evidence. So let's work backwards from our initial question, starting with this. Is Ulfric Stormcloak the right person to be the High King? Well, for one, I think he wins by default. All of the Jarls are characterized as being flawed in different ways. Some are naive, some are corrupt, some are only mildly competent. Skyrim's political infrastructure results in only a few holds being home to High Kings and Winter Holds now out of contention. That means it's a choice between Elisif and Ulfric, and as nice a person is, I don't think Elisif would do well as the High Queen. But that doesn't make Ulfric a good king. He clearly has charisma, which will go a long way in creating both a Skyrim that can stand on its own, but also very necessary alliances. Unfortunately, we aren't really told if Ulfric is taking steps to actually, you know, create those alliances. He has no children for political marriage, he's not even married himself. He's already middle-aged. Charisma is not the only characteristic of a good leader. However, Ulfric does show some wisdom in leadership. I'm not going to mention what Ulfric has to say after he dies just yet. I'll defer that to the main quest line. But if you know what I'm talking about, I'll explain why what he says is not convincing evidence. Can I take a second to just rant about Brunwolf Free Winter? I don't even know where I'm going to put this because I'm writing this after recording a clip of me talking to him. But I just have to complain. Brunwolf is a brilliant character in that he reflects a very real type of person in the world, which is the activist who refuses to associate with anybody who doesn't already agree with his platform, or in essence, a complete waste of oxygen. So I had to look up where to find him, and once I did, I realized I hadn't even really seen this character in Windhelm, and I had spent a decent chunk of time in the city. Then, when you talk to him, he immediately establishes whether you believe Skyrim is for the Nords or for everybody. He has different dialogue if you're a Nord, but the end result is that if you disagree with him, he isn't going to waste his time talking to you, and you can't speak with him again. That's just it. Which is hilarious, because he has a line of dialogue that I wanted to reference in this video that could make a compelling counter-argument to the Stormcloaks. Brunwolf has a favor quest, which is Radiant, but part of establishing that quest is a line that says that Ulfric only protects Nordic settlements in his hold. It's a good argument to include. Except Brunwolf is only brave enough to make it to people who cater to his sensibilities. But even then, it actually didn't appear for me because the quest is bugged and he won't give it to you if you already cleared the dungeon he wants to send you to. And I think that really says something about Bethesda's ability to tell stories. Basically, the main counter argument in Windhelm against Ulfric and it has a chance of bugging out. Nothing about Windhelm seems thought out beyond the surface level. Brunwolf suggests the Great War shouldn't have happened because it led to Ulfric's rebellion, almost completely oblivious to why the Great War happened in the first place and how, even if the Empire had acquiesced to the Thalmor's demands, that Ulfric still would have rebelled? You would think as a veteran of the conflict that he would know firsthand the reality of the Thalmor and the Old Mary Dominion. They are literally even more racist than Nords. The Nords just talk a lot of shit. The Thalmor send hit squads out to kidnap people so that they can torture them to death in order to impose their worldview that their race is supreme. Brunwolf is very clearly just the war veteran who opposes Ulfric character. He should never have been made Jarl of Windhelm unless Bethesda was prepared to actually revamp this character to be much better. Whenever a group of marauders attack a Nord village, Ulfric is the first to sound the horn and send the men. Sounds reasonable. But a group of dark elf refugees gets ambushed. A group of Argonians or a Khajiit caravan. No troops. No investigation. Nothing. Okay, pause. The Red Year was 200 years ago. There are no longer refugees coming from Morrowind, only immigrants. The Khajiit caravans are part of a criminal syndicate, and I seriously doubt there are traveling groups of Argonians out roughing it in this part of the world you may have noticed what kind of weather we have here. 
Further, I don't know if you've noticed, but there's a war going on, there are dragons about, and you're complaining about Ulfric protecting his vassals but not being able to help wanderers. You can send soldiers to protect a settlement, but what are they going to do about a highway robbery? By the time the Stormcloaks would arrive, the bandits would be gone. That's why the bandits are so dangerous. I mean, obviously this is all underdeveloped. Bethesda can barely wrap their heads around a timeline of events, let alone consistently portray this conflict. They showcase Dunmer farmers going off to join the Legion, but we never see Dunmer recruits. Obviously, the real answer for the best High King is me. Fuck Ulfric, let the Dragonborn run Skyrim into the ground. Should Skyrim be independent? No, it'll be the base of my new empire. Can it survive independence? No, because men are pigs that deserve to be slaves under Dunmeri masters. Now, generally as a rule, I plan on not talking about Tez 6 rumors, but for this I have to let it slide. Apparently, they want to do a more in-depth political system. Yeah, I'm sure it'll work this time just like it didn't with Morrowind and the Great House Council, in Oblivion with the Counties, and in Skyrim with the Civil War. And I'm sure the political climate of the world post-2014 is going to lead to a very thrilling and nuanced political story. Look at Fallout 4. Look and weep. They had all the opportunity in the world to make a four-sided conflict and still fumbled the world building when it came to the faction's motivations. To be honest, it comes off as chasing something that isn't authentically Bethesda anymore. Fallout 4 is the way it is because people like New Vegas more than 3 and Bethesda noticed. And Elder Scrolls has been chasing the politics of Daggerfall, even though in reality that doesn't seem to be what they want to do. They want to make these open world games with a focus on player exploration. I mean, that's sort of our, our main character of the game is what is the world and it helps define so much of the game for us. That walking around and just exploring and finding things, I think, is probably you know the most fun you can have in this game. Just get. They feel compelled to do these kinds of stories without really understanding what it is people want for them. If you're going to have a faction conflict, you have to start with a faction. Bethesda seems to have difficulty with world building, often going back to the well of other, more creative people to pull from. Bethesda didn't use the Brotherhood of Steel because they understood the nature of the faction and had a story to tell with it. They used it because it was familiar. In order to properly build a faction, you have to start with characters. The fact that Ulfric is ambiguously old or that he's been running Windhelm for a long time should not be nebulous. It should be established. It should be central to his character. How do you plan to make Skyrim great again when you can barely manage your own city? Ulfric should feel insecure about the state of Windhelm. He should be prepared to justify it to the player character. His explanation could be seen as a flaw or valid based on how the player interprets the situation. The same thing should be done for Tolius and Elisif. General Tolius as is comes off as a Floridian forced on a work trip to somewhere cold. He doesn't show any concern for Skyrim or its people, but the game isn't trying to make the case that he's necessarily ruthless. It just doesn't want to take the time to have Tolius discuss how he's worried for the future of his own homeland, and how he's angry that he has to waste resources fighting Nords when he should be preparing his men to fight the Dominion. A lot of this is based on things we're told in the game, but the game's rather coy with how it hands out information. It's enough to infer meaning without actually having to commit to having all the answers. It all comes off as a plastic conflict, which becomes confusing given the existing plasticity of Fallout 3 and 4. It's hard to believe the point of the Civil War is just to be pointless so a few lines of dialogue and Sovereign Guard can be more impactful. Guys, isn't it weird how war is pointless? Fuck off, there are plenty of valid reasons for war, especially in Elder Scrolls. Luckily for me, I myself can have a point to this section. Skyrim's user interface looks pretty good. I like the minimalist approach which harkens back to the straightforward nature of the Morrowind user interface. Unfortunately, Skyrim's user experience is awful. Ironically, that also goes back to Morrowind, albeit the Xbox version of the game. See, back then it wasn't unusual to have two user interfaces, one for PC with the mouse and keyboard and one for console for controllers. The reason being that each user engages with the system in different manners. Skyrim's UI works better on consoles than Oblivion's by merit of giving more information. However, the user interface is a known failure on PC, one that even Todd Howard mods out. Well, there's a number I like. I, on the PC, the UI one is really, really good. No, that isn't a feeling of deja vu. Literally the exact same thing has happened twice. Todd Howard is advertising a new DLC release for an Elder Scrolls game and says that he uses an interface mod for it. He does not support creating a new UI. He goes ahead with maintaining his old practice of console parity. He doesn't even release script functionality for interface mods to work without a third-party installation. Something, something, it's weird that it's happened twice. But what's so bad about Skyrim's interface that led to SkyUI becoming one of the most installed mods, and what does SkyUI do that makes it so much better? Skyrim continues the tradition of a panel-based UI system where each panel is given its own screen. You have your inventory, magic, map, and character panels. 
Skyrim added a menu which serves as a sort of transition slide between these four, although it's awkward because there's more than four panels. There's also the menu, the journal, the statistics, and the wait tabs. The transition menu will tell you the time and level progress. It would be neat if you could pin skills to be tracked on this menu to see them quickly, and the time display is pointless because the wait menu also tells you this information, but allows you to actually do something with it and can be reached just as easily. From here, down goes to the map. Skyrim opts for a 3D render of the game map, which to pull off they had to dunk the resolution of everything down. It's nice to look at, but I find myself often replacing this map with something more functional because I do modded playthroughs where knowing roads is important. Although, obviously at this point I know every road in Skyrim basically by heart. Local map is also still there just hanging on without a purpose because it's like, what dungeon am I supposed to get lost in and actually need it? I will say that Skyrim's map is superior for giving more of a bird's eye view as opposed to Oblivion's tight little viewport, but I ultimately still find myself a fan of Morrowind's map, which updates with a texture for areas you've already explored. Going up the menu takes us to the character sheet, which has been converted to this radial view of the heavens. Stylish, sure, the only reason I let it slide is that there's no functional reason to have a top-down view of all of our stats at once anymore. Add that back in and, well, the left and right menus are where people actually have problems, which is the bulk of what Sky UI actually replaces. Skyrim's inventory presents a banner of item categories with favorites at the top and an all menu second. Of course, the all menu continues to be a pointless addition because there's no reason in an itemized list system to want to see a continuous list of all the items you have in your inventory. The all section in Morrowind was fine because it used an icon system. The items were still organized by type, making locating specific items inside the entirety of your inventory very easy. Now on the surface, switching from icons to itemization is not an issue. Both systems have upsides and downsides. The upside of itemized systems is that it's easier to create divisions for organization as long as you have a consistent system for classifying items. Skyrim uses these divisions. Weapons, apparel, potions, scrolls, ingredients, food, books, keys, and miscellaneous. As usual, the last tab is used as a catch-all, and boy does it catch a lot which was a problem that Oblivion had, yet for some reason is mostly unfixed in Skyrim. Miscellaneous includes crafting items and soul gems, which honestly should be their own tabs, especially since routine soul gem recharging is a universal mechanic. Anyways, once you select a category, a second banner appears that lists all of the items in your inventory in that category. Once an item's selected, it'll pop up in the main viewport with a description, some stats, and its model. Where the system starts to fall apart is when there's too many items in a category. Your only option for sorting is alphabetical and there are no icons to distinguish between items. Where this appears ugliest is in the potions menu. Many potions in the game, unsurprisingly, start with the word potion. Potions and poisons are intermingled and after some time the list can become so long that it's hard to really have a bearing on where in the list you are outside of the top and bottom. Potions have always been a sore spot in these systems, especially given how much more of a reliance this game has on them and the Pip-Boy system's never been much better for medical supplies in Fallout. The UI is pretty wasteful in terms of presentation. While for some stuff like weapons and quest items, it's good to see the item, for potions it would probably be better to cut out the model view and just increase the banner size so that you can see the potion stats, which is pretty much exactly what SkyUI does in this situation. I would also do more to make sure that I can, at a glance, at just the list, tell which potions have which effects. I would organize the potion menu by effect. There's no reason to have six different locations for healing potions just because there are multiple tiers. You can use colors in this situation to help distinguish because it all becomes a blur of white text on a semi-opaque black background, and have the restore potions match their respective color of juice. However, all of these problems get worse with container inventories. Most things you loot have a pretty straightforward list with a small selection of items, which is where the system shines. The leveled lists are so consistent that I can process what I've received very quickly. It's when you start using containers back at the house that the default Skyrim user interface starts to break down. For some reason, it was decided that the only mode for container inventories would be all. This means that you have to scroll down a list of everything that is in the container. Now that's fine if you can organize your setup, however Skyrim does not have a free place mode for containers, meaning that you're at the mercy of the designers how well you can actually organize your play space. I usually have a container for alchemy supplies, crafting materials, generic items, and finally a trash can for items I want to sell. But even then the system's unideal because these containers won't sort entirely alphabetically, but equipment will actually be organized statistically. You are not given any recourse for organizing the list like you are in Oblivion. Skyrim's also lacking the basic feature of being able to designate items as junk to make clearing your inventory quicker, this leads to carry weight bloat as items pile up, even with frequent cleanings. The bad inventory system results in the aforementioned apathy threshold problem where potions go unused because going to the effort of finding a specific potion that you use once every couple hours is greater than your willingness to brute force the problem. 
I do have to wonder though, the claim is often made that Skyrim's user interface is designed to work better for consoles for mass accessibility, but I recall most of these problems being true on the 360 as well. While the menu does control slightly better with the controller, most of its issues actually stem from a lack of options being made available to the player, you know, spreadsheety and what have you. There are still several buttons going unused on a controller that could do functions like changing the organization parameters. Really, what Skyrim's menu does is be straightforward and easy to understand in the early game. The problems only become manifest if you try to engage with the game for more than a couple hours, which obviously Skyrim is a game with dozens of hours of content. The obvious expectation is that if you're really going to be some kind of power gamer intent on seeing everything, you are probably playing on a system that can modify the bad menu for something better, just as Todd intended. Which takes us to the magic menu. It's a mirror of the inventory, but with magic favorites and all, in case you want to see a list of all the magic you have in the game. There are reasons for non-magic players to visit this menu since the dragon shouts, racial powers, and status effects list are all in this part of town. The magic is then subdivided into their respective schools. It's not bad unless you get entirely too much magic and then it's as bad as any part of the inventory menu. Especially dragon shouts because there's a wide variety of different effects the shouts can have all located in one list. Overall, the clunkiness of the system is almost entirely fixed by Sky UI. It has divisions for item types but also subdivisions for types of items. You can sort by apparel, but if you're looking for boots, you can also sort and scroll down to the feet section. Although the funniest part of Sky UI is the simple fact that it really accomplishes the same thing as the default user interface. Saying that the UI has to be this way because the item card and model view are inaccurate because Sky UI accomplishes the same exact goals while still giving you an efficient method of finding items. Really, there's no reason why Bethesda can't create two user interfaces and give the player the option to pick which one they want. You're telling me they had time to make a high-resolution texture pack for PC, but not a modified UI scheme. Yeah, it's one thing to ask that of some studio of overworked developers who have bigger fish to fry. It's another when it's a studio with access to money-printing franchises, publisher support, and an internal desire for a better user interface system from its executive producer. Skyrim's soundtrack is, in my opinion, the best in the entire Elder Scrolls series, in a lot of ways. It's a culmination in ideas from Morrowind and Oblivion while expanding on those ideas. In Morrowind, music worked by the game just picking an mp3 file based on whether or not you were in a fight. Oblivion expanded that by adding dungeon and town tracks, increasing both the variety of music you can hear, as well as setting the tone for what was happening through the music. Skyrim does that as well, but even further expanded. There are tracks for the time of day, taverns, castles, and specific moments. The DLC even added more music, including some of my favorite songs in the entire franchise, such as the Falmer Valley and Solstheim themes. I'm not really interested in doing a track-by-track -track analysis of Skyrim. The music is absolutely integral to the success of the game, there's no doubt in my mind about that, but I probably overextended myself by doing that for Morrowind. Rather, I want to talk about Jeremy Soul. I blurred his name out in my Harry Potter video, and some people speculated about why that was, but I never directly answered. I actually didn't even do it originally, and my goal with that was not to exclude him. Rather, the reason I did it was that the point was to encourage viewers to think about the average people who make shovelware games. And unfortunately, commenters were gravitating towards noticing Soul's name in the credits, defeating the entire purpose of the section because people were only talking about the one famous guy who worked on the games. Now the speculation goes that I did it because of sexual assault allegations against him, but it's not that simple. It's been assumed that because Soul has been quiet since then and hasn't done much professional work that he must have done it. However, the much likelier explanation for Soul's disappearance actually has to do with his company, Direct Song, as well as a Kickstarter campaign he has done. Legal troubles are universally a bigger damper on creativity than getting cancelled on Twitter. When I made my previous videos, I had no idea about the story. Someone offhandedly commented about it, and I happened to see that comment, and that's the only reason I know about it. Which is pretty crazy given what happened. You would think people would have mentioned this a lot. I really hope someone watching this decides to expand it into being a full, detailed breakdown or journalistic article. Direct Song was Jeremy Soule's label, founded in 2005 to publish digital and later physical versions of his soundtracks. He was already halfway through his career as a composer at that point. What's important to note is that Soul, for a long time, produced multiple OSTs per year. After 2010, he really slowed the number of OSTs he was producing, 
but there was a drastic increase in production quality per soundtrack, notable examples being Skyrim in 2011 and Guild Wars 2 in 2012. But when it came time to sell those soundtracks, well, this is where problems began to emerge. Firstly, the Dawnguard and Dragonborn unique tracks were never digitally sold. Oftentimes, the versions Direct Song offered were higher quality, whereas you have to listen to these tracks through ripping software from the game files. But Direct Song started to have issues with actually delivering the products that people were purchasing. In one case, someone received a physical copy of the Guild Wars 2 soundtrack that they purchased in January of 2013 in June of 2017. There wasn't a lot of transparency about why there were issues with delivering these goods. If it was as simple as manufacturing delays or money troubles and that was stated, people would have probably been pretty forgiving. Part of the problem was how Direct Song actually operated. For Guild Wars, you could use the higher quality purchased soundtracks to replace the music in the game, but there ended up being a lot of issues with that business model. One of those issues apparently being that Soul held the rights which posed problems for ArenaNet when Direct Song disappeared. Soul was also vehemently anti-piracy, likening it to the Holocaust, which understandably bothered some people. Direct Song's customer support was famous for being difficult to work with. This eventually led to a class action lawsuit, but it's not clear to me what happened as a result of that. And then there was the Kickstarter campaign. Like many of its era, a Kickstarter campaign to produce a symphony ended up not being so simple. He wanted $10,000, he got $121,000, yet years later, he had not finished The Northerner. The campaign was shrouded in controversy, not just for being late, but the perception that Seoul had used the money to fund an international vacation. It was more complicated than that, but again, the lack of transparency with both his financial supporters as well as the broader public did not help the situation. Plus, the direct song stuff was going on with Guild Wars 2 at the same time. When the sexual assault allegations came out, the label handling the Northerner dropped Soul as a consequence. His social media pages disappeared, and later his direct song, Bandcamp, and Patreon pages also disappeared. Which is a sad ending for someone with as many amazing soundtracks to his name as Jeremy Soul.